International Short Stories, Volume One American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. International Short Stories, Volume One American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section One The Prophetic Pictures by nathaniel hawthorne but this painter cried walter ludlow with animation he not only excels in his peculiar art but possesses vast acquirements in all other learning and science he talks hebrew with dr mather and gives lectures in anatomy to dr boylston in a word he will meet the best instructed man among us on his own ground moreover he is a polished gentleman a citizen of the world yes a true cosmopolite for he will speak like a native of each clime and country on the globe except our own forests whither he is now going nor is all this what i most admire in him indeed said eleanor who had listened with a woman's interest to the description of such a man yet this is admirable enough surely it is replied her lover but far less so than his natural gift of adapting himself to every variety of character insomuch that all men and all women too eleanor shall find a mirror of themselves in this wonderful painter but the greatest wonder is yet to be told nay if he have more wonderful attributes than these said eleanor laughing boston is a perilous abode for the poor gentleman are you telling me of a painter or a wizard in truth answered he that question might be asked much more seriously than you suppose They say that he paints not merely a man's features, but his mind and heart He catches the secret sentiments and passions and throws them upon the canvas like sunshine Or perhaps in the portraits of dark-souled men like a gleam of infernal fire It is an awful gift added Walter lowering his voice from its tone of enthusiasm I shall almost be afraid to sit to him Walter are you in earnest exclaimed Eleanor for heaven's sake dearest Eleanor do not let him paint the look which you now wear said her lover smiling though rather perplexed There it is passing away now, but when you spoke you seemed frightened to death and very sad besides What were you thinking of? Nothing nothing answered Eleanor hastily you paint my face with your own fantasies well come for me tomorrow and we will visit this wonderful artist but when the young man had departed it cannot be denied that a remarkable expression was again visible on the fair and youthful face of his mistress it was a sad and anxious look little in accordance with what should have been the feelings of a maiden on the eve of wedlock yet walter ludlow was the chosen of her heart a look said eleanor to herself no wonder that it startled him if it expressed what i sometimes feel i know by my own experience how frightful a look may be but it was all fancy i thought nothing of it at the time i have seen nothing of it since i did but dream it and she busied herself about the embroidery of a ruff in which she meant that her portrait should be taken the painter of whom they had been speaking was not one of those native artists who at a later period than this borrowed their colors from the indians and manufactured their pencils of the furs of wild beasts perhaps if we could have revoked his life and prearranged his destiny he might have chosen to belong to that school without a master in the hope of being at least original since there were no works of art to imitate no rules to follow but he had been born and educated in Europe people said that he had studied the grandeur or beauty of conception and Every touch of the master hand in all the most famous pictures in cabinets and galleries and on the walls of churches So there was nothing more for his powerful mind to learn Art could add nothing to its lessons, but nature might he had therefore visited a world with a none of his professional brethren had preceded him to feast his eyes on visible images that were noble and picturesque yet had never been transferred to canvas 
America was too poor to afford other temptations to an artist of eminence Though many of the colonial gentry on the painter's arrival had expressed a wish to transmit their lineaments to posterity by means of his skill Whenever such proposals were made he fixed his piercing eyes on the applicant and seemed to look him through and through if he beheld only a sleek and comfortable visage though there were a gold lace coat to adorn the picture and golden guineas to pay for it he civilly rejected the task and the reward but if the face were the index of anything uncommon in thought sentiment or experience or if he met a beggar in the street with a white beard and a furrowed brow or if sometimes a child happened to look up and smile he would exhaust all the art on them that he denied to wealth pictorial skills being so rare in the colonies the painter became an object of general curiosity if few or none could appreciate the technical merit of his productions yet there were points in regard to which the opinion of the crowd was as valuable as the refined judgment of the amateur he watched the effect that each picture produced on such untutored beholders and derived profit from their remarks while they would as soon have thought of instructing nature herself as him who seemed to rival her Their admiration it must be owned was tinctured with the prejudices of the age and country Some deemed it an offense against the mosaic law and even a presumptuous mockery of the creator to bring into existence such lively images of his creations Others frightened at the art which could raise phantoms at will and keep the form of the dead among the living were inclined to consider the painter as a magician or perhaps the famous black man of old witch times plotting mischief in a new guise these foolish fancies were more than half believed among the mob even in superior circles his character was invested with a vague awe partly rising like smoke wreaths from the popular superstitions but chiefly caused by the varied knowledge and talents which he made subservient to his profession being on the eve of marriage walter ludlow and eleanor were eager to obtain their portraits as the first of what they doubtless hoped would be a long series of family pictures the day after the conversation above recorded they visited the painter's rooms a servant ushered them into an apartment where though the artist himself was not visible there were personages whom they could hardly forbear greeting with reverence they knew indeed that the whole assembly were but pictures yet felt it impossible to separate the idea of life and intellect from such striking counterfeits Several of the portraits were known to them either as distinguished characters of the day or their private acquaintances There was governor Burnett looking as if he had just received an undutiful communication from the House of Representatives and were inditing a most sharp response Mr. Cook hung beside the ruler whom he opposed sturdy and somewhat puritanical as befitted a popular leader The ancient lady of Sir William Phipps eyed them from the wall in rough and farthingale an imperious old dame not unsuspected of witchcraft John Winslow then a very young man wore the expression of warlike enterprise which long afterward made him a distinguished general their personal friends were recognized at a glance in most of the pictures the whole mind and character were brought out on the countenance and Concentrated into a single look so that to speak paradoxically the originals hardly resembled themselves so strikingly as the portraits did Among these modern worthies there were two old bearded Saints who had almost vanished into the darkening canvas There was also a pale but unfaded Madonna who had perhaps been worshipped in Rome and now regarded the lovers with such a mild and holy look that they longed to worship too how singular a thought observed walter ludlow that this beautiful face has been beautiful for above two hundred years oh if all beauty would endure so well do you not envy her eleanor if earth were heaven i might she replied but where all things fade how miserable to be the one that could not fade this dark old st peter has a fierce and ugly scowl saint though he may be continued walter he troubles me but the virgin looks kindly at us yes but very sorrowfully methinks said eleanor the easel stood beneath these three old pictures 
sustaining one that had been recently commenced. After a little inspection, they began to recognize the features of their own minister, the Reverend Dr. Coleman, growing into shape and life, as it were, out of a cloud. "'Kind old man!' exclaimed Eleanor. "'He gazes at me as if he were about to utter a word of paternal advice.' "'And at me,' said Walter, "'as if he were about to shake his head and rebuke me for some suspected iniquity. "'But so does the original. "'I shall never feel quite comfortable under his eye till we stand before him to be married.' They now heard a footstep on the floor, and turning, beheld the painter, who had been some moments in the room, and had listened to a few of their remarks. He was a middle-aged man, with a countenance well worthy of his own pencil. Indeed, but the picturesque though careless arrangement of his rich dress, and perhaps because his soul dwelt always among painted shapes, he looked somewhat like a portrait himself. His visitors were sensible of a kindred between the artist and his works, and felt as if one of the pictures had stepped from the canvas to salute them. Walter Ludlow, who was slightly known to the painter, explained the object of their visit. While he spoke, a sunbeam was falling athwart his figure and Eleanor's, with so happy an effect that they also seemed living pictures of youth and beauty, gladdened by bright fortune. The artist was evidently struck. "'My easel is occupied for several ensuing days, and my stay in Boston must be brief,' said he thoughtfully. Then, after an observant glance, he added, "'But your wishes shall be gratified, though I disappoint the Chief Justice and Madam Oliver. "'I must not lose this opportunity for the sake of painting a few ells of broadcloth and brocade.' The painter expressed a desire to introduce both their portraits into one picture, and represent them engaged in some appropriate action. This plan would have delighted the lovers, but was necessarily rejected, because so large a space of canvas would have been unfit for the room which it was intended to decorate. Two half-length portraits were therefore fixed upon. After they had taken their leave, Walter Ludlow asked Eleanor, with a smile, whether she knew what an influence over their fates the painter was about to acquire. The old women of Boston affirm, continued he, that after he has once got possession of a person's face and figure, he may paint him in any act or situation whatever, and the picture will be prophetic. Do you believe it? Not quite, said Eleanor, smiling. Yet if he has such magic, there is something so gentle in his manner that I am sure he will use it well. It was the painter's choice to proceed with both the portraits at the same time, assigning as a reason, in the mystical language which he sometimes used, that the faces threw light upon each other. Accordingly, he gave now a touch to Walter, and now to Eleanor, and the features of one and the other began to start forth so vividly that it appeared as if his triumphant art would actually disengage them from the canvas. Amid the rich light and deep shade they beheld their phantom selves, but though the likeness promised to be perfect, they were not quite satisfied with the expression. It seemed more vague than in most of the painter's works. He, however, was satisfied with the prospect of success, and being much interested in the lovers, employed his leisure moments unknown to them in making a crayon sketch of their two figures. During their sittings, he engaged them in conversation, and kindled up their faces with characteristic traits which, though continually varying, it was his purpose to combine and fix. At length he announced that at their next visit both the portraits would be ready for delivery. If my pencil will but be true to my conception, in the few last touches which I meditate, observed he, these two pictures will be my very best performances. Seldom, indeed, has an artist such subjects. While speaking, he still bent his penetrative eye upon them, nor withdrew it till they had reached the bottom of the stairs. Nothing in the whole circle of human vanities takes stronger hold of the imagination than this affair of having a portrait painted. Yet why should it be so? The looking-glass, the polished globes of the andirons, the mirror-like water, and all other reflecting surfaces continually present us with portraits, or rather ghosts of ourselves, which we glance at, and straightway forget them. But we forget them only because they vanish. It is the idea of duration, of earthly immortality, that gives such a mysterious interest to our own portraits. 
Walter and Eleanor were not insensible to this feeling and hastened to the painter's room punctually at the appointed hour to meet those pictured shapes which were to be their representatives with posterity. The sunshine flashed after them into the apartment, but left it somewhat gloomy as they closed the door. Their eyes were immediately attracted to their portraits, which rested against the furthest wall of the room. At the first glance, through the dim light and the distance, seeing themselves in precisely their natural attitudes, and with all the air that they recognized so well, they uttered a simultaneous exclamation of delight. "'There we stand,' cried Walter, enthusiastically, "'fixed in sunshine for ever. "'No dark passions can gather on our faces.' "'No,' said Eleanor, more calmly, "'no dreary change can sadden us.' This was said while they were approaching, and had yet gained only an imperfect view of the pictures. The painter, after saluting them, busied himself at a table in completing a crayon sketch, leaving his visitors to form their own judgment as to his perfected labours. At intervals he sent a glance from beneath his deep eyebrows, watching their countenances in profile, with his pencil suspended over the sketch. They had now stood some moments, each in front of the other's picture, contemplating it with entranced attention, but without uttering a word. At length, Walter stepped forward, then back, viewing Eleanor's portrait in various lights, and finally spoke. "'Is there not a change?' said he, in a doubtful and meditative tone. "'Yes, the perception of it grows more vivid the longer I look. It is certainly the same picture that I saw yesterday. The dress, the features, all are the same. And yet something is altered.' "'Is, then, the picture less like than it was yesterday?' inquired the painter now drawing near with irrepressible interest the features are perfect eleanor answered walter and at the first glance the expression seemed also hers but i could fancy that the portrait has changed countenance while i have been looking at it the eyes are fixed on mine with a strangely sad and anxious expression nay it is grief and terror is this like eleanor compare the living face with the pictured one said the painter. Walter glanced sidelong at his mistress and started. Motionless and absorbed, fascinated, as it were, in contemplation of Walter's portrait, Eleanor's face had assumed precisely the expression of which he had just been complaining. Had she practised for whole hours before a mirror, she could not have caught the look so successfully. Had the picture itself been a mirror, it could not have thrown back her present aspect, with stronger and more melancholy truth. She appeared quite unconscious of the dialogue between the artist and her lover. Eleanor, exclaimed Walter in amazement, what change has come over you? She did not hear him, nor desist from her fixed gaze, till he seized her hand and thus attracted her notice. Then, with a sudden tremor, she looked from the picture to the face of the original. Do you see no change in your portrait? asked she. In mine? None, replied Walter, examining it. But let me see. Yes, there is a slight change, an improvement, I think, in the picture, though none in the likeness. It has a livelier expression than yesterday, as if some bright thought were flashing from the eyes and about to be uttered from the lips. Now that I have caught the look, it becomes very decided. While he was intent on these observations, Eleanor turned to the painter. She regarded him with grief and awe, and felt that he repaid her with sympathy and commiseration, though wherefore she could but vaguely guess. "'That look,' whispered she, and shuddered, "'how came it there?' "'Madam,' said the painter, sadly, taking her hand and leading her apart, "'in both these pictures I have painted what I saw. "'The artist, the true artist, must look beneath the exterior. "'It is his gift.' his proudest but often a melancholy one, to see the inmost soul, and by a power indefinable even to himself, to make it glow or darken upon the canvas, in glances that express the thought and sentiment of years. Would that I might convince myself of error in the present instance. They had now approached the table, on which were heads in chalk, hands almost expressive as ordinary faces, ivied church towers, thatched cottages, old thunder-stricken trees, oriental and antique costume, 
and all such picturesque vagaries of an artist's idle moment. Turning them over, with seeming carelessness, a crayon sketch of two figures was disclosed. If I have failed, continued he, if your heart does not see itself reflected in your own portrait, if you have no secret cause to trust my delineation of the other, it is not yet too late to alter them. I might change the action of these figures too, but would it influence the event? He directed her notice to the sketch. A thrill ran through Eleanor's frame. A shriek was upon her lips, but she stifled it, with the self-command that becomes habitual to all who hide thoughts of fear and anguish within their bosoms. Turning from the table, she perceived that Walter had advanced near enough to have seen the sketch, though she could not determine whether it had caught his eye. "'We will not have the pictures altered,' she said hastily. "'If mine is sad, I shall but look the gayer for the contrast.' "'Be it so,' answered the painter, bowing. "'May your griefs be your fanciful ones, that only your picture may mourn for them. "'For your joys, may they be true and deep, and paint themselves upon this lovely face till it quite belie my heart.' After the marriage of Walter and Eleanor, the pictures formed the two most splendid ornaments of their abode. They hung side by side, separated by a narrow panel, appearing to eye each other constantly, yet always returning the gaze of the spectator. Travelled gentlemen who professed a knowledge of such subjects reckoned these among the most admirable specimens of modern portraiture, while common observers compared them with the originals feature by feature, and were rapturous in praise of the likeness. But it was on a third class, neither travelled connoisseurs nor common observers, but people of natural sensibility, that the pictures wrought their strongest effect. Such persons might gaze carelessly at first, but, becoming interested, would return day after day, and study these painted faces like the pages of a mystic volume. Walter Ludlow's portrait attracted their earliest notice, in the absence of himself and his bride, they sometimes disputed as to the expression which the painter had intended to throw upon the features, all agreeing that there was a look of earnest import, though no two explained it alike. There was less diversity of opinion in regard to Eleanor's picture. They differed indeed in their attempts to estimate the nature and depth of the gloom that dwelt upon her face, but agreed that it was gloom, and alien from the natural temperament of their youthful friend. A certain fanciful person announced, as the result of much scrutiny, that both these pictures were part of one design, and that the melancholy strength of feeling in Eleanor's countenance bore reference to the more vivid emotion, or, as he termed it, the wild passion in that of Walter. Though unskilled in the art, he even began a sketch, in which the action of the two figures was to correspond with their mutual expression. It was whispered among friends that, day by day, Eleanor's face was assuming a deeper shade of pensiveness, which threatened soon to render her too true a counterpart of her melancholy picture. Walter, on the other hand, instead of acquiring the vivid look which the painter had given him on the canvas, became reserved and downcast, with no outward flashes of emotion. However, it might be smouldering within. In course of time, Eleanor hung a gorgeous curtain of purple silk, wrought with flowers and fringed with heavy golden tassels, before the pictures, under pretense that the dust would tarnish their hues, or the light dim them. It was enough. Her visitors felt that the massive folds of the silk must never be withdrawn, nor the portraits mentioned in her presence. Time wore on, and the painter came again, he had been far enough to the north to see the silver cascade of the crystal hills, and to look over the vast round of cloud and forest from the summit of New England's loftiest mountain. But he did not profane that scene by the mockery of his art. He had also lain in a canoe on the bosom of Lake George, making his soul the mirror of its loveliness and grandeur, till not a picture in the Vatican was more vivid than his recollection. He had gone with the Indian hunters to Niagara, and there again had flung his hopeless pencil down the precipice, feeling that he could as soon paint the roar as aught else that goes to make up the wondrous cataract. In truth, it was seldom his impulse to occupy natural scenery, 
except as a framework for the delineations of the human form and face instinct with thought passion or suffering with store of such his adventurous ramble had enriched him the stern dignity of indian chiefs the dusky loveliness of indian girls the domestic life of wigwams the stealthy march the battle beneath gloomy pine trees the frontier fortress with its garrison the anomaly of the old french partisan bred in courts but grown gray in shaggy deserts such were the scenes and portraits that he had sketched the glow of perilous moments flashed of wild feeling struggles of fierce power love hate grief frenzy in a word all the worn-out heart of the old earth had been revealed to him under a new form his portfolio was filled with graphic illustrations of the volume of his memory which genius would transmute into its own substance and imbue with immortality he felt that the deep wisdom of his art which he had sought so far was found but amid stern or lovely nature in the perils of the forest or its overwhelming peacefulness still there had been true phantoms the companions of his way like all other men around whom an engrossing purpose wreathes itself he was insulated from the mass of humankind he had no aim no pleasure no sympathies but what were ultimately connected with his art though gentle in manner and upright in intent and action he did not possess kindly feelings his heart was cold no living creature could be brought near enough to keep him warm for these two beings however he had felt in its greatest intensity the sort of interest which always allied him to the subjects of his pencil he had pried into their souls with his keenest insight and pictured the result upon their features with his utmost skill so as barely to fall short of that standard which no genius ever reached his own severe conception he had caught from the duskiness of the future at least so he fancied a fearful secret and has obscurely revealed it on the portraits so much of himself of his imagination and all other powers had been lavished on the study of walter and eleanor that he almost regarded them as creations of his own like the thousands with which he had peopled the realms of picture therefore did they flit through the twilight of the woods hover on the mist of waterfalls look forth from the mirror of the lake nor melt away in the noontide sun they haunted his pictorial fancy not as mockeries of life nor pale goblins of the dead but in the guise of portraits each with the unalterable expression which his magic had evoked from the caverns of the soul he could not recross the atlantic till he had again beheld the originals of those airy pictures oh glorious art thus mused the enthusiastic painter as he trod the street thou art the image of the creator's own the innumerable forms that wander in nothingness start into being at thy beck the dead live again thou recallest them to their old scenes and givest their grey shadows the lustre of a better life at once earthly and immortal thou snatchest back the fleeting moments of history with thee there is no past for at thy touch all that is great becomes for ever present the illustrious men live through long ages in the visible performances of the very deeds which make them what they are o oh, potent art as thou bringest the faintly revealed past to stand in that narrow strip of sunlight which we call now canst thou summon the shrouded future to meet her there have i not achieved it am i not thy prophet thus with a proud yet melancholy fervour did he almost cry aloud as he passed through the toilsome street among people that knew not of his reveries nor could understand nor care for them it is not good for man to cherish a solitary ambition unless there be those around him by whose example he may regulate himself his thoughts desires and hopes will become extravagant and he the semblance perhaps the reality of a madman reading other bosoms with an acuteness almost preternatural the painter failed to see the disorder of his own and this should be the house said he looking up and down the front before he knocked heaven help my brains that picture methinks it will never vanish whether i look at the windows or the door there it is framed within them painted strongly and glowing in the richest tints the faces of the portraits the figures and actions of the sketch 
He knocked. The portraits, are they within? inquired he of the domestic. Then recollecting himself, your master and mistress, are they at home? They are, sir, said the servant, adding, as he noticed that picturesque look of which the painter could never divest himself. And the portraits, too. The guest was admitted into a parlour, communicating by a central door with an interior room of the same size. As the first apartment was empty, he passed into the entrance of the second, within which his eyes were greeted by those living personages, as well as their pictured representatives, who had long been the object of so singular an interest. He involuntarily paused on the threshold. They had not perceived his approach. Walter and Eleanor were standing before the portraits, whence the former had just flung back the rich and voluminous folds of the silken curtain, holding its golden tassel with one hand, while the other grasped that of his bride. The pictures, concealed for months, gleamed forth again in undiminished splendour, appearing to throw a sombre light across the room rather than to be disclosed by a borrowed radiance. That of Eleanor had been almost prophetic. A pensiveness, and next a gentle sorrow, had successively dwelt upon her countenance, deepening, with the lapse of time, into a quiet anguish. A mixture of affright would now have made it the very expression of the portrait. Walter's face was moody and dull, or animated only by fitful flashes, which left a heavier darkness for their momentary illumination. He looked from Eleanor to her portrait, and thence to his own, in the contemplation of which he finally stood absorbed. The painter seemed to hear the step of destiny approaching behind him, on its progress toward its victims. A strange thought darted into his mind. Was not his own the form in which that destiny had embodied itself, and he a chief agent of the coming evil which he had foreshadowed? Still, Walter remained silent before the picture, communing with it, as with his own heart, and abandoning himself to the spell of evil influence that the painter had cast upon the features. Gradually his eyes kindled, while, as Eleanor watched the increasing wildness of his face, her own assumed a look of terror, and when at last he turned upon her, the resemblance of both to their portraits was complete. "'Our fate is upon us,' howled Walter. "'Die!' Drawing a knife, he sustained her, as she was sinking to the ground, and aimed it at her bosom. In the action, and in the look of attitude of each, the painter beheld the figures of his sketch. The picture, with all its tremendous colouring, was finished. "'Hold, madman!' cried he, sternly. He had advanced from the door, and interposed himself between the wretched beings, with the same sense of power to regulate their destiny as to alter a scene upon the canvas. He stood like a magician, controlling the phantoms which he had evoked. What? muttered Walter Ludlow, as he relapsed from fierce excitement into silent gloom. Does fate impede its own decree? Wretched lady, said the painter, did I not warn you? You did, replied Eleanor calmly, as her terror gave place to the quiet grief which it had disturbed. But I loved him. Is there not a deep moral in the tale? Could the result of one, or all our deeds, be shadowed forth and set before us? Some would call it fate, and hurry onward, others be swept along by their passionate desires, and none be turned aside by the prophetic pictures. End of section one. Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 2. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker. Part 1 A pleasing land of drowsy head it was, of dreams that wave before the half-shut eye, and of gay castles in the clouds that pass, forever flushing round a summer sky. Castle of Indolence 
in the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the hudson at that broad expansion of the river denominated by the ancient dutch navigators the tapan zee and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of saint nicholas when they crossed there lies a small market town or rural port which by some is called greensburg but which is more generally and properly known by the name of tarry town this name was given it we are told in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days be that as it may i do not vouch for the fact but merely advert to it for the sake of being precise and authentic not far from this village perhaps about three miles there is a little valley or rather lap of land among high hills which is one of the quietest places in the whole world a small brook glides through it with just a murmur enough to lull one to repose and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquillity i recollect that when a stripling my first exploit in squirrel shooting was in a grove of tall walnut trees that shades one side of the valley i had wandered into it at noontime when all nature is peculiarly quiet and was startled by roar of my own gun as it broke the sabbath stillness around and was prolonged and reverberated by the angry echoes if ever i should wish for a retreat whither i might steal from the world and its distractions and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life i know of none more promising than this little valley from the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants who are descendants from the original dutch settlers this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of sleepy hollow and its rustic lads are called the sleepy hollow boys throughout all the neighboring country a drowsy dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere some say that the place was bewitched by a high german doctor during the early days of the settlement others that an old indian chief the prophet or wizard of his tribe held his powwows there before the country was discovered by master hendrick hudson certain it is the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people causing them to walk in a continual reverie they are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs and are subject to trances and visions and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air the whole neighborhood abounds with local tales haunted spots and twilight superstitions stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country and the nightmare with her whole ninefold seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambols the dominant spirit however that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head it is said by some to be the ghost of a hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannon-ball in some nameless battle during the revolutionary war and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind his haunts are not confined to the valley but extend at times to the adjacent roads and especially to the vicinity of a church that is at no great distance indeed certain of the most authentic historians of those parts who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this spectre allege that the body of the trooper having been buried in the churchyard the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak such is the general purport of this legendary superstition which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadows 
and the spectre is known at all the country firesides by the name of the headless horseman of sleepy hollow it is remarkable that the visionary propensity i have mentioned is not confined to the native inhabitants of the valley but is unconsciously imbibed by every one who resides there for a time however wide awake they may have been before they entered that sleepy region they are sure in a little time to inhale the witching influence of the air and begin to grow imaginative to dream dreams and see apparitions i mention this peaceful spot with all possible lord for it is in such little retired dutch valleys found here and there embosomed in the great state of new york that population manners and customs remain fixed while the great torrent of migration and improvement which is making such incessant changes in other parts of this restless country sweeps by them unobserved they are like those little nooks of still water which border a rapid stream where we may see the straw and bubble riding quietly at anchor or slowly revolving in their mimic harbor undisturbed by the rush of the passing current though many years have elapsed since i trod the drowsy shades of sleepy hollow yet i question whether i should not still find the same trees and the same families vegetating in its sheltered bosom in this by place of nature there abode in a remote period of american history and that is to say some thirty years since a worthy white of the name of ichabod crane who sojourned or as he expressed it tarried in sleepy hollow for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity he was a native of connecticut a state which supplies the union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodsmen and country schoolmasters the cognomen of crane was not inapplicable to his person he was tall but exceedingly lank with narrow shoulders long arms and legs hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves feet that might have served for shovels and his whole frame most loosely hung together his head was small and flat at top with huge ears large green glassy eyes and a long snipe nose so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew to see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield his schoolhouse was a low building of one large room rudely constructed of logs the windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of copy books it was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a width twisted in the handle of the door and stakes set against the window shutters so that though a thief might get in with perfect ease he would find some embarrassment in getting out an idea most probably borrowed by the architect Joost van Houten from the mystery of an ale pot the schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation just at the foot of a woody hill with a brook running close by and a formidable birch tree growing at one end of it from hence the low murmur of his pupils voices conning over their lessons might be heard of a drowsy summer's day like the hum of a beehive interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master in the tone of menace or command or peradventure by the appalling sound of the birch as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge truth to say he was a conscientious man that ever bore in mind the golden maxim spare the rod and spoil the child ichabod crane scholars certainly were not spoiled i would not have it imagined however that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects on the contrary he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity taking the burden off the backs of the weak and laying it on those of the strong your mere puny stripling that winced at the least flourish of the rod was passed by with indulgence 
but the claims of justice were satisfied by inflicting a double portion on some little tough wrong-headed broad-skirted dutch urchin who sulked and swelled and grew dogged and sullen beneath the birch all this he called doing his duty by their parents and he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance so consolatory to the smarting urchin that he would remember it and thank him for it the longest day he had to live when school hours were over he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys and on holy day afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers noted for the comforts of the cupboard indeed it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils the revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread for he was a huge feeder and though lank had the dilating powers of an anaconda but to help out his maintenance he was according to country custom in those parts boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed with these he lived successively a week at a time thus going the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief that all this might not be too onerous on the purses of his rustic patrons who are apt to consider the costs of schooling a grievous burden and schoolmasters as mere drones he had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable he assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of their farms helped to make hay mended the fences took the horses to water drove the cows from pasture and cut wood for the winter fire he laid aside too all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it in his little empire the school and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating he found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children particularly the youngest and like the lion bold which while um, so magnanimously the lamb did hold he would sit with the child on one knee and rock a cradle with his foot for whole hours together in addition to his other vocations he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in psalmody it was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers where in his own mind he completely carried away the psalm from the parson certain it is his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation and there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church and which may even be heard half a mile off quite to the opposite side of the mill pond on a still sunday morning which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of ichabod crane thus by divers little makeshifts in that ingenious way which is commonly denominated by hook and by crook the worthy pedagogue got on tolerably enough and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy life of it the schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood being considered a kind of idle gentleman-like personage of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains and indeed inferior in learning only to the parson his appearance therefore is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea-table of a farmhouse and the addition of a supernumerary dish of cakes or sweetmeats or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot our man of letters therefore was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels how he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on sundays gathering grapes for them from the wild vines that overrun the surrounding trees reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones or sauntering with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill pond while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back envying his superior elegance and address from his half itinerant life also he was a kind of traveling gazette carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction he was moreover esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition for he had read several books quite through 
and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. He was, in fact, an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary, and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. No tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow. It was often his delight, after his school was dismissed in the afternoon, to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover, bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse, and there con over old Mather's direful tales, until the gathering dusk of evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside, the boding cry of the tree-toad, that harbinger of storm, the dreary hooting of the screech-owl, or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened from their roost. The fireflies, too, which sparkled most vividly in the darkest places, now and then startled him, as one of uncommon brightness would stream across his path. And if by chance a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him, the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost, with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token. His only resource on such occasions, either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits, was to sing psalm tunes, and the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody in linked sweetness long drawn out, floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road. Another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with the old Dutch wives as they sat spinning by the fire, with a row of apples roasting and sputtering along the hearth, and listening to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins, and haunted fields and haunted brooks, and haunted bridges and haunted houses, and particularly of the headless horseman or galloping Hessian of the hollow as they sometimes called him. He would delight them equally by his anecdotes of witchcraft, and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air, which prevailed in the earlier times of Connecticut, and would frighten them woefully with speculations upon comets and shooting stars, and with the alarming fact that the world did absolutely turn round, and that they were half the time topsy-turvy. But if there was a pleasure in all this while snugly cuddling in the chimney corner of a chamber that was all of a ruddy glow from the crackling wood fire, and where of course no spectre dared to show its face, it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homeward. What fearful shapes and shadows beset his path, amid the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night! With what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window? How often was he appalled by some shrub covered with snow, which, like a sheeted spectre, beset his very path? How often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet, and dread to look over his shoulder, lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him? And how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees in the idea that it was the galloping Hessian on one of his nightly scourings. All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness, and though he had seen many spectres in his time, and had been more than once beset by Satan in diverse shapes in his lonely perambulations, Yet daylight put an end to all these evils, and he would have passed a pleasant life of it, in despite of the devil and all his works, if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together, and that was a woman. Among the musical disciples who assembled one evening in each week to receive his instructions in psalmody, was Katrina Van Tassel, the daughter and only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. 
She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed not merely for her beauty but her vast expectations. She was withal a little of a coquette, as might be perceived even in her dress, which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions, as most suited to set off her charms. She wore the ornaments of pure yellow gold, which her great-great-grandmother had brought over from Sardam, the tempting stomacher of the olden time, and withal a provokingly short petticoat to display the prettiest foot and ankle in the country round. Ichabod Crane had a soft and foolish heart toward the sex, and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes, more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion. Old Baltus Van Tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving, contented, liberal-hearted farmer. He seldom, it is true, sent either his eyes or his thoughts beyond the boundaries of his own farm. But within these everything was snug, happy, and well-conditioned. He was satisfied with his wealth, but not proud of it, and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived. His stronghold was situated on the banks of the Hudson, in one of those green, sheltered, fertile nooks in which the Dutch farmers are so fond of nestling. A great elm tree spread its broad branches over it, at the foot of which bubbled up a spring of the softest and sweetest water in a little well formed of a barrel, and then stole sparkling away through the grass to a neighboring brook that babbled along among alders and dwarf willows. Hard by the farmhouse was a vast barn that might have served for a church, every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm. The flail was busily resounding within it from morning to night. Swallows and martins skimmed twittering about the eaves, and rows of pigeons, some with one eye turned up as if watching the weather, some with their heads under their wings or buried in their bosoms, and others swelling and cooing and bowing about their dames, were enjoying the sunshine on the roof. Sleek, unwieldy porkers were grunting in the repose and abundance of their pens, from whence sallied forth now and then troops of suckling pigs, as if to snuff the air. A stately squadron of snowy geese were riding in an adjoining pond, convoying whole fleets of ducks. Regiments of turkeys were gobbling through the farmyard, and guinea fowls fretting about it like ill-tempered housewives, with their peevish, discontented cry. Before the barn door strutted the gallant cock, that pattern of a husband, a warrior, and a fine gentleman, clapping his burnished wings, and crowing in the pride and gladness of his heart, sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet, and then generously calling his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered. The pedagogue's mouth watered as he looked upon this sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare. In his devouring mind's eye, he pictured to himself every roasting pig running about with a pudding in its belly and an apple in its mouth. The pigeons were snugly put to bed in a comfortable pie and tucked in with a coverlet of crust. The geese were swimming in their own gravy, and the ducks pairing cosily in dishes like snug married couples with a decent competency of onion sauce. In the porkers he saw carved out the future sleek side of bacon and juicily relishing ham, not a turkey but he beheld daintily trussed up with its gizzard under its wing and peradventure a necklace of savory sausages, and even bright Chanticleer himself lay sprawling on his back in a side dish with uplifted claws as if craving that quarter which his chivalrous spirit disdained to ask while living. As the enraptured Ichabod fancied all this, and as he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadowlands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat, and Indian corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy flute which surrounded the warm tenement of Van Tassel, his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains, and his imagination expanded with the idea how they might be readily turned into cash and the money invested in immense tracts of wild land and shingle palaces in the wilderness. Nay, 
His busy fancy already realized his hopes and presented to him the blooming Katrina with a whole family of children mounted on the top of a wagon loaded with household trumpery with pots and kettles dangling beneath and he beheld himself bestriding a pacing mare with a colt at her heels setting out for Kentucky Tennessee or the Lord knows where when he entered the house the conquest of his heart was complete it was one of those spacious farmhouses with high ridge but lowly sloping roofs built in the style handed down from the first Dutch settlers the low projecting eaves forming a piazza along the front capable of being closed up in bad weather under this were hung flails harness various utensils of husbandry and nets for fishing in the neighboring river benches were built along the sides for summer use and the great spinning wheel at one end and a churn at the other showed the various uses to which this important porch might be devoted from this piazza the wonderful ichabod entered the hall which formed the center of the mansion and the place of usual residence here rows of resplendent pewter ranged on a long dresser dazzled his eyes in one corner stood a huge bag of wool ready to be spun in another a quantity of linsey woolsey just from the loom ears of indian corn and strings of dried apples and peaches hung in gay festoons along the walls mingled with a gourd of red peppers and a door left ajar gave him a peep into the best parlor where the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables shone like mirrors and irons with their accompanying shovel and tongues glistened from their covert of asparagus tops mock oranges and conch shells decorated the mantelpiece strings of various colored birds eggs were suspended above it a great ostrich egg was hung from the center of the room and the corner cupboard knowingly left open displayed immense treasures of old silver and well mended china from the moment ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight the peace of his mind was at an end and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel in this enterprise however he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight errant of yore who seldom had anything but giants enchanters fiery dragons and such like easily conquered adversaries to contend with and had to make his way merely through gates of iron and brass and walls of adamant to the castle keep where the lady of his heart was confined all of which he achieved as easily as a man might carve his way to the center of a Christmas pie and Then the lady gave him her hand as a matter of course Ichabod on the contrary had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette Beset with a labyrinth of whims and caprices which were forever presenting new difficulties and impediments and he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries of real flesh and blood the numerous rustic admirers who beset every portal to her heart keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other but ready to fly out in the common cause against any new competitor among these the most formidable was a burly roaring roistering blade of the name of abraham or according to the dutch abbreviation brom van brunt the hero of the country round which rung with his feats of strength and hardihood he was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance having a mingled air of fun and arrogance from his herculean frame and great powers of limb he had received the nickname of brom bones by which he was universally known he was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar he was foremost at all races and cockfights and with the ascendancy which bodily strength always acquires in rustic life was the umpire in all disputes setting his hat on one side and giving his decisions with an air and tone that admitted of no gainsay or appeal he was always ready for either a fight or a frolic had more mischief than ill will in his composition and with all his overbearing roughness there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at the bottom he had three or four boon companions of his own stamp who regarded him as their model 
and at the head of whom he scoured the country, attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles round. In cold weather he was distinguished by a fur cap, surmounted with a flaunting fox's tail, and when the folks at a country gathering descried this well-known crest at a distance, whisking about among a squad of hard riders, they always stood by for a squall. Sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past the farmhouses at midnight, with a whoop and a halloo like a troop of Don Cossacks. And the old dames, startled out of their sleep, would listen for a moment till the hurry-scurry had clattered by, and then exclaim, Aye, there goes Brom Bones and his gang. The neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe, admiration, and goodwill, and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity, always shook their heads and warranted Brom Bones was at the bottom of it. This rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Certain it is, his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire, who felt no inclination to cross a lion in his amours, insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's paling on a Sunday night, a sure sign that his master was courting, or as it is termed, sparking within, all other suitors passed by in despair, and carried the war into other quarters. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding, but tough, though he bent, he never broke and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, jerk, he was as erect and carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours any more than that stormy lover Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse, not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers. Balt Van Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better even than his pipe, and like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage the poultry, for, as she sagely observed, ducks and geese are foolish things, and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. And thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house, or plied her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza, honest Balt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior, who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight, that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won. To me they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point, or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues and may be captured in a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter, for a man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He that wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is this was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interests of the former evidently declined. His horse was no longer seen tied at the palings on Sunday nights, 
and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. Brum, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would fain have carried matters to open warfare and settle their pretensions to the lady according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners, the knight errants of yore, by single combat. But Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him. He had overheard the boast of Bones that he would double the schoolmaster up and put him on a shelf, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system. It left Brom no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rustic waggery in his disposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night in spite of its formidable fastenings of width and window stakes and turned everything topsy-turvy so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in presence of his mistress, and had a scoundrel dog who be taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner and introduced as a rival of Ichabod's to instruct her in psalmody. End of section two. Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 3. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Part Two. In this way matters went on for some time without producing any material effect on the relative situations of the contending powers. On a fine autumnal afternoon Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned on the lofty stool from whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. In his hand he swayed a ferrule, that scepter of despotic power, the birch of justice reposed on three nails behind the throne, a constant terror to evildoers, while on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles and prohibited weapons detected upon the persons of idle urchins, such as half-munched apples, pop-guns, whirligigs, fly-cages, and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks. Apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books, or slyly whispering behind them, with one eye kept upon the master, and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom. It was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a negro in tow-cloth jacket and trousers, a round-crowned fragment of a hat, like the cap of Mercury and mounted on the back of a ragged, wild, half-broken colt, which he managed with a rope by way of halter. He came clattering up to the school-door, with an invitation to Ichabod to attend a merry-making or quilting frolic to be held that evening at Mynheer Van Tassel's, and having delivered his message with that air of importance and effort at fine language which a negro was apt to display on petty embassies of the kind, he dashed over the brook and was seen scampering away up the hollow, full of the importance and hurry of his mission. All was now bustle and hubbub in the late quiet schoolroom. The scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles, those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity, and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word. Books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves, inkstands were overturned, benches thrown down, and the whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time, 
bursting forth like a legion of young imps yelping and racketing about the green in joy at their early emancipation the gallant ichabod now spent at least an extra half hour at his toilet brushing and furbishing up his best and indeed only suit of rusty black and arranging his looks by a bit of broken looking glass that hung up in the schoolhouse that he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was domiciliated a choleric old dutchman of the name of hans van ripper and thus gallantly mounted issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures but it is meet i should in the true spirit of romantic story give some account of the looks and equipments of my hero and his steed the animal he bestrode was a broken-down plough-horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness he was gaunt and shagged with a ewe neck and a head like a hammer his rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs one eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it still he must have had fire and metal in his day if we may judge from his name which was gunpowder he had in fact been a favorite steed of his master's the choleric van ripper who was a furious rider and had infused very probably some of his own spirit into the animal for old and broken down as he looked there was more of the lurking devil in him than in any young filly in the country ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed he rode with short stirrups which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle his sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers he carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a sceptre and as the horse jogged on the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings a small wool hat rested on the top of his nose for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail such was the appearance of ichabod and his steed as they shambled out of the gate of hans van ripper and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight it was as i have said a fine autumnal day the sky was clear and serene and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance the forests had put on their sober brown and yellow while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange purple and scarlet streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air the bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field the small birds were taking their farewell banquets in the fullness of their revelry they fluttered chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree capricious from the very profusion and variety around them there was the honest cock robin the favorite game of stripling sportsmen with its loud querulous note and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds and the golden-winged woodpecker with his crimson crest his broad black gorget and splendid plumage and the cedar bird with its red-tipped wings and yellow-tipped tail and its little montiero cap of feathers and the blue jay that noisy coxcomb in his gay light blue coat and white underclothes screaming and chattering nodding and bobbing and bowing and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove as ichabod jogged slowly on his way his eye ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn on all sides he beheld vast store of apples some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees some gathered into baskets and barrels for the market others heaped up in rich piles for the cider press further on he beheld great fields of indian corn with its golden ears peeping from their leafy coverts and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding and the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them turning up their fair round bellies to the sun and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies and anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields breathing the odor of the beehive 
and as he beheld them soft anticipation stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks well buttered and garnished with honey or treacle by the delicate little dimpled hand of katrina van tassel thus feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions he journeyed along the sides of a range of hills which look out upon some of the goodliest scenes of the mighty hudson the sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down into the west the wide bosom of that tapan zee lay motionless and glassy excepting that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow of the distant mountain a few amber clouds floated in the sky without a breath of air to move them the horizon was of a fine golden tint changing gradually into a pure apple green and from that into the deep blue of the mid heaven a slanting ray lingered on the woody crests of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river giving greater depth to the dark gray and purple of their rocky sides a sloop was loitering in the distance dropping slowly down with the tide her sail hanging uselessly against the mast and as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in the air it was toward evening that ichabod arrived at the castle of the Herr van tassel which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country old farmers a spare leathern-faced race in homespun coats and breeches blue stockings huge shoes and magnificent pewter buckles their brisk withered little dames in close crimped caps with long-waisted gowns homespun petticoats with scissors and pin cushions and gay calico pockets hanging on the outside buxom lassies almost as antiquated as their mothers excepting where a straw hat a fine ribbon or perhaps a white frock gave symptoms of city innovations the sons in short square skirted coats with rows of stupendous brass buttons and their hair generally cued in the fashion of the times especially if they could procure an eel skin for the purpose it being esteemed throughout the country as a potent nourisher and strengthener of the hair brom bones however was the hero of the scene having come to the gathering on his favorite steed daredevil a creature like himself full of metal and mischief and which no one but himself could manage he was in fact noted for preferring vicious animals given to all kinds of tricks which kept the rider in constant risk of his neck for he held a tractable well-broken horse as unworthy of a lad of spirit fain would i pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of van tassel's mansion not those of the bevy of buxom lassies with their luxurious display of red and white but the ample charms of a genuine dutch country tea-table in the sumptuous time of autumn such heaped-up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds known only to the experienced dutch housewives there was the doughty doughnut the tender ole cook and the crisp and crumbling cruller sweet cakes and short cakes ginger cakes and honey cakes and the whole family of cakes and then there were apple pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies besides slices of ham and smoked beef and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches and pears and quinces not to mention broiled shad and roasted chickens together with bowls of milk and cream all mingled higgledy piggledy pretty much as i have enumerated them with a motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the mist heaven bless the mark i want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves and am too eager to get on with my story happily ichabod crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian but did ample justice to every dainty he was a kind and thankful creature whose heart dilated in proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer and whose spirits rose with eating as some men's do with drink he could not help too rolling his large eyes round him as he ate and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor and then he thought 
how soon he'd turn his back upon the old schoolhouse snap his fingers in the face of hans van ripper and every other niggardly patron and kick any itinerant pedagogue out of doors that should dare to call him comrade old baltus van tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humor round and jolly as the harvest moon his hospitable attentions were brief but expressive being confined to a shake of the hand a slap on the shoulder a loud laugh and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves and now the sound of music from the common room or hall summoned to the dance the musician was an old gray-headed negro who had been the itinerant orchestra of the neighborhood for more than half a century his instrument was as old and battered as himself the greater part of the time he scraped away on two or three strings accompanying every movement of the bow with a motion of the head bowing almost to the ground and stamping with his foot whenever a fresh couple were to start ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers not a limb not a fiber about him was idle and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room you would have thought saint vitus himself that blessed patron of the dance was figuring before you in person he was the admiration of all the negroes who having gathered of all ages and sizes from the farm and the neighborhood stood forming a pyramid of shining black faces at every door and window gazing with delight at the scene rolling their white eyeballs and showing grinning rows of ivory from ear to ear how could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous the lady of his heart was his partner in the dance and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings while brom bones sorely smitten with love and jealousy sat brooding by himself in one corner when the dance was at an end Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who with old van tassel sat smoking at one end of the piazza gossiping over former times and drawling out long stories about the war this neighborhood at the time of which i am speaking was one of those highly favored places which abound with chronicle and great men the british and american line had run near it during the war it had therefore been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees cowboys and all kinds of border chivalry just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each storyteller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction and in the indistinctness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit there was the story of Duffy martling a large blue bearded dutchman who had nearly taken a British frigate with an old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge and there was an old gentleman who shall be nameless being too rich a mine here to be lightly mentioned who in the battle of white plains being an excellent master of defense parried a musket ball with a small sword insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz round the blade and glance off at the hilt in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword with the hilt a little bent there were several more that had been equally great in the field not one of whom but was persuaded that he had a considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination but all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded the neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered long settled retreats but are trampled underfoot by the shifting throng that forms the population of most of our country places besides there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves in their graves before their surviving friends have traveled away from the neighborhood so that when they turn out at night to walk their rounds they have no acquaintance left to call upon this is perhaps the reason why we so seldom hear of ghosts except in our long established dutch communities the immediate cause however of the prevalence of supernatural stories in these parts was doubtless owing to the vicinity of sleepy hollow 
there was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region it breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies infecting all the land several of the sleepy hollow people were present at van tassel's and as usual were doling out their wild and wonderful legends many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate major andre was taken and which stood in the neighborhood some mention was made also of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen at raven rock and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm having perished there in the snow the chief part of the stories however turned upon the favorite specter of sleepy hollow the headless horseman who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country and it is said tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard the sequestered situation of this church seems always to have made it a favorite haunt of troubled spirits it stands on a knoll surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms from among which its decent whitewashed walls shine modestly forth like christian purity beaming through the shades of retirement a gentle slope descends from it to a silvery sheet of water bordered by high trees between which peeps may be caught at the blue hills of the hudson to look upon its grass-grown yard where the sunbeams seem to sleep so quietly one would think that there at least the dead might rest in peace on one side of the church extends a wide woody dell along which raves a large brook among broken rocks and trunks of fallen trees over a deep black part of the stream not far from the church was formerly thrown a wooden bridge the road that led to it and the bridge itself were thickly shaded by overhanging trees which cast a gloom about it even in the daytime but occasioned a fearful darkness at night such was one of the favorite haunts of the headless horseman and the place where he was most frequently encountered the tale was told of old brower a most heretical disbeliever in ghosts how he met the horseman returning from his foray into sleepy hollow and was obliged to get up behind him how they galloped over bush and break over hill and swamp until they reached the bridge when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton threw old brower into the brook and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder this story was immediately matched by a thrice marvelous adventure of brom bones who made light of the galloping hessian as an errant jockey he affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village of sing sing he had been overtaken by this midnight trooper that he had offered to race with him for a bowl of punch and should have won it too for daredevil beat the goblin horse all hollow but just as they came to the church bridge the hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire all these tales told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark the countenances of the listeners only now and then receiving a casual gleam from the glare of a pipe sunk deep in the minds of ichabod he repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author cotton mather and added many marvelous events that had taken place in his native state of connecticut and fearful sights which he had seen in his nightly walks about sleepy hollow the revel now gradually broke up the old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills some of the damsels mounted on pillions behind their favorite swains and their light-hearted laughter mingling with the clatter of hoofs echoed along the silent woodlands sounding fainter and fainter until they gradually died away and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted ichabod only lingered behind according to the custom of country lovers to have a tete-a-tete -tete with the heiress fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success what passed at this interview i will not pretend to say for in fact i do not know something however i fear me must have gone wrong for he certainly sallied forth after no very great interval with an air quite desolate and chapfallen oh these women these women could that girl have been playing off any of her coquettish tricks 
was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival heaven only knows not i let it suffice to say ichabod stole forth with the air of one who had been sacking a hen roost rather than a fair lady's heart without looking to the right or left to notice the scene of rural wealth on which he had so often gloated he went straight to the stable and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused his steed most uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping dreaming of mountains of corn and oats and whole valleys of timothy and clover it was the very witching time of night that ichabod heavy-hearted and crestfallen pursued his travel homeward along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above tarrytown and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon the hour was as dismal as himself far below him the tappan zee spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters with here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor under the land in the dead hush of midnight he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the hudson but it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea of his distance from this faithful companion of man now and then too the long-drawn crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound off far off from some farmhouse away among the hills but it was like a dreaming sound in his ear no signs of life occurred near him but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed all the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection the night grew darker and darker the stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight he had never felt so lonely and dismal he was moreover approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid in the center of the road stood an enormous tulip tree which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighborhood and formed a kind of landmark its limbs were gnarled and fantastic large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air it was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate andre who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of major andre's tree the common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it as ichabod approached this fearful tree he began to whistle he thought his whistle was answered it was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches as he approached a little nearer he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree he paused and ceased whistling but on looking more narrowly perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare suddenly he heard a groan his teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle it was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze he passed the tree in safety but new perils lay before him about two hundred yards from the tree a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen known by the name of wiley's swamp a few rough logs laid side by side served for a bridge over this stream on that side of the road where the brook entered the wood a group of oaks and chestnuts matted thick with wild grapevines threw a cavernous gloom over it to pass this bridge was the severest trial it was at this identical spot that the unfortunate andre was captured and under the covert of those chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeoman concealed who surprised him this has ever since been considered a haunted stream and fearful are the feelings of a schoolboy who has to pass it alone after dark as he approached the stream his heart began to thump he summoned up however all his resolution gave his horse half a score of kicks in the ribs and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge 
but instead of starting forward the perverse old animal made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence ichabod whose fears increased with the delay jerked the reins on the other side and kicked lustily with a contrary foot it was all in vain his steed started it is true but it was only to plunge to the opposite side of the road into a thicket of brambles and alder bushes the schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel upon the starveling ribs of old gunpowder who dashed forward snuffling and snorting but came to a stand just by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head just at this moment a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of ichabod in the dark shadow of the grove on the margin of the brook he beheld something huge misshapen black and towering it stirred not but seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveller the hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror what was to be done to turn and fly was now too late and besides what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin if such it was which could ride upon the wings of the wind summoning up therefore a show of courage he demanded in stammering accents who are you he received no reply he repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice still there was no answer once more he cudgelled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder and shutting his eyes broke forth with involuntary fever into a psalm tune just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself into motion and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road though the night was dark and dismal yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained he appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame he made no offer of molestation or sociability but kept aloof on one side of the road jogging along on the blind side of old gunpowder who had now got over his fright and waywardness ichabod who had no relish for this strange midnight companion and bethought himself of the adventure of brown bones with the galloping hessian now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind the stranger however quickened his horse to an equal pace ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk thinking to lag behind the other did the same his heart began to sink within him he endeavored to resume his psalm tune but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he could not utter a stave there was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling it was soon fearfully accounted for on mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless but his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle his terror rose to desperation he rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip but the spectre started full jump with him away then they dashed through thick and thin stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight they had now reached the road which turns off to sleepy hollow but gunpowder who seemed possessed with a demon instead of keeping up it made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the left this road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile where it crosses the bridge famous in goblin story and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church as yet the panic of the steed had given his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase but just as he had got halfway through the hollow the girths of the saddle gave way and he felt it slipping from under him he seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm but in vain and had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled under foot by his pursuer for a moment 
the terror of hans von ripper's wrath passed across his mind for it was his sunday saddle but this was no time for petty fears the goblin was hard on his haunches an unskillful rider that he was he had much ado to maintain his seat sometimes slipping on one side sometimes on another and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder an opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand the wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken he saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond he recollected the place where brom bones ghostly competitor had disappeared if I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I'm safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprung upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but it was too late It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash He was tumbled headlong into the dust and gunpowder the black steed and the goblin rider passed like a whirlwind The next morning the old horse was found without his saddle and with a bridle under his feet Soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast Dinner hour came but no Ichabod the boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook But no schoolmaster Hans van Ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor Ichabod and his saddle an inquiry was set on foot and after diligent investigation they came upon his traces in one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt the tracks of horses hoofs deeply dented in the road and evidently at furious speed were traced to the bridge beyond which on the bank of a broad part of the brook where the water ran deep and black was found the hat of the unfortunate ichabod and close beside it a shattered pumpkin the brook was searched but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered Hans van Ripper as executor of his estate examined the bundle which contained all his worldly effects They consisted of two shirts and a half two stocks for the neck a pair of two of worsted stockings an old pair of corduroy small clothes a rusty razor a book of psalm tunes full of dogs ears and a broken pitch pipe as to the books and furniture of the schoolhouse they belonged to the community excepting cotton mather's history of witchcraft a new england almanac and a book of dreams and fortune-telling in which the last was a sheet of fool's cap much scribbled and blotted by several fruitless attempts to make a copy of verses in honor of the heiress of van tassel these magic books and the poetic scrawl were forthwith consigned to the flames by Hans van Ripper who from that time forward Determined to send his children no more to school Observing that he never knew any good come of the same reading and writing Whatever money the schoolmaster possessed and he had received his quarters pay But a day or two before he must have had about his person at the time of his disappearance the mysterious event causing much speculation at the church on the following Sunday. Knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard at the bridge, and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found. The stories of Brower, of Bones, and the whole budget of others were called to mind, and when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping Hessian as He was a bachelor and in nobody's debt Nobody troubled his head any more about him the school was removed to a different quarter of the hollow and another pedagogue reigned in his stead It is true an old farmer who had been down to New York on a visit several years after and from whom this account of the ghostly adventure was received brought home the intelligence that ichabod crane was still alive 
that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and Hans van Ripper, and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress. That he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country, had kept school and studied law at the same time, had been admitted to the bar, turned politician, electioneered, written for the newspapers, and finally had been made a justice of the ten-pound court. Brom Bones, too, who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related, and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. The old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means, and it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the winter evening's fire. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years, so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond. The schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate pedagogue and the ploughboy loitering homeward of a still summer evening has often fancied his voice at a distance chanting a melancholy psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of sleepy hollow postscript found in the handwriting of mr knickerbocker the preceding tale is given almost in the precise words in which I heard it related at a corporation meeting of the ancient city of the Manhattoes, at which were present many of its sagest and most illustrious burghers. The narrator was a pleasant shabby gentleman, old fellow in pepper and salt clothes, with a sadly humorous face, and one whom I strongly suspected of being poor. He made such efforts to be entertaining. When his story was concluded, there was much laughter and approbation, particularly from two or three deputy aldermen who had been asleep the greater part of the time. There was, however, one tall, dry-looking old gentleman with beetling eyebrows who maintained a grave and rather severe face throughout, now and then folding his arms, inclining his head, and looking down upon the floor, as if turning a doubt over in his mind. He was one of your wary men who never laugh but upon good grounds when they have reason and the law is on their side. When the mirth of the rest of the company had subsided and silence was restored, he leaned one arm on the elbow of his chair and sticking the other akimbo, demanded with a slight but exceedingly sage motion of the head and contraction of the brow what was the moral of the story and what it went to prove. The storyteller who was just putting a glass of wine to his lips as a refreshment after his toils, paused for a moment, looked at his inquirer with an air of infinite deference, and lowering the glass slowly to the table, observed that the story was intended most logically to prove that there is no situation in life but has its advantages and pleasures, provided we will but take a joke as we find it that therefore he that runs races with goblin troopers is likely to have rough riding of it. Ergo, for a country schoolmaster to be refused the hand of a Dutch heiress is a certain step to high preferment in the state. The cautious old gentleman knit his brows tenfold closer after this explanation, being sorely puzzled by the ratiocination of the syllogism, while methought, the one in pepper and salt eyed him with something of a triumphant leer. At length he observed that all this was very well, but still he thought the story a little on the extravagant. There were one or two points on which he had his doubts. Faith, sir, replied the storyteller, as to that matter, I don't believe one half of it myself. D. K. End of section three. Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 4. The Gold Bug, by Edgar Allan Poe. Part 1. What ho! What ho! This fellow is dancing mad. He hath been bitten by the tarantula. All in the wrong. Many years ago I contracted an intimacy with a Mr. William Legrand. He was of an ancient Huguenot family, and had once been wealthy, but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want. To avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters, he left New Orleans, the city of his forefathers, and took up his residence at Sullivan's Island near Charleston, South Carolina. This island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea sand, and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek, oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant, or at least dwarfish. No trees of any magnitude are to be seen near the western extremity, where Fort Moultrie stands, and where there are some miserable frame buildings tenanted during the summer by the fugitives from Charleston's dust and fever, may be found indeed the bristly palmetto. But the whole island, with the exception of this western point, and a line of hard white beach on the seacoast, is covered with a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle, so much prized by the horticulturists of England. The shrub here often attains the height of fifteen or twenty feet, and forms an almost impenetrable coppice, burdening the air with its fragrance. In the inmost recesses of this coppice, not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island, Legrand had built himself a small hut which he occupied when I first by mere accident made his acquaintance. This soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy, and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach and through the myrtles in quest of shells or entomological specimens, his collection of the latter might have been envied by a swammerdam. In these excursions he was usually accompanied by an old negro called Jupiter, who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family, but who could be induced, neither by threats nor by promises, to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young Massa Will. It is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand, conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter, with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October there occurred, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before sunset I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being at that time in Charleston, a distance of nine miles from the island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply, sought for the key where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door, and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty, and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling logs, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. Legrand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve forming a new genus, 
and more than this he had hunted down and secured with jupiter's assistance a scarabaeus which he believed to be totally new but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow and why not tonight i asked rubbing my hands over the blaze and wishing the whole tribe of the scarabaei at the devil ah if i had only known you were here said legrand but it's so long since i saw you and how could i foresee that you would pay me a visit this very night of all others as i was coming home i met lieutenant gunn from the fort and very foolishly i lent him the bug so it will be impossible for you to see it until the morning stay here tonight and i will send jupe down for it at sunrise it is the loveliest thing in creation what sunrise nonsense no the bug it is of a brilliant gold color about the size of a large hickory nut with two jet black spots near one extremity of the back and another somewhat longer at the other the antenna are they ain't no tin in him massa will i keep a tellin on you here interrupted jupiter de bug is a ghoul bug solid every bit of him inside and out sep him wing never feel half so heavy a bug in my life well suppose it is jupe replied legrand somewhat more earnestly it seemed to me than the case demanded is that any reason for your letting the birds burn the color he returned to me is really almost enough to warrant jupiter's idea you never saw a more brilliant metallic luster than the scales emit but of this you cannot judge till tomorrow in the meantime i can give you some idea of the shape saying this he seated himself at a small table on which were a pen and ink but no paper he looked for some in a drawer but found none never mind he said at length this will answer and he drew from his waistcoat pocket a scrap of what i took to be very dirty fool's cap and made upon it a rough drawing with a pen while he did this i retained my seat by the fire for i was still chilly when the design was complete he handed it to me without rising as i received it a loud growl was heard succeeded by a scratching at the door jupiter opened it and a large newfoundland belonging to legrand rushed in leaped upon my shoulders and loaded me with a caress for i had shown him much attention during previous visits when his gambols were over i looked at the paper and to speak the truth found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted well i said after contemplating it for some minutes this is a strange scarabaeus i must confess new to me never saw anything like it before unless it was a skull or a death's head which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation a death's head echoed legrand oh yes well it has something of that appearance upon paper no doubt the two upper black spots look like eyes eh and the longer one at the bottom like a mouth and then the shape of the whole is oval perhaps so said i but the grand i fear you're no artist i must wait until i see the beetle itself if i'm to form any idea of its personal appearance well i don't know said he a little nettled i draw tolerably should do it at least have had good masters and flatter myself that i'm not quite a blockhead but my dear fellow you're joking then said i this is a very passable skull indeed i may say that it is a very excellent skull according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology and your scarabaeus must be the queerest scarabaeus in the world if it resembles it why we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint i presume you will call the bug scarabaeus caput hominis or something of that kind there are many similar titles in the natural histories but where are the antenna you spoke of the antenna said legrand who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject i'm sure you must see the antenna i made them as distinct as they are in the original insect and i presume that it is sufficient well well i said perhaps you have still i don't see them and i handed him the paper without additional remark not wishing to ruffle his temper but i was much surprised at the turn affairs had taken his ill humor puzzled me and as for the drawing of the beetle there were positively no antenna visible 
and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and was about to crumple it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed suddenly to rivet his attention. In an instant his face grew violently red, in another excessively pale. For some minutes he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length he arose, took a candle from the table, and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea-chest in the furthest corner of the room. Here again he made an anxious examination of the paper, turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me. Yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comment. Presently he took from his coat-pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in it, and deposited both in a writing-desk, which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanour, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared, and yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my intention to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. He did not press me to remain, but as I departed, he shook my hand with even more than his usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit, at Charleston, from his man Jupiter. I had never seen the good old negro look so dispirited, and I feared that some serious disaster had befallen my friend. "'Well, Jupe,' said I, "'what is the matter now? How is your master?' "'Why, to speak the troop, massa, him not very well as mort be. Not well? I'm truly sorry to hear it. What does he complain of? There, that's it. Him never plain o' nothin, but him very sick for all that. Very sick, Jupiter, why didn't you say so at once? Is he confined to bed? No, that he ain't. He ain't fine nowhere. That's just war de shoe pinch. My mind has got to be very heavy but poor Massa Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand what it is you're talking about. You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Massa, it ain't worth while for to get mad about the matter. Massa will say nothing at all ain't the matter with him. But then what make him go about looking this here way, with his head down and he soldiers up, and as white as a goose? And then he keep a siphon all the time. Keeps a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon with the figures on this slate, the queerest figures I ever did see. I's getting to be scared, I tell you. Have for to keep mighty tight eye upon him noovers. T'other day he give me slip, for the sun up and was gone the whole of the blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut for to give him deuce good beating when he did come. But I's such a fool that I hadn't the heart after all. He looked so very poorly. Eh? What? Ah, oh, yes. Upon the whole I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it. But can you form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather, this change of conduct? Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, massa, they ain't been nothing unpleasant since den. Twas for den, I'm feared. Twas the very day you was there. How? How do you mean? Why, massa, I mean the bug, there now. The, the what? The bug. I bury certain that Massa Will been bit somewhere about the head by that ghoul bug. And what cause have you, Jupiter, for such a supposition? Claws enough, Massa, and mouth, too. I never did see such a deuced bug. He kick and he bite everything what come near him. Massa Will caught him fuss, but had for to let him go again mighty quick, I tell you. Then was the time he must a got the bite. I didn't like the look of the bug mouth myself, no how so I wouldn't take hold of him with my finger, but I cotch him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrap him up in the paper and stuff a piece of it in his mouth. That was the way. And you think, then, that your master was really bitten by the beetle, and that the bite made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I knows it. What make him dream about the gold so much, if tain't cause he bit by the gold bug? I's heerd about them gold bugs for this. 
But how do you know he dreams about gold? How do I know? Why, cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Well, Jew, perhaps you're right. But to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honor of a visit from you today? What the matter, massa? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? No, massa, I bring this here pistol. And here Jupiter handed me a note which ran thus. My dear friend, why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offense at any little brusquerie of mine. But no, that is improbable. Since I saw you, I have had great cause for anxiety. I have something to tell you, yet scarcely know how to tell it, or whether I should tell it at all. I have not been quite well for some days past, and poor old Jupe annoys me, almost beyond endurance, by his well-meant intentions. Would you believe it? He had prepared a huge stick the other day, with which to chastise me for giving him the slip, and spending the day, solus, among the hills on the mainland. I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me from a flogging. I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met. If you can, in any way, make it convenient, come over with Jupiter. Do come. I wish to see you tonight upon business of importance. I assure you that it is of the highest importance. Ever yours, William Legrand. There was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness. Its whole style differed materially from that of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had at length fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the negro. Upon reaching the wharf I noticed a scythe and three spades, all apparently new, lying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark. "'What is the meaning of all this, Jupe?' I inquired. "'Him scythe, massa, and spade.' "'Very true, but what are they doing here?' "'Him de scythe and de spade what massa will sis pon my buying for him in de town, and de devil's own lot of money I had to give for him. But what in the name of all that is mysterious is your massa will going to do with scythes and spades?' That's more than I know, and devil take me if I don't believe tis more than he know too. But it's all come of the bug. Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter, whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by de bug, I now stepped into the boat and made sail. With a fair and strong breeze we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Port Moultrie, and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut. It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived. Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation. He grasped my hand with a nervous impressment, which alarmed me, and strengthened the suspicions already entertained. His countenance was pale, even to ghastliness, and his deep-set eyes glared with an unnatural luster. After some inquiries respecting his health, I asked him, not knowing what better to say, if he had yet obtained the scarabaeus from Lieutenant Gunn. Oh, yes, he replied, coloring violently. I got it from him the next morning. Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabaeus. Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it? In what way, I asked, with a sad foreboding at heart, in supposing it to be a bug of real gold. He said this with an air of profound seriousness, and I felt inexpressibly shocked. This bug is to make my fortune, he continued, with a triumphant smile, to reinstate me in my family possessions. Is it any wonder, then, that I prize it? Since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me, I have only to use it properly, and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is the index. Jupiter, bring me that scarabaeus. What? De bug, massa? I'd rather not go for trouble, that bug. You must get him for your own self. Hereupon Legrand arose, and with a grave and stately air, brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed. It was a beautiful scarabaeus, and at that time unknown to naturalists. Of course a great prize in a scientific point of view. There were two round black spots near one extremity of the back, and a long one near the other. 
The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy, with all the appearance of burnished gold. The weight of the insect was very remarkable, and taking all things into consideration, I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it. But what to make of Legrand's concordance with that opinion, I could not for the life of me tell. I sent for you, said he in a grandiloquent tone, when I had completed my examination of the beetle. I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the frag. My dear Legrand, I cried, interrupting him, you are certainly unwell, and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed, and I will remain with you a few days until you get over this. You are feverish and feel my pulse, said he. I felt it, and to say the truth found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you. In the first place, go to bed. In the next, you are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills upon the mainland, and in this expedition we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I am anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied, but do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills? It has. Then, Legrand, I can become a party to no such absurd proceeding. I am sorry, very sorry, for we shall have to try it by ourselves. Try it by yourselves? The man is surely mad. But stay, how long do you propose to be absent? Probably all night. We shall start immediately, and be back at all events by sunrise. And will you promise me, upon your honor, that when this freak of yours is over, and the bug business, good God, settled to your satisfaction, you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly, as that of your physician? Yes, I promise. And now let us be off, for we have no time to lose. With a heavy heart, I accompanied my friend. We started about four o'clock. The Grand, Jupiter, the dog, and myself. Jupiter had with him the scythe and spades, the whole of which he insisted upon carrying, more through fear, it seemed to me, of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master than for any excessive industry or complacence. His demeanor was dogged in the extreme, and dat deuced bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey. For my own part, I had charge of a couple of dark lanterns, while Legrand contented himself with the scarabaeus, which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whipcord, twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went. When I observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I thought it best, however, to humor his fancy, at least for the present, or until I could adopt some more energetic measures. In the meantime, I endeavored, but all in vain, to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition. Having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him, he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance, and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than, We shall see. We crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff, and ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland, proceeded in a northwesterly direction through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate, where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen. Legrand led the way with decision, pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion. In this manner we journeyed for about two hours, and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen. It was a species of tableland near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill, densely wooded from base to pinnacle, and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil, 
and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined. Deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene. The natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles, through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way but for the scythe, and Jupiter, by direction of his master, proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of an enormously tall tulip tree which stood with some eight or ten oaks upon the level and far surpassed them all and all the other trees which i had then ever seen in the beauty of its foliage and form in the wide spread of its branches and in the general majesty of its appearance when we reached this tree legrand turned to jupiter and asked him if he thought he could climb it the old man seemed a little staggered by the question and for some moments made no reply at length he approached the huge trunk walked slowly around it and examined it with minute attention when he had completed his scrutiny he merely said yes massa you climb any tree he ever see in he life then up with you as soon as possible for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about how far must go up massa inquired jupiter get up the main trunk first and then i will tell you which way to go and here stop take this beetle with you de bug massa will de gold bug cried the negro drawing back in dismay what for must tote de bug way up de tree darn if i do if you are afraid jupe a great big negro like you to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle why you can carry it up by this string but if you do not take it up with you in some way i shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with this shovel end of section four national short stories volume one american stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 5. The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe, Part 2. What's the matter now, massa? said Jupe, evidently shamed into compliance. Always one for to raise fuss with old nigger. Was only fun in anyhow. Me feared de bug. What I care for de bug? Here he took a cautious hold of the extreme end of the string, and maintaining the insect as far from his person as circumstances would permit, prepared to ascend the tree. In youth, the tulip tree or liriodendron, tulipiferum, the most magnificent of American foresters, has a trunk peculiarly smooth and often rises to a great height without lateral branches but in its riper age the bark becomes gnarled and uneven while many short limbs make their appearance on the stem thus the difficulty of ascension in the present case lay more in semblance than in reality embracing the huge cylinder as closely as possible with his arms and knees seizing with his hands some projections and resting his naked toes upon others jupiter after one or two narrow escapes from falling at length wriggled himself into the first great fork and seemed to consider the whole business as virtually accomplished the risk of the achievement was in fact now over although the climber was some sixty or seventy feet from the ground which way must go now massa will he asked keep up the largest branch the one on this side said legrand the negro obeyed him promptly and apparently with but little trouble ascending higher and higher until no glimpse of his squat figure could be obtained through the dense foliage which enveloped it. Presently his voice was heard in a sort of hallo. How much further I's got to go? How high up are you? asked Legrand. Ever so fur, replied the negro. Can see the sky through the top of the tree. Never mind the sky, but attend to what I say. Look down the trunk and count the limbs below you on this side how many limbs have you passed 
One, two, three, four, five. I, I done pass five big limb, massa, pon dis side. Then go one limb higher. In a few minutes the voice was heard again, announcing that the seventh limb was attained. Now, Jupe, cried Legrand, evidently much excited. I want you to work your way out upon that limb as far as you can. If you see anything strange, let me know. By this time what little doubt I might have entertained of my poor friend's insanity was put finally at rest. I had no alternative but to conclude him stricken with lunacy, and I became seriously anxious about getting him home. While I was pondering upon what was best to be done, Jupiter's voice was again heard. Most feared for to venture upon dis limb very far. Tis dead limb pretty much all de way. Did you say it was a dead limb, Jupiter? cried Legrand in a quavering voice. Yes, massa. Him dead is de doornail. Done up for sartin. Done departed this here life. What in the name of heaven shall I do? asked Legrand, seemingly in the greatest distress. Do, said I, glad of an opportunity to interpose a word. Why, come home and go to bed. Come now. That's a fine fellow. It's getting late, and besides you remember your promise. Jupiter, cried he, without heeding me in the least. Do you hear me? Yes, Massa Will, hear you ever so plain. Try the wood well, then, with your knife, and see if you think it very rotten. Him rotten, Massa, sure enough replied the negro in a few moments but not so very rotten as mort be mort venture out little way pon de limb by myself that's true by yourself what do you mean why i mean de bug tis very heavy bug suppose i drop him down first and den de limb won't break with just the weight of one nigger you infernal scoundrel cried legrand apparently much relieved what do you mean by telling me such nonsense as that as sure as you drop that beetle, I'll break your neck. Look here, Jupiter, do you hear me? Yes, massa, needn't hollow at poor nigger that style. Well, now listen, if you will venture out on the limb as far as you think safe, and not let go the beetle, I'll make you a present of a silver dollar as soon as you get down. I'm gwine, massa Will, deed I is, replied the negro very promptly, most out to the end now. Out to the end? Here fairly screamed Legrand. Do you say you're out to the end of that limb? Soon be to the end, massa. Oh, Lord Gola mercy, what is this here pondy tree? Well, cried Legrand, highly delighted. What is it? Why, tain't nothing but a skull. Somebody been left him head up de tree, and de crows done gobble every bit of de meat off. A skull, you say? Very well. How is it fastened to the limb? What holds it on? Sure enough, massa, must look. Why, this very curious circumstance, pon my word, there's a great big nail in de skull. What fastens ob it on to de tree? Well, now, Jupiter, do exactly as I tell you, do you hear? Yes, massa. Pay attention, then. Find the left eye of the skull. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Why, they ain't no eye left at all. Curse your stupidity. Do you know your right hand from your left? Yes, I knows dat, knows all about dat. Tis my left hand what I chops the wood with. To be sure, you're left-handed, and your left eye is on the same side as your left hand. Now, I suppose you can find the left eye of the skull, or the place where the left eye has been. Have you found it? Here was a long pause. At length the negro asked, is the left eye of the skull pon the same side as the left hand of the skull too? Cause the skull ain't got not a bit of hand at all. Never mind. I got the left eye now. Here the left eye. What must do with it? Let the beetle drop through it as far as the string will reach. But be careful and not let go your hold of the string. All that done, Massa Will. Mighty easy thing for to put the bug through the hole. Look out for him there below. During this colloquy, no portion of Jupiter's person could be seen, but the beetle, which he had suffered to descend, was now visible at the end of the string, and glistened like a globe of burnished gold in the last rays of the setting sun, some of which still faintly illumined the eminence upon which we stood. The scarabaeus hung quite clear of any branches, 
and if allowed to fall would have fallen at our feet legrand immediately took the scythe and cleared with it a circular space three or four yards in diameter just beneath the insect and having accomplished this ordered jupiter to let go the string and come down from the tree driving a peg with great nicety into the ground at the precise spot where the beetle fell my friend now produced from his pocket a tape measure fastening one end of this at that point of the trunk of the tree which was nearest the peg he unrolled it till it reached the peg and thence further unrolled it in the direction already established by the two points of the tree and the peg for the distance of fifty feet jupiter clearing away the brambles with the scythe at the spot thus attained a second peg was driven and about this as a center a rude circle about four feet in diameter described taking now a spade himself and giving one to jupiter and one to me legrand begged us to set about digging as quickly as possible to speak the truth i had no especial relish for such amusement at any time and at that particular moment would willingly have declined it for the night was coming on and i felt much fatigue with the exercise already taken but i saw no mode of escape and was fearful of disturbing my poor friend's equanimity by a refusal could i have depended indeed upon jupiter's aid i would have had no hesitation in attempting to get the lunatic home by force but i was too well assured of the old negro's disposition to hope that he would assist me under any circumstances in a personal contest with his master i made no doubt that the latter had been infected with some of the innumerable southern superstitions about money buried and that his fantasy had received confirmation by the finding of the scarabaeus or perhaps by jupiter's obstinacy in maintaining it to be a bug of real gold a mind disposed to lunacy would readily be led away by such suggestions especially if chiming in with favorite preconceived ideas and then i called to mind the poor fellow's speech about the beetle's being the index of his fortune upon the whole i was sadly vexed and puzzled but at length i concluded to make a virtue of necessity to dig with a good will and thus the sooner to convince the visionary by ocular demonstration of the fallacy of the opinion he entertained the lanterns having been lit we all fell to work with a zeal worthy of a more rational cause and as the glare fell upon our persons and implements i could not help thinking how picturesque a group we composed and how strange and suspicious our labors must have appeared to any interloper who by chance might have stumbled upon our whereabout we dug very steadily for two hours little was said and our chief embarrassment lay in the yelping of the dog who took exceeding interest in our proceedings he at length became so obstreperous that we grew fearful of his giving the alarm to some stragglers in the vicinity or rather this was the apprehension of legrand for myself i should have rejoiced at any interruption which might have enabled me to get the wanderer home the noise was at length very effectually silenced by jupiter who getting out of the hole with a dogged air of deliberation tied the brute's mouth up with one of his suspenders and then returned with a grave chuckle to his task when the time mentioned had expired we had reached a depth of five feet and yet no signs of any treasure became manifest a general pause ensued and i began to hope that the farce was at an end legrand however although evidently much disconcerted wiped his brow thoughtfully and recommenced we had excavated the entire circle of four feet diameter and now we slightly enlarged the limit and went to the further depth of two feet still nothing appeared the gold seeker whom i sincerely pitied at length clambered from the pit with the bitterest disappointment imprinted upon every feature and proceeded slowly and reluctantly to put on his coat which he had thrown off at the beginning of his labor in the meantime i made no remark jupiter at a signal from his master began to gather up his tools this done and the dog having been unmuzzled we turned in profound silence toward home we had taken perhaps a dozen steps in this direction when with a loud oath 
Legrand strode up to Jupiter and seized him by the collar. The astonished negro opened his eyes and mouth to the fullest extent, let fall the spades, and fell upon his knees. You scoundrel, said Legrand, hissing out the syllables from between his clenched teeth. You infernal black villain! Speak, I tell you. Answer me this instant without prevarication. Which, which is your left eye? Oh, my golly, Massa Will! Ain't this here my left eye for a tain? Roared the terrified Jupiter, placing his hand upon his right organ of vision, and holding it there with a desperate pertinacity, as if in immediate dread of his master's attempt at a gouge. I thought so. I knew it. Hurrah! vociferated the grand letting the negro go and executing a series of curvets and caracoles much to the astonishment of his valet who arising from his knees looked mutely from his master to myself and then from myself to his master come we must go back said the latter the game's not up yet and he again led the way to the tulip tree jupiter said he when we reached his foot come here was the skull nailed to the limb with a face outward or with a face to the limb? The face was out, massa, so that the crows could get at the eyes good without any trouble. Well, then, was it this eye or that through which you dropped the beetle? Here Legrand touched each of Jupiter's eyes. Twas this eye, massa, the left eye, just as you tell me. And here it was his right eye that the negro indicated. That will do. We must try it again. Here, my friend, about whose madness I now saw, or fancied that I saw, certain indications of method, remove the peg which marked the spot where the beetle fell, to a spot about three inches to the westward of its former position, taking now the tape measure from the nearest point of the trunk to the peg as before, and continuing the extension in a straight line to the distance of fifty feet, a spot was indicated, removed by several yards from the point at which we had been digging. Around the new position a circle, somewhat larger than in the former instance, was now described, and we again set to work with the spade. I was dreadfully weary, but scarcely understanding what had occasioned the change in my thoughts, I felt no longer any great aversion from the labor imposed. I had become most unaccountably interested, nay, even excited. Perhaps there was something amid all the extravagant demeanor of Legrand, some air of forethought or of deliberation which impressed me. I dug eagerly, and now and then caught myself actually looking with something that very much resembled expectation for the fancied treasure, the vision of which had demented my unfortunate companion. At a period when such vagaries of thought most fully possessed me, and when we had been at work, perhaps an hour and a half, we were again interrupted by the violent howlings of the dog. His uneasiness in the first instant had been evidently but the result of playfulness or caprice, but he now assumed a bitter and serious tone. Upon Jupiter's again attempting to muzzle him, he made furious resistance, and leaping into the hole, tore up the mould frantically with his claws. In a few seconds he had uncovered a mass of human bones, forming two complete skeletons intermingled with several buttons of metal and what appeared to be the dust of decayed woolen one or two strokes of a spade upturned the blade of a large spanish knife and as we dug further three or four loose pieces of gold and silver coin came to light at sight of these the joy of jupiter could scarcely be restrained but the countenance of his master wore an air of extreme disappointment he urged us however to continue our exertions and the words were hardly uttered when I stumbled and fell forward, having caught the toe of my boot in a large ring of iron that lay half buried in the loose earth. We now worked in earnest. Never did I pass ten minutes of more intense excitement. During this interval we had fairly unearthed an oblong chest of wood, which from its perfect preservation and wonderful hardness had plainly been subjected to some mineralizing process perhaps that of the bichloride of mercury. This box was three feet and a half long, three feet broad, and two and a half feet deep. It was firmly secured by bands of wrought iron, riveted, and forming a kind of open trellis work over the hole. On each side of the chest, near the top, 
were three rings of iron, six in all, by means of which a firm hold could be obtained by six persons. Our utmost united endeavors served only to disturb the coffer very slightly in its bed. We at once saw the impossibility of removing so great a weight. Luckily, the sole fastenings of the lid consisted of two sliding bolts. These we drew back, trembling and panting with anxiety. In an instant, a treasure of incalculable value lay gleaming before us. As the rays of the lantern fell within the pit, there flashed upward a glow and a glare from a confused heap of gold and of jewels that absolutely dazzled our eyes. I shall not pretend to describe the feelings with which I gazed. Amazement was, of course, predominant. Legrand appeared exhausted with excitement and spoke very few words. Jupiter's countenance wore for some minutes as deadly a pallor as is possible in the nature of things for any negro's visage to assume. He seemed stupefied, thunder-stricken. Presently he fell upon his knees in the pit, and burying his naked arms up to the elbows in gold, left them there remain as if enjoying the luxury of a bath. At length, with a deep sigh, he exclaimed, as if in a soliloquy, "'And this all come of the gold bug, the putty gold bug, the poor little gold bug. What I boozed in that savage kind of style. Ain't you shame of yourself, nigger? Answer me that.' It became necessary at last that I should arouse both master and valet to the expediency of removing the treasure. It was growing late and it behooved us to make exertion that we might get everything housed before daylight. It was difficult to say what should be done, and much time was spent in deliberation, so confused were the ideas of all. We finally lightened the box by removing two-thirds of its contents, when we were enabled with some trouble to raise it from the hole. The articles taken out were deposited among the brambles, and the dog left to guard them with strict orders from Jupiter neither upon any pretense to stir from the spot, nor to open his mouth until our return. We then hurriedly made for home with the chest, reaching the hut in safety. But after excessive toil at one o'clock in the morning, worn out as we were, it was not in human nature to do more immediately. We rested until two, and had supper. Starting for the hills immediately afterward, armed with three stout sacks, which by good luck were upon the premises. A little before four we arrived at the pit, divided the remainder of the booty as equally as might be among us, and leaving the holes unfilled, again set out for the hut, at which for the second time we deposited our golden burdens. Just as the first faint streaks of the dawn gleamed from over the treetops in the east, we were now thoroughly broken down but the intense excitement of the time denied us repose. After an unquiet slumber of some three or four hours' duration, we arose, as if by preconcert, to make examination of our treasure. The chest had been full to the brim, and we spent the whole day and the greater part of the next night in a scrutiny of its contents. There had been nothing like order or arrangement. Everything had been heaped in promiscuously. Having assorted all with care, we found ourselves possessed of even vaster wealth than we had at first supposed. In coin, there was rather more than four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, estimating the value of the pieces as accurately as we could by the tables of the period. There was not a particle of silver. All was gold of antique date and of great variety. French, Spanish, and German money with a few English guineas, and some counters of which we had never seen specimens before. There were several very large and heavy coins, so worn we could make nothing of their inscriptions. There was no American money. The value of the jewels we found more difficulty in estimating. There were diamonds, some of them exceedingly large and fine, a hundred and ten in all, and not one of them small. Eighteen rubies of remarkable brilliancy, three hundred and ten emeralds, all very beautiful, and twenty-one sapphires with an opal. These stones had all been broken from their settings and thrown loose in the chest. The settings themselves, which we picked out from among the other gold, appeared to have been beaten up with hammers, 
as if to prevent identification. Besides all this, there was a vast quantity of solid gold ornaments, nearly two hundred massive finger and ear rings, rich chains, thirty of these if I remember, eighty-three very large and heavy crucifixes, five gold censers of great value, a prodigious golden punch bowl ornamented with richly chased vine leaves and bacchanalian figures with two sword handles exquisitely embossed and many other smaller articles which i cannot recollect the weight of these valuables exceeded three hundred and fifty pounds of bois du pois and in this estimate i have not included one hundred and ninety seven superb gold watches three of the number being worth each five hundred dollars if one many of them were very old and as timekeepers valueless the works having suffered more or less from corrosion but all were richly jeweled and in cases of great worth we estimated the entire contents of the chest that night at a million and a half dollars and upon the subsequent disposal of the trinkets and jewels a few being retained for our own use it was found that we had greatly undervalued the treasure when at length we had concluded our examination and the intense excitement of the time had in some measure subsided legrand who saw that i was dying with impatience for a solution of this most extraordinary riddle entered into a full detail of all the circumstances connected with it you remember said he that night when i handed you the rough sketch i had made of the scarabaeus you recollect also that I became quite vexed at you for insisting that my drawing resembled a death's head when you first made this assertion. I thought you were jesting, but afterward I called to mind the peculiar spots on the back of the insect, and admitted to myself that your remark had some little foundation in fact. Still, the sneer at my graphic powers irritated me, for I am considered a good artist, and therefore, when you handed me the scrap of parchment, I was about to crumple it up and throw it angrily into the fire. The scrap of paper, you mean, said I. No. It had much of the appearance of paper, and at first I supposed it to be such. But when I came to draw upon it, I discovered it at once to be a piece of very thin parchment. It was quite dirty, you remember. Well, as I was in the very act of crumpling it up, my glance fell upon the sketch at which you had been looking and you may imagine my astonishment when i perceived in fact the figure of a death's head just where it seemed to me i had made the drawing of the beetle for a moment i was too much amazed to think with accuracy i knew that my design was very different in detail from this although there was a certain similarity in general outline presently i took a candle and seating myself at the other end of the room proceeded to scrutinize the parchment more closely Upon turning it over, I saw my own sketch upon the reverse, just as I had made it. My first idea now was mere surprise at the really remarkable similarity of outline, at the singular coincidence involved in the fact that, unknown to me, there should have been a skull upon the other side of the parchment, immediately beneath my figure of the scarabaeus, and that this skull, not only in outline but in size, should so closely resemble my drawing. I say the singularity of this coincidence absolutely stupefied me for a time. This is the usual effect of such coincidences. The mind struggles to establish a connection, a sequence of cause and effect, and being unable to do so, suffers a species of temporary paralysis. But when I recovered from this stupor, there dawned upon me gradually a conviction which startled me even far more than the coincidence. I began distinctly, positively, to remember that there had been no drawing upon the parchment when I made my sketch of the scarabaeus. I became perfectly certain of this, for I recollected turning up first one side and then the other in search of the cleanest spot. Had the skull been there, of course I could not have failed to notice it. Here was indeed a mystery which I felt it impossible to explain. But even at that early moment there seemed to glimmer faintly within the most remote and secret chambers of my intellect a glow-worm-like conception of that truth which last night's adventure brought to so magnificent a demonstration. I arose at once, and putting the parchment securely away, dismissed all further reflection 
until I should be alone. End of section five. Short Stories, Volume One American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume One American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section Six The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. Part three. When you had gone, and when Jupiter was fast asleep, I betook myself to a more methodical investigation of the affair. In the first place, I considered the manner in which the parchment had come into my possession. The spot where we discovered the scarabaeus was on the coast of the mainland, about a mile eastward of the island, and but a short distance above the high water mark. Upon my taking hold of it, it gave me a sharp bite. Which caused me to let it drop Jupiter with his accustomed caution before seizing the insect which had flown toward him Looked about him for a leaf or something of that nature by which to take hold of it It was at this moment that his eyes and mine also fell upon the scrap of parchment Which I then supposed to be paper it was lying half buried in the sand a corner sticking up Near the spot where we found it, I observed the remnants of the hull of what appeared to have been a ship's longboat. The wreck seemed to have been there for a very great while, for the resemblance to boat timbers could scarcely be traced. Well, Jupiter picked up the parchment, wrapped the beetle in it, and gave it to me. Soon afterward we turned to go home, and on the way met Lieutenant Gunn. I showed him the insect, and he begged me to let him take it to the fort. Upon my consenting, he thrust it forthwith into his waistcoat pocket without the parchment in which it had been wrapped, and which I had continued to hold in my hand during his inspection. Perhaps he dreaded my changing my mind and thought it best to make sure of the prize at once. You know how enthusiastic he is on all subjects connected with natural history. At the same time, without being conscious of it, I must have deposited the parchment in my own pocket. You remember that when I went to the table for the purpose of making a sketch of the beetle, I found no paper where it was usually kept. I looked in the drawer and found none there. I searched my pockets, hoping to find an old letter, when my hand fell upon the parchment. I thus detail the precise mode in which it came into my possession, for the circumstances impressed me with peculiar force. No doubt you will think me fanciful, but I had already established a kind of connection. I had put together two links of a great chain. There was a boat lying upon a sea coast, and not far from the boat was a parchment, not a paper, with a skull depicted upon it. You will, of course, ask, where is the connection? I reply that the skull or death's head is the well-known emblem of the pirate. The flag of the death's head is hoisted in all engagements. I have said that the scrap was parchment, and not paper. Parchment is durable, almost imperishable. Matters of little moment are rarely consigned to parchment, since for the mere ordinary purposes of drawing or writing it is not nearly so well adapted as paper. This reflection suggested some meaning, some relevancy in the death's head. I did not fail to observe also the form of the parchment. Although one of its corners had been by some accident destroyed, it could be seen that the original form was oblong. It was just such a slip indeed as might have been chosen for a memorandum, for a record of something to be long remembered and carefully preserved. But, I interposed, you say that the skull was not upon the parchment when you made the drawing of the beetle. How then do you trace any connection between the boat and the skull, since this latter, according to your own admission, must have been designed, God only knows how or by whom, at some period subsequent to your sketching the scarabaeus. Ah, hereupon turns the whole mystery, although the secret at this point I had comparatively little difficulty in solving. My steps were sure, and could afford but a single result. I reasoned, for example, thus. When I drew the scarabaeus, there was no skull apparent upon the parchment, 
When I had completed the drawing, I gave it to you, and observed you narrowly until you returned it. You, therefore, did not design the skull, and no one else was present to do it. Then it was not done by human agency, and nevertheless it was done. At this stage of my reflections I endeavored to remember, and did remember, with entire distinctness every incident which occurred about the period in question. The weather was chilly. Oh, rare and happy accident, and a fire was blazing upon the hearth. I was heated with exercise, and sat near the table. You, however, had drawn a chair close to the chimney. Just as I placed the parchment in your hand, and as you were in the act of inspecting it, Wolf, the Newfoundland, entered, and leaped upon your shoulders. With your left hand you caressed him, and kept him off, while your right, holding the parchment, was permitted to fall listlessly between your knees, and in close proximity to the fire. At one moment I thought the blaze had caught it, and was about to caution you, but before I could speak you had withdrawn it, and were engaged in its examination. When I considered all these particulars, I doubted not for a moment that heat had been the agent in bringing to light upon the parchment the skull which I saw designed upon it. You are well aware that chemical preparations exist, and have existed time out of mind, by means of which it is possible to write upon either paper or vellum, so that the characters shall become visible only when subjected to the action of fire. Zafar, digested in aqua regia, and diluted with four times its weight of water, is sometimes employed. A green tint results. The regulus of cobalt, dissolved in a spirit of nitre, gives a red. These colors disappear at longer or shorter intervals after the material written upon it cools, but again becomes apparent upon the reapplication of heat. I now scrutinized the death's head with care. Its outer edges, the edges of the drawing nearest the edge of the vellum, was far more distinct than the others. It was clear that the action of the caloric had been imperfect or unequal. I immediately kindled the fire and subjected every portion of the parchment to a glowing heat. At first the only effect was the strengthening of the faint lines in the skull, but upon persevering in the experiment there became visible at the corner of the slip diagonally opposite to the spot in which the death's head was delineated, the figure of what I had first supposed to be a goat. A closer scrutiny, however, satisfied me that it was intended for a kid. Ha, ha, said I, to be sure I have no right to laugh at you. A million and a half of money is too serious a matter for mirth, but you're not about to establish a third link in your chain. You will not find any special connection between your pirates and a goat. Pirates, you know, have nothing to do with goats. They appertain to the farming interest. But I have just said that the figure was not that of a goat. Well, a kid, then, pretty much the same thing. Pretty much, but not altogether, said Legrand. You may have heard of one Captain Kid. I at once looked upon the figure of the animal as a kind of punning or hieroglyphical signature. I say signature because its position upon the vellum suggested this idea. The death's head at the corner diagonally opposite had in the same manner the air of a stamp or seal. But I was sorely put out by the absence of all else, of the body to my imagined instrument, of the text for my context. I presume you expected to find a letter between the stamp and the signature? Something of that kind. The fact is I felt irresistibly impressed with the presentiment of some vast good fortune impending. I can scarcely say why. Perhaps, after all, it was rather a desire than an actual belief. But do you know that Jupiter's silly words about the bug being of solid gold had a remarkable effect upon my fancy? And then the series of accidents and coincidences. These were so very extraordinary. Do you observe how mere an accident it was that these events should have occurred upon the sole day of all the year in which it has been, or may be, sufficiently cool for foe, and that without the fire, or without the intervention of the dog at the precise moment in which he appeared, I should never have become aware of the death's head, and so never the possessor of the treasure? But proceed, I am all impatience. Well, you have heard, of course, the many stories current, 
a thousand vague rumors afloat about money buried somewhere upon the Atlantic coast by Kidd and his associates. These rumors must have had some foundation, in fact, and that the rumors have existed so long and so continuously could have resulted, it appeared to me, only from the circumstance of the buried treasures still remaining entombed. Had Kidd concealed his plunder for a time and afterward reclaimed it, the rumors would scarcely have reached us in their present unvarying form. You will observe that the stories told are all about money seekers, not about money finders. Had the pirate recovered his money, there the affair would have dropped. It seemed to me that some accident, save the loss of a memorandum indicating its locality, had deprived him of the means of recovering it, and that this accident had become known to his followers, who otherwise might never have heard that the treasure had been concealed at all, and who, busying themselves in vain, because unguided attempts to regain it, had given first birth and then universal currency to the reports which are now so common. Have you ever heard of any important treasure being unearthed along the coast? Never. But that kid's accumulations were immense is well known. I took it for granted, therefore, that the earth still held them, and you will scarcely be surprised when I tell you that I felt a hope, nearly amounting to certainty, that the parchment so strangely found involved a lost record of the place of deposit. But how did you proceed? I held the vellum again to the fire, after increasing the heat, but nothing appeared. I now thought it possible that the coating of dirt might have something to do with the failure, so I carefully rinsed the parchment by pouring warm water over it, and having done this, I placed it in a tin pan with the skull downward, and put the pan upon a furnace of lighted charcoal. In a few minutes the pan having become thoroughly heated, I removed the slip, and to my inexpressible joy found it spotted in several places with what appeared to be figures arranged in lines. Again I placed it in the pan and suffered it to remain another minute. Upon taking it off, the whole was just as you see it now. Here Legrand, having reheated the parchment, submitted it to my inspection. There were many and confusing characters, rudely traced in a red tint, between the death's head and the goat. But, said I, returning him the slip, I am as much in the dark as ever. Were all the jewels of Golconda awaiting me upon my solution of this enigma, I am quite sure that I should be unable to earn them. And yet, said Legrand, the solution is by no means so difficult as you might be led to imagine from the first hasty inspection of the characters. These characters, as any one might readily guess, form a cipher. That is to say, they convey a meaning, but then from what is known of Kidd, I could not suppose him capable of constructing any of the more abstruse cryptographs. I made up my mind at once that this was of a simple species, such, however, as would appear to the crude intellect of the sailor absolutely insoluble without the key. And you readily solved it? Readily. I have solved others of an abstruseness ten thousand times greater. Circumstances and a certain bias of mind have led me to take interest in such riddles, and it may well be doubted whether human ingenuity can construct an enigma of the kind which human ingenuity may not, by proper application, resolve. In fact, having once established connected and legible characters, I scarcely gave a thought to the mere difficulty of developing their import. In the present case, indeed, in all cases of secret writing, the first question regards the language of the cipher. For the principles of solution so far especially as the more simple ciphers are concerned, depend upon, and are varied by, the genius of the particular idiom. In general there is no alternative but experiment, directed by probabilities of every tongue known to him who attempts the solution, until the true one be attained. But with the cipher now before us all difficulty was removed by the signature. The pun upon the word kid is appreciable in no other language than that of English. But for this consideration I should have begun my attempts with Spanish and French as the tongues in which a secret of this kind would most naturally have been written by a pirate of the Spanish main. As it was, I assumed the cryptograph to be English. 
Do you observe there are no divisions between the words? Had there been divisions, the task would have been comparatively easy. In such cases, I should have commenced with a collation and analysis of the shorter words, and had a word of a single letter occurred, as is most likely, A or I, for example, I should have considered the solution as assured. But there being no division, my first step was to ascertain the predominant letters as well as the least frequent. Counting all, I constructed a table. Thus, of the characters eight, there are thirty-three. Twenty-six semicolons, nineteen fours, sixteen stars, thirteen double daggers and parentheses, fourteen fives, eleven sixes, eight single daggers and ones, six o's, five ninety-twos, four colons and threes, three question marks, two staffs, and one double dash, and one period. Now in English, the letter which most frequently occurs is E. Afterward, the succession runs thus. A, O, I, D, H, N, R, S, T, U, Y, C, F, G, L, M, W, B, K, P, Q, X, Z. E predominates so remarkably that an individual sentence of any length is rarely seen in which it is not the prevailing character. Here then we have in the very beginning the groundwork for something more than just a mere guess. The general use which may be made of the table is obvious, but in this particular cipher we shall only very partially require its aid. As our predominant character is eight, we will commence by assuming it as the E of the natural alphabet. To verify the supposition, let us observe if the eight be seen often in couples, for E is doubled with great frequency in English, in such words, for example, as meet, fleet, speed, seen, been, agree, etc. In the present instance, we see it doubled no less than five times, although the cryptograph is brief. Let us assume eight, then, as E. Now, of all words in the language, the is most usual. Let us see, therefore, whether there are not repetitions of any three characters in the same order of collocation, the last of them being eight. If we discover repetitions of such letters so arranged, they will most probably represent the word the. Upon inspection, we find no less than seven such arrangements, the characters being semicolon forty-eight period. We may therefore assume that a semicolon represents T. 4 represents H, and 8 represents E, the last being now well confirmed, and thus a great step has been taken. But having established a single word, we are enabled to establish a vastly important point, that is to say, several commencements and terminations of other words. Let us refer, for example, to the last instance but one, in which the combination semicolon 48 occurs not far from the end of the cipher. We know that the semicolon immediately ensuing is the commencement of a word, and of six characters succeeding this, the. We are cognizant of no less than five. Let us set these characters down, thus, by the letters we know them to represent, leaving a space for the unknown. T-E-E-T-H, period. Here we are enabled at once to discard the T-H as forming no portion of the word, commencing with the first T semicolon, since by experiment of the entire alphabet for a letter adapted to the vacancy, we perceive that no word can be formed of which this TH can be a part. We are thus narrowed into T space EE, -E, comma, and, going through the alphabet, if necessary, as before, we arrive at the word tree as the sole possible reading. We thus gain another letter, R, represented by parentheses, with the words, the tree in juxtaposition. Looking beyond these words, for a short distance, we again see the combination semicolon 4, 8, and employ it by way of termination to what immediately precedes. We have thus this arrangement, the tree, semicolon, 4, dagger, 
question mark three four the or substituting the natural letters where known it reads thus the tree t h r double dagger question mark three h the now if in the place of the unknown characters we leave blank spaces or substitute dots we read thus the tree t h r dot 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 h t h e when the word through makes itself evident at once but this discovery gives us three new letters o u and g represented by double dagger question mark and three looking now narrowly through the cipher for combinations of known characters we find not very far from the beginning this arrangement eight three parentheses eight eight or e g r e e which plainly is the conclusion of the word degree and gives us another letter d represented by dagger four letters beyond the word degree we perceive the combination semicolon four six parentheses semicolon eight eight translating the known characters and representing the unknown by dots as before we read thus t h dot r t e e an arrangement immediately suggestive of the word thirteen and again furnishing us with two new characters i and n represented by six and star referring now to the beginning of the cryptograph we find the combination five three double dagger double dagger dagger translating as before we obtain good g o o d which assures us that the first letter is a and that the first two words are a good it is now time that we arrange our key as far as discovered in a tabular form to avoid confusion it will stand thus five represents a single dagger d eight e three g four h six i star n double dagger o parentheses r colon t question mark u we have therefore no less than eleven of the most important letters represented and it will be unnecessary to proceed with the details of the solution i have said enough to convince you that ciphers of this nature are readily soluble and to give you some insight into the rationale of their development but be assured that the specimen before us appertains to the very simplest species of cryptograph it now only remains to give you the full translation of the characters upon the parchment as unriddled and here it is a good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat forty one degrees and thirteen minutes northeast and by north main branch seventh limb east side shoot from the left eye of the death's head a bee line from the tree through the shot fifty feet out but said i the enigma seems still in as bad a condition as ever how is it possible to extort a meaning from all this jargon about devil's seats death's head and bishop's hotels i confess replied legrand that the matter still wears a serious aspect when regarded with a casual glance my first endeavor was to divide the sentence into the natural division intended by the cryptographist you mean to punctuate it something of that kind but how is it possible to effect this i reflected that it had been a point with the writer to run his words together without division so as to increase the difficulty of solution now a not over acute man in pursuing such an object would be nearly certain to overdo the matter when in the course of his composition he arrived at a break in his subject which would naturally require a pause or a point he would be exceedingly apt to run his characters at this place more than usually close together if you will observe the m s in the present instance you will easily detect five such cases of unusual crowding acting upon this hint i made the division thus a good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat forty-one degrees and thirteen minutes northeast and by north 
main branch seventh limb east side shoot from the left eye of the death's head a bee line from the tree through the shot fifty feet out even this division said i leaves me still in the dark it left me also in the dark replied legrand for a few days during which i made diligent inquiry in the neighborhood of sullivan's island for any building which went by the name of the bishop's hotel for of course i dropped the obsolete word hostel gaining no information on the subject i was on the point of extending my sphere of search and proceeding in a more systematic manner when one morning it entered into my head quite suddenly that this bishop's hostel might have some reference to an old family of the name of Besop, which time out of mine had held possession of an ancient manor house about four miles to the northward of the island i accordingly went over to the plantation and reinstituted my inquiries among the older negroes of the place at length one of the most aged of the women said that she had heard of such a place as Besop's castle and thought that she could guide me to it but that it was not a castle nor a tavern but a high rock i offered to pay her well for her trouble and after some demur she consented to accompany me to the spot we found it without much difficulty when dismissing her i proceeded to examine the place the castle consisted of an irregular assemblage of cliffs and rocks one of the latter being quite remarkable for its height as well as for its insulated and artificial appearance i clambered to its apex and then felt much at a loss as to what should be next done while i busied in reflection my eyes fell upon a narrow ledge in the eastern face of the rock perhaps a yard below the summit upon which i stood this ledge projected about eighteen inches and was not more than a foot wide while a niche in the cliff just above it gave it a rude resemblance to one of the hollow back chairs used by our ancestors i made no doubt that here was the devil's seat alluded to in the m s and now i seemed to grasp the full secret of the riddle the good glass i knew could have reference to nothing but a telescope for the word glass is rarely employed in any other sense by seamen now here i at once saw was a telescope to be used and a definite point of view admitting no variation from which to use it nor did i hesitate to believe that the phrases forty one degrees and thirteen minutes and northeast and by north were intended as directions for the leveling of the glass greatly excited by these discoveries i hurried home procured a telescope and returned to the rock i let myself down to the ledge and found that it was impossible to retain a seat upon it except in one particular position this fact confirmed my preconceived idea i proceeded to use the glass of course the forty one degrees and thirteen minutes could allude to nothing but elevation above the visible horizon since the horizontal direction was clearly indicated by the words northeast and by north this latter direction i at once established by means of a pocket compass then pointing the glass as nearly at an angle of forty one degrees of elevation as i could do it by guess i moved it cautiously up or down until my attention was arrested by a circular rift or opening in the foliage of a large tree that overtopped its fellows in the distance in the center of this rift i perceived a white spot but could not at first distinguish what it was adjusting the focus of the telescope i again looked and now made it out to be a human skull upon this discovery i was so sanguine as to consider the enigma solved for the phrase main branch seventh limb east side could refer only to the position of the skull upon the tree while shoot from the left eye of the death's head admitted also of but one interpretation in regard to a search for buried treasure i perceived that the design was to drop a bullet from the left eye of the skull and that a bee line or in other words a straight line drawn from the nearest point of the trunk through the shot or the spot where the bullet fell and thence extended to a distance of fifty feet would indicate a definite point and beneath this point i thought it at least possible that a deposit of value lay concealed 
All this, I said, is exceedingly clear, and although ingenious, still simple and explicit, when you left the bishop's hotel, what then? Why, having carefully taken the bearings of the tree, I turned homeward. The instant that I left the devil's seat, however, the circular rift vanished. Nor could I get a glimpse of it afterward, turn as I would. What seems to me the chief ingenuity in this whole business is the fact, for repeated experiment has convinced me it is a fact, that the circular opening in question is visible from no other attainable point of view than that afforded by the narrow ledge upon the face of the rock. In this expedition to the bishop's hotel I had been attended by Jupiter, who had no doubt observed for some weeks past the abstraction of my demeanor, and took especial care not to leave me alone. But on the next day, getting up very early, I contrived to give him the slip, and went into the hills in search of the tree. After much toil I found it. When I came home at night my valet proposed to give me a flogging. With the rest of the adventure I believe you are as well acquainted as myself. I suppose, said I, you missed the spot in the first attempt at digging through Jupiter's stupidity in letting the bug fall through the right instead of through the left eye of the skull. Precisely. This mistake made a difference of about two inches and a half in the shot, that is to say, in the position of the peg nearest the tree. And had the treasure been beneath the shot, the error would have been of little moment. But the shot, together with the nearest point of the tree, were merely two points for the establishment of a line of direction. Of course the error, however trivial in the beginning, increased as we proceeded with the line, and by the time we had gone fifty feet, threw us quite off the scent. But for my deep-seated impressions that treasure was here somewhere actually buried, we might have had all our labor in vain. But your grand eloquence and your conduct in swinging the beetle, how excessively odd! I was sure you were mad. And why did you insist upon letting fall the bug instead of a bullet from the skull? Why, to be frank, I felt somewhat annoyed by your evident suspicions touching my sanity, and so resolved to punish you quietly in my own way by a little bit of sober mystification. For this reason I swung the beetle, and for this reason I let it fall from the tree. An observation of yours was about its great weight, suggested the latter idea. Yes, I perceive, but now there is only one point which puzzles me. What are we to make of the skeletons found in the hole? That is a question I am no more able to answer than yourself. There seems, however, only one plausible way of accounting for them, and yet it is dreadful to believe in such atrocity as my suggestion would imply. It is clear that Kidd, if Kidd indeed, secreted this treasure, which I doubt not. It is clear that he must have had assistance in the labor. But this labor concluded, he may have thought it expedient to remove all participants in his secret. Perhaps a couple of blows with a mattock were sufficient, while his coadjutors were busy in the pit. Perhaps it required a dozen. Who shall tell? End of section 6「Short Stories」Volume 1 American Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories Volume 1 American Stories Edited by William Patton Section Seven. Corporal Flint's murder by F. Fenimore Cooper. Half an hour passed after the execution of the missionary, before the chiefs commenced their proceeding with the corporal. The delay was owing to a consultation in which the weasel had proposed dispatching a party to the castle, to bring in the family, and thus make a common destruction of the remaining pale faces known to be in that part of the openings. Peter did not dare to oppose this scheme himself, but he so managed as to get Crow's feather to do it without bringing himself into the foreground. 
the influence of the Potawatomi prevailed, and it was decided to torture this one captive and to secure his scalp before they proceeded to work their will on the others. Anque, who had gained ground rapidly by his late success, was once more commissioned to state to the captive the intention of his captors. Brother, commenced the weasel, placing himself directly in front of the corporal, I am about to speak to you. A wise warrior opens his ears when he hears the voice of his enemy. He may learn something it will be good for him to know. It will be good for you to know what I am about to say. Brother, you are a pale face, and we are Indians. You wish to get our hunting grounds, and we wish to keep them. To keep them, it has become necessary to take your scalp. I hope you are ready to let us have it. The corporal had but an indifferent knowledge of the Indian language, but he comprehended all that was uttered on this occasion. Interest quickened his faculties, and no part of what was said was lost. The gentle, slow, deliberate manner in which the weasel delivered himself contributed to his means of understanding. He was fortunately prepared for what he heard, and the announcement of his approaching fate did not disturb him to the degree of betraying weakness. This last was a triumph in which the Indians delighted, though they ever showed the most profound respect for such of their victims as manifested a manly fortitude. It was necessary to reply, which the corporal did in English, knowing that several present could interpret his words. With a view to render this the more easy, he spoke in fragment of sentences and with great deliberation. Engines, returned the corporal, you surrounded me, and I have been taken prisoner. Had there been a platoon on us, you might not have made out quite so well. It's no great victory for three hundred warriors to overcome a single man. I count Parson Amen as worse than nothing, for he looked to neither rear nor flank. If I could have half an hour's work upon you with only half of your late company, I think we, you, we should lower your conceit. But that is impossible, and so you may do just what you please with me. I ask no favors. Although his answer was very imperfectly translated, it awakened a good deal of admiration. A man who could look death so closely in the face with so much steadiness became a sort of hero in Indian eyes, and with the North American savage, fortitude is a virtue not inferior to courage. Murmurs of approbation were heard, and Unque was privately requested to urge the captive further, in order to see how far present appearances were likely to be maintained. Brother, I have said that we are Indians, resumed the vessel with an air so humble and a voice so meek that a stranger might have supposed he was consoling instead of endeavoring to intimidate the prisoner. It is true. We are nothing but poor, ignorant Indian. We can only torment our prisoners after the Indian fashion. If we were pale faces, we might do better. We did not torment the medicine priest. We were afraid he would laugh at our mistakes. He knew a great deal. We know but little. We do as well as we know how. Brother, when Indians do as well as they know how, a warrior should forget their mistakes. We wish to torment you in a way to prove that you are all over man. We wish so to torment you that you will stand up under the pain in such a way that it will make our young men think your mother was not a squaw, that there is no woman in you. We do this 
for our own honour as well as for yours. It will be an honour to us to have such a captive. It will be an honour to you to be such a captive. We shall do as well as we know how. Brother, it is most time to begin. The tormenting will last a long time. We must not let the medicine priest get too great a start on the path to the happy hunting grounds of your... Here, a most unexpected interruption occurred that effectually put a stop to the eloquence of Anqui. In his desire to make an impression, the savage approached within reach of the captive's arm, while his own mind was intent on the words that he hoped would make the prisoner quail. The corporal kept his eye on that of the speaker, charming him, as it were, into a riveted gaze in return. Watching his opportunity, he caught the tomahawk from the wizard's belt, and, by a single blow, felled him dead at his feet. Not content with this, the old soldier, now bounded forward, striking right and left, inflicting six or eight wounds on others, before he could be again arrested, disarmed, and bound. While the last was doing, Peter withdrew and observed. Many were the hues and other explanations of admiration that succeeded this display of desperate manhood. The body of the whistle was removed and entered, while the wounded withdrew to attend to their hurts, leaving the reina to the rest assembled there. As for the corporal, he was pretty well blown, and, in addition to being now bound hand and foot, his recent exertions, which were terrific while they lasted, effectually incapacitated him from making any move, so long as he was thus exhausted and confined. A council was now held by the principal chiefs, and Kwe had few friends. In this, he shared the fate of most demagogues, who are commonly despised even by those they lead and deceive. No one regretted him much, and some were actually glad at his fate. But the dignity of the conquerors must be vindicated. It would never do to allow a pale face to obtain so great an advantage, and to take a signal vengeance for his deed. After a long consultation, it was determined to subject the captive to the trial by saplings, and thus see if he could bear the torture without complaining. As some of our readers may not understand what this fell mode of tormenting is, it might be necessary to explain. There is scarcely a method of inflicting pain that comes within the compass of their means that the North American Indians have not essayed on their enemies. When the infernal ingenuity that is exercised on this occasion fails of its effect, the captives themselves have been heard to suggest other means of torturing that they have known practiced successfully by their own people. There is often a strange strife between the tor tormentors and the tormented, the one to manifest skill in inflicting pain, and the other to manifest fortitude in enduring it. As has just been said, quite as much renown is often acquired by the warrior in setting all the devices of his conquerors at defiance, while subject to their hellish attempts as in deeds of arms. It might be more true to say that such was the practice among the Indians than to say at the present time that such is for it is certain that civilization in its approaches, while it has in many particulars even degraded the red man, has had a silent effect in changing and mitigating many of his fiercer customs. This, perhaps, among the rest. It is probable that the more distant tribes still resort to all these ancient usages, but it is both hoped and believed 
that those nearer to the wise do not the torture by saplings is one of those modes of inflicting pain that would naturally suggest themselves to savages young trees that do not stand far apart are trimmed of their branches and brought nearer to each other by bending their bodies the victim is then attached to both trunks sometimes by his extended arms at others by his legs or by whatever part of the frame cruelty can suggest when the saplings are released and permitted to resume their upright positions of course the sufferer is lifted from the earth and hangs suspended by these limbs with a strain on them that soon produces the most intense anguish the celebrated punishment of the knout partakes of a good deal of the same character of suffering bow of the oak now approached the corporal to let him know how high an honor was in reserve for him brother said this ambitious orator you are a brave warrior you have done well not only have you killed one of our chiefs but you have wounded several of our young men no one but a brave could have done this you have forced us to bind you lest you might kill some more it is not often that captives do this your courage has caused us to consult how we might best torture you in a way most to manifest your manhood after talking together the chiefs have decided that a man of your firmness ought to be hung between two young trees we have found the trees and have cut off their branches you can see them if they were a little larger their force would be greater and they would give you more pain would be more worthy of you but these are the largest saplings we could find had there been any larger we would have let you have them we wished to do you honor for you are a bold warrior and worthy to be well tormented brother look at these saplings they are tall and straight when they are bent by many hands they will come together take away the hands and they will become straight again your arms must then keep them together we wish we had some pupusas here that they might shoot arrows unto your flesh that would help much to torment you you cannot have this honor for we have no pupusas we are afraid to let our young men shoot arrows into your flesh they are strong and might kill you we wish you to die between the saplings as is your right being so great a brave brother we think much better of you since you killed the weasel and hurt our young men if all your warriors at chicago had been as bold as you blackbird would not have taken that fort you would have saved many scalps this encourages us it makes us think the great spirit means to help us and that we shall kill all the pale faces when we get further into your settlements we do not expect to meet many such braves as you they tell us we shall then find men who will run and screech like women it will not be a pleasure to torment such men we had rather torment a bold warrior like you who makes us admire him for his manliness we love our schools but not in the war path they are best in the lodges here we want nothing but men you are a man a brave we honor you we think notwithstanding we shall yet make you weak it will not be easy yet we hope to do it we shall try we may not think quite so well of you if we do it but we shall always call you a brave a man is not a stone we can all feel and when we have done all that is in our power no one can do more it is so with engines we think it must be so with pale faces women to try and see how it is the couple understood very little of his harangue 
though he perfectly comprehended the preparation of the saplings and bow of the oak's allusions to them he was in a cold sweat, sweat at the thought for resolute as he was he foresaw sufferings that human fortitude could hardly endure in this state of the case and in the frame of mind he was in he had recourse to an expedient of which he had often heard and which he thought might now be practised to some advantage it was to open up upon the savages with abuse and to exasperate them by taunts and sarcasm to such a degree as might induce some of the weaker members of the tribe to dispatch him on the spot as the corporal with the perspective of the sapling before his eyes manifested a good deal of ingenuity on this occasion we shall record some of his efforts do you call yourself chief and warriors he began upon a pretty high key i call you squaws there is not a man among ye dogs will be the best name you are poor injuns a long time ago the pale faces came here in two or three little canoes there were but a handful and you were plentier than prairie wolves your bark could be heard throughout the land well what did this handful of pale faces he drove your feathers before them until they got all the best of the hunting grounds not an engine of you all now ever get down on the shores of the great salt lake unless to sell brooms and baskets and then he goes sneaking like a wolf after the sheep you have forgotten our clams and oysters taste your fathers had as many of them as they could eat but not one of you ever tasted them the pale faces eat them all if an injun asked for one they would throw the shell at his head and call him a dog do you think that my chiefs would hang one of you between two such miserable saplings as these no they would scorn to practice such pitiful torture they would bring the tops of two tall pines together three the hundred and fifty eat high and put their prisoner on the topmost boughs for the crows and ravens to pick his eyes out but you are miserable engines you know nothing if you knew it any better would you act such poor torment again a great brave i spit upon ye and call you squaws the pale faces have made women of ye they have taken out your hearts and put pieces of dog's flesh in their places here the corporal who delivered himself with an animation suited to his language was obliged to pause literally for want of breath singular as it may seem this tirade excited great admiration among the savages it is true that very few understood what was said perhaps no one understood at all but the manner was thought to be admirable when some of the language was interpreted a deep but smothered resentment was felt more especially at the towns touching the manner in which the whites had overcome the red men truth is hard to be borne and the individual or people who will treat a thousand injurious lies with contempt feel an all their ire aroused at one reproach that has its foundation in fact nevertheless the anger that the corporal's words did in truth awaken was successfully repressed and he had the disappointment of seeing that his life was spared for the torture brother said bow of the oak again placing himself before the captive you have a stout heart it is made of stone and not of flesh if our hearts be of dog's meat yours is of stone what you say is true the pale faces did come at first in two or three canoes and there were but few of them we are ashamed for it is true a few pale faces drove toward the setting sun many engines but we cannot be driven any further we mean to stop here and begin to take all the scalps we can a great chief who belongs to no one tribe but belongs to all tribes 
who speaks all tongues, has been sent by the Great Spirit to arouse us. He has done it. You know him. He came from the head of the lake with you, and kept his eye on your scalp. He is meant to take it from the first. He waited only for an opportunity. That opportunity has come, and we now mean to do as he had told us we ought to do. This is right. Squaws are in a hurry. Warriors know how to wait. We would kill you at once, and hang your scalp on our pole, but it would not be right. We wish to do what is right. If we are poor Indians, and know but little, we know what is right. It is right to torment so great a brave, and we mean to do it. It is only just to you to do so. An old warrior, who has seen so many enemies, and who has so big a heart, ought not to be knocked on the head like a papoose or a squaw. It is his right to be tormented. We are getting ready, and shall soon begin. If my brother can tell us a new way of tormenting, we are willing to try it. Should we not make out as well as pale faces, my brother will remember who we are. We mean to do our best, and we hope to make this art soft. If we do this, great will be our honor. Should we not do it, we cannot help it. We shall try. It was now the corporal's turn to put in a rebutter. This he did without any failure in will or performance. By this time he was so well warmed as to think or care very little about the saplings, and to overlook the pain they might occasion. Dogs can do little but bark, especially engine dogs, he said. Engine themselves are little better than their own dogs. They can bark, but they don't know how to bite. You have many great chiefs here. Some are panthers, and some bears, and some buffaloes. But where are your whistles? I've fed you now these twenty years, and never have I known ye to stand up to the bagonet. It's not in nature to do that. Here the corporal, without knowing it, made some such reproach to the aboriginal warriors of America as the English used to throw into the teeth of ourselves, that of not standing up to a weapon which neither party possessed. It was matter of great triumph that the Americans would not stand the charge of the bayonet at the renowned fight on breeds, for instance, when it is well known that not one man in five among the colonists had any such weapon at all to stand up with. A different story was told at Guilford, and Stony Point, and Utah, and Bennington, and Bemis Aids, and fifty other places that might be named after the troops were furnished with bayonets. Then it was found that the Americans could use them as well as others, and so might it have proved with the red men, though their discipline, or mode of fighting, scarce admitted of such systematic charges. All this, however, the corporal overlooked, much as if he were a regular historian who was writing to make out a case. Arky, brother, since you will call me brother, though heaven be praised, not a drop of nigger or engine blood runs in my veins, resumed the corporal. Arkin, friendly Reskin, answer me one thing. Did you ever hear of such a man as Mad Anthony? He was the tickler for your infernal tribes. You pulled no saplings together for him. He put you up with the long knives and leather stockings, and you outrun his fleetest horses. I was with him, and saw more naked back than naked faces among your people that day. Your great bear got a rap on his nose that sent him to his village, yelping like a cur. Again was the corporal compelled to stop to take breath. The allusion to Wayne and his defeat of the Indians exacted so much ire that several hands grasped knives and tomahawks 
and one arrow was actually drawn nearly to the head but the frown of Belia's speech prevented any outbreak or actual violence it was deemed prudent however to put an end to this scene lest the straightforward corporal who led it on heavily and who had so much to say about injun defeats might actually succeed in touching some festering wound that would bring him to his death at once it was accordingly determined to proceed with the torture of the saplings without further delay the corporal was removed accordingly and placed between two banded trees which were kept together by withes around their tops an arm of the captive was bound tightly at the wrist to the top of each tree so that his limbs were to act as the only tie between the saplings as soon as the whips should, should be cut the indians now worked in silence and the matter was getting to be much too serious for the corporal to indulge in any more words the cold sweat returned and many an anxious glance was cast by the veteran on the fell preparation still he maintained appearances and while all was ready not a man there was aware of the agony of dread which prevailed in the breast of the victim it was not death that he feared as much as suffering a few minutes the corporal knew would make the pain intolerable while he saw no hope of putting a speedy end to his existence a man might live hours in such a situation then it was that the teaching of childhood were revived in the bosom of this ardent man and he remembered the being that died for him in common with the rest of the human race on the tree the seeming similarity of his own execution struck his imagination and brought a tardy but faint recollection of those lessons that had lost most of their efficacy in the wickedness and piety of camps his soul struggled for relief in that direction but the present scene was too absorbing to admit of its lifting itself so far above his humanity why are the pale faces said bow of the oak we are going to cut the withs you will then be where a brave man will want all his courage if you are firm we will do you honor if you faint and screech our young men will laugh at you this is the way with engines they honor braves they point the finger at cowards here a sign was made by bear's meat and a warrior raised the tomahawk that was to separate the fastenings his hand was in the very act of descending when the crack of a rifle was heard and a little smoke rose out of the thicket near the spot where the bee hunter and the corporal himself had remained so long hid on the occasion of the council first held in that place the tomahawk fell however the withs were parted and up flew the saplings with a violence that threatened to tear the arms of the victim out of their sockets the indians listened expecting the screeches and groans they gazed hoping to witness the writhings of their captives but they were disappointed there hung the body its arm distended still holding the top of the sapling's boat but not a sign of life was seen a small line of blood trickled down the forehead and above it was the nearly imperceptible hole made by the passage of a bullet the head itself had fallen forward and a little on one shoulder the corporal had escaped the torments reserved for him by this friendly blow end of section seven Short Stories, Volume One, American Stories, 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 8 Uncle Jim and Uncle Billy by Bret Hart. Part 1 they were partners the avuncular title was bestowed on them by cedar camp possibly in recognition of a certain matured good humor quite distinct from the spasmodic exuberant spirits of its other members and possibly from what to its youthful sense seemed their advanced ages which must have been at least forty they had also set habits even in their improvidence lost incalculable and unpayable sums to each other over euchre regularly every evening and inspected their sluice boxes punctually every saturday for repairs which they never made they even got to resemble each other after the fashion of old married couples or rather as in matrimonial partnerships were subject to the domination of a stronger character although in their case it is to be feared that it was the feminine uncle billy enthusiastic imaginative and loquacious who swayed the masculine steady-going and practical uncle jim they had lived in the camp since its foundation in eighteen forty nine and there seemed to be no reason why they should not remain there until its inevitable evolution into a mining town the younger members might leave through restless ambition or a desire for change or novelty they were subject to no such trifling mutation yet cedar camp was surprised one day to hear that uncle billy was going away the rain was softly falling on the bark thatch of the cabin with a muffled murmur like a sound heard through sleep the southwest trades were warm even at that altitude as the open door testified although a fire of pine bark was flickering on the adobe hearth and striking out answering fires from the freshly scoured culinary utensils on the rude sideboard which uncle jim had cleaned that morning with his usual serious persistency their best clothes which were interchangeable and worn alternately by each other on festal occasions hung on the walls which were covered with a coarse sailcloth canvas instead of lath and plaster and were diversified by pictures from illustrated papers and stains from the exterior weather two bunks like ship's berths an upper and lower one occupied the gable end of this single apartment and on beds of coarse sacking filled with dry moss were carefully rolled their respective blankets and pillows they were the only articles not used in common and whose individuality was respected uncle jim who had been sitting before the fire rose as the square bulk of his partner appeared at the doorway with an armful of wood for the evening stove by that sign he knew it was nine o'clock for the last six years uncle billy had regularly brought in the wood at that hour and uncle jim had as regularly closed the door after him and set out their single table containing a greasy pack of cards taken from its drawer a bottle of whiskey and two tin drinking cups to this was added a ragged memorandum book and a stick of pencil the two men drew their stools to the table hold on a minute said uncle billy his partner laid down the cards as uncle billy extracted from his pocket a pill box and opening it gravely took a pill this was clearly an innovation on their regular proceedings for uncle billy was always in perfect health what's this for asked uncle jim half scornfully agin agur you ain't got no agur said uncle jim with the assurance of intimate cognizance of his partner's physical condition but it's a powerful preventive quinine saw this box at riley's store and laid out a quarter on it we can keep it here comfortable for evenings it's mighty soothin arter man's done a hard day's work on the river bar take one Uncle Jim gravely took a pill and swallowed it and handed the box back to his partner We'll leave it on the table sociable like in case any of the boys come in said uncle Billy taking up the cards Well, how do we stand? Uncle Jim consulted the memorandum book 
You were owing me sixty-two thousand dollars on the last game, and the limit seventy-five thousand. Gee willikins, ejaculated Uncle Billy. Let me see. He examined the book, feebly attempted to challenge the additions, but with no effect on the total. We ought to have made the limit a hundred thousand, he said seriously. Seventy-five thousand is only trifling in a game like ours, and you've set down my claim at Angel's, he continued. I allowed you ten thousand dollars for that, said Uncle Jim, with equal gravity. And it's a fancy price, too. The claim in question being an unprospected hillside ten miles distant, which Uncle Jim had never seen, and Uncle Billy had not visited for years. The statement was probably true, nevertheless. Uncle Billy retorted, You can never tell how these things will pan out. Why, only this morning I was taking a turn round shot up hill, that she know is just rotten with quartz and gold, and I couldn't help thinking how much it was like my old claim at Angel's. I must take a day off to go on there, and strike a pick in it, if only for luck. Suddenly he paused and said, Strange, ain't it? You should speak of it tonight. Now I call that queer. He laid down his cards and gazed mysteriously at his companion. Uncle Jim knew perfectly that Uncle Billy had regularly once a week for many years declared his final determination to go over to Angel's and prospect his claim. Yet nevertheless he half responded to his partner's suggestion of mystery, and a look of fatuous wonder crept into his eyes but he contented himself by saying cautiously, "'You spoke of it first. "'That's the more singular,' said Uncle Billy confidently, "'and I've been thinking about it, "'and kind of seeing myself thar all day. "'It's mighty queer.' He got up and began to rummage among some torn and coverless books in the corner. "'Where's that dream book gone to?' "'The Carson boys borrowed it,' replied Uncle Jim. "'Anyhow, yours wasn't no dream, only a kind of vision.' and the book don't take no stock in visions. Nevertheless, he watched his partner with some sympathy, and added, That reminds me that I had a dream the other night of being in Frisco at a small hotel with heaps of money, and all the time being sort of scared and bewildered over it. No, queried his partner, eagerly yet reproachfully. You never let on anything about it to me. It's mighty queer you having these strange feelings, for I've had them myself. And only tonight, coming up from the spring, I saw two crows hopping in the trail, and I says, if I sees another, it's luck sure. And you'll think I'm lying, but when I went to the woodpile just now, there was the third one sitting up on a log as plain as I see you. Tell you what folks can laugh, but that's just what Jim Filgree saw the night before he made that big strike. They were both smiling yet with an underlying credulity and seriousness as singularly pathetic as it seemed incongruous to their years and intelligence. Small wonder, however, that in their occupation and environment, living daily in an atmosphere of hope, expectation, and chance, looking forward each morning to the blind stroke of a pick that might bring fortune, they should see signs in nature and hear mystic voices in the trackless woods that surrounded them. Still less strange that they were peculiarly susceptible to the more recognized diversions of chance, and were gamblers on the turning of a card who trusted to the revelation of a shovelful of upturned earth. It was quite natural, therefore, that they should return from their abstract form of divination to the table and their cards. But they were scarcely seated before they heard a crackling step in the brush outside, and the free latch of their door was lifted. A younger member of the camp entered. He uttered a peevish, Hello, which might have passed for a greeting, or might have been a slight protest at finding the door closed, drew the stool from which Uncle Jim had just risen before the fire, shook his wet clothes like a Newfoundland dog, and sat down. Yet he was by no means churlish nor coarse-looking, and this act was rather one of easy-going, selfish, youthful familiarity than of rudeness. The cabin of Uncles Billy and Jim was considered a public right, or common, of the camp. Conferences between individual miners were appointed there. I'll meet you at Uncle Billy's was a common tryst. Added to this was a tacit claim upon the partner's arbitrative powers, or the equal right to request them to step outside if the interviews were of a private nature. 
Yet there was never any objection on the part of the partners, and tonight there was not a shadow of resentment of this intrusion in the patient, good-humored, tolerant eyes of uncles Jim and Billy as they gazed at their guest. Perhaps there was a slight gleam of relief in Uncle Jim's when he found that the guest was unaccompanied by anyone, and that it was not a tryst. It would have been unpleasant for the two partners to have stayed out in the rain while their guests were exchanging private confidences in their cabin. While there might have been no limit to their goodwill, there might have been some to their capacity for exposure. Uncle Jim drew a huge log from beside the hearth and sat on the driest end of it, while their guest occupied the stool. The young man, without turning away from his discontented peevish brooding over the fire, vaguely reached backward for the whiskey bottle and Uncle Billy's tin cup, to which he was assisted by the latter's hospitable hand. But on setting down the cup, his eye caught sight of the pill-box. "'What's that?' he said with gloomy scorn. "'Rat poison? Quinine pills. Agin agar,' said Uncle Jim. "'The newest thing out. Keeps out damp like Injun rubber. Take one to follow your whiskey. Me and Uncle Billy wouldn't think of settin' down quiet-like in the evening, out of work, without em. Take one. You're welcome. We keep em out here for the boys.' Accustomed as the partners were to adopt and wear each other's opinions before folks, as they did each other's clothing, Uncle Billy was nevertheless astonished and delighted at Uncle Jim's enthusiasm over his pills. The guest took one and swallowed it. "'Mighty bitter,' he said, glancing at his hosts with the quick Californian suspicion of some practical joke. But the honest faces of the partners reassured him. "'That bitterness ye taste?' said Uncle Jim quickly, is why the thing's gettin' its work. Sort of sickenin' the malaria, and kind of waterproofin' the insides all to onct and at the same lick. Don't you see? Put another in your vest pocket. You'll be cryin' for em like a child afore you get home. Thar. Well, how's things a-goin' on your claim, Dick? Boomin', eh? The guest raised his head and turned it sufficiently to fling his answer back over his shoulder at his hosts. I don't know what you'd call boomin', he said gloomily. I suppose you two men sitting here comfortably by the fire, without caring whether school keeps or not, would call two feet of backwater over one's claim boomin'. I reckon you'd consider a hundred and fifty feet of sluicin carried away and drifting to thunder down the South Fork, something in the way of advertising to your old camp. I suppose you'd think it was an inducement to investors. I shouldn't wonder he added still more gloomily, as a sudden dash of rain down the wide-throated chimney dropped in his tin cup. And it would be just like you two chaps, sitting there gormandizing over your quinine, if you said this rain that lasted three weeks was something to be proud of. It was the cheerful and the satisfying custom of the rest of the camp, for no reason whatever, to hold Uncle Jim and Uncle Billy responsible for its present location, its vicissitudes, the weather, or any convulsion of nature. And it was equally the partner's habit, for no reason whatever, to accept these animate versions and apologize. It's a rain that's soft and mellowin', said Uncle Billy gently, and supplant to the sinews and muscles. Did you ever notice, Jim, ostentatiously to his partner, did you ever notice that you get into a kind of sweaty lather workin' in it, sort of openin' to the pores? Fetches em every time, said Uncle Billy. Better nor fancy soap. The guest laughed bitterly. Well, I'm going to leave it to you. I reckon to cut the whole concern tomorrow and light out for something new. It can't be worse than this. The two partners looked grieved, albeit they were accustomed to these outbursts. Everybody who thought of getting away from Cedar Camp used it first as a threat to these patient men, after the fashion of runaway nephews, or made an exemplary scene of their going. "'Better think twice afore you go,' said Uncle Billy. "'I've seen worse weather afore you came,' said Uncle Jim slowly. "'Water all over the bar, the mud so deep ye couldn't get to angels for a sack of flour, and we had to grub on pine nuts and jackass rabbits.' and yet we stuck by the camp, and here we are. The mild answer apparently goaded their guest to fury. He rose from his seat, threw back his long dripping hair from his handsome but querulous face, and scattered a few drops on the partners. 
Yes, that's just it. That's what gets me. Here you stick and here you are, and here you'll stick and rust until you starve or drown. Here you are. Two men who ought to be out in the world playing your part as grown men, stuck here like children playing house in the woods, playing work in your wretched mud pie ditches and content. Two men not so old that you mightn't be taking your part in the fun of the world, going to balls or theaters or paying attention to girls, and yet old enough to have married and have your families around you, content to stay in this God-forsaken place. Old bachelors pigging together like poorhouse paupers. That's what gets me. Say you like it? Say you expect by hanging on to make a strike? And what does that amount to? What are your chances? How many of us have made or are making more than grub wages? Say you're willing to share and share alike as you do? Have you got enough for two? Aren't you actually living off each other? Aren't you grinding each other down, choking each other's struggles, as you sink together deeper and deeper in the mud of this cussed camp? And while you're doing this, aren't you by your age and position here, holding out hopes to others that you know cannot be fulfilled? Accustomed as they were to the half-querulous, half-humorous, but always extravagant criticism of the others, there was something so new in this arraignment of themselves that the partners for a moment sat silent. There was a slight flush on Uncle Billy's cheek. There was a slight paleness on Uncle Jim's. He was the first to reply, but he did so with a certain dignity which neither his partner nor their guest had ever seen on his face before. As it's our fire that's warmed ye up like this, Dick Bullen, he said, slowly rising, with his hand resting on Uncle Billy's shoulder, and as it's our whiskey that's loosened your tongue, I reckon we must put up with what you're saying, just as we've managed to put up with our own way of living, and not quarrel with ye under our roof. The young fellow saw the change in Uncle Jim's face, and quickly extended his hand with an apologetic backward shake of his long hair. Hang it all, old man, he said with a laugh of mingled contrition and amusement. You mustn't mind what I said just now. I've been so worried thinking of things about myself, and maybe a little about you, that I quite forgot I hadn't a call to preach to anybody, least of all to you. So we part friends, Uncle Jim, and you too, Uncle Billy, and you'll forget what I said. In fact, I don't know why I spoke at all. Only I was passing your claim just now, and wondering how much longer your old sluice boxes would hold out, and where in thunder you'd get others when they've caved in. I reckon that sent me off. That's all, old chap. Uncle Billy's face broke into a beaming smile of relief, and it was his hand that first grasped his guests. Uncle Jim quickly followed with as honest a pressure, but with eyes that did not seem to be looking at Bullen though all trace of resentment had died out of them. He walked to the door with him, again shook hands, but remained looking out in the darkness some time after Dick Bullen's tangled hair and broad shoulders had disappeared. Meantime Uncle Billy had resumed his seat and was chuckling and reminiscent as he cleaned out his pipe. Kinda reminds me of Joe Sharp, when he was cleaned out at poker by his own partners in his own cabin, coming up here and bedeviling us about it. What was it you lent him? But Uncle Jim did not reply, and Uncle Billy, taking up the cards, began to shuffle them, smiling vaguely, yet at the same time somewhat painfully. After all, Dick was mighty cut up about what he said, and I felt kind of sorry for him. And you know I rather cotton to a man that speaks his mind. Sort of clears him out, you know, of all the slumgullion that's in him. It's like washing out a pan of prospecting. You pour in the water, and keep slushing it around and round, and out comes first the mud and dirt, and then the gravel, and then the black sand, and then it's all out and there's a speck of gold glistening at the bottom. Then you think there was something in what he said, said Uncle Jim, facing about slowly. An odd tone in his voice made Uncle Billy look up. No, he said quickly, shying with the instinct of an easy, pleasure-loving nature from a possible grave situation. No, I don't think he ever got the color. But what are we moonin' about for? Ain't you going to play? It's more'n half-past nine now. Thus adjured, Uncle Jim moved up to the table and sat down, 
while Uncle Billy dealt the cards, turning up the jack or right bower, but without that exclamation of delight which always accompanied his good fortune, nor did Uncle Jim respond with the usual corresponding simulation of deep disgust. Such a circumstance had not occurred before in the history of their partnership. They both played in silence, a silence only interrupted by a larger splash of raindrops down the chimney. We ought to put a couple of stones on the chimney top, edgewise, like Jack Curtis does. It keeps out the rain without interfering with the draft, said Uncle Billy musingly. What's the use if— If what? said Uncle Billy quietly. If we don't make it broader, said Uncle Jim half wearily. They both stared at the chimney, but Uncle Jim's eye followed the wall around to the bunks. There were many discolorations on the canvas, and the picture of the Goddess of Liberty from an illustrated paper had broken out in a kind of damp, measly eruption. I'll stick that funny handbill of the wash and soda I got at the grocery store the other day right over the Liberty gal. It's a mighty purty woman washing with short sleeves, said Uncle Billy. That's the comfort of them pictures. You can always get something new, and it adds thickness to the wall. Uncle Jim went back to the cards in silence. After a moment he rose again and hung his overcoat against the door. Wind's coming in, he said briefly. Yes, said Uncle Billy cheerfully, but it wouldn't seem natural if there wasn't that crack in the door to let the sunlight in the mornings. Makes a kind of sundial, you know. When the streak of light's in that corner, I says six o'clock. When it's across the chimney, I say seven, and so tis. It certainly had grown chilly, and the wind was rising. The candle guttered and flickered. The embers on the hearth brightened occasionally, as if trying to dispel the gathering shadows, but always ineffectually. The game was frequently interrupted by the necessity of stirring the fire. After an interval of gloom in which each partner successively drew the candle to his side to examine his cards, Uncle Jim said, Say, well, responded Uncle Billy, are you sure you saw that third crow on the woodpile? Sure as I see you now, and a durn sight plainer. Why? Nothing, I was just thinking. Look here. How do we stand now? Uncle Billy was still losing. Nevertheless, he said cheerfully, I'm owing you a matter of sixty thousand dollars. Uncle Jim examined the book abstractedly. Suppose, he said slowly, but without looking at his partner, suppose, as it's getting late now, we play for my half share of the claim again the limit, seventy thousand to square up. Your half share, repeated Uncle Billy with amused incredulity. My half share of the claim, all of this, your house, you know, one half of all that Dick Bullen calls our rotten starvation property, reiterated Uncle Jim with a half smile. Uncle Billy laughed. It was a novel idea. It was, of course, all in the air, like the rest of their game, yet even then he had an odd feeling that he would have liked Dick Bullen to have known it. Wade in, old pard, he said, I'm on it. Uncle Jim lit another candle to reinforce the fading light, and the deal fell to Uncle Billy. He turned up Jack of Clubs. He also turned a little redder as he took up his cards, looked at them, and glanced hastily at his partner. It's no use playing, he said. Look here. He laid down his cards on the table. They were the ace, king, and queen of clubs, and jack of spades, or left bower, which, with the turned-up jack of clubs, or right bower, comprised all the winning cards. By jingo, if we'd been playing four-handed, say you and me again some other ducks, we'd have made four in that deal, and heisted some money, eh? And his eyes sparkled. Uncle Jim also had a slight tremulous light in his own. Oh, no, I didn't see no three crows this afternoon, added Uncle Billy gleefully, as his partner in turn began to shuffle the cards with laborious and conscientious exactitude. Then dealing, he turned up a heart for trumps. Uncle Billy took up his cards one by one, but when he had finished, his face had become as pale as it had been red before. What's the matter? said Uncle Jim quickly, his own face growing white. Uncle Billy, slowly and with breathless awe, laid down his cards, face up on the table. 
It was exactly the same sequence in hearts, with a knave of diamonds added. He could again take every trick. They stared at each other with vacant faces and a half-drawn smile of fear. They could hear the wind moaning in the trees beyond. There was a sudden rattling at the door. Uncle Billy started to his feet, but Uncle Jim caught his arm. Don't leave the cards. It's only the wind. Sit down, he said, in a low, awe-hushed voice. It's your deal. You were two before and two now. That makes you four. You've only one point to make to win the game. Go on. They both poured out a cup of whiskey, smiling vaguely, yet with a certain terror in their eyes. Their hands were cold. The cards slipped from Uncle Billy's benumbed fingers. When he had shuffled them, he passed them to his partner to shuffle them also, but did not speak. When Uncle Jim had shuffled them methodically, he handed them back fatefully to his partner. Uncle Billy dealt them with a trembling hand. He turned up a club. If you're sure of these tricks, you know you've won, said Uncle Jim in a voice that was scarcely audible. Uncle Billy did not reply, but tremulously laid down the ace and right and left bowers. He had won. A feeling of relief came over each, and they laughed hysterically and discordantly. Ridiculous and childish as their contest might have seemed to a looker-on, to each the tension had been as great as that of the greatest gambler without the gambler's trained restraint, coolness, and composure. Uncle Billy nervously took up the cards again. Don't, said Uncle Jim gravely. It's no use. The luck's gone now. Just one more deal, pleaded his partner. Uncle Jim looked at the fire. Uncle Billy hastily dealt and threw the two hands face up on the table. They were the ordinary average cards. He dealt again with the same result. I told you so, said Uncle Jim, without looking up. It certainly seemed a tame performance after their wonderful hands, and after another trial, Uncle Billy threw the cards aside and drew his stool before the fire. Mighty queer, weren't it? he said, with reminiscent awe. Three times running. Do you know, I felt a kind of creepy feeling down my back all the time. Crikey, what luck! None of the boys would believe it if we told them, least of all that Dick Bullen who don't believe in luck anyway. Wonder what he'd have said, and Lord how he'd have looked. Wall, what are you staring so for? Uncle Jim had faced around and was gazing at Uncle Billy's good-humored simple face. Nothing, he said briefly, and his eyes again sought the fire. Then don't look as if you were seeing something. You give me the creeps, returned Uncle Billy a little petulantly. Let's turn in afore the fire goes out. The fateful cards were put back into the drawer, the table shoved against the wall. The operation of undressing was quickly got over, the clothes they wore being put on top of their blankets. Uncle Billy yawned. I wonder what kind of a dream I'll have tonight. It ought to be something to explain that luck. This was his good night to his partner. In a few moments he was sound asleep. Not so Uncle Jim. He heard the wind gradually go down, and in the oppressive silence that followed could detect the deep breathing of his companion and the far-off yelp of a coyote. His eyesight becoming accustomed to the semi-darkness, broken only by the scintillation of the dying embers of their fire. He could take in every detail of their sordid cabin and the rude environment in which they had lived so long. The dismal patches on the bark roof, the wretched makeshifts of each day, the dreary prolongation of discomfort were all plain to him now, without the sanguine hope that had made them bearable and when he shut his eyes upon them, it was only to travel in fancy down the steep mountainside that he had trodden so often to the dreary claim on the overflowed river, to the heaps of tailings that encumbered it like empty shells of the hollow, profitless days spent there, which they were always waiting for the stroke of good fortune to clear away. He saw again the rotten sluicing through whose hopeless rifts and holes even their scant daily earnings had become scantier. At last he arose and with infinite gentleness let himself down from his berth without disturbing his sleeping partner, and wrapping himself in his blanket went to the door, which he noiselessly opened. From the position of a few stars that were glittering in the northern sky he knew that it was yet scarcely midnight. There were still long restless hours before the day, in the feverish state into which he had gradually worked himself 
it seemed to him impossible to wait for the coming of the dawn but he was mistaken for even as he stood there all nature seemed to invade his humble cabin with its free and fragrant breath and invest him with its great companionship he felt again in that breath that strange sense of freedom that mystic touch of partnership with the birds and beasts the shrubs and trees in this greater home before him it was this vague communion that had kept him there that still held these world-sick weary workers in their rude cabins on the slopes around him and he felt upon his brow that balm that had nightly lulled him and them to sleep and forgetfulness he closed the door turned away crept as noiselessly as before into his bunk again and presently fell into a profound slumber but when uncle billy awoke the next morning he saw it was late for the sun piercing the crack of the closed door was sending a pencil of light across the cold hearth like a match to rekindle its dead embers his first thought was of his strange luck the night before and of disappointment that he had not had the dream of divination that he had looked for he sprang to the floor but as he stood upright his glance fell on uncle jim's bunk it was empty not only that but his blankets uncle jim's own particular blankets were gone a sudden revelation of his partner's manner the night before struck him now with the cruelty of a blow a sudden intelligence perhaps the very divination that he had sought flashed upon him like lightning he glanced wildly around the cabin the table was drawn out from the wall a little ostentatiously as if to catch his eye on it was lying the stained shamey skin purse in which they had kept the few grains of gold remaining from their last week's clean-up the grains had been carefully divided and half had been taken but near it lay the little memorandum book open with a stick of pencil lying across it a deep line was drawn across the page on which was recorded their imaginary extravagant gains and losses even to the entry of uncle jim's half share of the claim which he had risked and lost underneath were hurriedly scrawled the words settled by your luck last night old pard james foster end of section eight Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 9. Uncle Jim and Uncle Billy by Bret Hart. Part two. It was nearly a month before Cedar Camp was convinced that Uncle Billy and Uncle Jim had dissolved partnership. Pride had prevented Uncle Billy from revealing his suspicions of the truth or of relating the events that preceded Uncle Jim's clandestine flight, and Dick Bullen had gone to Sacramento by stagecoach the same morning. He briefly gave out that his partner had been called to San Francisco on important business of their own and That indeed might necessitate his own removal there later in this he was singularly assisted by a letter from the absent Jim Dated at San Francisco begging him not to be anxious about his success as he had hopes of presently entering a profitable business but with no further allusions to his precipitate departure nor any suggestion of a reason for it for two or three days uncle billy was staggered and bewildered in his profound simplicity he wondered if his extraordinary good fortune that night had made him deaf to some explanation of his partners or more terrible if he had shown some low and incredible intimation of taking his partner's extravagant bet as real and binding in this distress he wrote to uncle jim an appealing and apologetic letter albeit somewhat incoherent and inaccurate and bristling with misspelling camp slang and old partnership jibes 
but to this elaborate epistle he received only uncle jim's repeated assurances of his own bright prospects and his hopes that his old partner would be more fortunate single-handed on the old claim for a whole week or two uncle billy sulked but his invincible optimism and good humor got the better of him and he thought only of his old partner's good fortune he wrote him regularly but always to one address a box at the san francisco post office which to the simple-minded uncle billy suggested a certain official importance to these letters uncle jim responded regularly but briefly from a certain intuitive pride in his partner and his affection uncle billy did not show these letters openly to the camp although he spoke freely of his former partner's promising future and even read them short extracts it is needless to say that the camp did not accept uncle billy's story with unsuspecting confidence and on the contrary a hundred surmises humorous or serious but always extravagant were afloat in cedar camp the partners had quarreled over their clothes uncle jim who was taller than uncle billy had refused to wear his partner's trousers they had quarreled over cards uncle jim had discovered that uncle billy was in possession of a coal deck or marked pack they had quarreled over uncle billy's carelessness in grinding up half a box of bilious pills in the morning's coffee a gloomily imaginative mule driver had darkly suggested that as no one had really seen uncle jim leave the camp he was still there and his bones would yet be found in one of the ditches while a still more credulous miner averred that what he had thought was the cry of a screech owl the night previous to uncle jim's disappearance might have been the agonized utterance of that murdered man it was highly characteristic of that camp and indeed of others in california that nobody not even the ingenious theorists themselves believed their story and that no one took the slightest pains to verify or disprove it happily uncle billy never knew it and moved all unconsciously in this atmosphere of burlesque suspicion and then a singular change took place in the attitude of the camp towards him and the disrupted partnership hitherto for no reason whatever all had agreed to put the blame upon billy possibly because he was present to receive it but as days passed that slight reticence and dejection in his manner which they had at first attributed to remorse and a guilty conscience now began to tell as absurdly in his favor here was uncle billy toiling through the ditches while his selfish partner was lolling in the lap of luxury in san francisco uncle billy's glowing accounts of uncle jim's success only contributed to the sympathy now fully given in his behalf and their execration of the absconding partner it was proposed at big store that a letter expressing the indignation of the camp over his heartless conduct to his late partner william fall should be forwarded to him condolences were offered to uncle billy and uncouth attempts were made to cheer his loneliness a procession of half a dozen men twice a week to his cabin carrying their own whiskey and winding up with a stag dance before the premises was sufficient to lighten his eclipse gaiety and remind him of a happier past surprise working parties visited his claim with spasmodic essays towards helping him and great good humor and hilarity prevailed it was not an unusual thing for an honest miner to arise from an idle gathering in some cabin and excuse himself with a remark that he reckoned he'd put in an hour's work in uncle billy's tailings and yet as before it was very improbable if any of these reckless benefactors really believed in their own earnestness or in the gravity of the situation indeed a kind of hopeful cynicism ran through their performances like as not uncle billy is still in cahoots i e shares with his old pard and is just laughing at us as he's sending him accounts of our tom foolin and so the winter passed and the rains and the days of cloudless skies and chill starlit nights began there were still freshets from the snow reservoirs piled high in the sierran passes and the bar was flooded but that passed too and only the sunshine remained monotonous as the seasons were there was a faint movement in the camp with the stirrings of the sap in the pines and cedars 
and then one day there was a strange excitement on the bar men were seen running hither and thither but mainly gathering in a crowd on uncle billy's claim that still retained the old partner's names in the fall and foster to add to the excitement there was the quickly repeated report of a revolver to all appearance aimlessly exploded in the air by someone on the outskirts of the assemblage as the crowd opened uncle billy appeared pale hysterical breathless and staggering a little under the back slapping and hand shaking of the whole camp for uncle billy had struck it rich had just discovered a pocket roughly estimated to be worth fifteen thousand dollars although in that supreme moment he missed the face of his old partner he could not help seeing the unaffected delight and happiness shining in the eyes of all who surrounded him it was characteristic of that sanguine but uncertain life that success and good fortune brought no jealousy nor envy to the unfortunate but was rather a promise and prophecy of the fulfillment of their own hopes the gold was there nature but yielded up her secret there was no prescribed limit to her bounty so strong was this conviction that a long-suffering but still hopeful miner in the enthusiasm of the moment stooped down and patted a large boulder with the apostrophic good old gal then followed a night of jubilee a next morning of hurried consultation with a mining expert and speculator lured to the camp by the good tidings and then the very next night to the utter astonishment of cedar camp uncle billy with a draft for twenty thousand dollars in his pocket started for san francisco and took leave of his claim and the camp forever when uncle billy landed at the wharves of san francisco he was a little bewildered the golden gate beyond was obliterated by the incoming sea fog which had also roofed in the whole city and lights already glittered along the gray streets that climbed the grayer sand hills as a western man brought up by inland rivers he was fascinated and thrilled by the tall-masted sea-going ships and he felt a strange sense of the remoter mysterious ocean which he had never seen but he was impressed and startled by smartly dressed men and women the passing of carriages and a sudden conviction that he was strange and foreign to what he saw it had been his cherished intention to call upon his old partner in his working clothes and then clapped down on the table before him a draft for ten thousand dollars as his share of their old claim but in the face of these brilliant strangers a sudden and unexpected timidity came upon him he had heard of a cheap popular hotel much frequented by the returning gold miner who entered its hospitable doors but which held an easy access to shops and emerged in a few hours a gorgeous butterfly of fashion leaving his old chrysalis behind him thence he inquired his way hence he afterwards issued in garments glaringly new and ill-fitting but he had not sacrificed his beard and there was still something fine and original in his handsome weak face that overcame the cheap convention of his clothes making his way to the post office he was again discomfited by the great size of the building and bewildered by the array of little square letter boxes behind glass which occupied one whole wall and an equal number of opaque and locked wooden ones legibly numbered his heart leaped he remembered the number and before him was a window with a clerk behind it uncle billy leaned forward can you tell me if the man that box 690 b longs to is in the clerk stared made him repeat the question and then turned away but he returned almost instantly with two or three grinning heads besides his own apparently set behind his shoulders uncle billy was again asked to repeat his question and he did so why don't you go and see if 690 is in the box said the first clerk turning with affected asperity to one of the others that clerk went away returned and said with singular gravity he was there a moment ago but he's gone out to stretch his legs it's rather cramping at first and he can't stand it more than ten hours at a time you know but simplicity has its limits 
Uncle Billy had already guessed his real error in believing his partner was officially connected with the building. His cheek had flushed and then paled again. The pupils of his blue eyes had contracted into suggestive black points. If you let me in at that window, young fellas, he said with equal gravity, I'll show you how I can make you small enough to go into a box without cramping. But I only wanted to know where Jim Foster lived, at which the first clerk became perfunctory again, but civil. A letter left in his box would get you that information, he said, and here's paper and pencil to write it now. Uncle Billy took the paper and began to write. Just got here. Come and see me at... And he paused. A brilliant idea had struck him. He could impress both his old partner and the upstarts at the window. He would put in the name of the latest swell hotel in San Francisco, said to be a fairy dream of opulence. He added, the Oriental, and without folding the paper, shoved it in the window. Don't you want an envelope? asked the clerk. Put a stamp on the corner of it, responded Uncle Billy, laying down a coin, and she'll go through. The clerk smiled, but affixed the stamp, and Uncle Billy turned away. But it was a short-lived triumph. The disappointment at finding Uncle Jim's address conveyed no idea of his habitation, seemed to remove him farther away, and lose his identity in the great city. Besides, he must now make good his own address, and seek rooms at the Oriental. He went thither. The furniture and decorations, even in these early days of hotel building in San Francisco, were extravagant and overstrained and Uncle Billy felt lost and lonely in his strange surroundings. But he took a handsome suite of rooms, paid for them in advance on the spot, and then, half frightened, walked out of them to ramble vaguely through the city in the feverish hope of meeting his old partner. At night his inquietude increased. He could not face the long row of tables in the pillared dining room, filled with smartly dressed men and women. He evaded his bedroom with its brocaded satin chairs and its gilt bedstead, and fled to his modest lodgings at the Good Cheer House, and appeased his hunger at its cheap restaurant, in the company of retired miners and freshly arrived Eastern immigrants. Two or three days passed thus in this quaint double existence. Three or four times a day he would enter the gorgeous Oriental with affected ease and carelessness, demand his key from the hotel clerk, ask for the letter that did not come, go to his room and gaze vaguely from his window on the passing crowd below for the partner he could not find, and then return to the good cheer house for rest and sustenance. On the fourth day he received a short note from Uncle Jim. It was couched in his usual sanguine but brief and businesslike style. He was very sorry but important and profitable business took him out of town, but he trusted to return soon and welcome his old partner. He was also for the first time jocose, and hoped that Uncle Billy would not see all the sights before he, Uncle Jim, returned. Disappointing as this procrastination was to Uncle Billy, a gleam of hope irradiated it. The letter had bridged over that gulf which seemed to yawn between them at the post office. His old partner had accepted his visit to San Francisco without question, and had alluded to a renewal of their old intimacy. For Uncle Billy, with all his trustful simplicity, had been tortured by two harrowing doubts. One, whether Uncle Jim, in his new-fledged smartness as a city man, such as he saw in the streets, would care for his rough companionship. The other, whether he, Uncle Billy, ought not to tell him at once of his changed fortune. But like all weak, unreasoning men, he clung desperately to a detail. He could not forego his old idea of astounding Uncle Jim by giving him his share of the strike as his first intimation of it, and he doubted, with more reason perhaps, if Jim would see him after he had heard of his good fortune, for Uncle Billy had still a frightened recollection of Uncle Jim's sudden stroke for independence and that rigid punctiliousness which had made him doggedly accept the responsibility of his extravagant stake at Euchre. 
with a view of educating himself for Uncle Jim's company, he saw the sights of San Francisco, as an overgrown and somewhat stupid child might have seen them, with great curiosity, but little contamination or corruption. But I think he was chiefly pleased with watching the arrival of the Sacramento and Stockton steamers at the wharves, in the hope of discovering his old partner among the passengers on the gangplank. Here, with his old superstitious tendency and gambler's instinct, he would augur great success in his search that day, if any one of the passengers bore the least resemblance to Uncle Jim. If a man or woman stepped off first, or if he met a single person's questioning eye, indeed this got to be the real occupation of the day, which he would on no account have omitted and to a certain extent revived each day in his mind the morning's work of their old partnership. He would say to himself, It's time to go and look up Jim, and put off what he was pleased to think were his pleasures until this act of duty was accomplished. In this singleness of purpose he made very few and no entangling acquaintances, nor did he impart to anyone the secret of his fortune, loyally reserving it for his partner's first knowledge. To a man of his natural frankness and simplicity, this was a great trial, and was perhaps a crucial test of his devotion. When he gave up his rooms at the Oriental as not necessary, after his partner's absence, he sent a letter, with his humble address, to the mysterious lockbox of his partner, without fear or false shame. He would explain it all when they met, but he sometimes treated unlucky and returning miners to a dinner and a visit to the gallery of some theatre. Yet while he had an active sympathy with and understanding of the humblest, Uncle Billy, who for many years had done his own and his partner's washing, scrubbing, mending, and cooking, and saw no degradation in it, was somewhat inconsistently irritated by menial functions in men, and although he gave extravagantly to waiters, and threw a dollar to the crossing sweeper, there was always a certain shy avoidance of them in his manner. Coming from the theater one night, Uncle Billy was, however, seriously concerned by one of these crossing sweepers, turning hastily before them and being knocked down by a passing carriage. The man rose and limped hurriedly away, but Uncle Billy was amazed and still more irritated to hear from his companion that this kind of menial occupation was often profitable, and that at some of the principal crossings the sweepers were already rich men. But a few days later brought a more notable event to Uncle Billy. One afternoon in Montgomery Street he recognized in one of its smartly dressed frequenters a man who had a few years before been a member of Cedar Camp. Uncle Billy's childish delight at this meeting, which seemed to bridge over his old partner's absence, was, however, only half responded to by the ex-miner, and then somewhat satirically. In the fullness of his emotion, Uncle Billy confided to him that he was seeking his old partner Jim Foster, and, reticent of his own good fortune, spoke glowingly of his partner's brilliant expectations, but deplored his inability to find him and just now he was away on important business. I reckon he's got back, said the man dryly. I didn't know he had a lockbox at the post office, but I can give you his other address. He lives at the Presidio at Washerwoman's Bay. He stopped and looked with a satirical smile at Uncle Billy, but the latter, familiar with the Californian mining camp nomenclature, saw nothing strange in it, and merely repeated his companion's words. You'll find him there. Goodbye. So long. Sorry, I'm in a hurry, said the ex-miner, and hurried away. Uncle Billy was too delighted with the prospect of a speedy meeting with Uncle Jim to resent his former associate's supercilious haste, or even to wonder why Uncle Jim had not informed him that he had returned. It was not the first time that he had felt how wide was the gulf between himself and these others and the thought drew him closer to his old partner, as well as his old idea, as it was now possible to surprise him with a draft. But as he was going to surprise him in his own boarding-house, probably a handsome one, Uncle Billy reflected that he would do so in a certain style. He accordingly went to a livery stable and ordered a landau and pair with a negro coachman. Seated in it, in his best and most ill-fitting clothes, 
He asked the coachman to take him to the Presidio and lean back in the cushions as they drove through the streets with such an expression of beaming gratification on his good-humored face that the passers-by smiled at the equipage and its extravagant occupant. To them it seemed not the unusual sight of the successful miner on a spree. To the unsophisticated Uncle Billy their smiling seemed only a natural and kindly recognition of his happiness, and he nodded and smiled back to them with unsuspecting candor and innocent playfulness. These year Frisco fellers ain't all slouches, you bet, he added to himself half aloud at the back of the grinning coachman. Their way led through well-built streets to the outskirts, or rather to that portion of the city which seemed to have been overwhelmed by shifting sand dunes, from which half-submerged fences and even low houses barely marked the foe of highway. The resistless trade winds which had marked this change blew keenly in his face and slightly chilled his ardor. At a turn in the road the sea came in sight and sloping toward it the great cemetery of lone mountain with white shafts and marbles that glittered in the sunlight like the sails of ships waiting to be launched down that slope into the eternal ocean uncle billy shuddered what if it had been his fate to seek uncle jim there does your presidio said the negro coachman a few moments later pointing with his whip and does your washwoman's bay uncle billy stared the huge quadrangular fort of stone with a flag flying above its battlements stood at a little distance pressing against the rocks as if beating back the encroaching surges between him and the fort but further inland was a lagoon with a number of dilapidated rudely patched cabins or cottages like stranded driftwood around its shore but there was no mansion no block of houses no street not another habitation or dwelling to be seen. Uncle Billy's first shock of astonishment was succeeded by a feeling of relief. He had secretly dreaded a meeting with his old partner in the haunts of fashion. Whatever was the cause that made Uncle Jim seek this obscure retirement affected him but slightly. He even was thrilled with a vague memory of the old shiftless camp they had both abandoned, a certain instinct he knew not why, or less still that it might be one of delicacy, made him alight before they reached the first house. Bidding the carriage wait, Uncle Billy entered, and was informed by a blousy Irish laundress at a tub that Jim Foster, or Arkansas Jim, lived at the fourth shanty beyond. He was at home, for he'd sprained his foot. Uncle Billy hurried on, stopped before the door of a shanty, scarcely less rude than their old cabin, and half timidly pushed it open. A growling voice from within, a figure that rose hurriedly leaning on a stick with an attempt to fly, but in the same moment sank back in a chair with an hysterical laugh, and Uncle Billy stood in the presence of his old partner. But as Uncle Billy darted forward, Uncle Jim rose again, and this time with outstretched hands. Uncle Billy caught them, and in one supreme pressure seemed to pour out and transfuse his whole simple soul into his partners. And there they swayed each other backward and forward and sideways by their still clasped hands, until Uncle Billy, with a glance at Uncle Jim's bandaged ankle, shoved him by sheer force down into his chair. Uncle Jim was first to speak. Caught, begosh! I might have known you'd be as big a fool as me. Look, you Billy Fall, do you know what you've done? You've druv me out of the streets where I was making an honest living by day on three crossings. Yes, he laughed forgivingly. You druv me out of it by day just because I reckoned that sometime I might run into your darn fool face. Another laugh and the grasp of the hand, and then... But gosh, not content with ruining my business by day, when I took to it at night... You took to going out at nights, too, and so put a stopper on me there. Shall I tell you what else you did? Well, by the holy poker, I owe this sprained foot to your darn foolishness and my own, for it was getting away from you one night after the theater that I got run into and run over. You see, he went on, unconscious of Uncle Billy's paling face, and with a naivete, though perhaps not a delicacy equal to Uncle Billy's own. 
I had to play roots on you with that lockbox business and these letters, because I didn't want you to know what I was up to, for you might not like it, and might think it was lowering to the old firm, don't you see? I wouldn't have gone into it, but I was played out, and I don't mind telling you now, old man, that when I wrote you that first chipper letter from the lockbox, I hadn't eat anything for two days. But it's all right now, with a laugh. Then I got into this business, thinking it nothing, just the very last thing, and do you know, old part, I couldn't tell anybody but you, and in fact I kept it just to tell you, I've made nine hundred and fifty-six dollars. Yes, sir, nine hundred and fifty-six dollars, solid money, in Adam and Company's bank, just out of my trade. What trade? asked Uncle Billy. Uncle Jim pointed to the corner, where stood a large, heavy crossing sweeper's broom. That trade. Certainly, said Uncle Billy with a quick laugh. It's an outdoor trade, said Uncle Jim gravely, but with no suggestion of awkwardness or apology in his manner. And there ain't much difference between sweeping a crossin' with a broom and raking over tailing with a rake. Only what ye get with a broom you have handed to ye, and you don't have to pick it up and fish it out ere the wet rocks and sluice gushin', and it's a heap less tirin' to the back. Certainly, you bet, said Uncle Billy enthusiastically, and yet with a certain nervous abstraction. I'm glad ye say so, for you see, I didn't know at first how you'd tumble to my doing it until I'd made my pile, and if I hadn't made it, I wouldn't have set eyes on ye again, old pard, never. Do you mind my running out a minute, said Uncle Billy, rising? You see, I got a friend waiting for me outside, and I reckon, he stammered, I'll just run out and send him off so I can talk comfortable to ye. Ye ain't got anybody your own money to, said Uncle Jim earnestly. Anybody following you to get paid, huh? for I can just set down right here and write ye off a check on the bank. No, said Uncle Billy. He slipped out of the door and ran like a deer to the waiting carriage, thrusting a twenty-dollar gold piece into the coachman's hand. He said hoarsely, I ain't wantin' that carriage just now. You can drive around and have a private jamboree all by yourself the rest of the afternoon, and then come and wait for me at the top of the hill yonder. Thus quit of his gorgeous equipage, he hurried back to Uncle Jim, grasping his $10,000 draft in his pocket. He was nervous. He was frightened. But he must get rid of the draft and his story and have it over. But before he could speak, he was unexpectedly stopped by Uncle Jim. Now look here, Billy boy, said Uncle Jim. I got something to say to ye, and I might as well clear it off my mind at once, and then we can start fair again. Now. He went on with a half laugh. Wasn't it enough for me to go on pretending I was rich and doing a big business and getting up that lockbox dodge so ye couldn't find out where I hung out and what I was doing? Wasn't it enough for me to go on with all this play acting? But you, you long legged ornery cuss, must get up and go to lying and play acting too. Me? Play acting? Me? Lying? gasped Uncle Billy. Uncle Jim leaned back in his chair and laughed. Do you think you could fool me? Do you think I didn't see through your little game of going to that swell oriental, but just wrastling your hash and having a roll down at the good cheer? Do you think I didn't spy on ye and find that out? Oh, you long-eared jackass rabbit! He laughed until the tears came into his eyes, and Uncle Billy laughed too, albeit until the laugh on his face became quite fixed, and he was fain to bury his head in his handkerchief. And yet said Uncle Jim, with a deep breath. Gosh, I was frightened. Just for a minute I thought maybe you had made a big strike when I got your first letter, and I made up my mind what I'd do, and then I remembered you was just that kind of an open sluice that couldn't keep anything to yourself, and you'd have been sure to have yelled it out to me the first thing. So I waited, and I found you out, you old sinner. He reached forward and dug Uncle Billy in the ribs. What would you have done? said Uncle Billy, after a hysterical collapse. Uncle Jim's face grew grave again. I'd have, I'd have cleared out, out of Frisco, out of California, out of America. I couldn't have stood it. Don't think I would have begrudged ye your luck. No man would have been gladder than me. He leaned forward again and laid his hand caressingly upon his partner's arm. Don't think I'd have wanted to take a penny of it, but I, thar, I couldn't have stood up under it. 
to have had you 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 that i left behind coming down here rolling in wealth and new partners and friends and arrive upon me and this shanty and and he threw towards the corner of the room a terrible gesture none the less terrible that it was illogical and inconsequent to all that had gone before and 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 that broom there was a dead silence in the room with it uncle billy seemed to feel himself again transported to the homely cabin at cedar camp and that fateful night with his partner's strange determined face before him as then he even fancied that he heard the roaring of the pines without and did not know that it was the distant sea but after a minute uncle jim resumed of course you've made a little raise somehow or you wouldn't be here yes said uncle billy eagerly yes i've got he stopped and stammered I i've got a, a few hundreds oh oh said uncle jim cheerfully he paused and then added earnestly i say you ain't got left over and above your d -d -d foolishness at the oriental as much as five hundred dollars i've got said uncle billy blushing a little over his first deliberate and affected lie i've got at least five hundred and seventy two dollars yes he added tentatively gazing anxiously at his partner i've got at least that gee willikins said uncle jim with a laugh and then eagerly look here pard then we're on velvet i've got nine hundred put your five with that and i know a little ranch that we can get for twelve hundred that's what i've been saving up for that's my little game no more mining for me it's got a shanty twice as big as our old cabin nigh on a hundred acres and two mustangs we can run it with two chinamen and just make it howl what you say eh? he extended his hand i'm in said uncle billy radiantly grasping uncle jim's but his smile faded and his clear simple brow wrinkled in two lines happily uncle jim did not notice it now then old pard he said brightly We'll have a gay old time tonight, one of our jamborees. I've got some whiskey here and a deck of cards, and we'll have a little game, you understand, but not for keeps now. No siree. We'll play for beans. A sudden light illuminated Uncle Billy's face again, but he said with a grim desperation, Not tonight. I've got to go into town. That friend of mine expects me to go to the theater, don't you see? But I'll be out tomorrow at sunup, and we'll fix up this thing of the ranch seems to me you're kind of stuck on this friend grunted uncle jim uncle billy's heart bounded at his partner's jealousy no but i must you know he returned with a faint laugh i say it ain't a her is it said uncle jim uncle billy achieved a diabolical wink and a creditable blush at his lie billy jim and under cover of this festive gallantry uncle billy escaped he ran through the gathering darkness and toiled up the shifting sands to the top of the hill where he found the carriage waiting what said uncle billy in a low confidential tone to the coachman what do you frisco fellows allow to be the best biggest and riskiest gambling saloon here something high-toned you know the negro grinned it was the usual case of the extravagant spendthrift miner though perhaps he had expected a different question and order de is de poker de el dorado and de arcade saloon boss he said flicking his whip meditatively most gents from de mines preferred de poker for de is dancing with de gals frown in but de real prima facie place for gents who go for buckin again de tiger and straight out gamblin is de arcade drive there like thunder said uncle billy leaping into the carriage True to his word, Uncle Billy was at his partner's shanty early the next morning. He looked a little tired, but happy, and had brought a draft with him for five hundred and seventy-five dollars, which he explained was the total of his capital. Uncle Jim was overjoyed. They would start for Napa that very day and conclude the purchase of the ranch. Uncle Jim's sprained foot was a sufficient reason for his giving up his present vocation, which he could also sell at a small profit. His domestic arrangements were very simple. There was nothing to take with him. There was everything to leave behind. And that afternoon at sunset, the two reunited partners were seated on the deck of the Napa boat as she swung into the stream. Uncle Billy was gazing over the railing with a look of abstracted relief towards the Golden Gate, 
where the sinking sun seemed to be drawing towards him in the ocean a golden stream that was forever pouring from the bay and the three hill city beside it what uncle billy was thinking of or what the picture suggested to him did not transpire for uncle jim who emboldened by his holiday was luxuriating in an evening paper suddenly uttered a long-drawn whistle and moved closer to his abstracted partner look here he said pointing to a paragraph he had evidently just read just you listen to this and see if we ain't lucky you and me to be just what we air trustin to our own hard work and not thinkin of strikes and fortins just unbutton your ears billy while i reel off this year thing i've just struck in the paper and see what dang fools some men can make of themselves and that their reporter what wrote it must have seen it really uncle jim cleared his throat and holding the paper close to his eyes read aloud slowly a scene of excitement that recalled the palmy days of forty nine was witnessed last night at the arcade saloon a stranger who might have belonged to that reckless epoch and who bore every evidence of being a successful pike county miner out on a spree appeared at one of the tables with a negro coachman bearing two heavy bags of gold selecting a faro bank as his base of operations he began to bet heavily and with apparent recklessness until his play excited the breathless attention of every one in a few moments he had won a sum variously estimated at from eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a rumor went round the room that it was a concerted attempt to break the bank rather than the drunken freak of a western miner dazzled by some successful strike to this theory the man's careless and indifferent bearing toward his extraordinary gains lent great credence the attempt if such it was however was unsuccessful after winning ten times in succession the luck turned and the unfortunate bucket was cleared out not only of his gains but of his original investment which may be placed roughly at twenty thousand dollars this extraordinary play was witnessed by a crowd of excited players who were less impressed by even the magnitude of the stakes than the perfect sang-froid and recklessness of the player who it is said at the close of the game tossed a twenty-dollar gold piece to the banker and smilingly withdrew the man was not recognized by any of the habitues of the place there said uncle jim as he hurriedly slurred over the french substantive at the close did ye ever see such god-forsaken foolishness uncle billy lifted his abstracted eyes from the current still pouring its unreturning gold into the sulking sun and said with a depreciatory smile never nor even in the days of prosperity that visited the great wheat ranch of fall and foster did he ever tell his secret to his partner end of section nine Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Green in Tampa, Florida. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 10. The Notary of Perigueux by H. W. Longfellow. Do not trust thy body with a physician. He'll make thy foolish bones go without flesh in a fortnight, and thy soul walk without a body in a senite after. Surely. You must know, gentlemen, that there lived some years ago in the city of Perigueux an honest notary public, the descendant of a very ancient and broken-down family, and the occupant of one of those old weather-beaten tenements which remind you of the times of your great-grandfather. He was a man of an unoffending quiet disposition, the father of a family, though not the head of it, for in that family the hen overcrowed the cock, and the neighbors, when they spake of the notary, shrugged their shoulders and exclaimed, Poor fellow, his spurs want sharpening. And fine, you understand me, gentlemen, he was henpecked. Well, finding no peace at home, he sought it elsewhere as was very natural for him to do. 
and at length discovered a place of rest far beyond the cares and clamors of domestic life. This was a little café estaminé, a short way out of the city, whither he repaired every evening to smoke his pipe, drink sugar water, and play his favorite game of domino. There he met the boon companions he most loved, heard all the floating chit-chat of the day, laughed when he was in a merry mood, found consolation when he was sad, and at all times gave vent to his opinions without fear of being snubbed short by a flat contradiction. Now the notary's bosom friend was a dealer in clary and cognac, who lived about a league from the city and always passed his evenings at the estaminet. He was a gross corpulent fellow, raised from a full-blooded Gascon breed, and sired by a comic actor of some reputation in his way. He was remarkable for nothing but his good humor, his love of cards, and a strong propensity to test the quality of his own liquors by comparing them with those sold at other places. As evil communications corrupt good manners, the bad practices of the wine dealer won insensibly upon the worthy notary, and before he was aware of it, he found himself weaned from domino and sugar water, and addicted to piquet and spiced wine. Indeed, it not infrequently happened that, after a long session at the estaminet, the two friends grew so urbane that they would waste a full half-hour at the door in friendly dispute which should conduct the other home. Though this course of life agreed well enough with the sluggish, phlegmatic temperament of the wine-dealer, it soon began to play the very deuce with the more sensitive organization of the notary, and finally put his nervous system completely out of tune. He lost his appetite, became gaunt and haggard, and could get no sleep. Legions of blue devils haunted him by day, and by night strange faces peeped through his bed curtains, and the nightmare snorted in his ear. The worse he grew, the more he smoked and tippled, and the more he smoked and tippled, why, as a matter of course, the worse he grew. His wife alternately stormed, remonstrated, entreated, but all in vain. She made the house too hot for him. He retreated to the tavern. She broke his long-stemmed pipes upon the andirons. He substituted a short-stemmed one, which for safekeeping he carried in his waistcoat pocket. Thus the unhappy notary ran gradually down at the heel. What with his bad habits and his domestic grievances, he became completely hipped. He imagined that he was going to die, and suffered in quick succession all the diseases that ever beset mortal man. Every shooting pain was an alarming symptom, every uneasy feeling after dinner a sure prognostic of some mortal disease. In vain did his friends endeavor to reason and then to laugh him out of his strange whims. For when did ever jest or reason cure a sick imagination? His only answer was, Do let me alone. I know better than you what ails me. Well, gentlemen, Things were in this state when, one afternoon in December, as he sat moping in his office, wrapped in an overcoat, with a cap on his head, and his feet thrust into a pair of furred slippers, a cabriolet stopped at the door, and a loud knocking without aroused him from his gloomy reverie. It was a message from his friend, the wine-dealer, who had been suddenly attacked with a violent fever and growing worse and worse, bad now sent in the greatest haste for the notary to draw up his last will and testament. The case was urgent, and admitted neither excuse nor delay, and the notary, tying a handkerchief round his face, and buttoning up to the chin, jumped into the cabriolet, and suffered himself, though not without some dismal presentiments and misgivings of heart, to be driven to the wine-dealer's house. When he arrived, he found everything in the greatest confusion. On entering the house, he ran against the apothecary, who was coming downstairs with a face as long as your arm. And a few steps farther he met the housekeeper, for the wine-dealer was an old bachelor, running up and down and wringing her hands for fear that the good man should die without making his will. He soon reached the chamber of his sick friend, 
and found him tossing about in a paroxysm of fever and calling out loud for a draught of cold water. The notary shook his head. He thought this a fatal symptom. For ten years back, the wine dealer had been suffering under a species of hydrophobia, which seemed suddenly to have left him. When the sick man saw who stood by his bedside, he stretched out his hand and exclaimed, Ah, my dear friend, have you come at last? You see, it is all over with me. You have arrived just in time to draw up that, that passport of mine. Ah, grand diable, how hot it is here. Water, 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 will nobody give me a drop of cold water? As the case was an urgent one, the notary made no delay in getting his papers in readiness, and in a short time the last will and testament of the wine dealer was drawn up in due form. The notary guiding the sick man's hand as he scrawled his signature at the bottom. As the evening wore away, the wine dealer grew worse and worse, and at length became delirious, mingling in his incoherent ravings the phrases of the credo and paternoster with the shibboleth of the dram shop and the card table. Take care, take care, there now, credo in, pop, ding a ling a ling, give me some of that, sante dees, why, you old publican, this wine is poisoned. I know your tricks, sanctum ecclesiam catholicam. Well, well, we shall see, imbecile, to have a tierce major and a seven of hearts, and discard the seven. By St. Anthony, capo, you are lurched. Ha, ha, I told you so. I knew very well. There, there, don't interrupt me. Carnis resurrectionum e vita eternum. With these words upon his lips, the poor wine-dealer expired. Meanwhile the notary sat cowering over the fire, aghast at the fearful scene that was passing before him, and now and then striving to keep up his courage by a glass of cognac. Already his fears were on the alert, and the idea of contagion flitted to and fro through his mind. In order to quiet these thoughts of evil import, he lighted his pipe and began to prepare for returning home. At that moment the apothecary turned round to him and said, Dreadful sickly time, this. The disorder seems to be spreading. What disorder? exclaimed the notary, with a movement of surprise. Two died yesterday and three today, continued the apothecary, without answering the question. Very sickly time, sir, very. But what disorder is it? What disease has carried off my friend here so suddenly? What disease? Why, scarlet fever, to be sure. And is it contagious? Certainly. Then I am a dead man, exclaimed the notary, putting his pipe into his waistcoat pocket, and beginning to walk up and down the room in despair. I am a dead man. Now, don't deceive me. Don't, will you? What, what are the symptoms? A sharp burning pain in the right side, said the apothecary. Oh, what a fool I was to come here! In vain did the housekeeper and the apothecary strive to pacify him. He was not a man to be reasoned with. He answered that he knew his own constitution better than they did, and insisted upon going home without delay. Unfortunately, the vehicle he came in had returned to the city, and the whole neighborhood was abed and asleep. What was to be done? Nothing in the world but to take the apothecary's horse, which stood hitched at the door, patiently waiting his master's will. Well, gentlemen, as there was no remedy, our notary mounted his raw bone steed and set forth upon his homeward journey. The night was cold and gusty, and the wind right in his teeth. Overhead the leaden clouds were beating to and fro and through them the newly risen moon seemed to be tossing and drifting along like a cockboat in the surf, now swallowed up in a huge billow of cloud, and now lifted upon its bosom and dashed with silvery spray. The trees by the roadside groaned with a sound of evil omen, and before him lay three mortal miles beset with a thousand imaginary perils. 
Obedient to the whip and spur, the steed leaped forward by fits and starts, now dashing away in a tremendous gallop, and now relaxing into a long, hard trot, while the rider, filled with symptoms of disease and dire presentiments of death, urged him on as if he were fleeing before the pestilence. In this way, by dint of whistling and shouting and beating right and left, one mile of the fatal three was safely passed. The apprehensions of the notary had so far subsided that he even suffered the poor horse to walk uphill. But these apprehensions were suddenly revived again with tenfold violence by a sharp pain in the right side, which seemed to pierce him like a needle. It is upon me at last, groaned the fear-stricken man. Heaven be merciful to me, the greatest of sinners, and must I die in a ditch after all? Hey, get out, get out and away went horse and rider at full speed, hurry-scurry, up hill and down, panting and blowing like a whirlwind. At every leap the pain in the rider's side seemed to increase. At first it was a little point like the prick of a needle. Then it spread to the size of a half-franc piece. Then covered a place as large as the palm of your hand. It gained upon him fast. The poor man groaned aloud in agony. Faster and faster sped the horse over the frozen ground. Farther and farther spread the pain over his side. To complete the dismal picture, the storm commenced. Snow mingled with rain. But snow and rain and cold were naught to him, for though his arms and legs were frozen to icicles, he felt it not. The fatal symptom was upon him. He was doomed to die, not of cold, but of scarlet fever. At length, he knew not how, more dead than alive, he reached the gate of the city. A band of ill-bred dogs that were serenading at the corner of the street, seeing the notary dash by, joined in the hue and cry, and ran barking and yelping at his heels. It was now late at night and only here and there a solitary lamp twinkled from an upper story. But on went the notary, down this street and up that, till at last he reached his own door. There was a light in his wife's bedchamber. The good woman came to the window, alarmed at such a knocking and howling and clattering at her door so late at night, and the notary was too deeply absorbed in his own sorrows to observe that the lamp cast the shadow of two heads in the window curtain. "'Let me in! Let me in! Quick! Quick!' he exclaimed, almost breathless from terror and fatigue. "'Who are you that come to disturb a lone woman at this hour of the night?' cried a sharp voice from above. "'Be gone about your business, and let quiet people sleep.' "'Oh, Diable, Diable, come down and let me in. I am your husband. Don't you know my voice? Quick, I beseech you, for I am dying here in the street.' After a few moments of delay and a few more words of parley, the door was opened, and the notary stalked into his domicile, pale and haggard in aspect, and as stiff and straight as a ghost. Cased from head to heel in an armor of ice, as the glare of the lamp fell upon him, he looked like a knight-errant mailed in steel. But in one place his armor was broken. On his right side was a circular spot as large as the crown of your hat, and about as black. "'My dear wife,' he exclaimed, with more tenderness than he had exhibited for many years, "'reach me a chair. My hours are numbered. I am a dead man.' Alarmed at these exclamations, his wife stripped off his overcoat. Something fell from beneath it, and was dashed to pieces on the hearth. It was the notary's pipe. He placed his hand upon his side, and, lo, it was bare to the skin. Coat, waistcoat, and linen were burnt through and through, and there was a blister on his side as large over as your head. The mystery was soon explained, symptom and all. The notary had put his pipe into his pocket without knocking out the ashes. And so my story ends. Is that all? asked the radical when the storyteller had finished. That is all. Well, what does your story prove? 
That is more than I can tell. All I know is that the story is true. And did he die? asked the nice little man in the gosling green. Yes, he died afterward, replied the storyteller, rather annoyed at the question. And what did he die of? continued the gosling green, following him up. What did he die of? Why, he died of a sudden. End of section 10. Recording by Larry Green in Tampa, Florida. Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kay Hand. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton, Section 11, The Widow's Cruise, by F. R. Stockton. The Widow Duckett lived in a small village about ten miles from the New Jersey seacoast. In this village she was born, here she had married and buried her husband, and here she expected somebody to bury her, but she was in no hurry for this, for she had scarcely reached middle age. She was a tall woman with no apparent fat in her composition, and full of activity, both muscular and mental. She rose at six o'clock in the morning, cooked breakfast, set the table, washed the dishes when the meal was over, milked, churned, swept, washed, ironed, worked in her little garden, attended to the flowers in the front yard, and in the afternoon knitted and quilted and sewed, and after tea she either went to see her neighbors or had them come to see her. When it was really dark, she lighted the lamp in her parlor and read for an hour, and if it happened to be one of Miss Mary Wilkins's books that she read, she expressed doubts as to the realism of the characters therein described. These doubts she expressed to Dorcas Networthy, who was a small, plump woman with a solemn face, who had lived with the widow for many years, and who had become her devoted disciple. Whatever the widow did, that also did Dorcas. Not so well, for her heart told her she could never expect to do that, but with a yearning anxiety to do everything as well as she could. She rose at five minutes past six, and in a subsidiary way she helped to get the breakfast, to eat it, to wash up the dishes, to work in the garden, to quilt, to sew, to visit and receive, and no one could have tried harder than she did to keep awake when the widow read aloud in the evening. All these things happened every day in the summer time, but in the winter the widow and Dorcas cleared the snow from their little front path instead of attending to the flowers, and in the evening they lighted a fire as well as a lamp in the parlor. Sometimes, however, something different happened, but this was not often, only a few times in the year. One of the different things occurred when Mrs. Duckett and Dorcas were sitting on their little front porch one summer afternoon, one on the little bench on one side of the door, and the other on the little bench on the other side of the door, each waiting until she should hear the clock strike five to prepare tea. But it was not yet a quarter to five when a one-horse wagon containing four men came slowly down the street. Dorcas first saw the wagon, and she instantly stopped knitting. "'Mercy on me!' she exclaimed. "'Whoever those people are, they are strangers here, and they don't know where to stop, for first they go to one side of the street and then to the other.' The widow looked around sharply. Humph, she said. "'Those men are sailor men. You might see that in a twinkling of an eye. Sailor men always drive that way, because that is the way they sail ships. They first tack in one direction, and then in another.' "'Mr. Duckett didn't like the sea,' remarked Dorcas, for about the three hundredth time. No, he didn't, answered the widow, for about the two hundred and fiftieth time, for there had been occasions when she thought Dorcas put this question inopportunely. He hated it, and he was drowned in it through trust in a sailorman, which I never did, nor shall. Do you really believe those men are coming here? Upon my word I do, said Dorcas, and her opinion was correct. The wagon drew up in front of Mrs. Duckett's little white house, and the two women sat rigidly, their hands in their laps, staring at the man who drove. This was an elderly personage with whitish hair, and under his chin a thin whitish beard which waved in the gentle breeze, and gave Dorcas the idea that his head was filled with hair which was leaking out from below. "'Is this the widow Duckett's?' inquired this elderly man, in a strong, penetrating voice. "'That's my name,' said the widow, and laying her knitting on the bench beside her, she went to the gate. Dorcas also laid her knitting on the bench beside her, and went to the gate." I was told, said the elderly man, at a house we touched at about a quarter of a mile back, that the widow Duckett's was the only house in this village where there was any chance of me and my mates getting a meal. We are four sailors, and we are making from the bay over to Cuppertown, 
and that's eight miles ahead yet and we are all pretty sharp set for something to eat this is the place said the widow and i do give meals if there is enough in the house and everything comes handy does everything come handy today said he it does said she and you can hitch your horse and come in but i haven't got anything for him oh that's all right said the man we brought along stores for him so we'll just make fast and then come in the two women hurried into the house in a state of bustling preparation for the furnishing of this meal meant one dollar in cash the four mariners all elderly men descended from the wagon each one scrambling with alacrity over a different wheel a box of broken ship biscuits was brought out and put on the ground in front of the horse who immediately set himself to eating with great satisfaction tea was a little late that day because there were six persons to provide for instead of two but it was a good meal and after the four seamen had washed their hands and faces at the pump in the back yard and had wiped them on two towels furnished by dorcas they all came in and sat down mrs ducket seated herself at the head of the table with the dignity proper to the mistress of the house and dorcas seated herself at the other end with the dignity proper to the disciple of the mistress no service was necessary for everything that was to be eaten or drunk was on the table when each of the elderly mariners had had as much bread and butter quickly baked soda biscuit dried beef cold ham cold tongue and preserved fruit of every variety known as his storage capacity would permit the mariner in command captain bird pushed back his chair whereupon the other mariners pushed back their chairs madam said captain bird we have all made a good meal which didn't need to be no better nor more of it and were satisfied but that horse out there has not had time to rest himself enough to go the eight miles that lies ahead of us so if it's all the same to you and this good lady we'd like to sit on that front porch a while and smoke our pipes i was a-looking at that porch when i came in and i bethought to myself what a rare good place it was to smoke a pipe in there's pipes been smoked there said the widow rising and it can be done again inside the house i don't allow tobacco but on the porch neither of us minds so the four captains betook themselves to the porch two of them seating themselves on the little bench on one side of the door and two of them on the little bench on the other side of the door and lighted their pipes shall we clear off the table and wash up the dishes said dorcas or wait until they are gone we will wait until they are gone said the widow for now that they are here we might as well have a bit of a chat with them when a sailor man lights his pipe he is generally willing to talk but when he is eaten you can't get a word out of him without thinking it necessary to ask permission for the house belonged to her the widow ducket brought a chair and put it in the hall close to the open front door and dorcas brought another chair and seated herself by the side of the widow do all you sailor men belong down there at the bay asked mrs ducket thus the conversation began and in a few minutes it had reached a point at which captain bird thought it proper to say that a great many strange things happened to seamen sailing on the sea which lands people never dream of such as anything in particular asked the widow at which remark dorcas clasped her hands in an expectancy at this question each of the mariners took his pipe from his mouth and gazed upon the floor and thought there's a good many strange things happened to me and my mates at sea would you and that other lady like to hear any of them asked captain bird we would like to hear them if they are true said the widow there's nothing happened to me and my mates that isn't true said captain bird and here is something that once happened to me i was on a whaling voyage when a big sperm whale just as mad as a fiery bull came at us head on and struck the ship at the stern with such tremendous force that his head crashed right through her timbers and he went nearly half his length into her hull the hold was mostly filled with empty barrels for we was just beginning our voyage and when he had made kindling wood of these there was room enough for him we all expected that it wouldn't take five minutes for the vessel to fill and go to the bottom and we made ready to take to the boats but it turned out we didn't need to take to no boats for as fast as the water rushed into the hold of the ship that whale drank it and squirted it up through the two blow holes in the top of his head and as there was an open hatchway just over his head the water all went into the sea again and that whale kept working day and night pumping the water out until we beached the vessel on the island of trinidad the whale helping us wonderful on our way over by the powerful working of his tail which being outside in the water acted like a propeller i don't believe anything stranger than that ever happened to a whaling ship no said the widow i don't believe anything ever did captain bird now looked at captain sanderson and the latter took his pipe out of his mouth and said that in all his sailing around the world he had never known anything queerer than what happened to a big steamship he chanced to be on which ran into an island in a fog 
everybody on board thought the ship was wrecked but it had twin screws and was going at such a tremendous speed that it turned the island entirely upside down and sailed over it and he had heard tell that even now people sailing over the spot could look down into the water and see the roots of the trees and the cellars of the houses captain sanderson now put his pipe back into his mouth and captain burris took out his pipe i was once in an obelisk ship said he that used to trade regular between egypt and new york carrying obelisks we had a big obelisk on board the way they ship obelisks is to make a hole in the stern of the ship and run the obelisk in pointed end foremost and this obelisk filled up nearly the whole of that ship from stern to bow we was about ten days out and sailing afore a northeast gale went the engines at full speed when suddenly we spied breakers ahead and our captain saw that we was about to run on a bank now if we hadn't had an obelisk on board we might have sailed over that bank but the captain knew that with an obelisk on board we drew too much water for this and that we'd be wrecked in about fifty-five seconds if something wasn't done quick so he had to do something quick and this is what he did he ordered all steam on and drove slam bang on that bank just as he expected we stopped so sudden that that big obelisk bounced forward its pointed end foremost and went clean through the bow and shot out into the sea the minute it did that the vessel was so lightened that it rose in the water and then we steamed over the bank there was one man knocked overboard by the shock when we struck but as soon as we missed him we went back after him and we got him all right you see when that obelisk went overboard its butt end which was heaviest went down first and when it touched bottom it just stood there and as it was such a big obelisk there was about five and a half feet of it stuck out of the water the man who was knocked overboard he just swum for that obelisk and he climbed up the hieroglyphics it was a mighty fine obelisk and the egyptians had cut their hieroglyphics good and deep so that the man could get a hand and foothold and when we got to him and took him off he was sitting high and dry on the pointed end of that obelisk it was a great pity about the obelisk for it was a good obelisk but as i never heard the company tried to raise it i expect it is standing there yet captain burris now put his pipe back into his mouth and looked at captain jenkinson who removed his pipe and said the queerest thing that ever happened to me was about a shark we was off the banks and the time of year was july and the ice was coming down and we got in among a lot of it not far away off our weather bow there was a little iceberg which had such a queerness about it that the captain and three men went in a boat to look at it the ice was mighty clear ice and you could see almost through it and right inside of it not more than three feet above the water line and about two feet or maybe twenty inches inside the ice was a whopping big shark about fourteen feet long a regular man-eater frozen in there hard and fast bless my soul said the captain this is a wonderful curiosity and i'm going to get him out just then one of the men said he saw that shark wink but the captain wouldn't believe him for he said that shark was frozen stiff and hard and couldn't wink you see the captain had his own ideas about things and he knew that whales was warm-blooded and would freeze if they was shut up in ice but he forgot that sharks was not whales and that they're cold-blooded just like toads and there is toads that has been shut up in rocks for thousands of years and they stayed alive no matter how cold the place was because they was cold-blooded and when the rocks was split out hopped the frog but as I said before, the captain forgot sharks was cold-blooded, and he determined to, to get that one out. Now you both know, being housekeepers, that if you take a needle and drive it into a hunk of ice, you can split it. The captain had a sail needle with him, and so he drove it into the iceberg right along the side of the shark and split it. Now the minute he did it, he knew that the man was right when he said he saw the shark wink, for it flopped out of that iceberg quicker nor a flash of lightning. What a happy fish he must have been, ejaculated Dorcas, forgetful of the precedent. So great was her emotion yes said captain jenkinson it was a happy fish enough but it wasn't a happy captain you see that shark hadn't had anything to eat for perhaps a thousand years until the captain came along with his sail needle surely you sailormen do see strange things now said the widow and the strangest thing about them is that they are true yes indeed said dorcas that is the most wonderful thing you wouldn't suppose said the widow ducket glancing from one bench of mariners to the other that i have a sea story to tell but i have and if you like i will tell it to you captain bird looked up a little surprised we would like to hear it indeed we would madam said he ay ay said captain burris and the other two mariners nodded it was a good while ago she said when i was living on the shore near the head of the bay that my husband was away and i was left alone in the house one morning my sister-in-law who lived on the other side of the bay sent me word by a boy on a horse that she hadn't any oil in the house to fill up the lamp that she always put in the window to light her husband home who was a fisherman and if i would send her some by the boy she would pay me back as soon as they bought oil the boy said he would stop on his way home and take the oil to her but he never did stop or perhaps he never went back and about five o'clock i began to get dreadfully worried for i knew if that lamp wasn't in my sister-in-law's window by dark she might be a widow before midnight so i said to myself i've got to get that oil to her no matter what happens or how it's done 
of course i couldn't tell what might happen but there was only one way it could be done and that was for me to get into the boat that was tied to the post down by the water and take it to her for it was too far for me to walk around by the head of the bay now the trouble was i didn't know no more about a boat and the managing of it than any one of you sailormen knows about clear starching but there wasn't no use of thinking what i knew and what i didn't know for i had to take it to her and there was no way of doing it except in that boat so i filled a gallon can for i thought i might as well take enough while i was about it and i went down to the water and i unhitched that boat and i put the oil can into her and then i got in and off i started and when i was about a quarter mile from the shore madam interrupted captain bird did you row or or was there a sail to the boat the widow looked at the questioner for a moment no said she i didn't row i forgot to bring the oars from the house but it didn't matter for i didn't know how to use them and if there had been a sail i couldn't have put it up for i didn't know how to use it either i used the rudder to make the boat go the rudder was the only thing i knew anything about i'd held a rudder when i was a little girl and i knew how to work it so i just took hold of the handle of the rudder and turned it round and round and that made the boat go ahead you know and madam exclaimed captain bird and the other elderly mariners took their pipes from their mouths yes that is the way i did it continued the widow briskly big steamships are made to go by a propeller turning round and round at their back ends and i made the rudder work in the same way and i got along very well too until suddenly when i was about a quarter of a mile from the shore the most terrible and awful storm arose there must have been a typhoon or a cyclone out at sea for the waves came up the bay bigger than houses and when they got to the head of the bay they turned around and tried to get out to sea again so in this way they continually met and made the most awful and roaring piling up of waves that was ever known my little boat was pitched about as if it had been a feather in a breeze and when the front part of it was cleaving itself down into the water the hind part was sticking up until the rudder whizzed around like a patent churn with no milk in it the thunder began to roar and the lightning flashed and three seagulls so nearly frightened to death that they began to turn up the whites of their eyes flew down and sat on one of the seats of my boat forgetting in that awful moment that man was their natural enemy i had a couple of biscuits in my pocket because i thought i might want a bite in crossing and i crumpled up one of these and fed the poor creatures then i began to wonder what i was going to do for things were a getting awfuler and awfuler every instant and the little boat was a heaving and a pitching and a rolling and hoisting itself up first on one end then on the other to such an extent that if i hadn't kept tight hold of the rudder handle i'd slipped off the seat i was sitting on all of a sudden i remembered the oil in the can but just as i was putting my fingers on the cork my conscience smote me am i going to use this oil i said to myself and let my sister-in-law's husband be wrecked for want of it and then i thought that he wouldn't want it at all that night and perhaps they would buy oil the next day and so i poured out about a tumbler full of it on the water and i can just tell you sailor men that you never saw anything act as prompt as that did in three seconds or perhaps five the water all around me for the distance of a small front yard was just as flat as a table and as smooth as glass and so inviting in appearance that the three gulls jumped out of the boat and began to swim about on it priming their feathers and looking at themselves in the transparent depths though i must say that one of them made an awful face as he dipped his bill into the water and tasted kerosene now i had time to sit quiet in the midst of the placid space i had made for myself and rest from working of the rudder truly it was a wonderful and marvelous thing to look at the waves was roaring and leaping up all around me higher than the roof of this house and sometimes their tops would reach over so that they nearly met and shut out all view of the stormy sky which seemed as if it was being torn to pieces by blaze and lightning while the thunder pealed so tremendous that it almost drowned the roar of the waves not only above and all around me was everything terrific and fearful but even under me it was the same for there was a big crack in the bottom of the boat as wide as my hand and through this i could see down into the water beneath and there was madam ejaculated captain bird the hand which had been holding his pipe a few inches from his mouth now dropping to his knee and at this motion the hands which held the pipes of the three other mariners dropped to their knees of course it sounds strange continued the widow but i know that people can see down into clear water and the water under me was clear and the crack was wide enough for me to see through and down under me was sharks and swordfishes and other horrible water creatures which i had never seen before all driven into the bay i haven't a doubt by the violence of the storm out at sea the thought of my being upset and fallen in among those monsters made my very blood run cold and involuntary like i began to turn the handle of the rudder and in a moment i shot into a wall of raging sea water that was towering around me for a second i was fairly blinded and stunned but i had the cork out of that oil can in no time and very soon you'd scarcely believe it if i told you how soon i had another placid mill pond surrounding of me i sat there panting and fanning with my straw hat for you better believe i was flustered and then i began to think how long it would take me to make a line of mill ponds clean across the head of the bay and how much oil it would need and whether i had enough 
So I sat and calculated that if a tumbler full of oil would make a smooth place about seven yards across, which I should say was the width of the one I was in, which I calculated by a measure of my eye as to how many breadths of carpet it would take to cover it, and if the bay was two miles across betwixt our house and my sister-in-law's, and although I couldn't get the thing down to exact figures, I saw pretty soon that I wouldn't have oil enough to make a level cutting through all those mountainous billows, and besides, even if I had enough to take me across, what good would be the use of going if there wasn't any oil left to fill my sister-in-law's lamp? While I was thinking and calculating, a perfectly dreadful thing happened, which made me think, if I didn't get out of this pretty soon, I'd find myself in a mighty risky predicament. The oil can, which I had forgotten to put the cork in, toppled over, and before I could grab it, every drop of the oil ran into the hind part of the boat, where it was soaked up by a lot of dry dust that was there. No wonder my heart sank when I saw this. Glancing wildly around me, as people will do when they are scared, I saw the smooth place I was in getting smaller and smaller, for the kerosene was evaporating as it will do even off woolen clothes if you give it time enough. The first pond I had come out of seemed to be covered up, and the great tower and throb and precipice of sea water was a-closing around me. Casting down my eyes in despair, I happened to look through the crack in the bottom of the boat, and oh, what a blessed relief it was! For down there everything was smooth and still, and I could see the sand on the bottom as level and hard, no doubt, as it was on the beach. Suddenly the thought struck me that the bottom would give me the only chance I had of getting out of the frightful fix I was in. If I could fill that oil can with air, and then putting it under my arm and taking a long breath, if I could drop down on that smooth bottom, I might run along toward shore as fast as I could, and then, when I felt my breath was given out, I could take a pull at the oil can and take another run, and then take another pull and another run, and perhaps the can would hold air enough for me until I got near to shore to wade to dry land. To be sure, the sharks and other monsters were down there, but then they must have been awfully frightened, and perhaps they might not remember that man was their natural enemy. Anyway. I thought it would be better to try the smooth water passage down there than stay and be swallowed up by the raging waves on top. So I blew the can full of air and corked it, and then I tore up some of the boards from the bottom of the boat so as to make a hole big enough for me to get through. And you sailor men needn't wriggle so when I say that, for you all know a diving bell hasn't any bottom at all, and the water never comes in. And so when I got the hole big enough, I took the oil can under my arm and was just about to slip down through it when I saw an awful turtle walking through the sand at the bottom. Now, I might trust sharks and swordfishes and sea serpents to be frightened and forget about their natural enemies, but I never could trust a gray turtle as big as a cart, with a black neck a yard long, with yellow bags to its jaws, to forget anything or remember anything. I'd as leave get into a bathtub with a live crab as go down there. It wasn't of no use so much as thinking of it, so I gave up that plan and didn't once look through that hole again. And what did you do, madam? asked Captain Bird, who was regarding her with a face of stone. I used electricity, she said. Now don't start as if you had a shock of it. That's what I used. When I was younger than I was then, and sometimes visited friends in the city, we often amused ourselves by rubbing our feet on the carpet until we got ourselves so full of electricity that we could put up our fingers and light the gas. So I said to myself that if I could get full electricity for the purpose of lighting the gas, I could get full of it for other purposes, and so, without losing a moment, I set to work. I stood up on one of the seats, which was dry, and rubbed the bottoms of my shoes backward and forward on it with such violence and swiftness that they pretty soon got warm and I began filling with electricity, and when I was fully charged with it from my toes to the top of my head, I just sprang into the water and swam ashore. Of course I couldn't sink, being full of electricity. Captain Bird heaved a long sigh and rose to his feet, whereupon the other mariners rose to their feet. Madam, said Captain Bird, what's to pay for the supper and the rest of the entertainment? The supper is twenty-five cents apiece, said Widow Ducket, and everything else is free, gratis. Whereupon each mariner put his hand into his trousers pocket, pulled out a silver quarter, and handed it to the widow. Then with four solemn good evenings, they went out to the front gate. Cast off, Captain Jenkinson, said Captain Bird, and you, Captain Burris, clue him up a forward. You can stay in the bow, Captain Sanderson, and take the sheet lines. I'll go aft. All being ready, each of the elderly mariners clambered over a wheel, and having seated themselves, they prepared to lay their course for Cuppertown. But just as they were about to start, Captain Jenkinson asked that they lay to a bit, and clambering down over his wheel, he re-entered the front gate and went up to the door of the house, where the widow and Dorcas were still standing. "'Madam,' said he, "'I just came back to ask what became of your brother-in-law through his wife's not being able to put no light in the window.' The storm drove him ashore on our side of the bay, said she, and the next morning he came up to our house, and I told him all that had happened to me. And when he took our boat and went home and told that story to his wife, she just packed up and went out west and got divorced from him, and it served him right, too. Thank you, ma'am, said Captain Jenkinson, and going out of the gate he clambered up over the wheel, and the wagon cleared for Cuppertown. 
when the elderly mariners were gone the widow ducket still standing in the door turned to dorcas think of it she said to tell all that to me in my own house and after i had opened my one jar of brandied peaches that i've been keeping for special company in your own house ejaculated dorcas and not one of them brandied peaches left the widow jingled the four corners in her hand before she slipped them into her pocket anyway dorcas she remarked i think we can now say we are square with all the world and so let's go in and wash the dishes yes said dorcas we're square end of section eleven national short stories volume one american stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 12. The Count and the Wedding Guest by O. Henry. One evening, when Andy Donovan went to dinner at his Second Avenue boarding house, Mrs. Scott introduced him to a new boarder. A young lady miss conway miss conway was small and unobtrusive she wore a plain snuffy brown dress and bestowed her interest which seemed languid upon her plate she lifted her diffident eyelids and shot one perspicuous judicial glance at mr donovan politely murmured his name and returned to her mutton mr donovan bowed with the grace and beaming smile that were rapidly winning for him social business and political advancement and erased the snuffy brown one from the tablets of his consideration two weeks later andy was sitting on the front steps enjoying his cigar there was a soft rustle behind and above him and andy turned his head and had his head turned just coming out the door was miss conway she wore a night black dress of crepe de crepe de or this thin black goods her hat was black and from it dropped and fluttered an ebon veil filmy as a spider's web she stood on the top step and drew on black silk gloves not a speck of white or a spot of color about her dress anywhere her rich golden hair was drawn with scarcely a ripple into a shining smooth knot low on her neck her face was plain rather than pretty but it was now illuminated and made almost beautiful by her large gray eyes that gazed above the houses across the street into the sky with an expression of the most appealing sadness and melancholy gather the idea girls all black you know with the preference for crepe de old oh, crepe de chine that's it all black and that sad far away look and the hair shining under the black veil you have to be a blonde of course and try to look as if although your young life had been blighted just as it was about to give a hop skip and a jump over the threshold of life a walk in the park might do you good and be sure to happen out the door at the right moment and oh it'll fetch em every time but it's fierce now how cynical i am ain't it to talk about morning costumes this way Mr. Donovan suddenly reinscribed Miss Conway upon the tablets of his consideration. He threw away the remaining inch and a quarter of his cigar, that would have been good for eight minutes yet, and quickly shifted his centre of gravity to his low-cut patent leathers. "'It's a fine clear evening, Miss Conway,' he said, and if the weather bureau could have heard the confident emphasis of his tones, it would have hoisted the square white signal and nailed it to the mast." To them that has the heart to enjoy it, it is Mr. Donovan, said Miss Conway, with a sigh. Mr. Donovan, in his heart, cursed fair weather, heartless weather. It should hail and blow and snow to be consonant with the mood of Miss Conway. I hope none of your relatives, I hope you haven't sustained a loss, ventured Mr. Donovan. Death has claimed, said Miss Conway, hesitating, not a relative, but one who... But I will not intrude my grief upon you, Mr. Donovan. Intrude? protested Mr. Donovan. Why, say, Miss Conway, I'd be delighted. That is, I'd be sorry. I mean, I'm sure nobody could sympathize with you truer than I would. Miss Conway smiled a little smile, and, oh, it was sadder than her expression in repose. Laugh, and the world laughs with you, 
Weep, and they give you the laugh, she quoted. I have learned that, Mr. Donovan. I have no friends or acquaintances in this city, but you have been kind to me. I appreciate it highly. He had passed her the pepper twice at the table. It's tough to be alone in New York, that's a cinch, said Mr. Donovan. But say, whenever this little old town does loosen up and get friendly, it goes the limit. Say you took a little stroll in the park, Miss Conway. Don't you think it might chase away some of your mully grubs? And if you'd allow me... Thanks, Mr. Donovan. I'd be pleased to accept of the escort, if you think the company of one whose heart is filled with gloom could be anyways agreeable to you. Through the open gates of the iron-railed old downtown park, where the elect once took the air, they strolled and found a quiet bench. There is this difference between the grief of youth and that of old age. Youth's burden is lightened by as much of it as another shares. Old age may give and give, but the sorrow remains the same. He was my fiancé, confided Miss Conway at the end of an hour. We were going to be married next spring. I don't want you to think that I am stringing you, Mr. Donovan, but he was a real count. He had an estate and a castle in Italy. Count Fernando Mazzini was his name. I never saw the beat of him for elegance. Papa objected, of course, and once we eloped, but Papa overtook us and took us back. I thought sure Papa and Fernando would fight a duel. Papa has a livery business in Poughkeepsie, you know. Finally, Papa came around all right and said we might be married next spring. Fernando showed him proofs of his title and wealth and then went over to Italy to get the castle fixed up for us. Papa's very proud and when Fernando wanted to give me several thousand dollars for my trousseau, he called him down something awful. He wouldn't even let me take a ring or any presents from him. And when Fernando sailed, I came to the city and got a position as cashier in a candy store. Three days ago, I got a letter from Italy, forwarded from Poughkeepsie, saying that Fernando had been killed in a gondola accident. That is why I am in mourning. My heart, Mr. Donovan, will remain forever in his grave. I guess I am poor company, Mr. Donovan, but I cannot take any interest in no one. I should not care to keep you from gaiety and your friends who can smile and entertain you. Perhaps you would prefer to walk back to the house. Now, girls, if you want to observe a young man hustle out after a pick and shovel, just tell him that your heart is in some other fellow's grave. Young men are grave robbers by nature. Ask any widow. Something must be done to restore that missing organ to weeping girls in crepe de chine. Dead men certainly got the worst of it from all sides. I'm awful sorry, said Mr. Donovan gently. No, we won't walk back to the house just yet. And don't say you haven't got no friends in this city, Miss Conway. I'm awful sorry, and I want you to believe I'm your friend, and that I'm awful sorry. I've got his picture here in my locket, said Miss Conway, after wiping her eyes with her handkerchief. I never showed it to anybody, but I will to you, Mr. Donovan, because I believe you to be a true friend. Mr. Donovan gazed long and with much interest at the photograph in the locket that Miss Conway opened for him. The face of Count Mazzini was one to command interest. It was a smooth, intelligent, bright, almost a handsome face, the face of a strong, cheerful man who might well be a leader among his fellows. I have a larger one framed in my room, said Miss Conway. When we return, I will show you that. They are all I have to remind me of Fernando. But he ever will be present in my heart, that's a sure thing. A subtle task confronted Mr. Donovan, that of supplanting the unfortunate Count in the heart of Miss Conway. This his admiration for her determined him to do. But the magnitude of the undertaking did not seem to weigh upon his spirits. The sympathetic but cheerful friend was the role he essayed, and he played it so successfully that the next half hour found him conversing pensively across two plates of ice cream though there was no diminution in the sadness of Miss Conway's large grey eyes. Before they parted in the hall that evening, she ran upstairs and brought down the framed photograph wrapped lovingly in a white silk scarf. Mr. Donovan surveyed it with inscrutable eyes. He gave me this the night he left for Italy, said Miss Conway. I had one for the locket made from this. A fine-looking man, said Mr. Donovan heartily. 
how would it suit you miss conway to give me the pleasure of your company to coney next sunday afternoon a month later they announced their engagement to mrs scott and the other boarders miss conway continued to wear black a week after the announcement the two sat on the same bench in the downtown park while the fluttering leaves of the trees made a dim kinetoscopic picture of them in the moonlight but donovan had worn a look of abstracted gloom all day he was so silent tonight that love's lips could not keep back any longer the questions that love's heart propounded what's the matter andy you are so solemn and grouchy tonight nothing maggie i know better can't i tell you never acted this way before what is it it's nothing much maggie yes it is and i want to know i'll bet it's some other girl you are thinking about all right why don't you go and get her if you want her take your arm away if you please i'll tell you then said andy wisely but i guess you won't understand it exactly you've heard of mike sullivan haven't you big mike sullivan everybody calls him no i haven't said maggie and i don't want to if he makes you act like this who is he he's the biggest man in new york said andy almost reverently he can do about anything he wants to with tammany or any other old thing in the political line he's a mile high and as broad as east river you say anything against big mike and you'll have a million men on your collarbone in about two seconds why he made a visit over to the old country a while back and the kings took to their holes like rabbits well big mike's a friend of mine i ain't more than deuce high in this district as far as influence goes but mike's as good a friend to a little man or a poor man as he is to a big one i met him today on the bowery and what do you think he does comes up and shakes hands andy he says i've been keeping cases on you you've been putting in some good licks over on your side of the street and i'm proud of you what'll you take to drink he takes a cigar and i take a highball i told him i was going to get married in two weeks andy says he send me an invitation so i'll keep in mind of it and i'll come to the wedding that's what big mike says to me and he always does what he says you don't understand it maggie but i'd have one of my hands cut off to have big mike sullivan at our wedding it would be the proudest day of my life when he goes to a man's wedding there's a guy being married that's made for life now that's why i've maybe been looking sore tonight why don't you invite him then if he's so much to the mustard said maggie lightly there's a reason why i can't said andy sadly there's a reason why he mustn't be there don't ask me what it is for i can't tell you oh i don't care said maggie it's something about politics of course but it's no reason why you can't smile at me maggie said andy presently do you think as much of me as you did of your as you did of the count mazzini he waited a long time but maggie did not reply and then suddenly she leaned against his shoulder and began to cry to cry and shake with sobs holding his arm tightly and wetting the crepe de chine with tears there 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 soothed andy putting aside his own trouble and what is it now andy sobbed maggie i've lied to you and you'll never marry me or love me any more but i feel that i've got to tell andy there never was so much as a little finger of a count i never had a bow in my life but all the other girls had and they talked about em and that seemed to make the fellows like em more and andy i look swell in black you know i do so i went out to a photograph store and bought that picture and had a little one made for my locket and made up all that story about the count and about his being killed so i could wear black and nobody can love a liar and you'll shake me andy and i'll die for shame and there never was anybody i liked but you and that's all but instead of being pushed away she found andy's arm folding her closely she looked up and saw his face cleared and smiling could you could you forgive me andy sure said andy it's all right about that back to the cemetery for the count you straightened everything out maggie i was in hopes you would before the wedding day bully girl andy said maggie with a somewhat shy smile after she had been thoroughly assured of forgiveness did you believe all that story about the count well not to any large extent said andy reaching for his cigar case 
because it's big Mike Sullivan's picture you've got in that locket of yours. End of section 12National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gertrude Durrett. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 13 Miss Tooker's Wedding Gift by John Kendrick Bangs Van Buren tossed his gloves impatiently on the table, removed his overcoat, and sat down before the fire. He was apparently deeply concerned about something, for when Nicky, his Japanese valet, entered the room and placed the whiskey and soda on the little table at his side, Van Buren paid no more attention to him than he would to a vagrant sun mote that crossed his path. Long and steadily he gazed into the broad fireplace, watching the dancing flames at play, pausing only to light his pipe, upon which he pulled fiercely. Finally he spoke, leaning forward, and to all intents and purposes addressing the andirons. Confound the money, he said impatiently. I wish to thunder the governor had left it to some orphan asylum or to found a chair in Choctaw at some New England university instead of to me. Then I might have made something of myself. Here I am, 27 years old, and all the fame I ever got came from leading cotillions at Newport and my sole contribution to the common wheel has consisted of the fines I've paid into the public treasury for exceeding the speed limit. Life! I've seen a lot of it, haven't I, in this empty social shell I've been born into. He paused for a moment and poured a stiff four fingers of whiskey into a glass at his side. Bah! he shuddered as the odor of it greeted his nostrils. You're a poor kind of fuel for such an engine as I might have been if I'd been started on the right track. By Jove, Ethel is right. What good am I? What have I ever done to make myself worthwhile or to show that I have any character in me that is a jot better than that of any of the rest of our poor stenciled gold-plated society. He looked at the glass and made a wry face. I'll cut you out anyhow, he said, pushing the liquor away from him. That's something. Nicky, he called. The inscrutable Nicky obeyed the summons on the word. Take that stuff away and hereafter don't bring it unless I call for it, said Van Buren. Any letters? One, said Nicky. A messenger brought him at eight o'clock. I get it. Nicky went to the escritoire and picked up the little square of blue envelope lying thereon and handed it to Van Buren. Thank you, Nicky. You may go now. I can get along without you until, well, say noon tomorrow. Good night. Good night, said Nicky and withdrew noiselessly. Hmm, ejaculated Van Buren. Even he is worth more to the world than I am. He does something, even if it is only for me, which is more than I can do. I don't seem to be able to do anything, even for myself. With a sigh of discontent, Van Buren poked the fire for a moment and then settled himself in the armchair holding the letter before his eyes as he did so. From Ethel, he said, probably my death warrant. Oh, well, why not? If she won't have me, she won't, that's all. Only one more drop of bitters in my cocktail. I may as well read it anyhow. It's like a cold plunge and I hate to take it, but here goes. 
He tore open the envelope and, extracting the note, read it. Dear Harry, I have been thinking things over since you left me this afternoon, and I have changed my mind. Van Buren's eyes lighted with hope. I do care for you, but I cannot see much happiness ahead for either of us unless one or the other of us changes radically. It may be my fault, but I cannot forget that if I married a man, I should want always to be proud of him and ambitious for his success in the world. If I were not ambitious, I could be proud of you just as you are, for I know you for the fine fellow that you are. While you do none of the things that I should love to have my future husband do, you at least do none of those other things that men make a practice of, and that means so much misery for their womankind, whether they show it or not. But, dear Harry, why can you not make yourself more of a man than you are? Why be content with just the splendid foundation, but let it lie, gradually disintegrating because you have failed to rear upon it some kind of a superstructure that would be in keeping with what rests beneath? You can, I know you can, and that is why I have decided to withdraw what appeared to be my final answer of this afternoon, and, if you want it, to give you another chance. If I want it, ejaculated Van Buren, Lord knows how I want it. Come to me at the end of a year and show me the record of something accomplished that lifts you out of this awful social rut we have all managed to get into, and my no of this afternoon may be turned into a yes, and the misery of my heart be turned to joy. Of course you will say that it is all very easy for me to write this and to tell you to go out and do something, but that the hard thing would be to tell you what to go out and do, and you will be perfectly right. General advice is the easiest thing in the world, but the specific constructive suggestion is very different. So I will give you the specific suggestion, and it is this. Why do you not write a novel? You used in your days at Harvard to write clever skits for the lampoon, and one or two of your little stories in The Advocate showed that you at least know how to put words and sentences together in a pleasing way. Even if the themes of your stories were slight and the plots not very intricate. Do this, Harry. Surely with your experience in life, you can think of something to write about. Apply yourself to this work during the coming year. And when your book is published and has proven a success, come to me again and maybe I shall have some good news to tell you. It may be, dear Harry, that you will not think it worthwhile. For myself, I hardly think the prize is worth the winning, but you seem to feel differently about that, if I may judge from what you said this afternoon, and you did seem to mean it all, every word of it, you poor boy. We shall meet, of course, as frequently as ever, but until the year is up, at that, a year of achievement, you must not speak of this matter again, and must regard me as I shall hope in any event always to remain your devoted friend, Ethel Tucker. Van Buren laughed nervously as he finished the letter, and again lit his pipe, which had gone out while he read. Write a novel, eh? He muttered with a grin. A nice, easy task, that. A hundred and fifty thousand words, all meaning something. Ah, me. Why the dickens wasn't I born in an age when knighthood was in flower, and my lady fair set Sir Hubert upon some easy task like putting on a tin suit and going out on the highway and swatting another potted Sir Bedivere on the head with an antique axe. The quest of the golden fleece. 
was an easy stunt alongside of writing a novel these times, and I fear I'm more of a Jason than a Henry James. He turned to his desk, and the next five minutes were devoted to the writing of an acknowledgment of Miss Tooker's letter. I thank you for your suggestion, he wrote, and I truly think it will bear thinking over. Any suggestion that makes for the realization of my fondest hopes will bear thinking over, for I'm going to do what I can. I wish you had set me an easier task, however, like getting myself appointed ambassador to England or excise commissioner, for honestly, I do not feel the call of the pen. Nevertheless, my dearest Ethel, just to prove to you how honestly devoted to you I am, I shall tomorrow lay in a stock of pads, a brand new pen, and a new Roosevelt Dictionary to guide me into the shortcut to success via the reformed spelling route. I have already got my leading characters, my heroine and my hero. She is the sweetest, fairest, dearest girl in the world and is to be named Ethel. The hero is to be a miserable, down-and-out young cub of a millionaire who, having been brought up in a hothouse atmosphere, never had a chance when exposed to the chilling blasts of the world. She, of course, will redeem poor Harry, that is to be my hero's name, from the pitfalls of Bridge, Newport, and the demon rum. And, of course, she will marry him in the end. Ever your devoted Harry. P.S. As expressive of my real feelings, my story will be written in blue ink. Late one evening, six months later, Van Buren rose wearily from his desk, but with a light of triumph in his eye. There, he said, that is done. The city of credit is at least au fait accompli. 137,567 words and all about Newport, with a bit of the life of its thriving suburbs, New York and Boston, thrown in to relieve the sordidness of it all. He gazed affectionately at the pile of manuscript before him. It hasn't been half bad after all, he said. The first 10,000 words came like water from a fire hose. The second 10,000 were pure dentistry tooth-pulling extraordinary, and the rest of it, well, it is queer how when you get interested in shoveling coal, how easy it all seems. And now for the hardest end of the job, to find a publisher who is weak-minded enough to print it. This indeed proved much the hardest part of Van Buren's work, for the reluctance of the large publishing houses of New York and Boston to place their imprint upon the title page of the City of Credit became painfully evident to the youthful author. The manuscript came back to Van Buren with a frequency that was more than ominous. I think he remarked ruefully to himself upon the occasion of the sixth rejection that I have discovered the principle of perpetual motion. If there were only enough publishers in the world to last through all eternity, I could keep this manuscript going forever. Days passed, and with no glimpse of hope, until one morning, at a time when the City of Credit was about due for its thirteenth reappearance to his desk, Van Buren found in its stead a letter from Hutchins and Waterbury of Boston, apprising him of the fact that his novel had been read and was so well liked that our Mr. Waterbury will be pleased to have Mr. Van Buren call to discuss a possible arrangement under which the firm would be willing to undertake its publication. Good Lord, cried Van Buren as he read the letter over for the third time, even then barely crediting the possibilities of success that now loomed before him, and Boston people, too. Will I call? Neepy, 
pack my suitcase at once and engage a seat for me on the Knickerbocker Limited. The following morning, an interview between our Mr. Waterbury and Van Buren took place in the firm's private office on Tremont Street, Boston. It appeared that while the readers of the firm of Hutchins and Waterbury had unanimously condemned the book, Mr. Waterbury himself, having read it, rather thought it might have a living chance. Some portions of your narrative are brilliant, and some of them are otherwise, Mr. Van Buren, said Mr. Waterbury frankly. But considering the authorship of the book and that it is a description of Newport life by one who is a part of its innermost circle, I am inclined to think it will prove interesting to the public. Your picture of the social wheels within wheels is so intimate and I judge so accurate that it would attract attention. I'm glad you think so, said Van Buren with a dry throat. The idea that his book might be published after all was really overpowering. On the other hand, the judgment of our readers is so unanimously adverse that Mr. Hutchins and I feel the need of proceeding cautiously. Now, what would you say to our publishing the book on uh, your account, as it were? You want me to, began Mr. Van Buren, to pay for the plates and advertising, said Mr. Waterbury. We will stand for the paper and the binding and will act as your agents in the distribution of the book, accounting to you for every copy printed and sold. Is, uh, is that quite on regal? Asked Van Buren dubiously. It is quite customary, replied Mr. Waterbury. In fact, 90% of our business is conducted upon that basis. I see, said Van Buren. You hand us your check for $2,500 to cover the expenses I have specified, continued the astute publisher, and we will publish your book, allowing you a royalty of 50% on every copy sold. I suppose the first edition would be, said Van Buren hesitatingly, 500 copies, said Waterbury. The smaller your first edition, the sooner you are likely to go into a second. And, as you know, it is a great advantage for a book to go into a second edition quickly, if only for advertising purposes. Think it over, and let me know this afternoon, if you can. I have to leave for Chicago tonight, and if we are to have the City of Credit ready for the autumn trade, we should begin on it right away. I understand, said Van Buren. Well, I, I guess it's all right. It's only the principle of the thing. But if, as you say, it is quite customary, why, yes, I'll give you my check now. Do you want it certified? That will not be at all necessary, Mr. Van Buren, said Waterbury magnanimously. We are quite aware that your own signature to a check is a sufficient certification. The afternoon train for Newport carried Van Buren back to the social capital with a contract in his pocket, signed by Messrs. Hutchins and Waterbury, assuring the early publication of the City of Credit. But in view of certain of its financial stipulations, Jubilant as he was over the success of his first real step toward fame, Van Buren did not show it to Miss Tooker, as he might have done had it contained no reference to a check on the 10th National Bank of New York calling for the payment of $2,500 to the Boston firm of publishers. In September, the City of Credit was published and widely advertised by Messrs. Hutchins and Waterbury, and Van Buren took particular pains to secure the first copy from the press and to send it by messenger with a suitable inscription and a note to Miss Tooker. I send you my book, he wrote, not because I think it is worth reading, but for the double purpose of showing you that I have tried my best to fulfill your wishes 
and to assure the work of at least the circulation of one copy. It has all of my heart in it. For one reason or another, doubtless because there were quite 500 other novels of a similar character put forth about the same time, by the end of October, the world had not yet been consumed by any conflagration of Van Buren's lighting. The book hangs fire, said Mr. Waterbury, when Van Buren called upon him at his Boston office to inquire how things were going. We printed 500 copies, and this morning's report shows 230 still on hand. A hundred and sixty were sent for review. I wish they hadn't been, said Van Buren, with a rueful smile. They have provided just 160 separate pieces of fuel for the critics to roast me with. Have there been any favorable reviews of the book? None that I have seen, but don't you worry about that, replied Mr. Waterbury comfortingly. It's the counting room, not the critics, that tell the story. Something may happen yet to pull us out. What, for instance, asked Van Buren. Oh, I don't know, said Waterbury. You might do something sensational and get it in the papers. That would help. It's up to you, Mr. Van Buren. I guess I'm all in, said Van Buren to himself as he walked down Tremont Street. Up to me to do something? By Jove! He interrupted himself abruptly. He had suddenly espied a copy of the City of Credit in a shop window. Up to me, is it? Well, I think I shall rise to the occasion and not by doing anything sensational either. He entered the shop. I want six copies of the City of Credit, he said quietly to the salesman. It's a first-class story. Much of a demand for it? No, said the salesman. We have only the window copy, and we've had that over a month. I can get them for you, however. All right, said Van Buren. Just send them to Charles H. Harney, the Helican Club, New York. I'll pay for them now. Van Buren paid his bill, and returning to the street, hailed a hansom. Take me to some good bookshop, he said to the cabbie. Instanter, he was whirled around into Winter Street, where stands one of Boston's most famous literary distributing centers. Have you the city of credit? He asked the salesman. I think we have a copy in stock, replied the latter. If we have it, we can get it for you. Do so, please, said Van Buren. I want a dozen copies. Send them by express to Charles H. Harney, the Helican Club, New York. How much? It's a dollar and a half book, I think, said the clerk. The discount will make it one dollar twenty. A dozen, did you say? Twenty-five cents expressage. That will make it fourteen dollars sixty-five cents. Van Buren paid up without a whisper. Once in the handsome again, he called up through the little hole in the top. Isn't there any other bookshop in town where I can get what I want, he demanded. There's a dozen of them, replied the cabbie. Then go to them all. That night when Van Buren started for New York, he had purchased a hundred and fifty copies of the City of Credit and had ordered them all to be addressed to the clerk at the Helican Club with whom, upon his arrival in town, he arranged for their immediate reshipment to the Harrison Safety Deposit Storage Company on 42nd Street. I'm going to have my happiness if I had to buy it, Van Buren muttered doggedly as he crept into bed shortly after midnight. And then, tossing sleeplessly in his bed, and at last rejoicing in the possession of his late father's millions to back him in his enterprise, he laid the foundations of a plan comparable only to that of the wheat king who corners the market, or the man of cotton who loads himself up with more bales of that useful commodity 
than all the fertile acres of the South could raise in seven seasons. Orders were dispatched by wire and by mail to all the booksellers in the land whose names and addresses Van Buren could get hold of. Department stores were put under contribution and their stock commandeered, and one of the biggest booms in the whole history of literature set in. The city of credit went into its second, fifth, twentieth, fiftieth large edition. Hutchins and Waterbury wrote Van Buren stating that a sudden turn in the market had made his book one of the six best sellers, not only of this century, but of all centuries. Their presses were seething to the point of white heat with the copies of the city of credit needed to supply the demand. Their binders were working day and night with a double force and their shipping department was pretty nearly swamped with the strain set upon it. Your royalty check in January 1st will be the fattest in the land, wrote Waterbury in a moment of enthusiasm. We are thinking of sending our staff of readers to the lunatic asylum and getting an entirely new set. An order for 4,000 has come in from Chicago this morning. St. Louis wants 1,500 and pretty nearly every other able-bodied town in the country is asking for from one to 150. By Christmas time, if the publisher's announcements were to be believed, the city of credit had attained to the enormous sale of 350,000, and Van Buren was in receipt of a letter from a literary periodical asking for his photograph for publication in its February issue. This brought him a realization of the fact that he might now fairly claim to be considered a literary success. At any rate, he felt that he had now a right to approach Miss Tooker with a fair prospect of receiving from her a favorable answer to the question which she had a year before left an open one. An event showed that his feeling was justified for two days later, he enjoyed the blissful sensation of finding himself the accepted lover of the woman he had tried so hard to please. Is it to be yes, he whispered as they sat together in the conservatory of her father's city house. It has always been yes, she replied softly. And then what happened is not for your eyes or mine. Suffice it to say that Van Buren moved immediately from sordid old New York to become a dweller in the higher altitude of Elysium. Incidentally, the boom of the city of credit stopped almost as suddenly as it had begun. There was nobody, apparently, who had felt called upon to throw in the necessary number of dollars to sustain an already stimulated market which puzzled Messrs. Hutchins and Waterbury exceedingly. They had hoped to live for the balance of their days upon the profits of their world's best seller. As the spring approached and the day set for Miss Tooker's wedding to Van Buren came nearer, the latter found himself daily becoming more and more a prey to conscience. There was a decidedly large fly in the amber of his happiness for as he viewed the part he had played in the forced success of the city of credit, he began to see it in its true light. The 1st of March brought him his royalty check from Hutchins and Waterbury, and it was, as had been predicted, gratifyingly large and reduced materially what he had called his campaign expenses. In the same mail, however, was a bill from the storage company in one of whose spacious chambers there reposed more copies of his novel than he liked to think. Over 250,000, the actual sales had been 260,000 in spite of the published announcements of a higher figure. The firm had 30 or 40,000 on hand, printed in a moment of confident enthusiasm when the flurry was at its height. Both communications brought before Van Buren's mind's eye 
all too vividly the specter of his duplicity, and he was too much of a man of conscience to be able to put it lightly aside. He tried to console himself with the idea that all is fair in love and war, but he could not, and his remorse caused him many a sleepless night. Finally, it was on the eve of the posting of the wedding invitations, scruple overcame him, and he resolved that he could not honestly lead his bride to the altar with such a record of deceit upon his escutcheon, especially in view of the fact that it was through this deceit that his happiness had been won. It is better to lose her before the ceremony than after it, he told himself. And bitter though the confidence might be, he made up his mind to tell Miss Tooker everything. Only I must break it gently, he observed. With this difficult errand in mind, he called upon his fiancée, and after the usual greeting, he started in on his confession. He had hardly begun it, however, when his courage failed him, and with the oozing of that, his words failed him also. He did have the courage, however, to seek to reveal the exact situation in another way. Ethel, dear, he said, awkwardly fumbling his gloves, I want to show you something. I have a a little surprise for you. The girl eyed him narrowly. For me, she said. Yes, he answered. The fact is, it's, it's a sort of wedding present I have for you, and I think you ought to see it before, well, now. Will you go? Miss Tooker was interested at once, and, taking a hansom, they were driven to the Harrison Storage Warehouse, on 42nd Street. Arrived there, Van Buren led her to the elevator and thence up to the small room in which lay the corroding and telltale packages and enormous bulk that were slowly but surely eating up his happiness. Why, Harry, she cried as she gazed in bewilderment at the huge pile of unopened bundles. Are these all for me? Yes, gulped Van Buren, his face flaming. But what do they contain? she asked. Two hundred and fifty thousand copies of my, my book, The City of Credit, said Van Buren, his eyes cast down. You mean that you? she began. Yes, it's exactly that, Ethel. I, I bought them all to, well, to boom the sales and to make a name for myself in the world, he said sheepishly, or rather for you, but I suppose now that you know. Then all this tremendous sale was arranged between you and your publishers to deceive me, she asked. Not at all, protested the unhappy Van Buren. On the contrary, I did it all myself. Hutchins and Waterbury don't know any more about it than you did an hour ago. No one knows except you and I. Van Buren paused. I could not let you marry me without knowing what I had done, he said. It would not be fair to, to our future. Tell me all about it, she said quietly, and Van Buren made his confession complete. He told her of his interview with Waterbury, how the latter had told him his book had fallen flat, how it was up to him to do something, how a sight of a single copy of the City of Credit in the Tremont Street shop window had tempted him first into a retail fall which had grown ultimately into a wholesale crime, as he put it. He did not spare himself in the least degree, humiliating as a narration of his story was to him. I suppose it is all up with me now, he said ruefully when he had finished. I don't know, said Ethel quietly. I don't know, Harry. Perhaps. Take me home, please. I want to show you something. The drive back to the Tooker mansion was taken in silence. Van Buren despised himself too strongly to be able to speak, and Miss Tooker had fallen into a deep reverie which the poor fellow at her side feared meant 
irrevocable ruin to his hopes. Come in, said Miss Tooker gravely, as the cab drew up at the house. I want to take you up into our attic storeroom and then ask you a plain question. Harry, and then I want you to answer that question simply and truthfully. Marveling much, Van Buren permitted himself to be led to the topmost floor of Miss Tooker's house. Look in there, said she, opening the door of the storeroom. Do you see those packages? Yes, he said. They look very much like mine, only there are fewer. Do you know what they contain, she asked. Book, queried Van Buren, entering the room and tapping one of the bundles. Yes, yours. Your books, 5,310 copies of the City of Credit. Harry, she said with a ruthful smile. You, he ejaculated hoarsely. Yes, I bought them all. Some in Newport, some in New York, some at Lenox, oh, everywhere. Now tell me this, she interrupted. Do you suppose that I would condemn you for doing on a large scale what I have been doing on a smaller scale ever since last November. A ray of hope dawned in Van Buren's eyes. Ethel, he cried, seizing her by the hand. You bought all those for me? I certainly did, Harry, she said quietly, with my pin money and my bridge money and all the other kinds of money that I could wheedle out of my dear old daddy. But answer me. Have I the right to sit in judgment on you? Not by a long shot, cried Van Buren. It would be an act of the most consummate hypocrisy. That is the way I look at it, dear, she whispered. And then, well, all I have to say is that I don't believe anything like what happened at that precise moment ever happened in an attic storeroom before. And the wedding invitations were mailed that very evening. End of section 13. Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton, Section 14. The Fable of the Two Mandolin Players and the Willing Performer, by George Ade. A very attractive debutante knew two young men, who called on her every Thursday evening and brought their mandolins along. They were conventional young men, of the kind that you see wearing spring overcoats in the clothing advertisements. One was named Fred, and the other was Eustace. The mothers of the neighborhood often remarked, What perfect manners Fred and Eustace have! Merely as an aside, it may be added that Fred and Eustace were more popular with the mothers than they were with the younger set, although no one could say a word against either of them. Only it was rumored in keen society that they didn't belong. The fact that they went calling in a crowd and took their mandolins along may give the acute reader some idea of the life that Fred and Eustace held out to the young women of their acquaintance. The debutante's name was Myrtle. Her parents were very watchful, and did not encourage her to receive callers, except such as were known to be exemplary young men. Fred and Eustace were a few of those who escaped the blacklist. Myrtle always appeared to be glad to see them, and they regarded her as a darned swell girl. Fred's cousin came from St. Paul on a visit, and one day, in the street, he saw Myrtle, and noticed that Fred tipped his hat and gave her a stage smile. "'O oh, Queen of Sheba!' explained the cousin from St. Paul, whose name was Gus, as he stood stock-still and watched Myrtle's reversible plaid disappear around a corner. "'She's a bird. Do you know her well?' "'I know her quite well,' replied Fred, coldly. "'She is a charming girl.' "'She is all of that. You are a great describer. And now what night are you going to take me round to call on her?' Fred very naturally hemmed and hawed. It must be remembered that Myrtle was a member of an excellent family, and had been schooled in the proprieties, and it was not to be supposed that she would crave the society of slangy old Gus, who had an abounding nerve, and furthermore was as fresh as the mountain air. 
He was the kind of fellow who would see a girl twice, and then, upon meeting her the third time, he would go up and straighten her cravat for her, and call her by her first name. Put him into a strange company, en route to a picnic, and by the time the baskets were unpacked he would have a blonde all to himself, and she would have traded her fan for his college pin. If a fair looker on the street happened to glance at him hard, he would run up and seize her by the hand, and convince her that they had met, and he always got away with it, too. In a department store, while awaiting for the cash boy to come back with the change, he would find out the girl's name, her favorite flower, and where a letter would reach her. Upon entering a parlor car at St. Paul, he would select a chair next to the most promising one in sight, and ask her if she cared to have the shade lowered. Before the train cleared the yards, he would have the porter bringing a footstool for the lady. At Hastings he would be asking her if she wanted something to read. At Red Wing he would be telling her that she resembled Maxine Elliot, and showing her his watch left to him by his grandfather, a prominent Virginian. At La Crosse he would be reading the menu card to her, and telling her how different it is when you have someone to join you in a bite. At Milwaukee he would go out and buy a bouquet for her, and when they rode into Chicago they would be looking but of the same window, and he would be arranging for her baggage with the transfer man. After that they would be old friends. Now, Fred and Eustace had been at school with Gus, and they had seen his work, and they were not disposed to introduce him into one of the most exclusive homes in the city. They had known Myrtle for many years, but they did not dare to address her by her first name, and they were positive that if Gus attempted any of his usual tactics with her she would be offended, and naturally enough they would be blamed for bringing him to the house. But Gus insisted. He said he had seen Myrtle, and she suited him from the ground up, and he proposed to have friendly doings with her. At last they told him they would take him if he promised to behave. Fred warned him that Myrtle would frown down any attempt to be familiar on short acquaintance, and Eustace said that as long as he had known Myrtle he had never presumed to be free and forward with her. He had simply played the mandolin. That was as far along as he had ever got. Gus told them not to worry about him. All he asked was a start. He said he was a willing performer, but as yet he never had been disqualified for crowding. Fred and Eustace took this to mean that he would not overplay his attentions, so they escorted him to the house. As soon as he had been presented, Gus showed her where to sit on the sofa. Then he placed himself about six inches away and began to buzz, looking her straight in the eye. He said that when he first saw her he mistook her for Miss Prentice, who was said to be the most beautiful girl in St. Paul. Only, when he came closer, he saw that it couldn't be Miss Prentice, because Miss Prentice didn't have such lovely hair. Then he asked her the month of her birth and told her fortune, thereby coming nearer to holding her hand within eight minutes than Eustace had come in a lifetime. "'Play something, boys,' he ordered, just as if he had paid them money to come along and make music for him. They unlimbered their mandolins and began to play a Sousa march. He asked Myrtle if she had seen the new moon. She replied that she had not. So they went outside. When Fred and Eustace finished the first piece, Gus appeared at the open window and asked them to play the Georgia Camp Meeting, which had always been one of his favorites. So they played that, and when they had concluded there came a voice from the outer darkness, and it was the voice of Myrtle. She said, I'll tell you what to play. Play the intermezzo. Fred and Eustace exchanged glances. They began to perceive that they had been backed into a siding. With a few potted palms in front of them, and two cards from the Union, they would have been just the same as a hired orchestra. But they played the intermezzo and felt peevish. Then they went to the window and looked out. Gus and Myrtle were sitting in the hammock, which had quite a pitch toward the center. Gus had braced himself by holding to the back of the hammock. He did not have his armor on Myrtle, but he had it extended in a line parallel with her back. What he had done wouldn't justify a girl in saying, Sir! but it started a real scandal with Fred and Eustace. They saw that the only way to get even with her was to go home without saying good night, so they slipped out the side door, shivering with indignation. After that, for several weeks, Gus kept Myrtle so busy that she had no time to think of considering other candidates. He sent books to her mother and allowed the old gentleman to take chips away from him at poker. They were married in the autumn, and father-in-law took Gus into the firm saying that he had needed a good pusher for a long time. At the wedding, the two mandolin players were permitted to act as ushers. Moral. To get a fair trial of speed, use a pacemaker. End of section 14.
National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina Anderson. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 15. The Fable of the Preacher Who Flew His Kite, But Not Because He Wished to Do So, by George Aid. A certain preacher became wise to the fact that he was not making a hit with his congregation. The parishioners did not seem inclined to seek him out after services and tell him he was a pansy. He suspected that they were rapping him on the quiet. The preacher knew there must be something wrong with his talk. He had been trying to expound, in a clear and straightforward manner, omitting foreign quotations, setting up for illustration of his points such historical characters as were familiar to his hearers, putting the stubby old English words ahead of the Latin, and rather flying low along the intellectual plane of the aggregation that chipped in to pay his salary. But the pew-holders were not tickled. They could understand everything he said, and they began to think he was common. So he studied the situation and decided that if he wanted to win them and make everybody believe he was a nobby and boss minister, he would have to hand out a little cuff. He fixed it up good and plenty. On the following Sunday morning, he got up in the lookout and read a text that didn't mean anything read from either direction and then he sized up his flock with a dreamy eye and said we cannot more adequately voice the poetry and mysticism of our text than in those familiar lines of the great icelandic poet ikon navroik to hold is not to have under the seared firmament where chaos sweeps and vast futility sneers at these puny aspirations there is the full reprisal when the preacher concluded this extract from the well-known Icelandic poet, he paused and looked downward, breathing heavily upon his nose, like Camille in the third act. A stout woman in the front row put on her eyeglasses and leaned forward so as not to miss anything. A venerable harness dealer over at the right nodded his head solemnly. He seemed to recognize the quotation members of the congregation glanced at one another as if to say this is certainly hot stuff the preacher wiped his brow and said he had no doubt that every one within the sound of his voice remembered what quirolius had said following the same line of thought it was quirolius who disputed the contention of the great persian theologian ramtazuk that the soul in its reaching out after the unknowable was guided by the spiritual genesis of motive rather than by mere impulse of mentality the preacher didn't know what all this meant and he didn't care but you can rest easy that the pew holders were on in a minute he talked it off in just the way that cyrano talks when he gets roxanne so dizzy that she nearly falls off the piazza the parishioners bit their lower lips and hungered for more first-class language they had paid their money for tall talk and were prepared to solve any and all styles of delivery they held on to the cushions and seemed to be having a nice time the preacher quoted copiously from the great poet amoebius he recited eighteen lines of greek and then said how true this is and not a parishioner batted an eye it was amoebius whose immortal lines he recited in order to prove the extreme error of the position assumed in the controversy by the famous italian polenta he had them going and there wasn't a thing to it when he would get tired of faking philosophy he would quote from a celebrated poet of ecuador or tasmania or some other seaport town compared with this verse all of which was the same school as the Icelandic masterpiece. The most obscure and clouded passage in Robert Browning was like a plate glass front in a State Street candy store, just after the colored boy gets through using the chamois. After that, he became eloquent and began to get rid of long Boston words that hadn't been used before that season. 
He grabbed a rhetorical Roman candle in each hand, and you couldn't see him for the sparks, after which he sank his voice to a whisper and talked about the birds and the flowers. Then, although there was no cue for him to weep, he shed a few real tears, and there wasn't a dry glove in the church. After he sat down, he could tell by the scared look of the people in front that he had made a ten strike. Did they give him the joyous palm that day? Sure. The stout lady could not control her feelings when she told him how much the sermon had helped her. The venerable harness dealer said he wished to endorse the able and scholarly criticism of Polenta. In fact, everyone said that the sermon was super fine and dandy. The only thing that worried the congregation was the fear that if it wished to retain such a whale, it might have to boost his salary. In the meantime, the preacher waited for someone to come and ask about Polenta, Mebius, Ramtazuk, Quirolius, and the great Icelandic poet Navroik. But no one had the face to step up and confess his ignorance of these celebrities. The pew-holders didn't even admit among themselves that the preacher had rung in some new ones. They stood pat and merely said it was an elegant sermon. Perceiving that they would stand for anything, the preacher knew what to do after that. Moral. Give the people what they think they want. The Shadows on the Wall by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Carolyn Glynn. She was elderly, tall, and harshly thin, with a hard colorlessness of face. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Ann Glynn, younger, stouter, and rosy of face between her crinkling puffs of gray hair, gasped by way of assent. She sat in a white flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Carolyn to her sister Mrs. Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn, the one beauty of the family. She was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking chair with her superb bulk of femininity and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanor. She was grieved over the loss of her brother. He had been the youngest, and she had been fond of him. But never had Emma Brigham lost sight of her own importance amidst the waters of tribulation. She was always awake to the consciousness of her own stability in the midst of vicissitudes and the splendor of her permanent bearing. But even her expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Carolyn's announcement and her sister Rebecca Ann's gasp of terror and distress in response. I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end, said she with an asperity which disturbed slightly the roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. Of course he did not know murmured Rebecca Ann in a faint tone strangely out of keeping with her appearance. One involuntarily looked again to be sure that such a feeble pipe came from that full, swelling chest. Of course he did not know it, said Carolyn quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange, sharp look of suspicion. How could he have known it, said she. Then she shrank as if from the other's possible answer. Of course, you and I both know that he could not, said she conclusively, but her pale face was paler than it had been before. Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs. Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in her chair. She had ceased rocking and was eyeing them both intently, with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. Given one common intensity of emotion and similar lines showed forth, and the three sisters of one race were evident. "'What do you mean?' said she, impartial to them both. Then she, too, seemed to shrink before a possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. <laughs> "'I guess you don't mean anything,' said she. But her face wore still the expression of shrinking horror. "'Nobody means anything,' said Carolyn firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. Where are you going? 
asked Mrs. Brigham. I have something to see, replied Caroline, and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. Oh, said Mrs. Brigham. After the door had closed behind Caroline, she turned to Rebecca. Did Henry have many words with him? she asked. They were talking very loud, replied Rebecca evasively, yet with an answering gleam of ready response to the other's curiosity in the quick lift of her soft blue eyes. Mrs. Brigham looked at her. She had not resumed rocking. She still sat up straight with a slight knit of intensity on her fair forehead, between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair. Did you hear anything? she asked in a low voice with a glance toward the door. I was just across the hall, in the south parlor, and that door was open, and this door ajar, replied Rebecca with a slight flush. Then you must have. I couldn't help it. Everything? Most of it? What was it? The old story. I suppose Henry was mad, as he always was, because Edward was living on here for nothing when he had wasted all the money father left him. Rebecca nodded with a fearful glance at the door. When Emma spoke again, her voice was still more hushed. I know how he felt, said she. He had always been so prudent himself, and worked hard at his profession, and there Edward had never done anything but spend, and it must have looked to him as if Edward was living at his expense, but he wasn't. No, he wasn't. It was the way father left the property, that all the children should have a home here, and he left money enough to buy the food and all, if we had all come home. Yes, and Edward had a right here according to the terms of father's will, and Henry ought to have remembered it. Yes, he ought. Did he say hard things? Pretty hard from what I heard. What? I heard him tell Edward that he had no business here at all, and he thought he had better go away. What did Edward say? That he would stay here as long as he lived, and afterward, too, if he had a mind to, and he would like to see Henry get him out, and then? What? Then he laughed. What did Henry say? I didn't hear him say anything, but... But what? I saw him when he came out of this room. He looked mad? You've seen him when he looked so. Emma nodded. The expression of horror on her face had deepened. Do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him? Yes. Don't. Then Caroline re-entered the room. She went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning. It was a cold, gloomy day of fall, and she warmed her hands, which were reddened from recent washing in cold water. Mrs. Brigham looked at her and hesitated. She glanced at the door, which was still ajar, as it did not easily shut, being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer. She rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud, which jarred the house. Rebecca started painfully with a half exclamation. Caroline looked at her disapprovingly. It's time you controlled your nerves, Rebecca, said she. I can't help it, replied Rebecca with almost a wail. I am nervous. There's enough to make me so, the Lord knows. What do you mean by that? asked Caroline, with her old air of sharp suspicion, and something between challenge and dread of its being met. Rebecca shrank. Nothing, said she then I wouldn't keep speaking in such a fashion. Emma, returning from the closed door, said impetuously that it ought to be fixed. It shut so hard. It will shrink enough after we have had the fire a few days, replied Caroline. If anything is done to it, it will be too small. There will be a crack at the sill. I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to Edward, said Mrs. Brigham abruptly, but in an almost inaudible voice. Hush! said Caroline, with a glance of actual fear at the closed door. Nobody can hear with the door shut. He must have heard it shut. And, well, I can't say. Well, I can say what I want to before he comes down, and I am not afraid of him. I don't know who is afraid of him. What reason is there for anybody to be afraid of Henry? demanded Caroline. Mrs. Brigham trembled before her sister's look. Rebecca gasped again. There isn't any reason, of course. Why should there be? I wouldn't speak so, then. Somebody might overhear you and think it was queer. Miranda Joy is in the south parlor, sewing, you know. I thought she went upstairs to stitch on the machine. She did, but she has come down again. Well, she can't hear. 
I say again, I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself. I shouldn't think he'd ever get over it, having words with poor Edward the very night before he died. Edward was enough sight better disposition than Henry, with all his faults. I always thought a great deal of poor Edward myself. Mrs. Brigham passed a large fluff of handkerchief across her face. Rebecca sobbed outright. Rebecca, said Caroline admonishingly, keeping her mouth stiff and swallowing determinately. I've never heard him speak a cross word, unless he spoke cross to Henry that last night. I don't know, but he did, from what Rebecca overheard, said Emma. Not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and aggravating, sniffled Rebecca. He never raised his voice, said Caroline, but he had his way. He had a right to in this case. Yes, he did. He had as much of a right here as Henry, sobbed Rebecca. And now he's gone, and he will never be in this home that poor father left him and the rest of us again. What do you really think ailed Edward? asked Emma, in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. Caroline sat down in a nearby armchair and clutched the arms convulsively until her thin knuckles whitened. I told you, said she. Rebecca held her handkerchief over her mouth and looked at them above it with terrified, streaming eyes. I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. You know Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs. Brigham hesitated a moment. Was there any talk of an examination, said she. Then Caroline turned on her fiercely. No, said she in a terrible voice. No. The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. It's Henry, Rebecca sighed rather than whispered. Mrs. Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush, across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back, when the door at last yielded and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs. Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face and only one small reddened ear as attentive as a dog's uncovered and revealing her alertness for his presence, at Caroline sitting with a strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly with a look of inscrutable fear and defiance of the fear and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same hard delicacy of form and feature. Both were tall and almost emaciated. Both had a sparse growth of gray blonde hair far back from high intellectual foreheads. Both had an almost noble equilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger, and an almost boyish recklessness and irresolution appeared in his face. He flung himself into a chair, with a gesture which was bewildering from its incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs. Brigham. "'I declare, Emma, you look younger every year,' he said. She flushed a little, and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise. Our thoughts today ought to belong to the one of us who will never grow older, said Caroline in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. Of course, we none of us forget that, said he in a deep, gentle voice. But we have to speak to the living, Caroline, and I have not seen Emma for a long time, and the living are as dear as the dead. Not to me, said Caroline. She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. Henry looked slowly after them. Caroline is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs. Brigham rocked. A confidence in him, inspired by his manner, was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he. It was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination? 
there was no need, I am perfectly certain, as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham felt a creep, as of some live horror over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. "'Where are you going?' asked Henry, in a strange, breathless voice. Mrs. Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing which she had to do, some black for the funeral, and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Caroline was there. She went close to her and took her hands, and the two sisters looked at each other. "'Don't speak. Don't. I won't have it,' said Caroline finally, in an awful whisper. "'I won't,' replied Emma. That afternoon the three sisters were in the study, the large front room on the ground floor across the hall from the south parlor, where the dusk deepened. Mrs. Brigham was hemming some black material. She sat close to the west window for the waning light. At last she laid her work on her lap. "'It's no use. I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light,' said she. Caroline, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca, in her usual place on the sofa. "'Rebecca, you had better get a lamp,' she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk, her face showed her agitation. "'It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamp quite yet,' she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. "'Yes, we do,' returned Mrs. Brigham peremptorily. We must have a light. I must finish this tonight, or I can't go to the funeral, and I can't see to sew another stitch. Caroline can see to write letters, and she is farther from the window than you are, said Rebecca. Are you trying to save kerosene, or are you lazy, Rebecca Glynn? cried Mrs. Brigham. I can go and get the light myself, but I have this work all in my lap. Caroline's pen stopped scratching. Rebecca, we must have the light, said she. "'Had we better have it in here?' asked Rebecca weakly. "'Of course! Why not?' cried Caroline sternly. "'I am sure I don't want to take my sewing into the other room when it's all cleaned up for tomorrow,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'Why, I never heard such a to-do about lighting a lamp!' Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently she entered with a lamp, a large one with a white porcelain shade. She set it on a table an old-fashioned card table which was placed against the opposite wall from the window. The wall was clear of bookcases and books, which were only on the three sides of the room. That opposite wall was taken up with three doors, the one small space being occupied by the table. Above the table on the old-fashioned paper of a white satin gloss, traversed by an indeterminate green scroll, hung quite high a small gilt and black framed ivory miniature taken in her girlhood of the mother of the family. When the lamp was set on the table beneath it, the tiny pretty face painted on the ivory seemed to gleam out with a look of intelligence. "'What have you put that lamp over there for?' asked Mrs. Brigham, with more of impatience than her voice usually revealed. Why didn't you set it up in the hall and have done with it? Neither Caroline nor I can see if it is on that table. I thought perhaps you would move, replied Rebecca hoarsely. If I do move, we can't both sit at that table. Caroline has her paper all spread around. Why don't you set the lamp on the study table in the middle of the room? Then we can both see. Rebecca hesitated. Her face was very pale. She looked with an appeal that was fairly agonizing at her sister, Caroline. "'Why don't you put the lamp on this table, as she says?' asked Caroline, almost fiercely. "'Why do you act so, Rebecca?' "'I should think you would ask her that,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'She doesn't act like herself at all.' Rebecca took the lamp and set it on the table in the middle of the room without another word. Then she turned her back upon it quickly and seated herself on the sofa and placed a hand over her eyes as if to shade them and remained so. Does the light hurt your eyes? And is that the reason why you didn't want the lamp? asked Mrs. Brigham kindly. I always like to sit in the dark, replied Rebecca chokingly. Then she snatched her handkerchief hastily from her pocket and began to weep. Caroline continued to write, Mrs. Brigham to sew. Suddenly, Mrs. Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again. 
and again turned to her task at last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly she looked from the wall around the room taking note of the various objects she looked at the wall long and intently then she turned to her sisters what is that said she what asked caroline harshly her pen scratched loudly across the paper rebecca gave one of her convulsive gasps that strange shadow on the wall replied mrs brigham rebecca sat with her face hidden caroline dipped her pen in the inkstand why don't you turn around and look asked mrs brigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way i am in a hurry to finish this letter if mrs wilson ebbett is going to get word in time to come to the funeral replied caroline shortly mrs brigham rose her work slipping to the floor and she began walking around the room moving various articles of furniture with her eyes on the shadow then suddenly she shrieked out look at this awful shadow what is it caroline look look rebecca look what is it all mrs brigham's triumphant placidity was gone her handsome face was livid with horror she stood stiffly pointing at the shadow look said she pointing her finger at it look what is it then rebecca burst out in a wild wail after a shuddering glance at the wall oh caroline there it is again there it is again caroline glynn you look said mrs brigham look what is that dreadful shadow caroline rose turned and stood confronting the wall how should i know she said it has been there every night since he died cried rebecca every night yes he died thursday and this is saturday that makes three nights said caroline rigidly she stood as if holding herself calm with a vise of concentrated will it it looks like like stammered mrs brigham in a tone of intense horror i know what it looks like well enough said caroline i've got eyes in my head it looks like edward burst out rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear only yes it does assented mrs brigham whose horror-stricken tone matched her sister's only oh it is awful what is it caroline i ask you again how should i know replied caroline i see it there like you how should i know any more than you it must be something in the room said mrs brigham staring wildly around we moved everything in the room the first night it came said rebecca it is not anything in the room caroline turned upon her with a sort of fury of course it is something in the room said she how you act what do you mean by talking so of course it is something in the room of course it is agreed mrs brigham looking at caroline suspiciously of course it must be it is only a coincidence it just happens so perhaps it is that fold of the window curtain that makes it it must be something in the room it is not anything in the room repeated rebecca with obstinate horror the door opened suddenly and henry glynn entered he began to speak then his eyes followed the direction of the others he stood stock still staring at the shadow on the wall it was life-size and stretched across the white parallelogram of a door half across the wall space on which the picture hung what is that he demanded in a strange voice it must be due to something in the room mrs brigham said faintly it is not due to anything in the room said rebecca again with the shrill insistency of terror how you act rebecca glynn said caroline henry glynn stood and stared a moment longer his face showed a gamut of emotions horror conviction then furious incredulity suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room he moved the furniture with fierce jerks turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall not a line of its terrible outlines wavered it must be something in the room he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash his face changed the inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident until one almost lost sight of his lineaments rebecca stood close to her sofa regarding him with woeful fascinated eyes mrs brigham clutched caroline's hand they both stood in a corner out of his way 
For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor, the sisters watching. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed and began straightening the furniture which he had flung down. What an absurdity, he said easily. Such a to-do about a shadow. That's so, assented Mrs. Brickham, in a scared voice which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. I think you have broken the chair that Edward was so fond of, said Caroline. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. Just as good as ever, he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. Did I scare you? he said. I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap to the bottom of a mystery. And that shadow does look queer, like... And I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to without any delay. You don't seem to have succeeded, remarked Caroline dryly, with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptibly. Oh, there is no accounting for shadows, he said, and he laughed again. A man is a fool to try to account for shadows. Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room. But Henry kept his back to the wall, as did indeed the others. Mrs. Brigham pressed close to Carolyn as she crossed the hall. He looked like a demon, she breathed in her ear. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk, her knees trembled so. I can't sit in that room again this evening, she whispered to Carolyn after supper. Very well, we will sit in the south room, replied Carolyn. I think we will sit in the south parlor, she said aloud. It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold. So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper, his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock, he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study. The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs. Brigham rose, folded her rustling skirts compactly around her, and began tiptoeing toward the door. What are you going to do? inquired Rebecca agitatedly. I am going to see what he is about, replied Mrs. Brigham cautiously. She pointed as she spoke to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it had somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. The hall lamp was not lit. You had better stay where you are, said Caroline with guarded sharpness. I am going to see, repeated Mrs. Brigham firmly. Then she folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk with its swelling curves was revealed in a black silk sheath, and she felt with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. In the south room Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Caroline sewed steadily. What Mrs. Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glynn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systematic passes and thrusts all over and through the intervening space with an old sword which had belonged to his father. Not an inch was left unpierced. He seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light. The shadow remained unmoved. Mrs. Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. Finally, Henry ceased and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs. Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. He looked like a demon, she said again. Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Carolyn? I don't feel as if I could stand much more. Indeed, she looked overcome. Her handsome, placid face was worn and strained and pale. Yes, there's plenty, said Carolyn. You can have some when you go to bed. I think we had all better take some, said Mrs. Brigham. Oh, my God, Carolyn, what? Don't ask and don't speak, said Carolyn. No, I am not going to, replied Mrs. Brigham, but... 
Rebecca moaned aloud. What are you doing that for? asked Caroline harshly. Poor Edward, returned Rebecca. That is all you have to groan for, said Caroline. There is nothing else. I am going to bed, said Mrs. Brigham. I shan't be able to be at the funeral if I don't. Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, and the south parlor was deserted. Caroline called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room, bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He set it on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible. His fair complexion showed livid. His blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took the lamp up and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the center table, and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his former frenzy, nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table, and the shadow sprang out upon the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs. Brigham and the other sisters, who could not sleep, heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast, Henry Glynn announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. He was a physician. How can you leave your patients now? asked Mrs. Brigham wonderingly. I don't know how to, but there is no other way, replied Henry easily. I have had a telegram from Dr. Mitford. Consultation? inquired Mrs. Brigham. I have business, replied Henry. Dr. Mitford was an old classmate of his who lived in a neighboring city and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. After he had gone, Mrs. Brigham said to Carolyn that after all Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr. Mitford, and she thought it very strange. Everything is very strange, said Rebecca with a shudder. What do you mean? inquired Carolyn sharply. Nothing, replied Rebecca. Nobody entered the library that day, nor the next, nor the next. The third day, Henry was expected home, but he did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. I call it pretty queer work, said Mrs. Brigham. The idea of a doctor leaving his patients for three days anyhow, at such a time as this, and I know he has some very sick ones, he said so, and the idea of a consultation lasting three days, there is no sense in it. And now he has not come. I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlor. There was no light in the study opposite, and the door was ajar. Presently Mrs. Bigham rose. She could not have told why. Something seemed to impel her. Some will outside her own. She went out of the room, again wrapping her rustling skirts around that she might pass noiselessly, and began pushing at the swollen door of the study. She has not got any lamp, said Rebecca in a shaking voice. Carolyn, who was writing letters, rose again, took a lamp, there were two in the room, and followed her sister. Rebecca had risen, but she stood trembling, not venturing to follow. The doorbell rang, but the others did not hear it. It was on the south door, on the other side of the house from the study. Rebecca, after hesitating until the bell rang the second time, went to the door. She remembered that the servant was out. Carolyn and her sister Emma entered the study. Carolyn set the lamp on the table. They looked at the wall. Oh, my God, gasped Mrs. Brigham. There are, there are two shadows. The sisters stood clutching each other, staring at the awful things on the wall. Then Rebecca came in, staggering, with a telegram in her hand. Here is telegram, she gasped. Henry is dead. End of section 15.
National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kay Hand. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 16. Major Perdue's Bargain, by Joel Chandler Harris. When next I had an opportunity to talk with Aunt Minervy Ann, she indulged in a hearty laugh before saying a word, and it was some time before she found her voice. "'What is so funny today?' I inquired. "'Misa, nothing tall about me, and taint only today, nutter. It's every day since I've been big enough for to see myself in the spring branch. I laugh then, and I laugh now every time I see myself in my mind, if I got any mind. I was talking to Hamp last night and telling him how I start in to tell you something about Marsh Paul Conant shoulder, and then end up by telling you everything else I know but dat. Hamp low, he did. That ain't nothing, because when I ax you to marry me, you start in and tell me about a nigger girl crossed our in Jasper County, which she make promise fer to marry a man, and she crossed her heart, and then when the time come, she stood up and marry him, and find out taint the same man, but somebody what she ain't never see before. I spect that so, sir, because they was something like that happened in Jasper County. You know the Waters family. They keep the racehorses. Well, sir, twas right on their plantation. Warren Waters told me about that hisself. He was the hoss trainer, and he's a right dar on the ground. When the gal done married, she look up and holler, You ain't my husband, because I ain't make no promise fer to marry you. The man he laugh and say, Don't need no promise atter you done married. Well, sir, they say that girl was scared, scared for true. She sot on look in her fire. The man sot and look at her. She tried her slip out to dough, and he slipped with her. She walked out towards the big house, and he walked out with her. She came back, and he came with her. She run, and he run with her. She cry, and he laugh at her. She done her what to do. By and by, she took a notion that the man might be old boy hisself, and she dropped down on her knees and gun to pray. This make the man restless, look like he frettin'. Then he gun to shake, like he havin' chill. Then he slipped down out in the cheer. Then he went on his all force. Then his clothes dropped off, and bless gracious dar he was, a great big black shaggy dog with a short chain round his neck. Someone flung a chunk of fire at him, and he ran out howlin'. That was the last they seed on him, sir. They flung his clothes into fire, and they make a blaze that come plumb out ter the top of chimbley stack. That what make me tell Hamp about it, sir. He axed me fer to marry him, and I want so mighty sure that he wasn't the old boy. Well, that is queer if true, said I. But how about Mr. Conant's crippled shoulder? Oh, it's the truth, sir. Warren Waters told me dat out in his own mouth, and he was right dar. I don't know but what the gal was Summerhurst Kinnery. I don't mind telling you that about Mars Paul, sir, but you mustn't let on about it, because Mars Tumlin and Mess Valley day as titches about that as they can be. I'd never get der forgivens if they knowed I was sitting down here tellin' about that. You know how twas in dem days. De folks that was de richest was de worstest off when de army come home from battlin'. I done told you about Mars Tumlin. He ain't had nothin' in de round world but a whole passel or land and me and Miss Valley. I don't count hemp, because hemp froos to believe he free. Twelly ramble round and find out the powder rollers ain't going to take him up. That how come I had to sell ginger cakes and chicken pies that time. The money I made at that ain't last long because Mars Tumlin he been used to rich fiddlers, and he went right down town and got in a bottle of chow chow and some olives and some sardines and some cheese and you know yourself, sir, that money ain't going to last when you buy that kind of doings. Well, sir, we done mighty well whilst the money held out. But taint court week all the time, and when dat the case, money got ter come from somewhere else side selling cakes and pies. By and by, Hamp, he got work at the Liberty Stable, where they hire out hosses and board em. I call it a hoss tavern, sir, but Hamp, he low it's a Liberty Stable. Anyhow, he got work dar, and that sort of help out. Sometimes he'd growl because I took his money fer to help out my white folks, but when he got right mad, I'd give Miss Valley the wink, and she'd say, Hampton, how'd you like ter have a little dram tonight? You look like you are tired. I could have hugged her for the way she done it, and she is that cute. And then Hamp, he grin and low, I ain't honin' for it, Miss Valley, but twon't do me no harm, and it may do me good. And then, sir, he'd set down, and atter he sort of warmed up with the dram, he'd kind of roll his eyes and low, Miss Valley, she is a fine white woman. Well, sir, tain't long for we had that nigger man trained, done trained, bless you, soul. One day Miss Valley had to go cross town, and she went by the Liberty Stable where Hamp was at, leastways he seed her summers, and he came home that night looking like he was feeling bad. He refused to talk. 
by and by at her his supper he say i seed miss valley down town ter day she was wid miss irene and dat dar frock she had on looked mighty shabby i low well it de best she got she ain't got money like the chippendales and miss irene don't keer how folks clothes look she too much quality for that hamp say why ain't you take some of your money and make miss valley get her nice frock i low war i got any money hamp he hit his pocket and say you got it right here and show sure enough sir dat nigger man had roller money most twenty dollars some hoss drovers had come long and hamp made dat money by trimming up the old mules they had and making em look young he's got the art der dat sir and dey paid him well dar was de money but how was i going to get it in miss valley's hand i can buy vittles and she not know where to come from but when it come to buying frocks well sir it stumped me dey want but one way ter do it and i done it i make like i was mad i tucked de money and went in de house dar where miss valley was sewing and mending i went stomping in i did and when i got in i started my tune i lo if de perdue's gwin to go scandalizin de self by trottin down town in broad daylight with all kind of frocks on der back i gwin way from here and i don't know but what i'll go anyhow tain't because dey's any lack er money for here de money right here with that i slammed it down on de table dar take dat and get you a frock dat'll make you look like something when you go outside this house and whiles you're gettin get something fur to put on your head whether it was by reason of a certain dramatic faculty inherent in her race that she was able to summon emotions at will or whether it was a mere unconscious reproduction i am not prepared to say but certain it is that in voice and gesture in tone and attitude and in a certain passionate earnestness of expression aunt minervy ann built up the whole scene before my eyes with such power that i seemed to have been present when it occurred i felt as if she had conveyed me bodily into the room to become a witness of the episode she went on still with a frown on her face and a certain violence of tone and manner i whipped round de room a time or two picking up de cheers and slamming em down again and knocking things round like i was mad miss valley put her sewing down and lay her hand on de money she low what's dis aunt minervy ann i said hit's money dat's what tis nuttin but nasty stinkin money i wish dey wa'n't none in de world less than i had a bar full she sort of fumble at de money wid her fingers you don't know sir how white and purty and weak her hand looked to me that night she low aunt minervy ann i can't take this i blaze out at her you don't have ter take it you done got it and if you don't keep it i'll rake up every rag and scrap i got and leave this place now now you just try me again aunt minervy ann summoned to her aid the passion of a moment that had passed away and again i had the queer experience of seeming to witness the whole scene she continued with that i whipped out of the room and out of the house and went and sat down dar in my house where hamp was at hamp he low what she say i say she ain't had time ter say nothing i come way from dere he low you ain't brung dat money back is you i say does you think i'm a start naked fool he low case if you is i'll put it right sprang into fire here well sir i sought dar some little time but everything was so still in de house being smart's tumblin gone down town that i crope back and crope in fur to see what miss valley doin well sir she was cryin settin dar cryin i low honey is i say anything fur to hurt your feelings she blubber out you know you ain't and then she cry good fashion des bout dat time who should come in but mars tumlin he look at miss valley and den he look at me he say valentine what de matter i say it's me i'm de one i made her cry i done something to hurt her feelings she low taint so and you know it i'm just crying because you too good to me well sir i had ter get out of her fur to keep from choking mars tumlin follow me out and right there on de porch he low minervy ann next time don't be so damn good to her i was doing some sniffling myself about that time and i ain't carin what i say so i stop and flung back at him i'll be des as damn good to her as i please i'm free well sir stid her hittin me mars tumlin bust out laughin and long atter dat he laugh every time he look at me des like something was ticklin and mighty nigh ter death i speck he must er told bout dat cussin part because folks round here done got the idea dat i'm a sassy and bad-tempered omen if i had to work for my livin sir i bound you i'd be a long time findin a place atter dat hamp he got into legislature and it sure was a money-makin place 
Den we had everything we wanted in mo too, but by and by the legislator gun out, and den dere we was, flat as flounders, and de white folks don't want to hire Hamp just cause he been to de legislator. But he got back in de Liberty Stable at her so long a time, yet twain't what you might call a livin'. All that time I hear Marsh Tumlin talkin' ter Miss Valley about what he call his wild land. He say he got two thousand acres down dar in de wire grass, and if he can sell it he be mighty glad ter do so. Well, sir, one day, long toward night, a two hoss wagon drove in at the side gate and come in de back yard. Old Ben Sadler was drivin' and he low, Hey yo, Minervy Ann, where you want these goods dropped at? I say, Hello yourself, if you want to hello. What you got dar, and who does it belong to? He low, it's good for Major Tumlin Purdue, and whar does you want em drapped at? Well, sir, I didn't know what ter say, but I'd run and ax Miss Valley, and she say put em out anywheres round there, cause she done her nothing bout em. So old Ben Sadler he put em out, and when I come to look at em, there was a barrel or something, and a keg or something, and a box or something. The barrel shuck like it might be molasses, and the keg shuck like it might be dram, and the box hefted like it might be tobacco and show sure enough that what they was a barrel or sorghum syrup and a keg of peach brandy and a box or plug terbacker i say right then and miss valley i'll tell you the same dat marsh tumlin done gone and swap off all his wall land but miss valley she say no he won't never think or seen a thing but bless your soul sir she wa'n't nothing but a schoolgirl you may say and she don't know no more about men folks than what the weasel do and den right pawn ter top that here come a nigger boy leadin' the bobtail hoss when i see that i does good as know dat de wild land done be swap off because mars tumlin ain't got nothin fur to buy all dem things wid and i tell you right now sir i was rank mad cause what we want wid any old bobtail hoss the sorghum mought do and a dram can be put up wid and a terbacker got some comfort in it but what the name or goodness we gurn to do with our old hoss when we ain't got hardly enough vittles fur to feed herself with that's what i asked miss valley and she say right pine blank she don't know well sir it's the lord's truth i was dat mad i don't know what to say and i wasn't care nutter cause i know how we had ter pinch and squeeze fur to get long in dis house but i went bout getting supper and by and by hamp he come and i told him about the old bobtail hoss and he went out and look at him at a while here he come back laughing i say you're well to laugh at that old hoss he low i ain't laughing at the hoss i'm laughing at you gal dat the finest hoss what ever put foot on the ground in this town dat's marse paul conan's trotting hoss he'll fetch five hundred dollars any day what are you doing here i up and told him all i knowed and he shook his head he low gal you lay low dey something in her behind all dat what hamp say sort of make me put on my studying cap but when you come ter look at it sir dey wa'n't nothing tall for me to study bout all i had ter do was ter try to find out what was behind it and let it go at dat when Marsh Tumlin come home ter supper, I knowed something was de matter with him. I knowed it by his looks, sir. It sort of would folks like tis with chillin'. If you keep your something about em, you'll watch their motions, and if you watch their motions, they don't had her tell you when something's de matter. He come in so easy, sir, dat Miss Valley ain't hear him, but I hear de dope Greek, and I knowed twas him. We was talkin' and gwin at a mighty rate, and I knowed he'd done stop ter listen. Miss Valley, she low, she spec somebody made him a present of dem dar things. I say, uh huh, honey, don't play fool yourself. Ain't nobody going to do dat. Our folks ain't no more like they used ter was dan crab apples is like plums. They done come ter pass dem whatsomever day gifts. They done come ter pass dat whatsomever day dit ter hands on. They fuse to turn it loose. All in em sep Mars Tumlin Purdue. They ain't no tellin what he gun for all dat trash trash it's wussin trash i wish you'd go out dar and look at that old bobtail hoss why that old hoss was stove up long for de war by rights he ought to be in de boneyard this very minute he won't be here two whole days for you'll see de buzzards lined up out there on de back fence waitin and they won't had her wait long nutter if they send any corn here fur to feed dat bag of bones wit i'll parch on it and eat it myself fo he shall have it if anybody speck i'm gwine to tend ter dat old frame dar speckin with de wrong specks I tell you that right now. All this time, Mars Tumlin was standing out in the hall listening. Miss Valley talked mighty sweet about it. She say, "If dey ain't nobody else to tend a hoss, reckon I can do it." I lo, my life er me, honey. The next news you know, you'll be hiring out to Liberty Stable. Well, sir, my talk gun to get so hot that Mars Tumlin just had to make a fuss. 
He fumbled with de dough knob and then came walking down de hall, and by that time I was in de dining room. I walk mighty light because if he say anything I want to hear it. You can't call it eavesdropping, sir. It looked to me that twas as much my business as twas dern, and I ain't never got dat idea out of my head down to this day. But Marse Tumlin ain't say nothing, cept for ter ax Miss Valley if she feelin' well and how everything was. But the minute I hear him open his mouth, I knew he'd had trouble on his mind. I can't tell you how I knowed it, sir, but dar twas. Look like he tried to hide it because he told a whole lot of funny tales about folks and twa'n't long before he had Miss Valley laughing fit ter kill. But he ain't fool me, sir. By and by Miss Valley she come in the dining room for to look at her settin' a table, because from a little girl she always liked to have the dishes fixed us so. She was sort of humming a tune like she ain't want ter talk, but I ain't let that stand in my way. I lo, I wish everybody was like that Mr. Paul Conant. I bet you right now he been downtown dar all day making money hand over fist, just as fast as he can rake it in. I know, cause I does his washing and cleans up his room for him. Miss Valley say, well, what of it? Money don't make him no better than anybody else. I lo, it don't make him no worse, and then, sides that, he ain't going to let anybody swindle him. By that time I had to go out and fetch supper in, and tain't take me no time, because I was just aching for to hear how Marse Tumlin come by them dark contraptions and contrivances. And I stayed in there to wait on de table, which it ain't need no waiting on. At a while, I lo, Marse Tumlin, I like to forget to tell you, your things done come. He say, what things, Minerva Ann? I said, dem dar contraptions, and that dar bobtail hoss. He looked mighty lean and hungry, day hoss do, but Hump says dat's because he's a high-bred hoss. He say dem our high-breed hosses won't take on no fat, no matter how much you feed em. Marsh Tumlin sort of drum on de table. At her wally low, dey done come, is dey, Minerva Ann? I say, yes, sir, dey are right now. Hamp puts it down dat dat hoss on de gayliest creatures whatever make track in this town. Well, sir, tain't no use to tell you what else was said, cause twa'n't much. I see dat Marse Tumlin wasn't goin' talk about it, on account her bein' feared he'd hurt Miss Valley's feelings if he told her that he done swap off all dat wild land for dem our things and dat our bobtail hoss. Dat what he done? Yes, sir. I hear him say so afterwards. He swap it off to Marse Paul Conant. I thank my lord it came out all right, but it come mighty nigh bein' de ruination or de family. How was that? I inquired. That what I'm going to tell you, sir. Right out of supper that night, Marsh Tumlin say he got to go down to town for to see a man on some business, and he asked me if I won't stay in the house star with Miss Valley. Twa'n't no trouble to me, because I'd been on the place anyhow, and so when I got the kitchen cleaned up and the things put away, I went back in the house where Miss Valley was at Marsh Tumlin was done gone. Miss Valley, she sought at the table doing some kind of ruffling, so I sought back again to wall and one of them to our high back cheers. What we said, I'll never tell you, sir, because I'm one of these kinder folks who ain't no sooner set down and get stilled than they goes ter nodding. That's me. Set me down in a cheer, high back or low back, and I'm done gone. I can sit here on de step and keep these eyes wide awake as a skeered rabbit, but set me down in a cheer? Well, sir, I'd like to see anybody keep me awake when that's the case. Dar I sat in that our high back cheer, Miss Valley rufflin' and flutin' something and trying to make me talk, and my head rollin' round like my neck done broke. By and by, blam, blam, come on to dough. We got one of them our jingling bells now, sir, but in them times we had a knocker, and it sounded like the roof falling in. I liked her jumped out of my skin. Miss Valley dropped her conflutements, and lo, what in the world? Aunt Minerva Ann, go to the dough. Well, sir, I went, but I ain't had no heart in it, because I ain't knowed who it might be, and where to come from, and what they want. But I went. Twas me or Miss Valley, and I wasn't going to let that child go, not at that time or night, though it wasn't so mighty late. I opened the dough and a crack. I did, and lo, who dat? Somebody make an answer. Is de major in, Aunt Minerva Ann? And I knowed right then it was Mars Paul Conant, and it come over me that he had something to do with sending them der contraptions, most especially dat our bobtail hoss. And then, too, sir, lots quicker'n I can tell it, hit come over me that he been asking me lots about Miss Valley. I'll come cross my mind, sirs, while I was pulling the dough open. I low I did, no, sir. Mas Tumlin gone down town for to look at her some business, but he showed to come back terrically. Won't you come in, sir, and wait for him? He sorter of flung his head back and laughed, soft and say, I don't care if I do, Aunt Minerva Ann. I low walk right in de parlor, sir, and I'll make light most for you kin turn round. He come in, he did, and I lit de lamp, and time I lit her, she gun to smoke. Well, sir, he took that lamp, run de wick up and down a time or two, and there she was, bright as day. 
when i went back in de room where miss valley was at she was standing there looking scared she say who dat i lo hits marse paul cone dat's who tis she say what he want i lo nothing much he does come a courtin better jump up and not keep him waitin well sir you could a knocked her down with a fetter she stood there with her hand on her throat taking short breaths just like a little bird does when it flies into winter and doesn't know how to fly out again by and by she say aunt minervy ann you ought to be shamed yourself i know dat man when i see him and that's all i lo honey you know mighty well he ain't come callin but he want her see marse tumlin and dey ain't nothin for to hinder you from goin in there and makin him feel at home while he's waitin she sort of study a while then she blush up she say i don't know what her i ought her well sir dat settled it i knowed by the way she look and talk dat she don't need no more swaddin i say all right honey do as you please but it's your house and you're de mistress and it'll look mighty funny if dat young man got ter set in there by himself and look at de wall while he waitin for marse tumlin i don't know where he say cause i ain't never hear him talk about nobody but i know mighty well he'll do a heap of thinkin thus like i tell you sir she skipped round there and flung on her sunday frock shook out her curls and sort of fumble round with some ribbons and dar she was lookin just as fine as a fiddle if not finer then she swept into the parlor and you mayn't believe it sir but she mighty nigh took de man's breath away mon she was purty and she ain't done no mo like these every day girls done nothing when she start way for me she was a gal by the time she walk up the hall and sweep in dat parlor she was a grown woman the bless what she had on at first stayed with her and looked like it was natural color and her eyes shined sir like she had fire in em i peeped at her sir from behind the curtains in the sittin room and i know what i'm talkin about it's the lord's truth sir if de men folks could tote derselves with the women and do one way whilst they feel in another way they wouldn't be livin in the world you take a school gal sir and she can fool the smartest man whatever tried to shoe let her he may talk with her all day and half de night and he never is ter find out what she thinkin about sometimes de gals fool de self sir but dat's mighty seldom i dunno what all they say cause i ain't been in dar so mighty long for i was not in but i did hear marse paul say He's dropped in for apologize about a little joke he played on Marse Tumlin. Miss Valley asked what was de joke, and he lowed at Marse Tumlin was banterin' folks for to buy his wild land, and Marse Paul asked him what he take for, and Marse Tumlin though will take anything he can chaw, sop, or drink. Dem was de words, chaw, sop, or drink. With that, Marse Paul say he give him a box or trebacker, a barrel of syrup, and a keg or peach brandy, and throw in his buggy hoss for good measure. Marse Tomlin say done, and they shook hands on it that's what marse paul told miss valley and he lo he's done it for fun cause he done looked into dat wild land and he lo she woof a pile of money well sir about that time i gun ter nod and then de few news i'd knowed miss valley was whacking away on de piano and it looked to me like she was just trying herself by that time dey was getting right chummy and so i curled up on de floor and dreamt dat de piano tunes was coming out in a barrel just like lasses when I waked up, Marse Paul Conant done gone, and Marse Tumlin ain't come, and Miss Valley was settin' in de parlor, lookin' up at the ceiling like she got some mighty long thoughts. Her color was still up. I look at her and laugh, and she made a mouth at me, and I say to myself, Hey, something to matter here, show. But I say out loud, Marse Paul Conant sure going to ask me if you ain't had a dram. She'll laugh and say, What answer you going to make? I lo. I'll bow and say, No, sir, I'm de one that drinks all de dram for de family well sir dat child saw inter laughing and she laugh and laughed while she would enter hysterics she was keyed up too high as you might say and dat's the way she come down again by and by marse tumlin come and miss valley she told him about how marse paul done been dar and he sot there and he did and hummed and hawed and done so funny to by and by i lo well folks i had her tell you good night and with that i went out at this point aunt minervy leaned forward clasped her hands over her knees and shook her head when she took up the thread of her narrative if it can be called such the tone of her voice was more subdued almost confidential in fact next morning was my wash day sir and about ten o'clock when i got ready they want no bluein in de house and mighty little soap i hunted high and i hunted low but no bluein can i find and dat make me mad because if i had to go down town after bluein my wash day'll be broke inter but tain't no good for to get mad because i was bleased to go at her to bluein so i tighten up my head hanger and flung a cape on my shoulders and put out 
I speck you know how it is, sir. You can't go downtown but what you'll see nigger women standing in the front yard looking over the palings. They all knowed me, and I knowed them, and the last blessed one of them had her hails me as I go by, and I had her stop and pass the time or day, cause if I'd a whipped on by, they'd a said I was going back both on my church and on my color. I dunner how long they kept me, but time I got to Proctor Stowe, I knew I'd been on the way too long. I noticed a crowd of men out there, some settin' and some standin', but I'd run in, I did, and the young man what do the clerkin', he foller me in and ax me what I want. I say I want a dime's worth of blue, and then after, please, sir, wrap it up, does as quick as he can. I took notice that while he was gettin' it out the box, he sort of stopped like he's listenin' in again. Whiles he had it in the scoop, just ready for drop it in the scales, he held his hand and wait. Then I know he was listen. That makes me listen, and then I hear Mars Tumlin talking, and time I hear him, I knowed he was irritated. Twain't because he was talking loud, sir, but twas he was talking level. When he talk loud, he feeling good. When he talk low, and one word sound the same and nutter, then some had better get out of his way. I left the counter and stepped to the door for to see what the matter was betwixt them. Well, sir, there was Mars Tumlin standing there close to Tom Ferryman. Mars Tumlin low, maybe the law done pinted you, my guardian. How do you know I been swindled? Tom Ferryman say, because I hear you say he bought your wild land for little or nothing. He'll swindle you if you trade with him, and you done trade with him. Mars Tumlin low, has Paul Conant ever swindled you? Tom Ferryman say, no, he ain't, and if he was, I'd give him a kickin'. Mars Tumlin low, well, you know you is a swindler, and nobody ain't kick you. How come that? Tom Ferryman say, if you say I'm a swindler, you're a liar. Well, sir, de man ain't no sooner say dat than bang went Mars Tumlin's pistol, and does as it banged Mars Paul Conan run twixt them, and de ball went right sprang through de collarbone and sort of sideways through de pine to de shoulder blade. Mars Tumlin dropped his pistol and cotched him, and he fell and knelt down by him, and all de time dat dar Tom Ferryman was standing right over him with his pistol in his hand. I squall out, I did. Why ain't some of you white men take dat man's pistol away from him? Don't you see what he fixin' to do? I runned at him, and he sort of flung back with his arm, and when he done that, somebody grabbed him from behind. All that time, Mars Tumlin was asking Mars Paul if he hurt much. I hear him say, I wouldn't have done it for the world, Conant, not for the world. Then the doctor, he come up, and Mars Tumlin, he pestered a man till he hear him say, Don't worry, Major, this boy will live to be an older man than you ever will. Then Mars Tumlin got his pistol, and hunt up and down for that Tom Ferryman, but he done gone. I seed him when he got on his hoss. I say to Mars Tumlin, ain't you just as well to fetch Mars Paul Conant home while we all can take care of him? He low, that's a fact. Go home and tell your Miss Valley for to have the big room fixed up time we get there with him. I say, Humph, I'll fix him myself. I know I ain't going to let Miss Valley do it. Well, sir, tain't no use for to tell you to rest. Dar's dat our baby and dar, and what mo sign does you want to show you that it all turned out just like one of them old time tales? End of section 16. Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Green in Tampa, Florida. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 17. A Kentucky Cinderella by F. Hopkinson Smith. I was bending over my easel, hard at work upon a full-length portrait of a young girl in a costume of fifty years ago, when the door of my studio opened softly and Aunt Chloe came in. "'Good morning, sir. I didn't think you'd come today, being a Sunday,' she said with a slight bend of her knees. "'I just sweep up a little mite. Don't you move. I won't disturb you.' Aunt Chloe had first opened my door a year before with a note from Marnie, a brother brush, which began, Here is an old southern mammy who has seen better days. Paint her if you can, and ended with, Anyway, give her a job. The bearer of the note was indeed the ideal mammy, even to the bandana handkerchief bound about her head, and the capacious waist and ample bosom the lullaby resting place for many a child, white and black. I had never seen a real one in the flesh before. I had heard about them in my earlier days. 
Daddy Billy, my father's body servant, and my father's slave, who lived to be ninety-four, had told me of his own Aunt Myrie, who had died in the old days, but too far back for me to remember. And I had listened when a boy to the traditions connected with the plantations of my ancestors, of the Keziahs and Mammy Crouches and Mammy Janes. But I had never looked into the eyes of one of the old school until I saw Aunt Chloe, nor had I ever fully realized how quaintly courteous and gentle one of them could be, until, with an old-time manner born of a training seldom found outside the old southern homes, she bent forward, spread her apron with both hands, and with a little backward dip had said, as she left me that first day, Thank you, sir. I'll come every Sunday morning. I'll do my best to please you, and I specs I can. I do not often work on Sunday, but my picture had been too long delayed, waiting for a faded wedding dress, worn once by the original when she was a bride, and which had only been found when two of her descendants had ransacked their respective garrets. Must be mighty drive, sir, she said working on the sabbath day golly but that's a pretty lady and she put down her pail i see it last sunday when i come in but she didn't have them ruffles round her neck then that you done give her Claire to goodness that child looked like she was just a gwine to speak aunt chloe was leaning on her broom her eyes scrutinizing the portrait well if that don't beat the land I ain't never seen none of dem frocks since the old times, and dem little old shoes with the ribbons crossed on the ankles. She's the living personification. She is so for a fact. Mm -mm. It is difficult to convey this peculiar sound of complete approval in so many letters. Did you ever know anybody like her? I asked. The old woman straightened her back, and for a moment her eyes looked into mine. I had often tried to draw from her something of her earlier life, but she had always evaded my questions. Marnie had told me that his attempts had at first been equally disappointing. Body as old as me, sir, seen a plenty of people. Then her eyes sought the canvas again. After a moment's pause, she said, as if to herself, Used a real quality, child. That you is, every speck and speech of you. I tried again. Does it look like anybody you ever saw, Aunt Chloe? It do, and it don't, she answered critically. The feet is like hern, but the eyes ain't. Who? Oh, Miss Nanny. And she leaned again on her broom and looked down on the floor. I heaped up a little pile of pigments on one corner of my palette, and flattened them for a highlight on a fold in the satin gown. Who was Miss Nanny? I asked carelessly. I was afraid the thread would break if I pulled too hard. One of my chillin', honey. A peculiar softness came into her voice. Tell me about her. It'll help me get her eyes right, so you can remember her better. They don't look human enough to me anyhow, this last to myself. Where did she live? Where they all live? Down in the big house. She warn't Marse Henry's real child, but she come of the blood. She didn't have dem kind of shoes on her footsies when I first see her. But she wore em when she left me. That she did. Her voice rose suddenly and her eyes brightened. And dem ain't nothing to the way they shined. I ain't never seen no satin slippers shine like dim slippers. They was just a blaze. I worked on in silence. Marnie had cautioned me not to be too curious. Some day she might open her heart and tell me wonderful stories of her earlier life, but I must not appear too anxious. She had become rather suspicious of strangers since she had moved north and lost track of her own people, Marnie had said. Aunt Chloe picked up her pail and began moving some easels into a far corner of my studio and piling the chairs in a heap. 
This done, she stopped again and stood behind me, looking intently at the canvas over my shoulder. My, my, ain't that the very image of that frock? I can see it now, just as Miss Nanny come down the stairs. But you got to put that gold chain on it for it gets to be the very express image. I had it round my own neck once. I knew just how it looked. I laid down my palette and, picking up a piece of chalk, asked her to describe it so that I could make an outline. It was long and heavy, and it wound round the neck twice and hung down to the waist, and that watch on the end of it, well, I ain't seen none like that one since. I declared you it was just as teeny as one of them little biscuits I used to make for her when she come in the kitchen, and she was there most of the time. They didn't care nothing for her much. Let her go round barefoot half the time, and her hair a flying. Only one good frock to her name, and that warn't nothing but calico. I used to wash that many a time for her long fore she was out in the bed. All this makes my blood bile to this day whenever I think of the way they treated that child. But it didn't make no difference what she had on, shoes or no shoes. Her footses was that little, and pretty, with her big eyes and her cheeks, just as fresh as them rosewater roses that I used to snip off for old Sam to put on the table. Oh, I tell you, if you could picture her like that, there wouldn't be nobody clear from here to glory come nigh her. Aunt Chloe's eyes were kindling with every word. I remembered Marnie's warning and kept still. I had abandoned the sketch of the chain as an unnecessary incentive and had begun again with my palette knife pottering away, nodding appreciatingly, and now and then putting a question to clear up some tangled situation as to dates and localities which her rambling talk had left unsettled. Yes, sir, down in the bluegrass country near Lexington, Kentucky, where my old master Mars Henry Gordon lived, she answered to my inquiry as to where this all happened. I used to go every year to see him after the war was over and kept it up till he died. There weren't nobody like him then, and there ain't none now. He weren't never spiteful to chillin', white or black. Everybody knowed that. I was a pickin' in him myself, and I belonged to him, and he ain't never laid a lick on me, and he wouldn't let nobody else do it another except my mammy. I remembers one time when Aunt Dinah made a cake that old Sam, he were a heap younger then, couldn't put on the table cause there was a piece broke out in it. Sam he riz, and Dinah she riz, and after they all called each other all the names they could lay their tongues to, Miss Anne, my own first mistress, come in and she said them chillin took that cake, and tain't nary one of you that's responsible. What's this? says Mars Henry. Chillin, stealing cake? Send em here to me. When we all come in, there was six or eight of us, he says, Every one of you look me in the eye. Now which one took it? I kept looking away, first on the floor, then out the windy. Look at me, he says again. You ain't looking, Clorindy. Then I catched him watching me. Now you all go out, he says, and the one that's guilty can come back again. Then we all went out in the yard. You tell him, says one. No, you tell him. And that's the way it went on. I knowed I was the worstest, for I opened the door of the sideboard and gin it to the others. Then I thought, if I don't tell him, maybe he'll lick the whole passel on us, and that ain't right. But if I go tell him and beg his humble pardon, he might let me go. So I crept round where he was settin' with his book on his knee. Aunt Chloe was now moving stealthily behind me, her eyes fixed on her imaginary master head down, one finger in her mouth. And I say, Mars Henry, and he look up and say, Who's that? And I say, That's Clorindy. And he say, What you want? Mars Henry, I come to tell you, I was hungry, and I see the door open, and I shove it back and took the piece of the cake. And I thought, Maybe if I done told you, you'd forgive me. Then you is the ringleader, he says, and you tempted the other chillin'? 
Yes, I says, I speck so. Well, he says, looking down on the carpet, now that you has professed and begged pardon, you was good and ready to pay attention to what I'm going to say. The other children had sneaked up and was listening. They expected to see me get it, though they ain't nearly one of them ever known him to strike em a lick. Then he says, this here is a little thing, this stealing a cake, and it's a big thing at the same time. Miss Ann has been right smart put out about it, and I'm going to see that it don't happen again. If you see a pin on the floor, you wouldn't steal it. You'd pick it up if you wanted it, and it wouldn't be nothing cause somebody throwed it away, and it was free to everybody. But if you see a piece of money on the floor, you know nobody didn't throw that away, and if you pick it up and don't tell, that's something else. That's stealing cause you took something that somebody else had paid something for and that belongs to him. Now this cake ain't a much count, but it warn't yourn, and you oughtn't to took it. If you'd ask your mistress for it, she'd give you a piece. There ain't nothing here you chillin don't give when you ask for it. I didn't say nothing more. I just waited for him to do anything he wanted to me. Then he looks at the carpet for a long time, and he says, I reckon you won't take no more cake without asking for it, Clorindy, and you chillin' can go out and play again. The tears were now standing in her eyes. That's what my old master was, sir. I ain't never forgot it. If he had beat me to death, he couldn't have done no more for me. He just explained to me, and I ain't never forgot since. Did your own mother find it out, I asked? The tears were gone now. Her face was radiant again at my question. That she did, sir. One of the children done told on me. Mammy just made one grab as I run past the kitchen door and reached for a barrel stave, and she fairly sought me a fire. Aunt Chloe was now holding her sides with laughter, fresh tears streaming down her cheeks. But Mars Henry never knowed it. Lord, sir, there ain't nobody round here like him, nor never was. I can remember him now, same as it was yesterday, with his white hair, and he is settin' in his big chair. It was the last time I ever see him. The big house was gone, and the colored people was gone, and he was dat po he didn't know where the next mouthful was comin' from. I come out behind him so. Aunt Chloe made me her old master, and my stool his rocking chair. And I pat him on the shoulder this way, and he say, Chloe, is that you? How is it you look so comfortable like? And I say, it's you, Mars Henry. You done it all. Your teaching made me what I is. And if you study about it, you'll know it's so, and the others ain't no worse. Of all the colored people you owned, there ain't nary one been hung or been in the penitentiary, nor ain't known as liars. That's the way you watch us up. And I love him yet, and if he was a living today, I'd work for him and take care of him if I went hungry myself. The only fool thing Master Henry ever done was a marrying that widow woman for his second wife, Miss Nanny, that looks a little bit like that child you got there before you, and she pointed to the canvas, wouldn't have been sought and abused like she was but for her. That woman warn't nothing but a harp strainer no way, if I do say it. Everybody know that. How Mars Henry Gordon come to marry her and nobody knowed her this day. She warn't none of our people. They do say that he met her up to Frankfurt when he was in the legislature, but I don't know if that's so. But she warn't nothing nohow. Was Miss Nanny her child? I asked, stepping back from my easel to get the better effect of my canvas. No, sir, that she warn't, with emphasis. She was Moss Henry's own sister's child, she was. Her people, Miss Nanny's, lived up in Indiana, and they was just as poor as watermelon rinds. And when her mother died, Mars Henry sent for her to come live with him, cause he said Miss Rachel, that was that woman's own child by her first husband, was lonesome. They was both about the one age, fourteen or fifteen years old, but Lord a massy! Miss Rachel warn't lonesome. 
except for what he couldn't get, and she most broke her heart about that, much as she could break it about anything. I remember the fair day Miss Nanny come. I see her coming down the road, toting a big band box and a carpet bag most big as herself. Then she turned in the gate. For God, I says to old Sam, who was setting the table for dinner, who's this year coming in? Then I see her stop and set the bundles down and catch her breath, and then she come on again. That's Mars Henry's niece, he says. I heard the mistress say she was a-coming one day this week by the coach. I see right away that that woman was up to one of her tricks. She didn't tend to let that child come no other way except like a servant. She was that dirt mean. Oh, you needn't look, sir. I ain't meaning no one to speak. But I know that woman when Mars Henry first married her, and she ain't never fooled me once. First time she come into the house, she walked plumb in the kitchen, when me and old Sam and old Dinah was eating our dinner, we settin' at the table like we used to did, and she flung her head up in the air, and she says, After this, when I come in, I want you niggers to get up on your feet. Think of that, will you? Mars Henry never called near one of us nigger since we was pickin' in his. I know then she warn't accustomed to nothin'. But I tell you, she never put on them kind of airs when Mars Henry was about. No, sir. She was always mighty sugar-like to him when he was home. But there ain't no conniption she warn't up to when he couldn't hear it. She had pretty nigh riz the roof when he done tell her that Miss Nanny was a-comin' to live with him. But she couldn't stand again him, for warn't her only daughter, Miss Rachel, living on him? And not only Miss Rachel, but lots more of her people where she come from. Well, sir, as soon as old Sam said what child it was that was coming down the road, I dropped my dishcloth and I run out to meet her. Is you Miss Nanny, I says? Give me that bag, I says, and that box. Yes, she says, that's me. And ain't you Aunt Chloe what I heard so much about? Honey, you ain't never going to get the kind of look on that picture you was working on there, sir, as sweet as that child's face when she said that to me. I loved her from that first minute I see her, and I loved her ever since, just as I loved her mother before her. When she got to the house, me a toting the things on behind, the mistress come out on the porch. Oh, that's you, is it, Nanny, she says. Well, Chloe'll tell you where to go. And she went straight in the house again, never kissed her, nor touched her, nor nothing. Old Sam was a pilot. He heard her say it, and if he was alive, he'd tell you same as me. Where's she going to sleep, I asked, calling after her. Upstairs, along with Miss Rachel? I was getting hot myself, though I didn't say nothing. No, she says, flinging her head up like a goat. My daughter needs all the room she's got. You can take her downstairs and fix up a place for her alongside of you and Dinah. She was the old cook. Come along, I says, Miss Nanny. And I dropped a curtsy, same as if she was a princess. And so she was and Mars Henry's own eyes in her head, enough like him to be his own child. I have everything ready for you, I says. You wait here and take the air, and I got a chair and sat her down on the porch, and old Sam brung her some cake, and I went to get the room ready, the room off the kitchen pantry where they puts the overseer's children when they come to see him. Pretty soon Miss Rachel come down and went up and kissed her, that is, Sam said so, though I ain't never seen her kiss her that time nor no other time. Miss Rachel and the mistress was both split out of the same piece of kindling, and what one was again, t'other was again. A blind man could see that Miss Rachel never liked Miss Nanny from the first. She was that cross-grained and pernickety. No matter what Miss Nanny done to please her, it weren't good enough for her. Why, do you know, when the other children come over from the next plantation, Miss Rachel wouldn't send for Miss Nanny to come in the parlor. No, sir, that she wouldn't. 
and dey'd run off and leave her too when dey was gwine picnicking, and treat dat child audacious, saying she was poor white trash and charity child and things like dat, till I would go and tell Mars Henry about it. Then there'd be a ruction, and Mars Henry'd blaze out, and just soon as he was off again to Frankfurt, and he was there most of the time, for he was one of these year old-timers that they couldn't get along without at the legislature. They treat her worse than ever. Soon's Dinah and me see that, we keep Miss Nanny along with us much as we could. She'd eat with them when there weren't no company around, but that was about all. Did they send her to school? I asked, fearing that she would again lose the thread. My picture had a new meaning for me now that it looked like her heroine. No, sir, dat they didn't, cept to the schoolhouse at the crossroads, where everybody's chillin' went. But they sent Miss Rachel to a real hidey tidy school, dat they did, down to Louisville. Two winters she was there, and every time when she come home for holiday times, she had more airs than when she went away. Mars Henry wanted both children to go, but that woman outdid him and she faced him up and down that there weren't money enough for two, and that her daughter was the fittest and all that, and he give in. I didn't hear it, but old Sam did, and his hand shook so he most spilt the soup. But, law, honey, that didn't make no difference to Miss Nanny. She'd go off by herself with her books and sit all day under the trees and sing to herself just like a bird, and they'd sing to her and all that time her face was a beaming and her hair shining like gold and she a growing taller and her eyes getting bigger and bigger and brighter and her little footses white and cunning as a rabbit's the only place where she did go outside the big house was over to miss morgan's who lived on the next plantation miss morgan didn't have no children of her own and she'd send for Miss Nanny to come and keep her company. She was dat dead lonesome, and they was glad enough to let the child go so they could get her out of the house. Old Sam allers said that, for he heard em talk at the table and knowed what was going on. Pretty soon, long come the time when Miss Rachel done finish her education, and she come back to the big house and sot herself up to see if company. She weren't bad looking in dim days, I must say, and if that woman's spirit hadn't been in her she might have pulled through but there weren't no fetchin up could stand again dat blood miss rachel get dat ornery dat you couldn't do nothin with her just like her ma the first real out and out beau she had was dr tom bowling he lived about fourteen miles out of lexington on the big plantation and was the richest young man in our parts his pa had died about two years before and left him more money than he could throw away, and he'd just come back from Philadelphia where he'd been a-learning to be a doctor. He met Miss Rachel at a party in Louisville, and the first Sunday she come home he drove over to see her. If you could have seen the mistress when she see him coming in the gate, all his riding boots and his yellow breeches and bottled green coat, and his servant a-riding behind to hold the horses. Old Sam and me was a watchin' the mistress peekin' through the blind at him, her eyes a blazin', and Sam laughed so he had to stuff a napkin in his mouth to keep her from hearin' him. Well, sir, that went on all the summer. Every time he come, the mistress be that sweet, most make a body sick to see her, and when he'd stay away, she was that pesky, there weren't no livin' with her. Of course, there was plenty more Jim and courtin' Miss Rachel, too. But none of them didn't count with the mistress except the doctor, cause he was rich. That's all there was to it, cause he was rich. I tell you, old Sam had to tell many a lie to the other gentleman, saying Miss Rachel was sick or something else when she was a waiting for the doctor to come, and was feared he might meet some of them and get scared away. Miss Nanny, she'd watch him too from behind the kitchen door scrunched down looking over the pantry window sill and then she'd tell dinah and me what he did and how he got off his horse and 
hand the reins to the boy and slap his boots with his riding whip like he was a dustin off a fly and she'd act it all out for me and dinah and slap her own frock and then she laughed fit to kill herself and dance all around the kitchen would you believe it no they ain't nobody'd believe it they never asked her to come in once while he was in the parlor and they never once told him that miss nanny was a livin on top side of the earth course people gin a talk and everybody say that dr bolin was gettin nice to coon and the first thing they know there would be a weddin in the gordon family and then again there was plenty more people said he was only passin the time with miss rachel and that he come to see mars henry to talk politics well one day sir i was standin in the door and i see him come in afoot without his horse and servant and step up on the porch quick and rap at the door like he say to himself let me in i'm in a hurry i got something on my mind old sam was just a going to open the door for him when miss nanny come a running in the kitchen from the yard her cheeks like the roses her hair a flying and her big head a hanging to a string down her back i gin sam one look and he stopped and i says to miss nanny run honey i says and open the door for old sam i speck i says it's one of them peddlers if you could have seen that child's face when she come back aunt chloe's hands were now waving above her head her mouth wide open in her merriment every tooth shining she was white one minute and red as a beet the next oh aunt chloe what did you let me go for she says oh i wouldn't have let him see me like this for anything in the world oh i am that put out what did he say to you honey i says he didn't say nothing he just look at me and say he begged my pardon and was miss rachel in and then i said i'd run and tell her and when i come downstairs again he was a standin in the hall with his eyes up the staircase and he never stopped looking at me till i come down well that won't do you no harm child i says a cat can look at a king old sam was a watchin her too and when she gone in her little room and shut the door sam says i lay if mars tom bowling had anything on his mind when he come here today it's mighty unsettled by this time next time dr tom bowling come he say to the mistress who's that young lady he says that opened the door for me last time i was here i hope to see her again is she in then they both cooked up some lie about her being over to miss morgan's or something and soon's he was gone they come down and riz sam for not tending the door and letting that ragged flyaway gal open it then they went for miss nanny till they made her cry and she come to me and i took her in my lap and comforted her like i always did the next time he come he says i hear that your niece miss nanny barnes is living with you and that she very exclusive i hope that you'll swade her to come in the parlor he says there was his very words sam was standing close to him as i am to you and he heard him she ain't yet in society the mister says and she's that wild that we can't possess her oh is that so he says is she in now no she says she's over to miss morgan's that was a fact this time she gone that very morning then miss rachel come down and course sam didn't hear no more cause he had to go out pretty soon out the doctor come these visits mind you was getting shorter and shorter though he do come as often and over he goes to miss morgan's hisself now i don't know what he said to miss nanny or what passed twixt em cause she didn't tell me only that she said he had come to see miss morgan about some land matters and that miss morgan introduced em but nothing more lord bless that child and sir that was the first time she ever kept 
anything from her old mammy. Dat made me more glad than ever. I know den they was both hit. But my lord, the fur began to fly when the mistress and Miss Rachel heard about that visit. What you mean making out at Dr. Boland? Don't you know he's good as gage to my daughter, the mistress said. That was a lie, for he never said a word to Miss Rachel. Old Sam could have told you that. Get out of my house, you good for nothing pauper, and take your rags with you. I see right away the bat was in the fire. Mars Henry warn't expected home till next Sunday, and so I took her over to Miss Morgan, and then I ups and tells her everything that woman had done to that child since the day she come. And when I done, she took Miss Nanny by the hand, and she says, You won't never want a home child so long as I live. Go back, Chloe, and get her clothes. But I didn't get them. I knowed Mars Henry'd raised the roof when he come, and he did, bless your heart. Went over hisself and got her and brought her home, and that night when Dr. Bowling come, he made her sit down in the parlor. And before he went home that night, the doctor, he said to Mars Henry, I want your permission, Mr. Gordon, to pay my addresses to Miss Nanny, your niece. Sam was a standing close as he could get to the door, and he heard every word. Now, he ain't never said that, mind you, to Mars Henry about Miss Rachel, and that's why I know that he weren't hit unto death with her. Well... Do you know, sir, that that woman was that audacious? She wouldn't let em see each other after that except on the front porch. Wouldn't let em come in the house. Make em do all their courting on the steps and out at the pasture gate. The doctor would rare and pitch and get white in the face at the scandalous way that Miss Barnes was being treated. Until Miss Nanny put both her little hands on his'n, soothing like, and then he'd grab em and kiss em like he'd eat em up. Sam cotched em at it, and he done told me. And then they'd saunter off down the porch, saying it was too hot or too cool, or that they was looking for birds' nests in the porch vines, till they'd get to the far end where the mistress nor Sam nor nobody else could hear what they was a saying and a whispering, and there they'd sit for hours. But I tell you, the doctor had a hard time of getting her, even when Mars Henry gin his consent. And he never would a got her if Miss Rachel, just for spite, I spec, hadn't a took up with Colonel Todd Hunter's son that was a courtin' on her too, and run off and married him. Then Miss Nanny knowed she was free to follow her own heart. I tell you, it had a made you cry your eyes out, sir to see that child try and fix herself up to meet him the days and nights she knowed he was a-coming, and she was just one white frock to her name, and we all felt just as bad as her. Dinah would wash it, and I'd smooth her hair, and old Sam would get a fresh rose to put in her neck. Pretty soon the wedding day was painted, and me and Dinah and old Sam began to wonder how that child was a-going to get clothes to be married in. Sam heard old Marster ask that same question at the table, and he see him give the mistress the money to buy em for her, and the mistress said that she reckoned Miss Nanny's people would want the privilege of dressing her now that she was a-gwine to marry that worthless young doctor Tom Bowling that nobody would have in the house, but that if they didn't she'd gin her some of Rachel's clothes, and if them were enough then she'd spend the money to the best advantage. Dem was her very words. Sam here to say em. I know dat meant that the child would go naked, for she wouldn't have worn none of Miss Rachel's rubbish, and not a cent would she get of the money. So I got that old white frock out, and Dinah found a white ribbon in an old trunk in the garret, and washed and ironed it to tie round her waist. And Miss Nanny come and look at it, and when she see it, the Tears riz up in her eyes. Don't you cry, child, I says. He ain't loving you for your clothes, and never did. First time he see you, you was putting on barefoot. It's you he wants, not your frocks, honey. And then the sun come out on her face, and her eyes dried up, 
and she gin a smile and sing like a robin after the rain. Pretty soon, long come Christmas time, and me and old Sam and Dinah was watchin' out to see what Mars Tom Bolin was gwine to gin his bride, for she was pretty nigh dat as they was to be married the week after Christmas. Well, sir, the morning for Christmas come, and then the outer noon come, and then the night come, and most ever hour somebody sent something for Miss Rachel, and yet not one scrap of nothing as big as a chinka pen come for Miss Nanny. Dinah and me was dat unrestless that we couldn't sleep. Miss Nanny didn't say nothing when she went to bed, but I see a little shadow creep over her face, and I know right away what hurted her. Well, the next morning, Christmas morning that was, old Sam come a bustin' in the kitchen door, a hollerin' loud as he could holler. Aunt Chloe was now rocking herself back and forth, clapping her hands as she talked. That there was a trunk on the front porch for Miss Nanny, that was that heavy it took four niggers to lift it. I run and Dinah run, and when we got to the trunk, most all the niggers was thick around it as flies, and Miss Nanny was standing over it reading a card with her name on it, and a scription saying that it was a Christmas gift with the compliments of a friend. But who that friend was, whether it was Mars Henry who sent it that way so that that woman wouldn't tear his hair out, or whether Miss Morgan sent it that hadn't more enough money to live on, or whether some of her own kin in Indiana that was dirt poor stole the money and sent it, or whether the young Dr. Tom Doling, who had more money than all the banks in Lexington, done did it. Don't nobody know till this day, except me and old Sam, and we ain't tellin'. But my soul alive, the insides of that trunk took the breath clean out of the mistress and Miss Rachel. Sam opened it, and I took out the things. Honey, there was a wedding dress, all white satin, that would stand alone, just the very made of the one you got in that picture for you, and a changeable silk, that heavy, and a plaid one, and everything a young lady could get on her back from her skin out, and a thousand-dollar watch and chain. I wore that watch myself. Miss Nanny was a-standing by me, a-clapping her hands and laughing, and when that watch and chain came out, she just throwed the chain over my neck and stuck the little watch in my bosom and says, There, you dear old mammy, go look at yourself in the glass and see how fine you is. The next week come to wedding, I'll never forget that wedding to my dying day. Mars Tom Bolin driv in with a coach and four and two outriders, and the horses wore white ribbons on their ears, and the coachman had flowers in his coat most big as his head, and they whirled up in front of the porch, and out he stepped in his blue coat and brass buttons and a yellow waistcoat, yellow as a gourd, and his bell-crown hat in his hand. She was a-waitin' for him with that white satin dress on, and the chain round her neck, and her little footses tied up with silk ribbons, the very match of them you got pictured, and her face shining like an angel. And all the niggers was a-standin' round the porch, their eyes out in their heads. And Mars Henry was there in his new clothes, looking so grand, and Sam in his white gloves, and me in a new head handkerchief. Everybody was happy sip one that one was the mistress standing in the door she wouldn't come out to the coach where the horses was a chomping the bits and the froth a dropping on the ground and she wouldn't speak to mars tom she kept back in the doorway miss rachel was that mean she wouldn't come downstairs miss nanny give mars tom bowling her hand and look up in his face like a queen and then she kissed Mars Henry and whispered something in his ear that nobody didn't hear, only the tears gin to jump out and roll down his cheeks. And then she looked the mistress full in the face and, without a word, dropped her a low curtsy. I come to lass. She looked at me for a minute with her eyes a-swimming, and then she throwed her arms round my neck and hugged and kissed me 
and den I see her arm slip around her waist and lift her in de coach, and den de horses begin to plunge, and dey was off. And after dat dey had five years, the happiest years dem two ever seen. I know, cause Mars Henry gin me to her, and I lived with em day in and day out till that baby come, and then aunt chloe stopped and reached out her hand as if to steady herself the tears were streaming down her cheeks then she advanced a step fixed her eyes on the portrait and in a voice broken with emotion said honey child honey child is you tired of waiting for your old mammy keep a watchin honey keep a watchin it won't be long now for i come keep a watchin end of section 17 recording by larry green in tampa florida international short stories volume 1 american stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1 American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 18 by the waters of paradise by f marion crawford part one i remember my childhood very distinctly i do not think that the fact argues a good memory for i have never been clever at learning words by heart in prose or rhyme so that i believe my remembrance of events depends much more upon the events themselves than upon my possessing any special facility for recalling them. Perhaps I am too imaginative, and the earliest impressions I received were of a kind to stimulate the imagination abnormally. A long series of little misfortunes so connected with each other as to suggest a sort of weird fatality, so worked upon my melancholy temperament when I was a boy that, before I was of age, I sincerely believed myself to be under a curse, and not only myself, but my whole family and every individual who bore my name. I was born in the old place where my father and his father and all his predecessors had been born beyond the memory of man it is a very old house and the greater part of it was originally a castle strongly fortified and surrounded by a steep moat supplied with abundant water from the hills by a hidden aqueduct many of the fortification have been destroyed and the moat has been filled up the water from the aqueduct supplies great fountains and runs down into huge oblong basins in the terraced gardens one below the other each surrounded by a broad pavement of marble between the water and the flower beds the waste surplus finally escapes through an artificial grotto some thirty yards long into a stream flowing down through the park to the meadows beyond and thence to the distant river the buildings were extended a little and greatly altered more than two hundred years ago in the time of charles the second but since then little has been done to improve them though they have been kept in fairly good repair according to our fortunes in the gardens there are terraces and huge hedges of box and evergreen 
some of which used to be clipped into shapes of animals in the italian style i can remember when i was a lad how i used to try to make out what the trees were cut to represent and how i used to appeal for explanations to judith my welsh nurse she dealt in a strange mythology of her own and peopled the gardens with griffins dragons good jenny and bad and filled my mind with them at the same time my nursery window afforded a view of the great fountains at the head of the upper basin and on moonlight nights the welshwoman who dulled me up to the glass and bid me look at the mist and spray rising into mysterious shapes moving mystically in the white light like living things it's the woman of the water she used to say and sometimes she would threaten that if i did not go to sleep the woman of the water would steal up to the high window and carry me away in her wet arms the place was gloomy the broad basins of water and the tall evergreen hedges gave it a funeral look and the damp stained marble causeways by the pools might have been made of tombstones the gray and weather-beaten walls and towers without the dark and massively furnished rooms within the deep mysterious recesses and the heavy curtains all affected my spirits i was silent and sad from my childhood there was a great clock tower above from which the hours rang dismally during the day and tolled like a nail in the dead of night there was no light nor life in the house for my mother was a helpless invalid and my father had grown melancholy in his long task of caring for her he was a thin dark man with sad eyes kind i think but silent and unhappy next to my mother i believe he loved me better than anything on earth for he took immense pains and trouble in teaching me and what he taught me i have never forgotten perhaps it was his only amusement and that may be the reason why i had no nursery governess or teacher of any kind while he lived i used to be taken to see my mother every day and sometimes twice a day for an hour at a time then i sat upon a little stool near her feet and she would ask me what i'd been doing and what i wanted to do i dare say she saw already the seeds of a profound melancholy in my nature for she looked at me always with a sad smile and kissed me with a sigh when i was taken away one night when i was just six years old I lay awake in the nursery. The door was not quite shut, and the Welsh nurse was sitting, sewing, in the next room. Suddenly, I heard her groan and say in a strange voice, One, two, one, two. I was frightened, and I jumped up and ran to the door, barefooted as I was. What is it, Judith? I cried, clinging to her skirts. I can remember the look in her strange, dark eyes as she answered, One, two, leaden coffins, fallen from the ceiling. She crooned, working herself in her chair. One, two, a light coffin and a heavy coffin, falling to the floor. Then, she seemed to notice me and she took me back to bed and sang me to sleep with a queer old welsh song i do not know how it was but the impression got hold of me that she had meant that my father and mother were going to die very soon 
they died in the very room where she had been sitting that night it was a great room my day nursery full of sun when there was any and when the days were dark it was the most cheerful place in the house my mother grew rapidly worse and i was transferred to another part of the building to make place for her they thought my nursery was gayer for her i suppose but she could not live she was beautiful when she was dead and i cried bitterly the light one the light one the heavy one to come crooned the welsh woman and she was right my father took the room after my mother was gone and day by day he grew thinner and paler and sadder the heavy one the heavy one all of late mooned my nurse one night in december standing still just as she was going to take away the light after putting me to bed then she took me up again and wrapped me in a little gown and led me away to my father's room she knocked but no one answered she opened the door and we found him in his easy chair before the fire very white quite dead so i was alone with the welshwoman till strange people came and relations whom i had never seen and then i heard them saying that i must be taken away to some more cheerful place they were kind people and i will not believe that they were kind only because i was to be very rich when i grew to be a man the world never seemed to be a very bad place to me nor all the people to be miserable sinners even when i was most melancholy i do not remember that any one ever did me any great injustice nor that i was ever oppressed or ill-treated in any way even by the boys at school i was sad i suppose because my childhood was so gloomy and later because i was unlucky in everything i undertook till i finally believed i was pursued by fate and i used to dream that the old welsh nurse and the woman of the water between them had vowed to pursue me to my end but my natural disposition should have been cheerful as i have often thought among the lads of my age i was never last or even among the last in anything but i was never first if i trained for a race i was sure to sprain my ankle on the day when i was to run if i pulled an oar with others my oar was sure to break if i competed for a prize some unforeseen accident prevented my winning it at the last moment nothing to which i put my hand succeeded and i got the reputation of being unlucky until my companions felt it it was always safe to bet against me no matter what the appearances might be i became discouraged and listless in everything i gave up the idea of competing for any distinction at the university comforting myself with the thought that i could not fail in the examination for the ordinary degree the day before the examination began i fell ill and when at last i recovered after a narrow escape from death i turned my back upon oxford and went down alone to visit the old place where i had been born feeble in health and profoundly disgusted and discouraged i was twenty-one years of age master of myself and of my fortune but so deeply had the long chain of small and lucky circumstances affected me that i thought seriously of shutting myself up from the world to live the life of a hermit and to die as soon as possible 
death seemed the only cheerful possibility in my existence and my thoughts soon dwelt upon it altogether i had never shown any wish to return to my own home since i had been taken away as a little boy and no one had ever pressed me to do so the place had been kept in order after a fashion and did not seem to have suffered during the fifteen years or more of my absence nothing earthly could affect those old grey walls who had fought the elements for so many centuries the garden was more wild than i remember it the marble causeways about the pools looked more yellow and damp than of old and the whole place at first looked smaller it was not until i had wandered about the house and grounds for many hours that i realized the huge size of the home where i was to live in solitude then i began to delight in it and my resolution to live alone grew stronger the people had turned out to welcome me of course and i tried to recognize the changed faces of the old gardener and the old housekeeper and to call them by name my old nurse i knew at once she had grown very gray since the, she heard the coffins fall in the nursery fifteen years before but her strange eyes were the same and the look in them woke all my old memories she went over the house with me and how is the woman on the water i asked trying to laugh a little does she still play in the moonlight she's hungry answered the welshwoman in a low voice hungry then we will feed her i laughed but old judith turned very pale and looked at me strangely feed her eh hey, you will feed her well she muttered glancing behind her at the ancient housekeeper who tottered after us with few steps through the halls and passages i didn't think much of her words she had always talked oddly the huge size of the home where i was to live in solitude then i began to delight in it and my resolution to live alone grew stronger the people had turned out to welcome me of course and i tried to recognize the changed faces of the old gardener and the old housekeeper and to call them by name my old nurse i knew at once she had grown very gray since the, she heard the coffins fall in the nursery fifteen years before but her strange eyes were the same and the look in them woke all my old memories she went over the house with me and how is the woman of the water i asked trying to laugh a little does she still play in the moonlight she is hungry answered the welshwoman in a low voice hungry then we will feed her i laughed but old judith turned very pale and looked at me strangely feed her eh you will feed her well she muttered glancing behind her at the ancient housekeeper who tottered after us with feeble steps through the halls and passages i did not think much of her word she had always talked oddly as welshwomen will and though i was melancholy i am sure i was not superstitious and i was certainly not timid only as in a far-off dream i seemed to see her standing with the light in her hand and muttering the heavy one wool of lead and then leading a little boy through the long corridors to see his father lying dead in a great easy chair before a smouldering fire so we went over the house and i chose the rooms where i would live and the servants i had brought with me ordered and arranged everything and i had no more trouble i did not care what they did 
provided I was left in peace, and was not expected to give directions, for I was more listless than ever, owing to the effects of my illness at college. I dined in solitary state, and the melancholy grandeur of the vast old dining room pleased me. Then I went to the room I had selected for my study, and sat down in a deep chair under a bright light to think or to let my thoughts meander through labyrinths of their own choosing, utterly indifferent to the course they might take. The tall windows of the room opened to the level of the ground upon the terrace at the head of the garden. It was in the end of July, and everything was open, for the weather was warm. As I sat alone, I heard the unceasing splash of the great fountains, and I fell to thinking of the woman of the water. I rose and went out into the still night, and sat down upon a seat on the terrace between two gigantic Italian flower pots. The air was deliciously soft and sweet with the smell of the flowers, and the garden was more congenial to me than the house. Sad people always like running water and the sound of it at night, though I cannot tell why. I sat and listened in the gloom, for it was dark below, and the pale moon had not yet climbed over the hills in front of me, though all the air above was light with her rising beams. Slowly, the white halo in the eastern sky ascended in an arch above the wooded crest, making the outlines of the mountains more intensively black by contrast, as though the head of some great white saint were rising from behind a screen in a vast cathedral, throwing misty glories from below. I longed to see the moon herself, and I tried to recall the seconds before she must appear. Then she sprang up quickly, and, in a moment more, hung around and perfect in the sky. I gazed at her, and then at the floating spray of the tall fountains, and down at the pools, where the water lilies were rocking softly in their sleep on the velvet surface of the moonlit water. Just then, a great swan floated out silently into the midst of the basin, and reached his long neck, catching the water in his broad bill, and scattering showers of diamonds around him. Suddenly, as I gazed, something came between me and the light. I looked up instantly. Between me and the round disk of the moon rose a luminous face of a woman, with great strange eyes and a woman's mouth, full and soft, but not smiling, hooded in black, staring at me as I sat still upon my bench. She was close to me, so close that, that I could have touched her with my hand, but I was transfixed and helpless. She stood still for a moment, but her expression did not change. Then she passed swiftly away, and my hair stood up on my head, while the cold breeze from her white dress was wafted to my temples as she moved. The moonlight, shining through the tossing spray of the fountain, made tracery of shadow in the gleaming folds of her garments. In an instant she was good, and I was alone. I was strangely shaken by the vision, and some time passed before I could rise to my feet, for I was still weak from my illness, and the sight I had seen would have startled anyone. I did not reason with myself, for I was certain that I had looked upon the unearthly, and no argument could have destroyed that belief. At last I got up and stood unsteadily, gazing in the direction in which I thought the face had gone. But there was nothing to be seen, nothing but the broad paths 
the tall, dark evergreen hedges, the tossing water of the fountains, and the smooth pool below. I fell back upon the seat and recalled the face I had seen. Strange to say, now that the first impression had passed, there was nothing startling in the recollection. On the contrary, I felt that I was fascinated by the face and would give anything to see it again. I could retrace the beautiful straight features, the long dark eyes, and the wonderful mouth most exactly in my mind. And when I had reconstructed every detail from memory, I knew that the whole was beautiful and that I should love a woman with such a face. I wonder whether she is the woman of the water, I said to myself. Then, rising once more, I wandered down the garden, descending one short flight of steps after another, from terrace to terrace by the edge of the marble basins, through the shadow and through the moonlight, and I crossed the water by the rustic bridge above the artificial grotto, and climbed slowly again to the highest terrace by the other side. The air seemed sweeter, and I was very calm, so that I think I smiled to myself as I walked, as though a new happiness had come to me. The woman's face seemed always before me, and the thought of it gave me an unwanted thrill of pleasure, unlike anything I had felt ever before. I turned as I reached the house and looked back upon the scene. It had certainly changed in the short hour since I had come out, and my mood had changed with it. Just like my luck, I thought, to fall in love with a ghost. But in old times I would have sighed and gone to bed more sad than ever at such a melancholy conclusion. Tonight I felt happy almost for the first time in my life. The gloomy old study seemed cheerful when I went in. The old pictures on the wall smiled at me, and I sat down in my deep chair with a new and delightful sensation that I was not alone. The idea of having seen a ghost and of feeling much the better for it was so absurd that I laughed softly as I took up one of the books I had brought with me and began to read. That impression did not wear off. I slept peacefully, and in the morning I threw open my windows to the summer air and looked down at the garden, at the stretches of green, and at the colored flower beds, at the circling swallows, and at the bright water. A man might make a paradise of this place, I exclaimed, a man and a woman together. From that day, the old castle no longer seemed gloomy, and I think I ceased to be sad. For some time, too, I began to take an interest in the place and to try and make it more alive. I avoided my old Welsh nurse, lest she should damp my humor but with some dismal prophecy, and recall my old self by bringing back memories of my dismal childhood. But what I thought of most was the ghostly figure I had seen in the garden that first night after my arrival. I went out every evening and wandered through the walks and paths, but, try as might, I did not see my vision again. At last, after many days, the memory grew more faint, and my old moody nature gradually overcame the temporary sense of lightness I had experienced. The summer turned to autumn, and I grew restless. It began to rain. The dampness pervaded the gardens, and the outer halls smelled musty, like tombs. The grey sky oppressed me intolerably. I left the place as if it was, and went abroad, determined to try anything 
which might possibly make a second break in the monotonous melancholy from which I suffered. End of section 18 Part 1《National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 19 By the Waters of Paradise by F. Marion Crawford Part 2 Most people would be struck by the utter insignificance of the small events which, after the death of my parents, influenced my life and made me unhappy. The gruesome forebodings of a Welsh nurse, which chanced to be realized by an odd coincidence of events, should not seem enough to change the nature of a child and to direct the bent of his character in after years. The little disappointments of schoolboy life, and the somewhat less childish ones of an uneventful and undistinguished academic career should not have sufficed to turn me out at one and twenty years of age a melancholic listless idler some weakness of my own character may have contributed to the result but in a greater degree it was due to my having a reputation of bad luck however i will not try to analyze the causes of my state for i should satisfy nobody least of all myself Still less will I attempt to explain why I felt a temporary revival of my spirits after my adventure in the garden. It is certain that I was in love with the face I had seen, and that I longed to see it again, that I gave up all hope of a second visitation, grew more sad than ever, packed up my traps, and finally went abroad. But in my dreams, I went back to my home, and it always appeared to be sunny and bright, as it had looked on that summer's morning, after I had seen the woman by the fountain. I went to Paris. I went farther, and wandered about Germany. I tried to amuse myself, and I failed miserably. With the aimless whims of an idle and useless man, come all sorts of suggestions for good resolutions. One day I made up my mind that I would go and bury myself in a German university for a time and live simply like a poor student. I started with the intention of going to Leipzig, determining to stay there until some event should direct my life or change my humor or make an end of me altogether. The express train stopped at some station, of which I did not know the name. It was dusk on a winter's afternoon, and I peered through the thick glass from my seat. Suddenly, another train came gliding in from the opposite direction, and stopped alongside of ours. I looked at the carriage, which chanced to be abreast of mine, and idly read the black letters painted on a white board swinging from the brass handrail. Berlin, Cologne, Paris. Then I looked up at the window above. I started violently, and the cold perspiration broke out upon my forehead. In the dim light, not six feet from where I sat, I saw the face of a woman, the face I loved, the straight, fine features, the strange eyes, the wonderful mouth, the pale skin. Her headdress was a dark veil which seemed to be tied about her head and passed over the shoulders under the chin. As I threw down the window and knelt on the cushioned seat, leaning far out to get a better view, 
a long whistled scream through the station followed by a quick series of dull clanking sound then there was a slight jerk and my train moved on luckily the window was narrow being the one over the seat beside the door or i believe i would have jumped out of it then and there in an instant the speed increased and i was being carried swiftly away in the opposite direction from the thing i loved for a quarter of an hour i lay back in my place stunned by the suddenness of the apparition at last one of the two other passengers a large and gorgeous captain of the white Königsberg cuirassier silly but firmly suggested that i might shut my window as the evening was cold i did so with an apology and relapsed into silence the train ran swiftly on for a long time and it was already beginning to slacken speed before entering another station when i roused myself and made a sudden resolution as the carriage stopped before the brilliantly lighted platform i seized my belongings saluted my fellow passengers and got out determined to take the first express back to paris this time the circumstances of the vision had been so natural that it did not strike me that there was anything unreal about the face or about the woman to whom it belonged i did not try to explain to myself how the face and the woman could be travelling by a fast train from berlin to paris on a winter's afternoon when both were in my mind indelibly associated with the moonlight and the fountains in my own english home i certainly would not have admitted that i had been mistaken in the dusk attributing to what i had seen a resemblance to my former vision which did not really exist there was not the slightest doubt in my mind and i was positively sure that i had again seen the face i loved i did not hesitate and in a few hours i was on my way back to paris i could not help reflecting on my ill luck wandering as i had been for many months i might as easily have chanced that i should be travelling in the same train with that woman instead of going the other way but my luck was destined to turn for a time i searched paris for several days i dined at the principal hotels i went to the theatres i rode in the bois de boulogne in the morning and picked up an acquaintance whom i forced to drive me with me in the afternoon i went to mass at the madeleine and i attended the services at the english church i hung about the louvre and notre dame i went to versailles i spent hours in parading the rue de rivoli in the neighbourhood of Muris's corner where foreigners pass and repass from morning till night at last i received an invitation to a reception at the english embassy i went and i found that i had th thought so long there she was sitting by an old lady in grey satin and diamonds who had wrinkled that kindly face and keen grey eyes that seemed to take in everything they saw with very little inclination to give much in return but i did not notice the chaperon i saw only the face that had haunted me for months and in the excitement of the moment i walked quickly towards the pair forgetting such a trifle as the necessity for an introduction she was more beautiful than i had thought but i never doubted that it was she herself and no other vision or no vision before this was the reality and i knew it twice her hair had been covered now at last i saw it and the added beauty of its magnificence glorified the whole woman it was rich hair fine and abundant golden with deep ruddy tints in it like red bronze spun fire there was no ornament in it not a rose not a thread of gold 
and I felt that it needed nothing to enhance its splendor, nothing but her pale face, her dark, strange eyes, and her heavy eyebrows. I could see that she was slender, too, but strong withal, as she sat there, quietly gazing at the moving scene in the midst of the brilliant lights and the hum of perpetual conversation. I recollected the detail of introduction in time, and turned aside to look for my host. I found him at last. I begged him to present me to the two ladies, pointing them out to him at the same time. Yes, um, by all means, um, replied his excellency with a pleasant smile. He evidently had no idea of my name, which was not to be wondered at. I am Lord Cairngorm. I observed. Oh, by all means, answered the ambassador with the same hospitable smile. Yes, um, the fact is, I must try and find out who they are. Such lots of people, you know. Oh, I will present me. I will try and find out for you, said I, laughing. Ah, yes, so kind of you. Come along, said my host. We threaded the crowd, and in a few minutes, we stood before the two ladies. Well, man, Trodwell's Lord Kangam, he said, then adding quickly to me, Come and dine tomorrow, won't you? He glided away with his pleasant smile and disappeared in the crowd. I sat down beside the beautiful girl, conscious that the eyes of the duenna were upon me. I think we've been very near meeting before, I remarked by way of opening the conversation. My companion turned her eyes full upon me with an air of inquiry. She evidently did not recall my face if she had ever seen me. Really? I cannot remember, she observed in a low musical voice. When? In the first place, you came down from Berlin by the express ten days ago. I was going the other way and our carriages stopped opposite each other. I saw you at the window. Yes, we came that way, but I do not remember. She hesitated. Secondly, I continued, I was setting a load in my garden last summer, near the end of July. Do you remember? You must have wandered in there through the park. You came up to the house and looked at me. Was that you? she asked in evident surprise. Then she broke into a laugh. I told everybody I'd seen a ghost. There had never been any canned gorms in the place since the memory of men. We left the next day and never heard that you had come here. Indeed, I did not know the castle belonged to you. Where are you staying? I asked. Where? Why, with my aunt, where I always stay. She is your neighbor, since it is you. I beg your pardon, but then, is your aunt Lady Bluebell? I did not quite catch. Don't be afraid. She is amazingly deaf. Yes, she is the relict of my beloved uncle, the 16th or 17th Baron Bluebell. I forget exactly how many of them there have been. And I, do you know who I am? She laughed, well knowing that I didn't. No, I answered frankly, I have not the least idea. I asked to be introduced because I recognized you. Perhaps, perhaps you are uh, Miss Bluebell? Considering that you are a neighbor, I will tell you who I am, she answered. No, I am of the tribe of the Bluebells, but my name is Lamas, and I've been given to understand that I was Christian margaret being a floral family they call me daisy a dreadful american man once told me that my aunt was a bluebell and that i was a harebell with two l's and an e because my hair is so thick i warn you so that you may avoid making such a bad pun do i look like a man who makes pants i asked being very conscious of my melancholy face and sad looks. Miss Lammas eyed me critically. No, you have a mournful temperament. I think I can trust you, she answered. 
Do you think you could communicate to my aunt the fact that you are a kangaroo and a neighbor? I'm sure she would like to know. I leaned towards the old lady, inflating my lungs for a yell. But Miss Lammas stopped me. That is not of the slightest use, she remarked. You can write it on a bit of paper. She is utterly deaf. I have a pencil, I answered, but I have no paper. Would my cuff do, do you think? Oh, yes, replied Miss Lammas with alacrity. Men often do that. I wrote on my cuff. Miss Lammas wishes me to explain that I am your neighbor, Kangorm. Then I held out my arm before the old lady's nose. She seemed perfectly accustomed to the proceeding, put up her glasses, read the words, smiled, nodded, and addressed me in the unearthly voice peculiar to people who hear nothing. I knew your grandfather very well, she said. Then she smiled and nodded to me again and to her niece and relapsed into silence. It is all right, remarked Miss Lammas. Aunt Bluebell knows she is deaf and does not so much like the parrot. You see, she knew your grandfather. How odd that we should be neighbors. Why haven't we met before? If you had told me you knew my grandfather when you appeared in the garden, I should not have been the least surprised, I answered irrelevantly. I really thought you were the ghost of the old fountain. How in the world did you come here at that hour? We were a large party, and we went out for a walk. Then we thought we should like to see what your park was like in the moonlight. And so we trespassed. I got separated from the rest and came upon you by accident, just as I was admiring the extremely ghostly look of your house and wondering whether anybody would ever come and live there again. It looks like the castle of Macbeth or a scene from the opera. Do you know anybody here? Hardly so. Do you? No. Aunt Bluebell said it was her duty to come. It is easy for her to go out. She doesn't bear the burden of the conversation. I'm sorry you find it a burden, said I. Shall I go away? Miss Lammas looked at me with a sudden gravity in her beautiful eyes, and there was a sort of hesitation about the lines of her full, soft mouth. No, she said at last, quite simply. Don't go away. We may like each other if you stay a little longer, and we ought to, because we are neighbors in the country. I suppose I ought to have thought Miss Lammas a very odd girl. There is, indeed, a sort of freemasonry between people who discover that they live near each other and that they ought to have known each other before. But there was a sort of unexpected frankness and simplicity in the girl's amusing manner which would have struck anyone else as being singular, to say the least of it. To me, however, it all seemed natural enough. I had dreamed of her face too long not to be utterly happy when I met her at last and could talk to her as much as I pleased. To me, the man of ill luck in everything, the whole meeting seemed too good to be true. I felt again that strange sensation of lightness which I had experienced after I had seen her face in the garden. The great rooms seemed brighter, life seemed worth living, and my sluggish, melancholy blood ran faster and filled me with a new sense of strength. I said to myself that without this woman I was but an imperfect being, but that with her I could accomplish everything to which I should set my hand. Like the dear doctor, when he thought he had cheated Mephistopheles at last, I could have cried aloud up to the fleeting moment, Ferfeltok, du bist so schön. Are you always gay? I asked suddenly. How happy you must be! The days would sometimes seem very long if I were gloomy, she answered thoughtfully. Yes, 
I think I find life very pleasant, and I tell it so. How can you tell life anything? I inquired. If I could catch my life and talk to it, I would abuse it prodigiously, I assure you. I dare say you have a melancholy temper. You ought to live out of doors, dig potatoes, make hay, shoot, hunt, tumble into ditches, and come home muddy and hungry for dinner. It would be much better for you than moping in your rook tower and hating everything. It is rather lonely down there, I murmured apologetically, feeling that Miss Lammas was quite right. Then marry and quarrel with your wife, she laughed. Anything is better than being alone. I am a very peaceable person. I never quarrel with anybody. You can try it. You will find it quite impossible. Will you let me try? She asked, still smiling. By all means, especially if it is to be only a preliminary canter, I answered rashly. What do you mean? She inquired, turning quickly to me. Oh, nothing. You might try my paces with a view to quarrelling in the future. I cannot imagine how you are going to do it. You will have to resort to immediate and direct abuse. No, I will only say that if you do not like your life, it is your own fault. How can a man of your age talk of being melancholy or of the hollowness of existence? Are you consumptive? Are you subject to hereditary insanity? Are you deaf, like Ern Bluebell? Are you poor, like lots of people? Have you been crossed in love? Have you lost the world for a woman, or any particular woman, for the sake of the world? Are you feeble-minded, a cripple, an outcast? Are you repulsively ugly? She laughed again. Is there any reason in the world why you should not enjoy all you have got in life? No, there is no reason whatever, except that I am dreadfully unlucky, especially in small things. Then try big things, just for a change, suggested Miss Lammas. Try and get married, for instance, and how it turns out. If I turn out badly, I, it would be rather serious. Not half so serious as it is to abuse everything unreasonably. If abuse is your particular talent, abuse something they ought to be abused. Abuse the conservatives or the liberals. It doesn't matter which, since they are always abusing each other. Make yourself felt by other people. You will like it, if they don't. It will make a man of you. Fill your mouth with pebbles and howl at the sea if you cannot do anything else. It did the most no end of good, you know. You will have the satisfaction of imitating a great man. Really, Miss Lammas, I think the list of innocent exercises you propose. Very well. If you don't care for that sort of thing, care for some other sort of thing, care for something or hate something, don't be idle. Life is short, and though art may be long, plenty of noise answers nearly as well. I do care for something, I mean somebody, I said. A woman? Then marry her, don't hesitate. I do not know whether she would marry me, I replied. I have never asked her. Then ask her at once, answered Miss Lammas. I shall die happy if I feel I have persuaded a melancholy fellow creature to rouse himself to action. Ask her, by all means, and see what she says. If she does not accept you at once, she might take you the next time. Meanwhile, you will have entered for the race. If you lose, there are the old-aged trial stakes and the consolation race, and plenty of selling races in the bargain. Shall I take you at your word, Miss Lammas? I hope you will, she answered. Since you yourself advise me, I will. Miss Lammas, will you do me the honour to marry me? For the first time in my life, the blood rushed to my head, 
and my sight swam. I cannot tell why I said it. It would be useless to try to explain the extraordinary fascination the girl exercised over me, or the still more extraordinary feeling of intimacy with her which had grown in me during that half hour. Lonely, sad, unlucky as I had been all my life, I was certainly not timid, nor even shy, but to propose to marry a woman after half an hour's acquaintance was a piece of madness of which I never believed myself capable, and of which I should never be capable again, could I be placed in the same situation. It was as though my whole being had been changed in a moment by magic, by the white magic of her nature brought into contact with mine. The blood sank back to my heart, and a moment later I found myself staring at her with anxious eyes. To my amazement, she was as calm as ever, but her beautiful mouth smiled, and there was a mischievous light in her dark brown eyes. Fairy court, she answered, but for an individual who pretends to be listless and sad, you are not lacking in humor. I had really not the least idea what you were going to say. Wouldn't it be singularly awkward for you if I had said yes? I never saw anybody begin to practice so sharply what was preached to him, with so very little loss of time. You probably never met a man who had dreamed of you for seven months before being introduced. No, I never did, she answered gaily. It smacks of the romantic. Perhaps you are a romantic character, after all. I should think you were if I believed you. Very well. You've taken my advice, entered for a stranger's race and lost it, tried the old aged trial stakes. You have another cuff and a pencil, propose to Aunt Bluebell. She would dance with astonishment, and she might recover her earring. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. All short stories, volume one, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, volume one, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section. 20. By the Waters of Paradise by F. Marion Crawford. Part 3. That was how I first asked Margaret Lammas to be my wife, and I will agree with anyone who says I behaved very foolishly. But I have not repented of it, and I never shall. I have long ago understood that I was out of my mind that evening, but I think that my temporary insanity on that occasion, has had the effect of making me a saner man ever since. Her manner turned my head, for it was so different from what I had expected, to hear this lovely creature, who in my imagination was the heroine of romance, if not of tragedy, talking familiarly and laughing readily, was more than my equanimity could bear, and I lost my head as well as my heart. But when I went back to England in the spring, I went to make certain arrangements at the castle, certain changes and improvements which would be absolutely necessary. I had won the race for which I had entered myself so rashly, and we were to be married in June. Whether the change was due to the orders I had left with the gardener and the rest of the servants, or to my own state of mind, I cannot tell. At all events, the old place did not look the same to me when I opened my window on the morning after my arrival. There were the grey walls below me, and the grey turrets flanking the huge building. There were the fountains, the marble causeways, the smooth basins, the tall box edges, 
the water lilies and the swan just as of old but there was something else there too something in the air in the water and in the greenness that i did not recognize a light over everything by which everything was transfigured the clock in the tower struck e seven in the strokes of the ancient bell sounded like a wedding chime the air sang with the thrilling treble of the songbirds with the silvery music of the splashing water and the softer harmony of the leaves stirred by the fresh morning wind there was a smell of new mown hay from the distant meadows and of blooming roses from the beds below wafted up together to my window i stood in the pure sunshine and drank the air and all the sounds and the odors that were in it and i looked down at my garden and said it is paradise after all i think the men of old were right when they called heaven a garden and eden a garden inhabited by one man and one woman the earthly paradise i turned away wondering what had become of the gloomy memories i had always associated with my home i tried to recall the impression of my nurse's horrible prophecy before the death of my parents an impression which hitherto had been vivid enough i tried to remember my old self my dejection my listlessness my bad luck my petty disappointments i endeavoured to force myself to think as i used to think if only to satisfy myself that i not lost my individuality but i succeeded in none of these efforts i was a different man a changed being incapable of sorrow of ill luck or of sadness my life had been a dream not evil but infinitely gloomy and hopeless it was now a reality full of hope gladness and all manner of good my home had been like a tomb today it was paradise my heart had been as though it had not existed today it beat with strength and youth and the certainty of realized happiness i reveled in the beauty of the world and called loveliness out of the future to enjoy it before time should bring it to me as a traveller in the plains looks up to the mountains and already tastes the cool air through the dust of the road here i thought we'll live and live for years there we will sit by the fountains towards evening and in the deep moonlight down those paths we will wander together on those benches we will rest and talk among those eastern hills we will ride through the soft twilight and in the old house we will tell tales on winter nights when the logs burn high and the holly berries are red and the old clock tolls out the dying year on these old steps in these dark passages and stately rooms there will one day be the sound of little pattering feet and laughing child voices will ring up to the vaults of the ancient hall those tiny footsteps shall not be slow and sad as mine were nor shall the childish words be spoken in an awed whisper no gloomy welshwoman shall people the dusky corners with weird horrors no utter horrid prophecies of death and ghastly things all shall be young and fresh and joyful and happy and we will turn the old luck again and forget that there was ever any sadness so i thought as i looked out of my window that morning and for many mornings after that and every day it all seemed more real than ever before and much nearer but the old nurse looked at me askance and muttered odd sayings about the woman of the water i cared little what she said because i was far too happy at last the time came near for the wedding lady bluebell and all the tribe of bluebells as margaret called them 
that were at the Bluebell Grange, for we had determined to be married in the country, and to come straight to the castle afterwards. We cared little for travelling, and not at all for a crowded ceremony at St. George's in Hanover Square, with all the tiresome formalities afterwards. I used to ride over to the Grange every day, and very often Margaret would come with her aunt and some of the consuls to the castle. I was suspicious of my own taste, and was only too glad to let her have her way about the alterations and improvements in our home. We were to be married on the 30th of July, and on the evening of the 28th, Margaret drove over with some of the Bluebell party. In the long summer twilight, we, we all went out into the garden. Naturally enough, Margaret and I were left to ourselves, and we wandered down by the marble basins. It is an odd coincidence, I said. It was on this very night last year that I first saw you. Hmm, <laughs> considering that it is the month of July, answered Margaret with a laugh, and that we have been here almost every day, I don't think the coincidence is so extraordinary after all. No, dear, said I, I suppose not. I don't know why it struck me. We shall very likely be here a year from today, and a year from that. The odd thing, when I think of it, is that you should be here at all. But my luck has turned. I ought not to think anything odd that happens, now that I have you. It is all sure to be good. A slight change in your ideas since that remarkable performance of yours in Paris, said Margaret. Do you know? I thought you were the most extraordinary man I'd ever met. I thought you were the most charming woman I'd ever seen. I naturally did not want to lose any time in frivolities. I took you at your word, I followed your advice, I asked you to marry me. And this is the delightful result. What's the matter? Margaret had started suddenly, and her hand tightened on my arm. An old woman was coming up the path, and was close to us before we saw her, for the moon had risen, and it was shining full in our faces. The woman turned out to be my old nurse. It's only Judith, dear. Don't be frightened, I said. Then I spoke to the Welsh woman. What are you about, Judith? Have you been feeding the woman of the water? Eh, uh, when the clock strikes, Willie, my lord, I, I mean, muttered the old creature, drawing aside to let us pass, and fixing her strange eyes on Margaret's face. What does she mean? asked Margaret when we had gone by. Nothing, darling. The old thing is mildly crazy, but she is a good soul. We went on in silence for a few moments, and came to the rustic bridge just above the artificial grotto, through which the water ran out into the park, dark and swift in its narrow channel. We stopped and leaned on the wooden rail. The moon was now behind us, and shone full upon the long vista of basins and on the huge walls and towers of the castle above. How proud you ought to be of such a grand old place, said Margaret softly. It is yours now, darling, I answered. You have as good a right to love it as I. But I only love it because you are to live in it, dear. Her hand stole out and loaned mine and we were both silent. Just then, the clock began to strike far off in the tower. I counted. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. I looked at my watch. Twelve, thirteen. I laughed. The bell went on, striking. The old clock has gone crazy like you did, I explained. Still it went on, note after note, ringing out monotonously through the still air. We leaned over the rail, instinctively looking in the direction whence the sound came. On and on it went. 
I counted nearly a hundred, out of sheer curiosity, for I understood that something had broken, and that the thing was running itself down. Suddenly there was a crack as of breaking wood, a cry and a heavy splash, and I was alone, clinging to the broken end of the rail of the rusty bridge. I do not think I hesitated while my purse beat twice. I sprang clear of the bridge into the black rushing water, dived to the bottom, came up again with empty hands, turned and swam downward through the grotto in the thick darkness, plunging and diving at every stroke, striking my head and hands against jagged stones and sharp corners, clutching a glass something in my fingers and dragging it up with all my might. I spoke, I cried aloud, but there was no answer. I was alone in the pitchy darkness with my burden, and the house was five hundred yards away. Struggling still, I felt the ground beneath my feet. I saw a ray of moonlight. The grotto widened, and the deep water became a broad and shallow brook as I stumbled over the stones, and, at last, led Margaret's body on the bank in the park beyond. Eh, hey, Willie, as the clock struck, said the voice of Judith, the Welsh nurse, as she bent down and looked at the white face. The old woman must have turned back and followed us, seen the accident, and slipped out by the lower gate of the garden. Eh, hey, she groaned, you have fed the woman of the water this night, Willie, while the clock was striking. I scarcely heard her as I knelt beside the lifeless body of the woman I loved, chafing the wet white temples and gazing wildly into the wide staring eyes. I remember only the first returning look of consciousness, the first heaving breath, the first movement of those dear hands stretching out towards me. That is not much of a story, you say. It is the story of my life, that is all. It does not pretend to be anything else. All Judith says my luck turned on that summer's night when I was struggling in the water to save all that was worth living for. A month later, there was a stone bridge over the grotto, and Margaret and I stood on it and looked up at the moonlight castle as we had done once before, and as we have done many times since. For all those things happened ten years ago, last summer, and this is the tenth Christmas Eve we've spent together by the roaring logs in the old hall, talking of old times. And every year there are more old times to talk of. There are curly-headed boys, too, with red-gold hair and dark brown eyes, like their mother's, and a little Margaret, with solemn black eyes like mine. Why could she not look like her mother, too, as well as the rest of them? The world is very bright at this glorious Christmas time, and perhaps there is little use in calling up the sadness of long ago, unless it be to make the jolly firelight seem more cheerful, the good wife's face look gladder and to give the children's laughter a merrier ring, by contrast with all what is, that is gone. Perhaps, too, some sad-faced, listless, melancholy youth, who feels that the world is very hollow, and that life is like a perpetual funeral service, just as I used to feel myself, may take courage from my example, and, having found the woman of his heart, ask her to marry him after half an hour's acquaintance. But, on the whole, I would not advise any man to marry, for the simple reason that no man will ever find a wife like mine, and being obliged to do farther, he will necessarily fare worse. My wife has done miracles, but I will not assert that any other woman is able to follow her example. Margaret always said that the old place was beautiful, and that I ought to be proud of it. I dare say she is right. 
She has even more imagination than I, but I have a good answer, and a plain one, which is this, that all the beauty of the castles comes from her. She has breathed upon it all, as the children blow upon the cool glass window panes in winter, and as their warm breath crystallizes into landscapes from fairyland, full of exquisite shapes and traceries upon the blank surface, so her spirit has transformed every grey stone of the old towers, every ancient tree and hedge in the gardens, every thought in my once melancholy self. All that was old is young, and all that was sad is glad, and I am the gladdest of all. Whatever heaven may be, there is no earthly paradise without movement, nor is there anywhere a place to so desolate, so dreary, so unutterably miserable, that a woman cannot make it seem heaven to the man she loves, and who loves her. I hear certain cynics laugh and cry that all that has been said before. Do not, do not loathe, my good cynic. You are too small a man to laugh at such a great thing as love. Prayers have been said before now by many, and perhaps you say yours too. I do not think they lose anything by being repeated, nor you by repeating them. You say that the world is bitter and full of the waters of bitterness. Love and so live that you may be loved. The world will turn sweet for you, and you shall rest, like me, by the waters of paradise. End of section 20「American Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « International Short Stories» Volume 1 – American Stories Edited by William Patton Section 21 – A Memorable Night by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 1 I am a young physician of limited practice and great ambition. At the time of the incidents I am about to relate, my office was in a respectable house in 24th Street, New York City, and was shared, greatly to my own pleasure and convenience, by a clever young German whose acquaintance I had made in the hospital, and to whom I had become, in the one short year in which we had practiced together, most unreasonably attached. I say unreasonably because it was a liking for which I could not account, even to myself, as he was neither especially prepossessing in appearance nor gifted with any too great amiability of character. He was, however, a brilliant theorist and an unquestionably trustworthy practitioner, and for these reasons probably I entertained for him a profound respect and, as I have already said, a hearty and spontaneous affection. As our specialties were the same, and as, moreover, they were of a nature which did not call for night work, we usually spent the evening together. But once I failed to join him at the office, and it is of this night I have to tell. I had been over to Orange, for my heart was sore over the quarrel I had had with Dora, and I was resolved to make one final effort towards reconciliation. But alas for my hopes, she was not at home, and what was worse I soon learned that she was going to sail the next morning for Europe. This news, coming as it did without warning, affected me seriously, for I knew if she escaped from my influence at this time, I should certainly lose her for ever, for the gentleman concerning whom we had quarreled was a much better match for her than I and almost equally in love. However, her father, who had always been my friend, did not look upon this same gentleman's advantages with as favorable an eye as she did, 
and when he heard I was in the house, he came hurrying into my presence, with excitement written in every line of his fine face. "'Ah, Dick, my boy!' he exclaimed joyfully. "'How opportune this is! I was wishing you would come, for do you know, Appleby has taken passage on board the same steamer as Dora, and if he and she cross together, they will certainly come to an understanding, and that will not be fair to you, or pleasing to me.' and I do not care who knows it. I gave him one look, and sank quite overwhelmed into the seat nearest me. Appleby was the name of my rival, and I quite agreed with her father that the tete-a-tetes afforded by an ocean voyage would surely put an end to the hopes which I had so long and secretly cherished. Does she know he is going? Did she encourage him? I stammered. But the old man answered genially, Oh, she knows but I cannot say anything positive about her having encouraged him. The fact is, Dick, she still holds a soft place in her heart for you, and if you were going to be of the party, well, I think you would come off conqueror yet. Then I will be of the party, I cried. It is only six now, and I can be in New York by seven. That gives me five hours before midnight, time enough in which to arrange my plans, see Richter, and make everything ready for sailing in the morning. "'Dick, you are a trump!' exclaimed the gratified father. "'You have a spirit I like, and if Dora does not like it too, then I am mistaken in her good sense. But can you leave your patience? "'Just now I have but one patient who is in anything like a critical condition,' I replied, "'and her case Richter understands almost as well as I do myself.' I will have to see her this evening, of course, and explain, but there is time for that if I go now. The steamer sails at nine. Precisely. Do not tell Dora that I expect to be there. Let her be surprised. Dear girl, she is quite well, I hope. Yes, very well, only going over with her aunt to do some shopping. A poor outlook for a struggling physician, you think. Well, I don't know about that. She is just the kind of girl to go from one extreme to another. If she once loves you, she will not care any longer about Paris fashions. She shall love me, I cried, and left him in a great hurry to catch the first train for Hoboken. It seemed wild, this scheme, but I determined to pursue it. I loved Dora too much to lose her, and if three weeks' absence would procure me the happiness of my life, why should I hesitate to avail myself of the proffered opportunity? I rode on air as the express I had taken shot from station to station, and by the time I had arrived at Christopher Street Ferry, my plans were all laid and my time disposed of till midnight. It was therefore with no laggard step I hurried to my office, nor was it with any ordinary feelings of impatience that I found Richter out, for this was not his usual hour for absenting himself and I had much to tell him and many advices to give. It was the first balk I had received, and I was fuming over it, when I saw what looked like a package of books lying on the table before me, and though it was addressed to my partner, I was about to take it up, when I heard my name uttered in a tremulous tone, and turning, saw a man standing in the doorway, who, the moment I met his eye, advanced into the room and said, "'Oh, doctor!' I have been waiting for you an hour. Mrs. Warner has been taken very bad, sir, and she prays that you'll not delay a moment before coming to her. It is something serious, I fear, and she may have died already, for she would have no one else but you, and it is now an hour since I left her. And who are you? I asked, for though I knew Mrs. Warner well, she is the patient to whom I have already referred, I did not know her messenger. I am a servant in the house where she was taken ill. Then she is not at home? No, sir, she is in Second Avenue. I am very sorry, I began, but I have not the time, but he interrupted eagerly. There is a carriage at the door. We thought you might not have your phaeton ready. I had noticed the carriage. Very well, said I, I will go. But first let me write a line. Oh, sir, the man broke in pleadingly. Do not wait for anything. She is really very bad, and I heard her calling for you as I ran out of the house. She had her voice then, I ventured, somewhat distrustful of the whole thing, and yet not knowing how to refuse the man, 
especially as it was absolutely necessary for me to see Mrs. Warner that night and get her consent to my departure before I could think of making further plans. So, leaving word for Richter to be sure and wait for me if he came home before I did, I signified to Mrs. Warner's messenger that I was ready to go with him and immediately took a seat in the carriage which had been provided for me. The man at once jumped up on the box beside the driver, and before I could close the carriage door we were off, riding rapidly down Seventh Avenue. As we went the thought came, what if Mrs. Warner will not let me off? But I dismissed the fear at once, for this patient of mine is an extremely unselfish woman and if she were not too ill to grasp the situation, would certainly sympathize with the strait I was in, and consent to accept Richter's services in place of my own, especially as she knows and trusts him. When the carriage stopped it was already dark and I could distinguish little of the house I entered, save that it was large and old, and did not look like an establishment where a manservant would be likely to be kept. "'Is Mrs. Warner here?' I asked of the man, who was slowly getting down from the box. "'Yes, sir,' he answered quickly, and I was about to ring the bell before me, when the door opened and a young German girl, curtsying slightly, welcomed me in, saying, "'Mrs. Warner is upstairs, sir, in the front room, if you please.' Not doubting her, but greatly astonished at the barren aspect of the place I was in, I stumbled up the faintly lighted stairs before me and entered the great front room. It was empty but through an open door at the other end I heard a voice saying, "'He has come, madam,' and anxious to see my patient, whose presence in this desolate house I found it harder and harder to understand, I stepped into the room where she presumably lay. Alas for my temerity in doing so, for no sooner had I crossed the threshold than the door by which I had entered closed with a click unlike any I had ever heard before, and when I turned to see what it meant, Another click came from the opposite side of the room, and I perceived with a benumbed sense of wonder that the one person whose somewhat shadowy figure I had encountered on entering had vanished from the place, and that I was shut up alone in a room without visible means of egress. This was startling and hard to believe at first, but after I had tried the door by which I had entered and found it securely locked, and then bounding to the other side of the room, tried the opposite one with the same result, I could not but acknowledge I was caught. What did it mean? Caught, and I was in haste, mad haste. Filling the room with my cries, I shouted for help and a quick release, but my efforts were naturally fruitless. And after exhausting myself in vain, I stood still and surveyed, with what equanimity was left me, the appearance of the dreary place in which I had thus suddenly become entrapped. CHAPTER Two. It was a small square room, and I shall not soon forget with what a foreboding shudder I observed that its four blank walls were literally unbroken by a single window, for this told me that I was in no communication with the street, and that it would be impossible for me to summon help from the outside world. The single gas jet burning in a fixture hanging from the ceiling was the only relief given to the eye in the blank expanse of white wall that surrounded me, while as to furniture the room could boast of nothing more than an old-fashioned black walnut table and two chairs, the latter cushioned but stiff in the back and generally dilapidated in appearance. The only sign of comfort about me was a tray that stood on the table, containing a couple of bottles of wine and two glasses. The bottles were full and the glasses clean and to add to this appearance of hospitality, a box of cigars rested invitingly near, which I could not fail to perceive, even at the first glance, were of the very best brand. Astonished at these tokens of consideration for my welfare, and confounded by the prospect which they offered of a lengthy stay in this place, I gave another great shout, but to no better purpose than before. Not a voice answered, and not a stir was heard in the house but there came from without the faint sound of suddenly moving wheels, as if the carriage which I had left standing before the door had slowly rolled away. If this were so, then I was indeed a prisoner, while the moments so necessary to my plans, and perhaps to the securing of my whole future happiness, were flying by like the wind. 
As I realized this, and my own utter helplessness, I fell into one of the chairs before me, in a state of perfect despair. Not that any fears for my life were disturbing me. The one in my situation might well question if he would ever again breathe the open air from which he had been so ingeniously lured. I did not, in that first moment of utter downheartedness, so much as inquire the reason for the trick which had been played upon me. No, my heart was full of Dora, and I was asking myself if I were destined to lose her after all, and that, through no lack of effort on my part, but just because a party of thieves or blackmailers had thought fit to play a game with my liberty. It could not be. There must be some mistake about it. It was some great joke, or I was the victim of a dream, or suffering from some hideous nightmare. Why, only a half hour before, I was in my own office, among my own familiar belongings, and now, but alas, it was no delusion. Only four blank whitewashed walls met my inquiring eyes, and though I knocked and knocked again upon the two doors which guarded me on either side, hollow echoes continued to be the only answer I received. Had the carriage then taken away the two persons I had seen in this house, and was I indeed alone in its great emptiness? The thought made me desperate, but notwithstanding this I was resolved to continue my efforts, for I might be mistaken. There might yet be some being left who would yield to my entreaties, if they were backed by something substantial. Taking out my watch I laid it on the table. It was just a quarter to eight. Then I emptied my trousers pockets of whatever money they held, and when all was heaped up before me I could count but twelve dollars, which together with my studs and a seal ring which I wore, seemed a paltry pittance with which to barter for the liberty of which I had been robbed. But it was all I had with me, and I was willing to part with it at once if only someone would unlock the door and let me go. But how to make known my wishes, even if there was anyone to listen to them? I had already called in vain, and there was no bell. Yes, there was. Why had I not seen it before? There was a bell, and I sprang to ring it. But just as my hand fell on the cord, I heard a gentle voice behind my back saying in good English, but with a strong foreign accent, Put up your money, Mr. Atwater. We do not want your money, only your society. Allow me to beg you to replace both watch and money. Wheeling about in my double surprise at the presence of this intruder and his unexpected acquaintance with my name, I encountered the smiling glance of a middle-aged man of genteel appearance and courteous manners. He was bowing almost to the ground, and was, as I instantly detected, of German birth and education, a gentleman and not a blackleg that I had every reason to expect to see. "'You have made a slight mistake,' he was saying. "'It is your society only your society that we want. Astonished at his appearance, and exceedingly irritated by his words, I stepped back as he offered me my watch, and bluntly cried, If it is my society only that you want, you have certainly taken very strange means to procure it. A thief could have set up no neater trap, and if it is money you want, state your sum and let me go, for my time is valuable and my society likely to be unpleasant. He gave a shrug with his shoulders that in no wise interfered with his set smile. "'You choose to be facetious,' he observed. "'I have already remarked that we have no use for your money. Will you sit down? Here is some excellent wine, and if this brand of cigars does not suit you, I will send for another.' "'Send for the devil!' I cried, greatly exasperated. "'What do you mean by keeping me in this place against my will?' open that door and let me out, or I was ready to spring, and he saw it. Smiling more atrociously than ever, he slipped behind the table, and before I could reach him had quietly drawn a pistol, which he cocked before my eyes. You are excited, he remarked, with a suavity that nearly drove me mad. Now excitement is no aid to good company, and I am determined that none but good company shall be in this room tonight. So if you will be kind enough to calm yourself, Mr. Atwater, you and I may yet enjoy ourselves, but if not, the action he made was significant, and I felt the cold sweat break out on my forehead through all the heat of my indignation. 
but I did not mean to show him that he had intimidated me. Excuse me, said I, and put down your pistol. Though you are making me lose irredeemable time, I will try and control myself enough to give you an opportunity for explaining yourself. Why have you entrapped me into this place? I have already told you, said he, gently laying the pistol before him, but within easy reach of his hand. But that is preposterous, I began, fast losing my self-control again. You do not know me, and if you did, pardon me. You see, I know your name. Yes, that was true, and the fact set me thinking. How did he know my name? I did not know him, nor did I know this house, or any reason for which I could have been beguiled into it. Was I the victim of a conspiracy, or was the man mad? Looking at him very earnestly, I declared, My name is Atwater, and so far you are right. But in learning that much about me, you must also have learned that I am neither rich nor influential, nor of any special value to a blackmailer. Why choose me, then, for your society? Why not choose someone who can talk? I find your conversation very interesting. Baffled, exasperated, almost beyond the power to restrain myself, I shook my fist in his face, notwithstanding I saw his hand fly to his pistol. Let me go, I shrieked. Let me out of this place. I have business, I tell you, important business which means everything to me, and which, if I do not attend to it tonight, will be lost to me forever. Let me go, and I will so far reward you that I will speak to no one of what has taken place here tonight. But go my ways, forgetful of you, forgetful of this house, forgetful of all connected with it. You are very good, was his quiet reply. But this vine has to be drunk, and he calmly poured out a glass, while I drew back in despair. You do not drink vine? he queried, holding up the glass he had filled between himself and the light. It is a pity, for it is of most rare vintage. But perhaps you smoke. Sick and disgusted, I found a chair and sat down in it. If the man were crazy, there was certainly method in his madness. Besides, he had not a crazy eye. There was calm calculation in it, and not a little good nature. Did he simply want to detain me, and if so, did he have a motive it would pay me to fathom before I exerted myself further to ensure my release? Answering the wave he made me with his hand by reaching out for the bottle and filling myself a glass, I forced myself to speak more affably as I remarked. If the wine must be drunk, we had better be about it, as you cannot mean to detain me more than an hour, whatever reason you may have for wishing my society. He looked at me inquiringly before answering. Then, tossing off his glass, he remarked, I am sorry, but in an hour a man can scarcely make the acquaintance of another man's exterior. Then you mean? To know you thoroughly, if you will be so good. I may never have the opportunity again. He must be mad. Nothing else but mania could account for such words and such actions. And yet, if mad, why was he allowed to enter my presence? The man who brought me here, the woman who received me at the door, had not been mad. And I must stay here, I began, till I am quite satisfied. I am afraid that will take till morning. I gave a cry of despair and then, in my utter desperation, spoke up to him, as I would to a man of feeling. You don't know what you are doing. You don't know what I shall suffer by any such cruel detention. This night is not like other nights to me. This is a special night in my life, and I need it. I need it, I tell you, to spend as I will. The woman I love. It seemed horrible to speak of her in this place, but I was wild at my helplessness and madly hoped I might awake some answering chord in a breast which could not be void of all feeling, or he would not have that benevolent look in his eye. The woman I love, I repeated, sails for Europe tomorrow. We have quarreled, but she still cares for me, and if I can sail on the same steamer, we will yet make up and be happy. At what time does the steamer start? At nine in the morning. 
Well, you shall leave this house at eight. If you go directly to the steamer, you will be in time. But, but, I panted, I have made no arrangements. I shall have to go to my lodgings, write letters, get money. I ought to be there at this moment. Have you no mercy on a man who never did you wrong, and only ask to quit you, and forget the precious hour you have made him lose? I am sorry, he said. It is certainly quite unfortunate, but the door will not be opened before eight. There is really no one in the house to unlock it. And do you mean to say, I cried aghast, that you could not open the door if you would? That you are locked in here as well as I? And that I must remain here till morning, no matter how I feel or you feel? Will you not take a cigar? he asked. Then I began to see how useless it was to struggle and visions of Dora leaning on the steamer rail, with that serpent whispering soft entreaties in her ear, came rushing before me, till I could have wept in my jealous chagrin. It is cruel, base, devilish, I began, if you had the excuse of wanting money, and took this method of wringing my all from me, I could have patience. But to entrap me, and keep me here for nothing, when my whole future happiness is trembling in the balance, is the work of a fiend, and I made a sudden pause, for a strange idea had struck me. CHAPTER Three. What if this man, these men, and this woman, were in league with him whose rivalry I feared, and whom I had intended to supplant on the morrow? It was a wild surmise. But was it any wilder than to believe I was held here for a mere whim, a freak, a joke, as this bowing, smiling man before me would have me believe? Rising in fresh excitement, I struck my hand on the table. "'You want to keep me from going on the steamer,' I cried. "'That other wretch who loves her has paid you.' But that other wretch could not know that I was meditating any such unusual scheme as following him without a full day's warning. I thought of this even before I had finished my sentence, and did not need the blank astonishment in the face of the man before me to convince me that I had given utterance to a foolish accusation. It would have been some sort of a motive for your actions, I humbly added, as I sank back from my hostile attitude. Now you have none. I thought he bestowed upon me a look of quiet pity, but if so, he soon hid it with his uplifted glass. "'Forget the girl,' said he. "'I know of a dozen just as pretty.' I was too indignant to answer. "'Women are the bane of life,' he now sententiously exclaimed. "'They are ever intruding themselves between a man and his comfort, as, for instance, just now, between yourself and this good wine.' I caught up the bottle in sheer desperation. Don't talk of them, I cried, and I will try and drink. I almost wish there was poison in the glass. My death here might bring punishment upon you. He shook his head, totally unmoved by my passion. We deal punishment, not receive it. It would not worry me in the least to leave you lying here upon the floor. I did not believe this, but I did not stop to weigh the question then. I was too much struck by a word he had used. Deal punishment, I repeated. Are you punishing me? Is that why I am here? He laughed and held out his glass to mine. You enjoy being sarcastic, he observed. Well, it gives a spice to conversation, I own. Talk is apt to be dull without it. For reply, I struck the glass from his hand. It fell and shivered, and he looked for the moment really distressed. I had rather you had struck me, he remarked for I have an answer for an injury like that. But for a broken glass, he sighed and looked dolefully at the pieces on the floor. Mortified and somewhat ashamed, I put down my own glass. You should not have exasperated me, I cried, and walked away beyond temptation to the other side of the room. His spirits had received a dampener, but in a few minutes he seized upon a cigar and began smoking. As the wreaths curled over his head, he began to talk, and this time it was on subjects totally foreign to myself, and even to himself. It was good talk that I recognized, though I hardly listened to what he said. 
I was asking myself what time it had now got to be, and what was the meaning of my incarceration, till my brain became weary and I could scarcely distinguish the topic he discussed. But he kept on, for all my seeming and indeed real indifference, kept on, hour after hour, in a monologue he endeavored to make interesting, and which probably would have been so, if the time and occasion had been fit for my enjoying it. As it was, I had no ear for choicest phrases, his subtlest criticisms, or his most philosophic disquisitions. I was wrapped up in self, and my cruel disappointment, and when, in a certain access of frenzy, I leaped to my feet and took a look at the watch still lying on the table, and saw it was four o'clock in the morning, I gave a bound of final despair, and throwing myself on the floor, gave myself up to the heavy sleep that mercifully came to relieve me. I was roused by feeling a touch on my breast. Clapping my hand to the spot where I had felt the intruding hand, I discovered that my watch had been returned to my pocket. Drawing it out, I first looked at it and then cast my eyes quickly about the room. There was no one with me, and the doors stood open between me and the hall. It was eight o'clock as my watch had just told me, that I rushed from the house and took the shortest road to the steamer goes without saying. I could not cross the ocean with Dora, but I might yet see her and tell her how near I came to giving her my company on that long voyage, which now would only serve to further the ends of my rival. But when, after torturing delays on cars and ferry boats, and incredible efforts to pierce a throng that was equally determined not to be pierced, I at last reached the wharf. It was to behold her, just as I had fancied in my wildest moments, leaning on a rail of the ship, and listening, while she abstractedly waved her hand to some friends below, to the words of the man who had never looked so handsome to me, or so odious as at this moment of his unconscious triumph. Her father was near her, and from his eager attitude and rapidly wandering gaze, I saw that he was watching for me. At last he spied me, struggling aboard, and immediately his face lighted up in a way which made me wish he had not thought it necessary to wait for my anticipated meeting with his daughter. "'Ah, Dick, you are late,' he began effusively, as I put foot on deck. But I waved him back and went at once to Dora. "'Forgive me, pardon me,' I incoherently said, as her sweet eyes rose in startled pleasure to mine. I would have brought you flowers, but I meant to sail with you, Dora. I tried to, but wretches, villains, prevented it, and, and, oh, it does not matter, she said, and then blushed, probably because the words sounded unkind. I mean, but she could not say what she meant, for just then the bell rang for all visitors to leave, and her father came forward, evidently thinking all was right between us smiled benignantly in her face, gave her a kiss and me a wink, and disappeared in the crowd that now was rapidly going ashore. I felt that I must follow, but I gave her one look and one squeeze of the hand, and then as I saw her glances wander to his face, I groaned in spirit, stammered some words of choking sorrow, and was gone, before her embarrassment would let her speak words which I knew would only add to my grief and make this hasty parting unendurable. The look of amazement and chagrin with which her father met my reappearance on the dock can easily be imagined. "'Why, Dick!' he exclaimed. "'Aren't you going after all?' "'I thought I could rely on you. Where's your plucky lad? Scared off by a frown? I wouldn't have believed it, Dick. What if she does frown today? She will smile tomorrow.' I shook my head. I could not tell him just then that it was not through any lack of pluck on my part that I had failed him. When I left the dock I went straight to a restaurant, for I was faint as well as miserable. But my cup of coffee choked me, and the rolls and eggs were more than I could face. Rising impatiently I went out. Was any one more wretched than I that morning, and could any one nourish a more bitter grievance? As I strode towards my lodgings, I chewed on the cut of my disappointment till my wrongs loomed up like mountains, and I was seized by a spirit of revenge. Should I let such an interference as I had received go unpunished? No, 
if the wretch who had detained me was not used to punishment he should receive a specimen of it now and from a man who was no longer a prisoner and who once aroused did not easily forego his purposes turning aside from my former destination i went immediately to a police station and when i had entered my complaint was astonished to see that all the officials had grouped about me and were listening to my words with the most startled interest was the man who came for you a german one asked i said yes and the man who stood guardian over you and entertained you with wine and cigars was not he a german too i nodded acquiescence and they at once began to whisper together then one of them advanced to me and said you have not been home i understand you had better come astonished by his manner i endeavored to inquire what he meant but he drew me away and not until we were within a stone's throw of my office did he say you must prepare yourself for a shock the impertinences you suffered from last night were unpleasant no doubt but if you had been allowed to return home you might not now be deploring them in comparative peace and safety what do you mean that your partner was not as fortunate as yourself look up at the house what do you see there a crowd was what i saw first but he made me look higher and then i perceived that the windows of my room of our room were shattered and blackened and that part of the casement of one had been blown out a fire i shrieked poor richter was smoking no he was not smoking he had no time for a smoke an infernal machine burst in that room last night and your friend was its wretched victim i never knew why my friend's life was made a sacrifice to the revenge of his fellow countrymen though we had been intimate over the year we had been together he had never talked to me of his country and i had never seen him in company with one of his own nation but that he was the victim of some political revenge was apparent for though it proved impossible to find the man who had detained me the house was found and ransacked and amongst other secret things was discovered the model of the machine which had been introduced into our room and which had proved so fatal to the man it was addressed to why men who were so relentless in their purposes towards him should have taken such plans to keep me from sharing his fate is one of those anomalies in human nature which now and then awake our astonishment if i had not lost dora through my detention at their hands i should look back upon that evening with sensations of thankfulness as it is i sometimes question if it would not have been better if they had let me take my chances have i lost dora from a letter i received today i begin to think not End of section 21National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Grabowski. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 22. The Man from Red Dog by Alfred Henry Lewis Let me try one of them there cigars. It was the pleasant after-dinner hour, and I was on the veranda for a quiet smoke. The old cattleman had just thrown down his paper, and the half-light of the waning sun was a bit too dim for his eyes of seventy years. Whenever I behold a cigar, said the old fellow, as he puffed voluminously at the principe I passed over, I thinks of what that witness says in the murder trial at Socorro. What was you doing in camp yourself? asked the judge of this year witness the day of the killing. Which, says the witness, on crossing his legs, and letting on he ain't made bashful and uneasy by so much attentions being shown him, which I was eating of a few sardines, a drinking of a few drinks of whiskey, the smoking of a few cigars, and a romancing around. 
after this abrupt, not to say ambiguous reminiscence, the old cattleman puffed contentedly for a moment. "'What murder trial was this you speak of?' I asked. "'Who had been killed?' "'Now, I don't reckon I ever does know who it is gets downed,' he replied. "'This year murder trial itself is news to me complete. "'I was wagging along with it when I trails into Socorro at that time, "'and I merely santers over to the court out of way to hear what's going on. "'The judge is sort of getting in on the play while I'm listening. "'What was the last words of this year, gent who's killed?' "'asked the judge of this witness. "'As nearly as I keeps tabs, judge,' says the witness, the dying statement of this person is four aces to beat. Which, if deceased, had knowed Socorro like I does, says the judge, like he's commenting to himself, he'd surely realize that such remarks is simply suicidal. Again the old cattleman relapsed into silence in the smoke of the Principe. How did the trial come out? I queried. Was the accused found guilty? Which, the trial itself, he replied, don't come out. There's a parcel of the boys who's come into town to see that justice is done. And being the roundup is going forward at the time, they naturally feels hurried and pressed for leisure. They alls ought to be back on the range with their cattle. Now, so the fifth day, when Things is lurking along at the trial till it looks like the law has hobbled on. Well, the word goes round it's going to be about a week yet before the jury gets action on this miscreant who's being tried. The boys become plumb aggravated and wearied out. That way, and kicking the door of the calaboose, they searches out the felon, swings him to a cottonwood not otherwise engaged. And the right prevails. Naturally, the trial bogs down right there. After another season of silence and smoke, the old cattleman struck in again. Speaking of killings, well, I'm the last gent to go fostering ideas of bloodshed. I'm some discouraged just now by what I've been reading in that paper about a duel between some Italians. And it surely tries me the way them aliens plays boss. It's obvious the stars in a clear night never meant fight just a little bit. I abhor duels, cowers from the mere idea. But, after all, business is business. And when folks fight them, the objects of the meeting ought to be blood. But the way these year European shorthorns fixes it, gent surely runs a heap more risk of becoming an angel abrupt, tending of a Texas cakewalk in a purely social way. They ever fight duels in the West? Why, yes, some. My memory comes a cantering up right now to details of an encounter I once beholds in Wolfville. There ain't no much time thrown away with a duel in the Southwest. The people's mighty extemporaneous. Don't go browsing round none, sending challenges and riding. That sort of flapdoodle. When a gent notices the signs of getting about right for him to go on the warpath, he picks out his meat, surges up, and declares himself. The victim, who is most likely a mighty serious and experienced person, don't copper the play by making vain remarks, but brings his gatlin into play surprising. Next it's bang, 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 mixed up with flashes and white smoke. The duel's over complete. The gent, who still adorns our midst, takes a drink on the house, while St. Peter unbars things a lot and arranges gate and seat checks with the others in the realms of light. That's all there is to it. The tide of life again flows onward to the eternal sea, and nary a ripple. Oh, this here Wolfville duel. Well, it's this way. The day is blazing hot. Business laying prone and dead, just blistered to death. A parcel of us is sort of pervading around the dance hall, it being the biggest and coolest store in camp. A Monty game is struggling for breath in a, a feeble, fitful way in a corner. 
Some of us is watching in, and some are sitting round loose, or thinking, but all keeping mumming still, cause it's so hot. Just then, some gent in a horse goes whooping up the street, yelling, a whirl in the loop of his rope, allowing he's generally having a mighty good time. Who's this year tumultuous man on the horse? says Enright, a regarding of him in a displeased way from the door. I meets him up the street a minute back, says Dan Boggs, and he allows he's called the man from Red Dog, says he's took a day off to visit us, and aims to lay waste the camp before he goes back. Hm. Yeah, about then, the Red Dog man notes old Santa Rosa, who keeps the Mexican Bailey Hall and his woman, Maria, fussing with each other in front of the New York store. They's locked horns over a drink or something, and is pow-wowing a mighty unamitable. Whatever does this year Mexican family mean, says the red dog man, a surveying of em plenty scornful, a dragging of their domestic brawls out here to offend the suffering public fur. Why ever don't they stay in their wiki up and fight, and not to take to putting it all over the American race, which ain't in the play none, and don't thirst there for. However, I unites and reconciles this divided household easy. Now with this, the red dog man drops the loop of his lariat around the two contestants and jumps the bronco up the street like it's come out in a gun. Of course, Santa Rosa and Marie goes along on their heads promiscuous. They goes coasting along until they gets pulled into a mesquite bush. The rope slips off in the saddle and there they be. We always goes over from the dance hall, extricating of them, and final they rounds up mighty hapless and weak, and can only walk. They surely lose enough hide to make a pair of leggings. Which I brings them together like twins, says the red dog man, riding back for his rope. I offers two to one, no limit, they don't fight none whatever for a month. Which, as it surely looks like is right, no one takes them. So the red dog man leaves his bluff a hanging and goes into the dance hall. A given of it out cold and clammy, he meditates, blabbing. No promenade to the bar, yells the red dog man as he goes in. I'm a wolf, and it's my night to howl. Don't rouse me, barkeep, with a sight of merely one bottle. Set them all up. I'm some fastidious about my fire water and likes a chance to select. Well... We alls takes our inspiration, and the red dog man tucks his under his belt and turns round to Enright. I takes it you're the old he coon of this year outfit, says the red dog man, supercilious like. Which if I ain't, says Enright. It's plenty safe as a play to let your wisdom flow this away till the he coon gets here. If there's anything, says the red dog man, I turns from sick. It's violence and devastation. But I hear such complaints constant this year camp of Wolfville. I takes my first idle day right over and line things up. Now you're a bee, and while I regrets it, I find you alls is a lawless, unregenerate set and heaps sight worse than rumor. Now I takes a notion, for I sees no other trail, that by next drink time I climbs into the saddle, throws my rope round this denizen, and removes it from the map. Naturally, says Enright, some sarcastic. And make them them schemes, you ain't looking for no trouble whatever, the band the tarpons like us. None whatever, says the red dog man, mighty confident. In thirty minutes, I distribute this year hamlet round the landscape, same as them graces, which feet become in history, then I canters back to red dog. Well, says Enright, it's plenty plight to let us know what's coming this away. Oh, I ain't telling you none, says the red dog man. I simply let's fly this hint. So any of you alls has got a brick of brack of value special, he takes a warning some and packs it off all safe. Now it's about then when Cherokee Hall, who's looking on, shoulders in between Enright and the red dog man, mighty positive. Cherokee is a heap sot in his ideas, and I sees right off he's took a notion again, the red dog man. Bash, you've got a lot of work cut out, says Cherokee, eyeing the red dog man malignant. 
Suppose we tips a canteen again. I surely goes you, says the red dog man. I drinks with friend, I drinks with foe, with a part of my bosom and a shuddering victim of my wrath all similar. Cherokee turns out a big drink and stands a holding of it in his hand. I want to say right here, this Cherokee's plenty guileful. You was naming, says Cherokee, some public improvements you plans to make. Such as moving this year camp round some, I believes. That's whatever, says the red dog man. And the holy cost I initiates is due to start in fifteen minutes. I've been figuring on you, says Cherokee. And I gives you the result in strict confidence without holding out a card. When you all talks of tearing up Wolfville, you're a liar and a horse thief. And you ain't gonna tear up nothing. What's this I years? Yells a frenzied red dog man reaching for his gun. But he never gets it. For the same second, Cherokee spills a glass of whiskey straight in his eyes. And the next, he's anguished and blind as a mole. I'll fool this year human Simon up a lot, says Cherokee, a hurling of the red dog man to the floor, face down, while his nine-inch boy shines in his hand like the sting of a wasp. I sure fixed him so he can't get a job clerking in a store. And, grabbing the red dog man's hair, which is as long as the mane of a pony, he slashes it off close in one motion. There's a fringe for your leggings, Nell, remarks Cherokee, uh, turning the crop over to Pharaoh Nell. Now, Doc, Cherokee goes on to Doc Pete's. Take this here red dog stranger over to the red line. Fix his eyes all right, and then tell him, if he thinks he needs blood in this, to take his Winchester and go north to the middle of the street. In twenty minutes, and by the watch, I steps out in the dance hall door looking for him. Punting the door all fair and square. I don't aim to play nothing low on this year, gent. He gets a chance for his ante. Doc Pete sort of accumulates a red dog, man. Who's cussing and carrying on scandalous. Leads him over to the red light. In a minute, word comes to Cherokee as his eyes is rounding up all proper. That he's making war medicine grown more hostile, constant, and to heal himself. At that, Cherokee, out of calm, sends out for Jack Moore's Winchester, which is an eight squire, latest model. Oh, Cherokee, says Pharaoh Nell, beginning to cry and curling her arms around his neck. I'm afraid he's going to down you. Ain't there no way to fix it? Can't Dan Year settle this with Red Dog Man? Sir, says Dan Boggs, and I makes the trip too gleeful, just to spare Nell's feelings, Cherokee, and, and not to interfere with no gent's little game. I takes your hand and plays it. Not none, says Cherokee. This is my deal. Now don't cry, Nellie, he adds, smoothing down her yaller hair. Folks in my business has to hold themselves ready to face any game on the word, and they never weakens or lays down. And another thing, little girl, I gets this red dog sharp shore. I'm in the middle of a run of luck, and I holds fours twice last night, with a flush and a full hand out again em. Nell at last lets go of Cherokee's neck, and, being a female and timid that way, allows she'll go, and won't stop to see the shooting none. We applaud the idea, thinking she might shake Cherokee some if she stays, and of course, a gent out shooting for his life needs his nerve. Well, twenty minutes is up. The red dog man gets his rifle off in his saddle and goes down to the middle of the street. Turning up his big sombrero, he squares round, cocks his gun, and waits. Then Enright goes out with Cherokee and stands him in the street about a hundred yards from the red dog man. After Cherokee's placed, he holds up his hand for attention and says, When all's ready, I stands to one side and drops my hat. You all's fire at will. The Enright goes over to the side of the street, counts one, two, three, and drops his hat. And bangity bang bang goes the rifles like the roll of a drum. The Cherokee can work Winchester like one of these here Yankee alarm clocks. And that red dog hold up don't seem none behind. About the fifth fire, the red dog man sort of steps forward and drops his gun. After standing on steady for a second, 
he starts to crippling down at his knees. At last, he comes ahead on his face like a landslide. There's two bullets plumb through his lungs. And when we gets to him, the red froth is coming out in his mouth some plenteous. We packs him back into the red light and lays him onto a monte table. By me by, he comes to a little, and Pete's asking him whatever he thinks he wants. I want you alls to take off my moccasin and pack me into the street, says the red dog man. I ain't allowing for my old mother in Missouri to be told as how I dies in no gin mill. She surely abominates of them. And I don't die with no boots on, neither. We all packs him back into the street again, and pulls away at his boots. About the time we gets him off, he sags back convulsive. There he is, as dead as Santa Anna. What sort of a game is this, anyhow? Says Dan Boggs, who, while he stands there, has been pawing over a red dog man's rifle. Looks like this vivacious party's plum loco. Here's his hind sights wedged up for a thousand yards, and he's been a shooting the cartridges with a hundred twenty grains of powder in them. Right between the sights and the jump of the powder, he's been shooting plum over Cherokee and aiming straight at him. Nelly, says Enright, looking remorseful at the girl who colors up and begins to cry again. Did you cold deck this year, Red Dog Sport, this away? I'm frog, sobs Nell. He gets Cherokee, so I slides over when you all was waiting and fixes his gun some. Which I should surely concede you did, says Enright. The way that Red Dog gent manipulates his weapon shows he knows his game. Except for you, a uh, certain things up on him. I'm powerful afraid you'd spoil Cherokee a whole lot. Well, gents, goes on in right after thinking a while. I reckons we alls might as well drink on it. History never shows a game yet, but a woman in it, which is on the squire. And we meekly bars of burdens with the rest. End of section twenty two. Good Stories, Volume One American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vernon Schmidt, The King of 192. International Short Stories, Volume 1. American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 23. John the Cod's Little Ship. By Charles G. D. Roberts. Patiently. Doggedly, yet with the light in his eyes that belongs to the enthusiast and the dreamer, young John the Cod had worked at it. Throughout the winter he had hewed the seasoned timbers and the diminutive Hackmatack knees from the swamp far back in the Echo Valley, and whenever the sledding was good, with his yoke of black oxen he had hauled his materials to the secret place of his shipbuilding by the winding shore of a deep tidal tributary of the Port Royal. In the spring, he had laid the keel and riveted securely to it the squared hackmatack knees. It was unusual to use such sturdy and unmanageable timbers as these hackmatack knees for a craft so small as this which the young Acadian was building. But John McCod's thoughts were long thoughts and went far ahead. He was putting all his hopes, as well as all his scant patrimony, into this little ship and he was resolved that it should be strong to carry his fortunes. Through all the green and blue and golden Acadian summer, he had toiled joyously at bending the thin planks and riveting them soundly to the ribs, the stem and the stern post. It was hot work, but white and savory. 
the clean spruce planks that he wrought with breathing sweet scents to his lungs, as as and chisel and saw set free the tonic spirit of their fibers. His chips soon spread a yellow carpet over the mossy sward and the tree roots. The yellow sides of his graceful craft presently arose high among the green kissing branches of the water ash and the Indian pear. The tawny, golden, shimmering current of the creek lipped up at high tide close under the stern of the little ship, and set afloat the lowest layers of the chips, while at ebb a gleaming abyss of red mud, with walls sloping sharply to a mere rivulet at their foot, seemed to tempt the structure to a premature launching, and a wild swooshing rush to oozy doom. Very secluded, far apart from the beaten highway or forest byway, and quite aside from all the river traffic, was the place of John McCod's shipbuilding. And so it came about that the clear ringing blows of his ads, the sharp staccato of his diligent hammer, and the strident crying of his saw, brought no answer but the chatter of the striped chipmunk among the near tree roots, or the scolding of the garrulous and inquisitive red squirrels in the branches overhead. At the quiet of the noon hour, while John lay in the shade, contemplating his handiwork, and weaving his many-colored dreams, and munching his brown bread cakes and pale cheese, the clucking partridge hen would lead her brood out to investigate the edges of the chips thrown open, where insects gathered in the heat. And afterward, when once more John's hammering set up its brisk and cheerful echoes, the big golden-winged woodpeckers would promptly accept the sound as a challenge, and began an emulous rat-tat-tat-tatting on the resonant soundboard of a dead beach not far off. By the time the partridge brood had taken to whirring up into the maple branches when alarmed, instead of scurrying to cover in the underbrush, the hall was completed, and the smell of smoking pitch drowned the woodsy odors as John caulked the seams. Then the pale yellow of the timbers no more shone to the reddening leafage, but a somber black bolt loomed impressively above the chips, daunting the squirrels for a few days with this strange shadow. By the time of the moose calling, when the rowan berries hung in great scarlet branches and half the red leafage was turning brown, and the pale gold birch leaves fell in fluttering showers at every gust. Two slim masts had raised their tops above the trees, and the white bowsprit was thrusting its nose into the branches of the nearest red maple. Under the bowsprit glittered a carved and gilded Madonna, the most auspicious figurehead to which, in John's eyes, he could entrust the fortunes of his handiwork. A few days more, and a ship was done so nearly complete that three or four hours of work would make her ready for sea. Being so small, it was feasible to launch her in this advanced state of equipment, and the conditions under which she had been built made it necessary that she should be prepared to hurry straight from the greased ways of launching to the security of the open sea. The tidal creek in which she would first take water could give her no safe harborage, and once out of the creek, she would have to make all speed, under cover of night, till Port Royal River and the sodded ramparts of Annapolis Town should be left many miles astern. Having made his preparations and gathered his materials far ahead, and devised his precautions with subtlety, and accustomed his neighbors to the idea that he was an erratic youth, given to long absences and futile schemes, not worth gossip. John has succeeded in keeping his enterprise a secret from all but two persons. These two, deep in his counsels from the first, Barb Dudon, his sweetheart, and Mitch Masson, his friend and ally. Mitch Masson, whose home was served him best as a place to stay away from, was in the village of Grand Pre, far up in the base of the Midas, had been John's close friend since early boyhood, in the days before Port Royal Town had been captured by the English and found its name changed to Annapolis. He was a daring adventurer, hunter, woods ranger, an implacable partisan of the French cause, and just now deeply interested in the traffic between Acadie and the new French fortress city of Louisbourg. 
traffic which the English governor was angrily determined to break up. Mitch Masson could sail a ship as well as set a deadfall or lay an ambush. He had kept bright in John's heart the flame of hatred against the English conquerors of Acadie. It was he who had come to the aid of John's shipbuilding from time to time, when timbers had to be put in place which were too heavy for one pair of hands to work with. It was, indeed, at his suggestion that John had finally decided to sell his cottage on the outskirts of Annapolis town, his scrap of upland with his apple trees in full bearing, his strip of rich dyke land with his apple trees in full bearing, his strip of rich dyke forbidden traffic, and to settle under the woods of Lewisburg, where the flag he loved would always wave over his roof tree. It was Mitch Masson who had shown John how by this course he could quickly go rich, and make a home for Barb, which that somewhat disconcerting and incomprehensible maiden would not scorn to her sex. Mitch Masson loved his own honor. He loved John. He hated the English. John's secret was safe with him. Mademoiselle Barb, under a disguise of indifference, which sometimes reduced John to the not unprofitable condition wherein hard work is the sole refuge from despair, hid a passionate interest in her lover's undertaking. She, too, hated the new domination. She, too, shocked to escape from Annapolis and take up life anew under her old flag of Fleur de Lis. Moreover, her restless and fiery spirit could accept no contended tiller of green Acadian acres for a mate and she was resolved that John's courageous heart and stirring dreams should translate themselves into action. She would have him not only the daring dreamer, but the daring doer, the successful smuggler, the shrewd foiler of the English watchdogs, the admired and consulted partisan leader. That he had it in him to be all these things, she felt utterly convinced. But she proposed that the debilitating effects of too much happiness should have no chance of postponing his success. Her keen watchfulness detected every weak spot in John's enterprise, every unguarded point in his secret, and her two-edged mockery, which seemed as careless and inconsequent as the wind, at once accomplished the effects she had in view. Her fickleness of mood her bewildering caprice were the iridescent foam bubbles veiling a deep and steady current. She knew that she loved John's love for her, of which she felt as certain as dawn does of the sunrise. She had a suspicion in the deep of her heart that she might be in love with John himself, but of this she was in no haste to be assured. She was loyal in every fiber, and John's secret was safe with her. Thus the wonder came to pass that John's secret, though known to three people, yet remained so long a secret. Had the English governor, behind his sodded ramparts overlooking the tide, got word of it, never would John the cause little ship had sailed the open, save with an English captain and an English crew. It would have been confiscated, on the not unreasonable presumption that it was intended for the forbidden trade. Early in the afternoon, on a day of mid-October, John stepped down the ladder which leaned against the starboard bow of his ship, and contemplated with satisfaction the name, Monrave, which he had just painted in strong gold lettering. The exultation in his eyes became a passion of love and worship, as he turned to the slim girl who lay curled up luxuriously on a sweet-smelling pile of dried ferns and marsh grass, watching him. Since you won't let me name her directly after you, that is the nearest I can come to it, Bob, he said. You can't find fault with that. You are my dream, and all else besides. For a moment she watched him in silence. Her figure was of a childish slenderness, and there was a childish abandon in her attitude. The small hands, crossed idly in her lap, were very dark and thin and long-fingered, with rosy nails. She was dressed in skirt and bodice of the creamy Acadian homespun linen, the skirt reaching not quite to her slim ankles. Her mouth was full and red, half sorrowful, half mocking. 
Her face, small and rather thin, was tanned to a clear dark brown, and of a type that suggested a strain of the ancient blood of the Bosques. The thick black masses of her hair, with a rebel wave in them, and here and there a glint of flame, half covered her little ears and were gathered into a knot at the back of her neck. The brim of her low-crowned hat of quilted linen was tilted far down to shade her face, and her eyes, very green and clear and large, made a bewildering brilliance in the shadow. The light in her eyes softened presently, and she said in a low voice, Poor boy, a very sharp reality you would find me most of the time, I'm afraid. For this unexpected utterance, John had no words of answer ready. But his look was a sufficiently eloquent refutation. He took a few eager steps toward her. Then, meaning inhibition in the sudden gravity of her mouth, he checked himself. Day after tomorrow, about sundown, said he, Our Lady and St. Joseph permitting, we will get her launched. The tide will be full then, and we will run down with it, and pass the fort before moonrise. If the wind's fair, we will get out of the basin and off to sea that same night. But if it fails us, they'll be tight enough to get us round the island and into a hidden anchorage in Hibbert River. Then, a cargo of Acadian beef and barley for Lewisburg. And then, money. And then, and then, you. He looked at her with pleading and longing in his eyes, but with a doggedness about his mouth which told of much pain endured and a determination which might bide his time, indeed, but would not be balked. The look of the mouth she was conscious of, deep down in her heart, and she in reality rested upon it, but it was the look in his eyes which she answered. She answered it lightly. A mocking smile played about the corner of her lips, and her eyes sparkled upon him whimsically. The look both repulsed and invited him, and he hung for some moments, as it were, trembling midway between the promise and the denial. Don't be too sure of me, she said at last, and his face fell, not so much at the words themselves as at their discouraging accent. But, he protested, it is all planned, all done, just for you, Bart. There is nothing in it at all except you. It is all you. That is understood between us from the first, and all the time. Still her mouth mocked him, and still her eyes gleamed upon him with their enigmatic light. You will have your beautiful little ship, she said slowly. You will have wonderful adventures, and little time to think of me at all. You will make a wonderful deal of money. You will make your name famous and hated among these English. I am expecting you to do great things. But as for me... I am not one yet, John. His eyes glowed upon her, and the lines of his face set themselves with a sudden masterfulness. He gave a little, soft laugh. You are mine. You will be my wife before I make my second voyage. If you believe that, you ought to be a very happy man, she retorted. And her smile softened almost imperceptibly as she said it. You don't look quite as happy as you ought to, John. Don't make me wait for my second voyage. Let me take you away from this unhappy country. Come with me. Come with me now. He spoke swiftly, his voice thick with the sudden outburst of passion long held in check, and he strode forward to catch her in his arms. Instantaneous as a darting bird, or as a flash of light on a wave, she was up from a resting place and away behind the pile of grass and ferns. Stay there, she commanded or I'll go home at once. And John stayed. She laughed at him, gaily, mercilessly. Would you have me take you on trust, John? She questioned, with her head on one side. How do I know that you are going to be brave enough to fight the English, or clever enough to outwit them? How do I know you will really do the great things I'm expecting of you? I know your dreams are fine, boy, but you must show me deeds. I will, he answered quietly. Come here, sweet, just for one minute. No, she said with a very positive shake of her small head. You must go on with your work. You have more to do yet than you realize. And I have something to do, too. I must go home at once. That's not fair, Barn, he pleaded. I don't care. 
It is good for you. No, don't come one step with me. Not one step. Go on with your work. I'm going to fly. She ran lightly across the chips, at a safe distance from John's outstretched arms, and turned into the trail among the maples. There she paused, gave her lover one melting, caressing, but still half-mocking glance, and cried to him, I am making a flag for my mate, and it's not nearly done yet, John. Then she disappeared among the bright branches. With a tumult in his heart, John turned back to his ladder and paint pots. Little twinges of angry disappointment ran along his nerves, only to be smothered straight away in a flood of passionate tenderness. Next voyage, anyway, he muttered to himself as he worked feverishly. I couldn't live longer than that without her. And he went over and over in his imagination every detail of the girl's appearance, the changing moods of her radiant dark face, her hair, her hands, the tones of her voice. Along the trail through the autumn maples, meanwhile, Mademoiselle Barb was speeding on light feet. The little smile was gone from the corners of her mouth, and into her eyes, now that John could no longer see them, was come a great gentleness. Her mockery, her impatience, her picturesque asperity were a kind of game which she played with herself, to disguise, sometimes even from herself, the greatness and the oversensitiveness of her heart. At this moment she was feeling sore at the nearness of John's departure, and was conscious of the pressure of his will urging her to go with him. This she was resolved she would not do, but she was equally resolved that her flag should be ready and go in her place. As for the next voyage, well, she thought to herself that John might persuade her by that time, if he tried hard. As to his success, she had not really a grain of doubt. She knew well enough the quality of his fiber. Her light feet, as she hurried, made hardly a sound upon the soft mold of the trail, which was half hidden by the bright autumn carpeting of the leaves. But presently she heard the noise of heavier footfalls approaching. Just ahead of her the trail turned sharply. Peering through the tangle of branches and thin leafage, she caught glimpses of something that caused her face to grow pale, her heart to throb up into her throat, and she stepped behind the thick shelter of a fir bush to consider what was to be done. The sight that so disturbed her was in itself no terrible one. A tall, ruddy-faced, keen-eyed man, carelessly dressed but of erect military bearing, came striding up the trail, a gun over his arm, brown dog at his heels. Barb recognized him at once, the English officer in command of the fort at Annapolis. She saw that he was out for partridges, but she saw also that he was walking at a pace that would speedily devour the scant two miles that divided him from the shipyard of Monrave. It was evident that he had forgotten his shooting in his interest in this unknown trail upon which he had stumbled. If he went on, the game was up for John's little ship. She resolved that he should not go on. It took her just five seconds to decide the whole question. There was a large fallen tree close beside the trail, two or three paces from where she hid. Over this she threw herself discreetly, with a little choking scream, and lay moaning among the leaves beside it. The Englishman darted forward and was at her side in a moment, bending over her with a mingling of alarm and admiration in his grey eyes. Mademoiselle, he cried, what has happened? Are you much hurt? Receiving no answer but more faint moans, he lifted her gently and stood her on her feet. But the instant he released her, she collapsed upon the leaves, an appealing but intoxicating confusion of skirts and slim brown hands and crinkly dark hair and the corner of a red mouth, in the glimpse of an ankle. Mademoiselle, tell me what is the matter. Tell me what can I do. Let me do something, I beg of you. Lifting her again, he seated her beside him on the fallen tree. And this time he did not at once release her. At first her eyes closed and her face a little drawn as with pain, she clung instinctively to his arm, with hands that seemed to him the most maddening that he had ever seen. Then, after several minutes, which were very agreeable to him in spite of his anxiety, 
she appeared to pull herself together with a mighty effort. She moved away from his clasp, sat up straight, and opened upon him great eyes of pain and gratitude. Oh, thank you, monsieur, she said simply. I'm afraid I have been very troublesome, but indeed I thought I was going to die. But what is the matter, mademoiselle? Tell me, and let me help you. She sat cringing and setting her teeth hard. He noticed how white were the teeth, how scarlet the full lips. It is just my heart, she said. I was looking through the bushes to see who was coming. Something startled me, I think, and the pain clutched my heart so I could not breathe, and I fell off. She paused to moan a little softly and catch her breath. Before he could say anything, she went on. It's better now, but it hurts horribly. Let me support you, mademoiselle he urged with eager courtesy. But she shrank away from the approaching ministration. No, monsieur, I am better, really. But I must get home as quick as I can. She rose unsteadily. The Englishman arose at the same time. The next moment Barb sank back again, biting her lips to keep back her cry. Oh, she gasped. I can't stand it. How can I get home? You must let me see you home, mademoiselle, said the officer authority blending with palpable enthusiasm in his tones. You are so good, monsieur, she murmured gratefully. But I could not think of taking you away back so far, almost to the village. It will spoil your afternoon sport. The sympathy on the Englishman's face gave way to amusement, and he hastened to assure her of her mistake. Not at all. Indeed, mademoiselle, it would be quite as much my pleasure as my duty to see you safely home. Your misfortune, if not too serious, is my great good fortune. Thanking him with a look, Bob arose weakly and took the proffered arm. At first the homeward journey was very slow, but as the afternoon deepened and the walls gathered between the English commandant and Johns of the ship, the girl began to let herself recover. By this time she felt there was no danger of her escort leaving her one minute before he was obliged to, and she knew that now, for this night, the ship was safe. At last, as they emerged from the woods into the high pasture ground, behind the cottage where Barb lived with her aunt and uncle, the Englishman threw off the gallant for a moment and became the wide-awake officer. He paused, took his bearings carefully, and scrutinized the trail behind him with searching eyes. I have not seen this road before, mademoiselle, he mocked, and it interests me. It is not down on our map of the Annapolis district. Whither does it lead, may I ask? Barb's heart grew faint within her, but she answered lightly, with the look that somehow conveyed to him the impression that he should not be interested in Rose when she was by. They haul wood over it. My uncle and his neighbors in the winter, she answered, and black mud in summer from the swamp back there. The Englishman appeared satisfied but she felt that his curiosity was aroused, and with all her arts she strove to divert his thoughts exclusively to herself. She succeeded in this to a degree that presently began to stir her apprehensiveness, and at her doorway she made her grateful farewells a trifle hurried, but the Englishman would listen to nothing more discouraging than au revoir. At last, he said, I shall be shooting over these woods again tomorrow. Barb clutched hard upon the latch and held her breath. I shall give myself the pleasure of calling to ask after. But no, he corrected himself. You are making me forget, mademoiselle. I have a council meeting to fill my day with drudgery tomorrow. Barb breathed again at this respite. I must deny myself to the day after. I may call then, may I not? There was a moment's pause, and in that moment the girl's swift brain made its decision. Certainly, Monsieur la Commandant, she said, sweeping his face with a brilliant glance that made his nerves tingle sweetly. I shall be much honored. My aunt and I will be much honored. And with a curtsy half mocking, half formal, and a disastrous curving of her scarlet lips, she slipped into the house. By Jove, muttered the Englishman as he strode away in a daze. From the window, behind the bean vines, Barb watched him go. The instant he was out of sight, she darted from the door, sped swiftly over the rough pasture lot, and disappeared among the twilights of the trail. 
where the afternoon shadows were already darkening the purple. She ran with the endurance of health and practice and the clean, breathing outdoor life. But presently her breath began to fail, her heart to thump madly against her slim sides. Then around the bend of the trail came John, returning earlier than his wont. With an exclamation of glad surprise, he sprang forward to meet her. Still more was his surprise when she caught him by the shoulders with both hands and leaned, gasping and sobbing, against his breast. After one fierce clasp, he held her lightly and tenderly like a child, and anxiously scanned her face. What is it, Barb? Beloved, what is the matter? He questioned eagerly. The ship, she panted. Must go! You must go tomorrow night! Why? But it is impossible! He protested, bewildered. Mitch won't be here till the day after, and one man can't launch her and can't sail her all by himself. I tell you, it must be done, she cried imperiously. You must! You must! And then, in a few edged words, she explains the situation. If you can't, all is lost, she concluded. For they will discover you and seize the ship the day after tomorrow. John, I would never believe that you had any such word as can't. By this time John's face was white, and his jaw was set. Of course, he said quietly. It will be done somehow. I'm not beaten till I'm dead. But the chances are, sweet, that after I get the little ship launched, I'll run her aground somewhere down the river, and be caught next day like a rat in a barrel. Stiglitz navigating at best down the river, and one man can't rightly manage even the foresail alone, and steer, and those eddies and twists in the channel. But... But, John, she interrupted, and then paused, leaning close against him, and looking up at him with eyes that seemed to him to make a brightness in the dark. But what, beautiful, he questioned, leaning his face over her, and growing suddenly tremulous with a vague, wonderful expectancy. I can help. Take me. And she hid her eyes against his rough shirt sleeve. One moment John stood tense, moveless unable to apprehend this sudden realization of his dreams. Then he swung her light figure up into his arms, and covered her face and hair with kisses. With a little smile of content upon her lips, she suffered his madness for a while. Then she made him put her down. There is no time now to make love to me, she said. We so much to do and plan. You've never run away with a ship and a girl before, John, and we must make sure you know just how to go about it. That night Barb snatched a few hours of sleep, being mindful of the witchery of her eyes. But John toiled all night long, driving his duke of oxen to and fro between his cabin and the shipyard in the forest. And he was not weary. His heart was light as air and sang with every pulse. His strength and his star, he felt them equal to any crisis. On the following afternoon, when it wanted yet an hour of high tide, and the shadows of the maples were beginning to creep over the yellow chips. All was ready. Full of a wild gaiety and untiring as a boy, Barb had worked all day getting the sails bit, the stores on board, the last of block and tackle into place. Suddenly, from a post of vantage in the high-pointing bowsprit, she looked down the trail and clapped her brown hands with a shout of delight. Mitch has come! she cried and Mitch Masson, striding into the open, threw down a big red bundle on the chips. Pretty nigh ready, he inquired. Why, what is the matter, Mongol? John's face had fallen like his heart. There was no longer any necessity of Barb sharing his adventure, but he hurried forward and clasped his friend's hand. We've got to get away tonight, he stammered, struggling bravely to make his voice sound cheerful. The English are coming over here tomorrow to find out what's going on, so it's time for us to be going off. Barb was to help me through with it. Mitch held to John's hand and glanced questioningly from his troubled face to the girl's teasing one. But Barb had burned her bridges and saw no reason to be unmerciful. I suppose I'll have to just be crew and cabin boy now, Mitch. She pouted. John was going to let me be first mate, and there wasn't going to be any crew. A great joy broke over John's face, and Mitch removed his grey woolen cap with a sweeping bow, 
but before either could reply there came from a little way up the trail the excited yapping as of a dog that has treed a partridge the three looked at each other their eyes wide with apprehension then the report of a gun the englishman gasped barb he has not waited quick hide one each side of the trail and take him prisoner don't shoot him he was kind to me john snatched up his musket and the two men darted into the bush by a rope from the bulwarks barb swung herself lightly to the ground in haste she crossed the chips through an open and then carelessly swinging her hat in her hand and singing a fitful snatch of song she sauntered up the trail to meet the intruder the trail wound rapidly so that before she had gone two score paces the ship was hid from her view a few steps more and the englishman came in sight swinging forward alertly a fluff of brown feathers dangling from his right hand he was face to face with barb and the delighted astonishment that came into his eyes was dashed with the faint chill of suspicion how fate favors me mademoiselle he exclaimed doffing his cap gad you are a brave girl to wander so far into the woods alone no monsieur fate does not favor you retorted barb with a sort of intimate petulance holding out her brown fingers you had no business coming today when you said you were not coming till tomorrow now you are going to find out a secret of mine which i didn't want anyone to find out but you are not angry at seeing me he protested no she answered her head upon one side in doubt while she bewildered him with her eyes but i'm sorry in a way well come and i'll show you forgive me for lying to you yesterday about this road and she turned to accompany him walking very close to his side so that her slim shoulder touched his arm and blurred his sagacity the next instant came the sharp order halt don't stir or you're dead the englishman found himself facing two leveled muskets at the same moment his own weapon went flying into the underbrush twitched from his hold by a dexterous catch of barb's fingers he stood still and very straight his arms at his side eyeing his assailant steadily his first impulse was to dart upon them with his naked hands but he saw the well-knit form of john almost his own height the lean set face a certain exultation in the eyes which he read aright and he saw the shrewd dark confident look of mitch the experienced master of situations the red mounted slowly to his face and he turned upon barb a look wherein reproach at once gave way to scorn and the kind of shame barb herself flushed under that look you wrong me monsieur she cried impetuously i did it to save you you are a brave man and would have tried to fight and they would have killed you he bowed stiffly and turned to the men what do you want of me your parole said john give us your word that you will come with us quietly making no resistance and no effort to escape the englishman shut his lips doggedly then you must be bound said mitch with curt decision we have no time to waste let me bind you monsieur said barb taking his wrists gently and putting them behind his back it is no dishonor to be captive to a woman with a silk scarf from her waist and a feminine cunning in knots she quickly tied his hands together so that he felt himself quite hopeless of escape then in a cold wrap he was led forward with no constraint but barb's touch upon his arm the ship high on her stalks came into view and he understood seating himself upon a log with his back against a tree mitch passed a rope about his waist and made him fast to the trunk there he sat and chewed his indignation while his captors went in haste about their work but presently he grew interested he saw the blocks knocked out from under the little ship's sides so that she came down upon the greased ways and slid smoothly into the flood he saw her chucked gradually by a rope turned once around the tree trunk so that she was kept from running aground on the opposite side of the basin. He saw a small boat dragged down from the bushes to the edge of the tide, and oars put into it. By this time he had revolved many aspects of the case in his mind. Then came to him Barb and John. Monsieur, said John, I regret to have inconvenienced you in this way, but you would have without mercy wrecked all my hopes. 
I have put all my means into this little ship, built with my own hands. My heart is set on removing from the land of Acadie to live once more under my own flag of France. But I do not wish to take you prisoner to Louisbourg, or to put you to any further annoyance. To Mademoiselle Dudon you showed yourself yesterday a most kind and courteous gentleman. All Acadie knows you are brave. Give me your word that you will in no way seek to stop or hinder our departure, and let me set you free. Give your parole, Monsieur, begged Barb, or you will have to devote yourself to entertaining me all the way to Louisbourg. The Englishman's face brightened. Almost you make me wish to go to Louisbourg, Mademoiselle. With the duty you apportion me, I should be much happier, I assure you, than here in Annapolis trying to govern your good fellow countrymen. But I will give my parole. I promise you, sir, and he turned his face to John, that I will not in any way interfere with the departure of you and your ship from Acadie. Thank you, said John, and he undid the rope and the scarf. The Englishman arose, walked down to the waterside with Barb, and with elaborate courtesy helped her into the boat. He bent his lips over her hand as he said goodbye. Turning upon him then a laughing face of farewell, Barb cried, Never, never will I pardon you, Monsieur, for consenting to give your parole. Mademoiselle, he answered, I am your prisoner still, and always. End of section 23《American Short Stories》Volume 1 American Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories Volume 1 American Stories Edited by William Patton Section 24, Part 1 Those All Loons, or Which is the Madman, by W. Gilmore Sims I am but mad north-northwest, when the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a hansel. Hamlet Chapter 1 We had spent a merry night of it. Our stars had paled their not ineffectual fires, only in the daylight, and while Dan Phoebus as was yet rising, choking on the misty mountain tops, I was busy in adjusting my foot in the stirrup and mounting my good steed frame to find my way by the close cut and through narrow hidden trails to my lodgings in the little town of C on the very borders of Mississippi. There were a dozen of us, all merry larks half mad with wine and laughter, and the ride of seven miles proved a shocked one. In less than two hours I was snugly snoozing in my own sheets and dreaming of the twin daughters of old answered owls. Well might one dream of such precious damsels. Verily, they seemed all of a sudden to have become part of my existence. They filled my thoughts excited my imagination, and, if it be not an impertinence to say anything of the heart of a roving lad of eighteen, then were they at the very bottom of mine. Both of them, let me say, for they were twins, and were endowed with equal rights by nature. I was not yet prepared to say what was the difference, if any, between their claims. One was fair, the other brown one pensive, the other merry as a cricket of Venus. Susanna was meek as became an elder's daughter. Emmeline so mischievous that she might well have worried the meekest of the saints in the calendar from his propriety and position. I confess, though I thought constantly of Susanna, I always looked after Emmeline the first. She was a brunette, one of your flashing, sparkling, effervescing beauties, perpetually running over with exultation, brimful of passionate fancies that tripped, on tiptoe, half-winged, 
through her thoughts. She was a creature to make your blood bound in your bosom, to take you entirely off your feet and fancy, for the moment, that your heels are quite as much entitled to dominion as your head. Lovely, too, brilliant, if not absolutely perfect in features, she kept you always in a sort of sunlight. She sang well, talked well, danced well, was always in air, seemed never herself to lack repose, and, it must be confessed, seldom suffered it to anybody else. Her dancing was the crowning grace and glory. She was not Taglioni, not an Elsla. I do not pretend that, but she was a born artist. Every motion was a study, every look was life. Her form subsided into the sweetest luxuriance in attitude and rose into motion with some such exquisite buoyancy as would become Venus issuing from the foam. Her very affectation was so naturally worn that you, at length, looked for them as essential to her charm. I confess, but no, why should I do anything so foolish? Susanna was a very different creature. She was a fair girl, rather pale, perhaps, when her features were in repose. She had rich, soft, flaxen hair and dark blue eyes. She looked rather than spoke. Her words were few, her glances many. She was not necessarily silent in silence. On the contrary, a very silence had frequently a significance taken with the looks that needed no help from speech. She seemed to look through you at a glance, yet there was a liquid sweetness in her gaze that disarmed it of all annoyance. If Emmeline was the glory of the sunlight, Susanna was the sovereign of the shade. If the song of the one filled you with exultation, that of the other awakened all your tenderness. If Emmeline was a creature for the dance, Susanna was the wooing, beguiling Egeria who could snatch you from yourself in the moments of respite and repose. For my part, I felt that I could spend all my mornings with the former and all my evenings with the latter. Susanna with her large, blue, tearful eyes and few murmuring and always gentle accents shone out upon me at nightfall as that last star that watches in the vault of night for the coming of the sapphire dawn. So much for the damsels, and all these fancies, not to say feelings, were the fruit of but three short days' acquaintance with their object. But these were days when thoughts travel merrily and fast, when all that concerns the fancies and the affections are caught up in a moment as if the mind were nothing but a conjuries of instincts and the sensibilities with a thousand delicate antennae were ever on the grasp for prey. Squire Owens was a planter of tolerable condition. He was a widower with his two lovely and lovable daughters, no more. But, bless you, mine was no calculating heart, very far from it. Neither the wealth of the father nor the beauty of the girls had yet prompted me to think of marriage. Life was pleasant enough as it was. Why burden it? Let well enough alone, say, say I. I had no wish to be happier. A wife never entered my thoughts. What might have come of being often with such damsels, there's no telling. But just then it was quite enough to dance with Hermeline and muse with Susanna and Vevla Bagatta. I need say nothing more of my dreams, since the reader sufficiently knows the subject. I slept late that day, and only rose in time for dinner, which, in that almost primitive region, took place at twelve o'clock m. I had no appetite. A herring and soda water might have sufficed but these were matters foreign to the manner. I endured the day and headache together as well as I could, slept soundly that night, with now the most ravishing fancies of Emmeline 
and now the pleasant dreams of Susanna, one or other of whom still usurped the place of a bright particular star in my most capacious fancy. Truth is, in those heyday days, my innocent heart never saw any terrors in polygamy. I rose a new man, refreshed, and very eager for a start. I barely swallowed my breakfast when Priam was at the door. While I was about to mount, with thoughts filled with the meek beauties of Susanna, I was arrested by the approach of no less a person than Ephraim Strong, the village blacksmith. You're going dry, I see. Yes, to square hours, I reckon. Right. Well, keep a sharp look out on the road, for there's news come down that the famous Archie Dargan has broke Hamilton jail. And who's Archie Dargan? What? Don't know Archie? Why, he's the madman that's been shut up there. It's now going on for two years. Ah, madman, eh? Yes, and a mighty savagerous one at that. He's the cunningest white man going. Talks like a book, and knows how to get out of the scrape. He's just as sensible as any man for a time. But sudden, he takes a start, like a shame horse, and before you know where you are, his ears are in your jaw. Once he blazes out, it's knife or gun, hatchet or hickory, anything he can lay hands on. He's killed two men already, and cut another's throat almost killing. He's an ugly chap to meet on the road, so look out right and left. What sort of man is he? He looks, yes. Well, I reckon he's about your heft. He's young and tallish, with a fair skin, brown hair, and a mighty quick keen blue eye that never looks steadily nowhere. Look sharp for him. The sheriff, with his, suppose you come and take us, is out after him, but he's mighty cute to dodge, and had the start some twelve hours before they missed him. Chapter 2 The information thus received did not disquiet me. After the momentary reflection that it might be awkward to meet a madman out of bounds upon the highway, I quickly dismissed the matter from my mind. I had no room for any but pleasant meditation. The fair Susanna was now uppermost in my dreaming fancies, and, reversing the grasp upon my whip, the ivory handle of which, lined with an ounce or two of lead, seemed to me a sufficiently effective weapon for the worst of dangers, I bade my friendly blacksmith farewell and dashed forward upon the high road. A smart canter soon took me out of the settlement, and once in the woods I recommended myself, with all the happy facility of youth, to its most pleasant and beguiling imaginings. I suppose I had ridden a mile or more, the story of the bedlamite was gone utterly from my thought, when a sudden turn in a road showed me a person also mounted and coming towards me at an easy trot, some twenty-five or thirty yards distant. There was nothing remarkable in his appearance. He was a plain farmer, a woodman, clothed in ample homespun, and riding a short, heavy chunk of an animal that had just been taken from the plough. The rider was a spare, long-legged person, probably thirty years old thereabouts. He looked innocent enough, wearing that simple, open-mouthed sort of countenance, the owner of which, we assume, at a glance, will never set any neighboring stream on fire. He belonged, evidently, to a class as humble as he was simple, but I had been brought up in a school which taught me that the claims of poverty were quite as urgent upon courtesy as those of wealth. Accordingly, as we neared each other, I prepared to bestow upon him the usual civil recognition on the highway. What is it Scott says? I'm not sure that I quote him rightly. When men in distant forests may meet, 
they pass not as in peaceful street. And, with the best of good humor, I rounded my lips into a smile and got ready my salutation. To account somewhat for its effect when uttered, I must premise that my own personal appearance at this time was rather wild and impressive. My face was full of laughter and my manners of buoyancy. My hair was very long and fell in masses upon my shoulder, unrestrained by the cap which I habitually wore and which, as I was riding under heavy shade trees, was grasped in my hand along with my riding whip. As the stranger drew nigh, the arm was extended, cap and whip lifted in air, and with free, generous lungs I shouted, Good morning, my friend. How works the world with you today? The effect of this address was prodigious. The fellow gave no answer, not a word, not a syllable, not the slightest nod of the head, nay, tout au contraire. But for the delighting of his amazed pupils, and the dropping of the lower jaw, his features might have been chiseled out of stone. They wore an expression amounting to consternation, and I could see that he caught up his bridle with increased alertness, bent himself to the saddle, half drew up his horse, and then, as if suddenly resolved, edged him off, as closely as the woods would allow to the opposite side of the road. The undergrowth was too thick to allow of his going into the wood at the spot where we encountered, or he certainly would have done so. Somewhat surprised at this, I said something. I cannot now recollect what, the effect of which was even more impressive upon him than my former speech. The heads of our horses were now nearly parallel. The road was an ordinary wagon track, say twelve feet wide. I could have brushed him with my cap as we passed, and, waving it still aloft, he seemed to fancy that such was my intention, for, inclining his whole body on the off side of his nag, as the Comanche does when his aim is to send an arrow at his enemy beneath his neck, his heels thrown back, though spurless, were made to belabor with the most surprising rapidity the flanks of his drowsy animal. And, not without some effect, the creature dashed first into a trot, then into a canter, and finally into a gallop, which, as I was bound one way and he the other, soon threw a considerable space between us. The fellow's mad, was my reflection and speech, as, whirling my horse half about, I could see him looking backward and driving his ear still into the sides of his reluctant hack. The next moment gave me a solution of the matter. The simple countryman had heard of the Bedlamite from a Milton jail. My bare head, the long hair flying in the wind, my buoyancy of manner, and the hearty and perhaps novel form of salutation with which I addressed him, had satisfied him that I was the person. As the thought struck me, I resolved to play the game out, and, with the restless love of levity which has been too frequently my error, I put the whip over my horse's neck and sent him forward in pursuit. My nag was a fine one, and very soon the space was lessened between me and the chase. As he heard the footfall behind, the frightened fugitive redoubled his exertions. He led himself to it, his heels paddling in the sides of his donkey with redoubled industry. And thus I kept him for a good mile until the first houses of the settlement grew visible in the distance. I then once more turned upon the path to the Owens, laughing merrily at the rare chase, and the undisguised condemnation of the countryman. The story afforded ample merriment to my fair friends, Emmeline and Susanna. It was so ridiculous that one of my appearance should be taken for a madman. The silly fellow deserves the scare. On these points we were all perfectly agreed. 
That night we spent charmingly. The company did not separate till near one o'clock. We had fun and fiddles. I danced by turns with the twins, and more than once with a Miss Quadley, a very pretty girl, who was present. Squire Owens was in the best of humours, and no ways loath I was made to stay all night. Chapter three A new day of delight dawned upon us with the next. Her breakfast made a happy family picture, which I began to think it would be cruel to interrupt. So snugly did I sit beside Emmeline, and so sweetly did Susanna Minister at the coffee urn, and so patriarchally did the old man look around upon the circle, that my meditations were all in favour of certain measures for perpetuating the scene. The chief difficulty seemed to be in the way of a choice between the sisters. How happy could I be with either, were the other dear charmer away? I turned now from one to the other, only to become more bewildered. The lively glance and playful remark of Emmeline, her lovely, smiling visage and buoyant, unpremeditative air, were triumphant always, while I beheld them. But the pensive, earnest look of Susanna, the mellow cadences of her tones, seemed always to sink into my soul, and were certainly remembered longest. Present, Emmeline was irresistible. Absent, I thought chiefly of Susanna. Breakfast was fairly over before I came to a decision. We adjourned to the parlour, and there, with Emmeline at the piano, and Susanna with her courage in hand, a favourite poet, I was quite as much distracted as before. The bravura of the one swept me over completely of my fate, and when I pleaded with the other to read me the touching poem of Chernoviev, her low, subdued, and exquisitely modulated utterance, so touching, so true to the plaintive and seductive sentiment, so harmonious even when broken, so thrilling even when most checked and hushed, was quite as little to be withstood. Like the ass picked with two bundles of hair, my eyes wandered from one to the other, uncertain where to fix, and thus passed the two first hours after breakfast. The third brought an acquisition to our party. We heard the trampling of horses' feet in the court below, and all hurried to the windows to see the newcomer. We had but a glimpse of him, a tall, good-looking personage, about thirty years of age, with great whiskers and a huge military cloak. Squire Owens met him in the reception room, and they remained some half-hour or three-quarters together. It was evidently a business visit. The girls were all agog to know what it was about, and I was mortified to think that Emmeline was now far less eager to interest me than before. She now turned listlessly over the pages of a music book, or strummed upon the keys of a piano, with the air of one whose thoughts were elsewhere. Susanna did not seem so much disturbed. She still continued to draw my attention to the more pleasing passages of the poet. But I could see, or I fancied, that even she was somewhat curious as to the coming of the stranger. Her eyes turned occasionally to the parlour door at the slightest approaching sound, and she sometimes looked in my face with a vacant eye when I was making some of my most favourable points of conversation. At length there was a stir within, a buzz, and the scraping of feet. The door was thrown open, and, ushered by the father, the stranger made his appearance. His air was rather distangy. His person was well made, tall and symmetrical. His face was martial and expressive. His complexion was of a rich dark brown. His eye was grey, large and restless, his hair thin and dishevelled. His carriage 
was very erect. His coat, which was rather seedy, was close buttoned to his chin. His movements were quick and impetuous, and seemed to obey the slightest sound, whether of his own or of the voices of others. He approached the company with the manner of an old acquaintance, certainly with that of a man who had always been conversing with the best society. His ease was unobtrusive, a polite difference invariably distinguishing his deportment whenever he had occasion to address the ladies. Still, he spoke as one having authority. There was a lordly something in his tones, an emphatic assurance in his gesture, that seemed to settle every question, and, after a little while, I found that, hereafter, if I played on any fiddle at all, in that presence, it was certainly not to be the first. Emmeline and Susanna had ears for me no longer. There was a something of impatience in the manner of the former, whenever I spoke, as if I had only interrupted much pleasanter sounds, and even Susanna, the meek Susanna, put down her courage upon a stool, and seemed all attention only for the imposing stranger. The effect upon the old man was scarcely less agreeable. Colonel Nelson, so was the stranger called, had come to see about the purchase of his upper mill-house tract, a body of land containing some four thousand acres, the sale of which was absolutely necessary to relieve him from certain encumbrances. From the conversation which he had already had with his visitor, it appeared that the preliminaries would be of easy adjustment, and Squire Owens was in the best of all possible humours. It was nothing but Colonel Nelson, Colonel Nelson. The girls did not seem to need this influence, though they evidently perceived it, and, in the course of this first half-hour after his introduction, I felt myself rapidly becoming de trop. The stranger spoke in passionate bursts, at first in low tones, with halting, hesitating manner, then, as if the idea were fairly grasped, he delighted into a torrent of utterance, his voice rising with his thought, until he started from his chair and confronted the listener. I cannot deny that there was a richness in his language, a warmth and color in his thought, which fascinated while it startled me. It was only when he had fairly ended that one began to ask what had been the provocation to so much warmth, and whether the thought to which we had listened was legitimately the growth of previous suggestions. But I was in no mood to listen to the stranger or to analyze what he said. I found my situation quite too mortifying, a mortification which wasn't lessened when I perceived that neither of the two damsels said a word against my proposed departure. Had they shown but the slightest solicitude, I might have been reconciled to my temporary obscuration. But no, they suffered me to rise and declare my purpose, and made no sign. A cold curtsy from them, and a stately and polite bow from Colonel Nelson, acknowledged my parting salutation and Squire Owens attended me to the threshold, and lingered with me till my horse was got in readiness. As I dashed through the gateway, I could hear the rich voice of Emmeline swelling exultingly over the tones of her piano, and my fancy presented me with the images of Colonel Nelson hanging over her on one hand, while the meek Susanna on the other was casting those oblique glances upon him which had so frequently been addressed to me. Ah, pestilent jades! I exclaimed in the bitterness of a boyish heart. This, then, is the love of woman. End of part one Journal Short Stories, volume one 
American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 25. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 25. These All Loons or Witches and Madmen, by W. Gilmore Sims. Part 2. Chapter 1. Chewing such bitter cud as this, I had probably ridden a good mile, when suddenly I heard the sound of human voices, and, looking up, discovered three men, mounted, and just in front of me. They had hauled up, and were seemingly waiting my approach. A buzzing conversation was going on between them. That's he, said one. Sure, was the question of another. A whistle at my very side caused me to turn my head, and, as I did so, my horse was caught by the bridle, and I received a severe blow from a club above my ears, which brought me down almost unconscious upon the ground. In an instant, two stout fellows were upon me and busy in the praiseworthy toil of roping me, hands and feet, where I lay. Hurt, stung, and utterly confounded by the surprise, I was not prepared to suffer this indignity with patience. I made manful struggle and, for a moment, succeeded in shaking off both assailants. But another blow, taking effect upon my temples, and dealt with no moderate appliance of hickory, left me insensible. When I recovered consciousness, I found myself in a cart, my hands tied behind me, my head bandaged with a red cotton handkerchief, and my breast and arms covered with blood. A stout fellow rode beside me in the cart, while another drove, and on each side of the vehicle trotted a man, well armed, with a double-barreled gun. "'What does all this mean?' I demanded. "'What am I here? Why the assault? What do you mean to do with me?' "'Don't be obstropopulous,' said one of the men. "'We don't mean to hurt you. Only put you safe.' We had to tap you on the head a little, for your own good. Indeed, I exclaimed, the feeling of that unhappy tapping upon the head making me only the sorer at every moment. But will you tell me what this is for, and in what respect did my good require that my head should be broken? It might have been worse for you, where you was unbeknown, replied the spokesman. But we know your situation, and serve you off easily. Be quiet now, and What do you mean? What is my situation? Well, I reckon we know. Only you be quiet, or we'll have to give you the scale. And he led aloft a huge wagon whip as he spoke. I had sufficient proof already of the unscrupulousness with which my companions acted, not to be very chary of giving them farther provocation, and, in silent misgiving, I turned my head to the opposite side of the vehicle. The first glance in this quarter revealed to me the true history of my disaster, and furnished an ample solution of the whole mystery. Who should I behold but the very fellow whom I had chased into town the day before? The truth was now apparent. I had been captured at the stray bedlamite from Hamilton jail. It was because of this that I had been tapped on the head, only for my own good. As the conjecture flashed upon me, I could not avoid laughter, particularly as I beheld the still doubtful and apprehensive visage of the man beside me. My laughter had a very annoying effect upon all parties. It was more fearful sign than my anger might have been. The fellow whom I had scared, 
edged a little farther from the cart, and the man who had played spokesman, and upon whom the whole business seemed to have devolved, now shook his whip again. "'None of that, my lad,' said he, "'or I'll have to bruise you again. Don't be obstropopulous. "'You've taken me for a madman, have you?' said I. "'Well, I reckon you ought to know what you are. There's no dispute in it. "'And this silly fellow has made you believe it. Reckon. "'You've made a great mistake. Don't think it. "'But you have. Only take me to see, and I'll prove it by General Cock himself, "'or Squire Humphreys, or anybody in the town.' No, no, my friend, that cock won't fight. We ain't misdoubting at all, but you are the right man. You answer all the description, and Jake Sturgis here has made his affidavy that you chased him, neck and neck, as mad as any blind puppy in a dry September for an hour by sun yesterday. We don't want no more proof. And why do you mean to carry me? I inquired with all the coolness I was master of. Well, we'll put you up in a pen we've got a small piece from here, and when the sheriff comes, he'll take you back to your old quarters at Hamilton Jail, where I reckon they'll fix you a little tighter than they had you before. We've sent after the sheriff, and he suppose you come and take us, and I reckon they'll be here about sundown. Chapter Five. Here was a situation, indeed, burning with indignation. I was yet sufficiently master of myself to see that any ebullition of rage on my part would only confirm the impression which they had received of my insanity. I said little, therefore, and that little was confined to an attempt to explain the chase of yesterday, which Jake Sturgis had made the subject of such a mischievous affidavit. But, as I could not do this without laughter, I incurred the danger of the whip. My laugh was ominous. Jack edged off once more to the roadside. The man beside me got his bludgeon in readiness, and the potent wagon whip of the leader of the party was uplifted in threatening significance. Laughter was clearly out of the question, and it naturally ceased on my part as I got in sight of the pen in which I was to be kept secure. This structure is one well known to the less civilized regions of the country. It is a common place of safekeeping in the absence of jail and proper officers. It is called technically a bull pen and consists of huge logs roughly put together, crossing at right angles, forming a hollow square. The logs too massy to be removed, and the structure too high to be climbed, particularly if the prisoner should happen to be, like myself, fairly tied up hand and foot together. I reluctant terribly at being put in the, to this place. I pleaded urgently, struggled fiercely, and was thrust in neck and heels without remorse. And, in sheer hopelessness and vexation, I lay with my face prone to the earth, and, half buried among the leaves, weeping, I shame to confess it, the bitter tears of impotence and mortification. Meantime, the news of my capture went through the country. Not my capture, mark me but that of the famous madman Archie Dorgan, who had broke Hamilton jail. This was an event, and visitors began to collect. My captors, who kept watch on the outside of my den, had their hands full in answering questions. Man, woman, and child, squire and ploughboy, and finally dams and damsels, accumulated around me, and such a throng of eyes as pierced the crevices of my log dungeon to see the strange monster by whom they were threatened now disarmed of his terrors were to use the language of one of my keepers a power to calculate 
this was not the smallest part of my annoyance the logs were sufficiently far apart to suffer me to see and to be seen and i crouched closer to my rushes and buried my face more thoroughly than ever if possible to screen my dishonored visage from their curious scrutiny this conduct mightily offended some of the visitors i can't see his face said one stir him with a long pole and i was greatly in danger of being treated as a surly bear refusing to dance for his keeper since one of mine seemed very much disposed to gratify the spectator and had actually begun sharpening the end of a ten-foot hickory for the purpose of pricking me into more sociableness he was prevented from carrying his generous design into effect by the suggestion of one of his companions better don't bosh if ever he should get out again he put his ear mark upon you reckon you're right was the reply of the other as he led his rod out of sight meanwhile the people came and went each departing visitor sending others a couple of hours might have elapsed leaving me in this humiliating situation chained to the stake the beast of a bare garden with fifty greedy and still dissatisfied eyes upon me of these fully one-fourth were of the tender gender some pitied me some laughed and all congratulated themselves that i was safely led by the heels incapable of further mischief it was not the most agreeable part of their remarks to find that they all universally agreed that i was a most frightful looking object whether they saw my face or not they all discovered that i glared frightfully upon them and i heard one or two of them ask in undertones did you see his teeth how sharp i gnashed them with a vengeance all the while you may be sure chapter six the last and worst humiliation was yet to come that which put me for a long season out of humour with all human and woman nature conscious of an unusual degree of bustle without i was suddenly startled by sounds of a voice that had been once pleasantly familiar it was that of a female a clear soft transparent sound which till this moment had never been associated in my thoughts with with anything but the most perfect of all mortal melodies it was now jangle harsh like sweet bells out of tune the voice was that of emmeline good heavens i explained to myself can she be here in another instant i heard that of susanna the meek susanna she too was among the curious to examine the feature of the bedlamite archie doggan dear me said emmeline is he in that place what a horrid place said susanna it's the very place for such a horrid creature responded emmeline can he get out papa said susanna isn't a mad person very strong oh don't frighten a body susanna before you have be had a peep cried emmeline i declare i'm afraid to look do Col colonel nelson peep first and see if there's no danger and there was the confounded colonel nelson addressing his eyes to my person and assuring his fair companion my emmeline my susanna that there was no sort of danger that i was evidently in one of my fits of apathy the paroxysm is off for the moment ladies and even if he were violent it is impossible that he should break through the pen he seems quite harmless you may look with safety yes he's mighty quiet now miss said one of my keepers encouragingly but it's all owing to the close sight of my whip he was again to be obstropopulous more than once when i shook it over him he's used to it i reckon 
you can always tell when the roaring fit is coming on for he breaks out in such a dreadful sort of laughing ha ha he loves does he ha ha such was the somewhat wild interruption offered by colonel nelson himself if my love produced such an effect upon my keeper his had a very disquieting effect upon me but the instinctive conviction that emmeline and susanna were now gazing upon me prompted me with a sort of fascination to lift my head and look for them i saw their eyes quite distinctly bright treacheries i could distinguish between them and there were those of colonel nelson beside them the three persons evidently in close propinquity what a dreadful looking creature said susanna dreadful said emmeline i see nothing so dreadful in him he seems tame enough i'm sure if that's a madman i don't see why people should be afraid of him poor man how bloody he is said susanna we had to tap him miss a little upon the head to bring him quiet he's tame and innocent now but you should see him when he's going to break out only just hear him when he laughs i could not resist the temptation the last remark of my keeper fell on my ears like a suggestion and suddenly shooting up my head and glaring fiercely at the spectators i gave them a yell of laughter as terrible as i could possibly make it ah was the shriek of susanna and she dashed back from the logs before the sounds had well ceased they were echoed from without and in a more fearful and natural style from the practised lungs of colonel Nelson. his yells following mine were enough to startle even me what he cried thrusting his fingers through the crevice you would come out would you you would try your strength with mine let him out let him out i'm ready for him breast to breast man against man tooth and nail forever and forever you can laugh too but ah what do you say to that shut up shut up and be ashamed of yourself ah there was a sensation without i could see that emmeline recoiled from the side of her companion he had thrown himself into an attitude had grappled the logs of my dungeon and exhibited a degree of strange emotion which to say the least took everybody by surprise my chief custodian was the first to speak don't be scared mister there's no danger he can't get out but i say let him out let him out look at him ladies look at him you shall see what a madman is you shall see how i can manage him Arky fellow out with him at once give me a whip i know all about this treatment you shall see me work him i'll manage him i'll fight with him, him and laugh with him too how we shall laugh ha 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 his horrible laughter for it was horrible was cut short by an unexpected incident he was knocked down as suddenly as i had been with a blow from behind to the astonishment of all around the assailant was the sheriff of hamilton jail who had just arrived and detected the fugitive archie doggan the most cunning of all bedlamites as he afterwards assured me in the person of the handsome colonel nelson i knew the scamp by his loss i heard it half a mile said the sheriff as he planted himself upon the bosom of the prostrate man and proceeded to leash him in proper order here was a concatenation accordingly who have i got in the pen was the exception inquiry of my captor the fellow whose whip had been so potent over my imagination who have you anybody there demanded the sheriff i reckon we caught your chap that jack made affidavy was the madman let him out then and beg the man's pardon 
I'll answer for Archie Dargan. My appearance before the astonished damsels was gratifying to neither of us. I was covered with mud and blood, and then with confusion. Oh, mister, how could we think it was you? Such a fright as they've made you. Such was Emmeline's speech after her recovery. Susanna's was quite as characteristic. I am so very sorry, mister. Spare your regrets, ladies, I muttered ungraciously as I leapt on my horse. I wish you a very pleasant morning. Ha, 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 yelled the bedlamite, writhing and bounding in his leash. A very pleasant morning. The damsels took to their heels and went off in one direction quite as fast as I did in the other. Since that day, dear reader, I have never suffered myself to scare a fool or to fall in love with a pair of twins. And if ever I marry, take my word for it, the happy woman shall never be a Susanna or an Emmeline. End of section 25「Short Stories」Volume 1 – American Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org International Short Stories Volume 1 – American Stories Edited by William Patton Section 26 The Chiropodist by Bayard Taylor R. Henry Bartlett was one of three gentlemen rowed from the railroad station to Moose Hotel at Trenton Falls on the top of an omnibus, and who, having clambered down from that lofty perch under the inspection of forty pair of eyes leveled at them from the balcony, Assent to inscribe their names in the book and secure the keys of their several chambers. To no one of the three, however, was this privacy so welcome as to Mr. Bartlett, who, entering his room with flushed face, nervously dismissed the servant, locked the door, and dropped into a chair with a pant of relief. Our business being entirely with him, we shall at once dismiss his two companions, whom, indeed, we have only introduced as accessories to the principal figure, and, taking our invisible seats in the opposite chair, proceed to a contemplation of his person. Age, four, perhaps five and twenty, certainly not more. Eight, five feet nine inches, with well-developed breast and shoulders limbs whose firm ample muscle betrays itself through the straight lines of his light summer costume and hands and feet of agreeable shape complexion fair the skin of feminine fineness and transparency whereon the incredible blood writes his emotion so palpably that he who runs may read eyes of a clear earnest blue but so sure of meeting a steady gaze that few know how beautiful they really are. Mouth full and sensitive, and of so rich and dewy a red that we cannot help wishing he were a woman that we might be pardoned to for kissing it. Forehead broad and rather low. Hair, but there we hesitate, for his enemies would certainly call it red. Indeed, in some lights it is red, but its prevailing tint is brown with a bronze lustre on the curls. As he sits thus, unconscious of our observation, he is certainly handsome, in spite of a haunting air of timidity, which weakens the expression of features not weak in themselves. On further observation, we are inclined to believe that he has not achieved that easy pause of self-possession 
which in men of becoming modesties is the result of more or less social experience he belongs evidently to that class of awkward honest warm-hearted and sensitive natures whom all men like and some women mr Ballas's reflections after his arrival were we have good reason to know after this fashion when will i cease to be a fool why couldn't i stare back at all those people on the balcony as coolly as the two fellows who sat beside me why couldn't i get down without missing the step and grazing my shin on the wheel why should i walk into the house with my head down and a million of cold little needles pricking my back because men and women and not sheep were looking at me i have at least an average body as men do an average intellect too i think yet every day i see spindly brainless squirts mr barlett would not have used this epithet in conversation but it certainly passed through his mind put me to shame by their self-possession the women think me a fool because i have not the courage to be natural and unembarrassed and i carry the consciousness of the fact about me whenever i meet them come come this will never do i am a man and i ought to possess the ordinary resolution of a man now here's a chance to turn over a new leaf nobody knows me no one will notice me particularly and whether i fail or succeed the experiment will never be brought forward to my confusion hereafter full of a sudden courage he sprang to his feet and carefully adjusted his toilet for the tea table whistling cheerfully all the while at the sound of the gong he descended the staircase and approached the dining room with head erect meeting the gaze of the other guests with a steadiness which resembled defiance he was surprised to find how mechanical and transitory were the glances he encountered as mr bartlett's friend I should not like to assert that in his efforts to appear self-possessed he approached the bounds of effrontery but i have my own private suspicions about the matter at the table a lively conversation was carried on and he was able to take many stealthy observations of the ladies without being noticed to his shame i must confess that he had never been so seriously in love though it was a condition he most earnestly desired attracted toward women by the instinct of his nature and repelled by his awkward embarrassment there seemed little chance that he would ever attain it on this particular occasion however he cast his eyes around with the air of a sultan scanning his slaves before throwing the handkerchief to the chosen one the female guest, old, young, married, single, ill-favored, or beautiful, was subjected to the review. It is impossible to describe Mr. Bartlett's satisfaction with himself. He had passed over twenty-nine or thirty-five ladies present without experiencing any special emotion. But at the thirties, he was suddenly attacked by a recurrence of his habitual timidity he fixed his eyes upon his toast painfully conscious by the warmth of his ears that he was blushing violently and actually drank a third cup of tea one more than his usual allowance before he became sufficiently composed to look up again really there was no cause for confusion her face was turned away so that even the profile was not wholly visible but the exquisite line of the forehead and cheek bent inward at the angle of the unseen eye and melting into the sweep of the neck and shoulder were the surest possible prophecies of beauty her chestnut hair rippled at the temple was gathered into a heavy shining knot at the back of her head and inwoven with the varnished heart-shaped leaves of the smilax 
more than this mr bartlett did not dare to notice during the evening he flitted restlessly about the rooms intent on an object which he thus explained to himself i should like to see whether a front face corresponds to the outline of a cheek i am alone it is too late to visit the falls and a whim of this sort will help me to pass the time but the lady belonged apparently to a numerous party who took position of one end of the balcony and sat in the moonlight in such a position that he could not see her features with distinctness the face was a pure oval in a framework of superb hair and the glossy leaves of smilax glittered like silver in the moonlight whenever she chanced to turn her head there were songs and she sang scenes that are brightest or something of the kind suggested by the influence of the night her voice was clear and sweet without much strength one of those voices which seemed to be made for singing to one ear alone here by god's grace is the one voice for me thought mr bartlett he had just been reading the ideas of the king he slipped off to bed saying to himself a little more courage and i may be able to make her acquaintance in the morning he set out to make the tour of the force entering the glen from below he slowly crept up the black shells of rock under and around the rush of the amber waters the naiads of trenton waving their scarves of rainbow breed tossed their foam fringes in his face above the dryads of the pine and beech looked down from their seats on the brink of the overhanging walls mr bartlett was neither a poet nor a painter nor was it necessary but his temperament as you may know from his skin and the color of his hair was joyous and excitable and he felt a degree of delight that made him forget his own self i fancy there are no embarrassing conventionalism at the bottom of the earth wherever that may be and the glen at trenton is two hundred feet on the way thither our friend enjoyed to the full his partial release and was surprised to find that he could assist several married ladies to climb the slippery steps at the high pole without consciously blushing how it came to pass he never could rightly tell but certain it is that on lifting his eyes after a long contemplation of the shifting slides of fretted amber he found himself alone in the glen with the exception of a young lady who sat on the rocks a few paces distant at the first glance he thought it was a child for the slight form was habited in a bloomer dress and a broad hat shaded the graceful head the white trousers were gathered around her ankles and a pair of the prettiest feet he had ever seen dangle in the age of the swift stream she was idly plucking up tufts of grass from the crevices of the rock and tossing them in the mouth of the cataract and her face was partly turned toward him it was the fair unknown of the evening before there was no mistaking the lovely cheek and the rippled chestnut hair mr bartlett felt as he afterward expressed himself a warm sweet shudder run through all his veins alone with that lovely creature below the outside surface of the earth oh if i could but speak to her her dress shows that she can lay aside the soulless forms of society in such a place as this why not i there's locking and kirkland and lots of fellows i know wouldn't hesitate a moment what shall i say the scenery is fine pshaw but the first sentence is the only difficulty the rest will come of itself what if i address her boldly as an old acquaintance and then apologize for my mistake upon my word a good idea so natural and possible having determined upon this plan 
he immediately put it into action before the resolve had time to cool his step was firm and his bearing was sufficiently confident as he approached her but when she lifted her long lashes disclosing a pair of large limpid hazel eyes which regarded him unabashed with the transient curiosity one bestows upon a stranger his face i am sure betrayed the humbug of the thing the lady however not anticipating what followed could scarcely have remarked it raising his head as he reached the corner of the rock upon which she sat he said in a voice so curiously balanced between his enforced boldness and his reflected surprise thereat that he hardly recognized it as his own how do you do miss lawrence the lady looked at him wonderingly steady childlike eyes that frankly and innocently perused his face as if seeking for some trace of a forgotten acquaintance mr bartlett could not withdraw his although he knew that his face was getting redder and his respiration more unsteady every moment he stammered forth miss lawrence of south carolina i believe you are mistaken sir said the lady with the least shade of coldness in her voice but it fell upon mr bartlett like the wind from an iceberg i am not miss lawrence um beg your pardon he answered somewhat confusedly you resemble i expected to meet her here will you please tell her i inquired for her here's my card therewith he thrust both hands into his vest pockets extracted a card from one of them and laid it hastily upon the rock beside her bertha bertha rang through the glen above the roar of the waterfall the remainder of the party which the young lady had preceded now came into view descending toward her good day miss lawrence said mr bartlett again lifting his hat and retracing his steps for his life he could not have passed her and run the gauntlet of the faces of her friends upon the narrow path every soul of them would have instantly seen that what a fool he was moreover he had achieved enough for one day the soldier who storms a perilous breach and finds himself alive on the inside of it could not be more astonished than he i blundered awfully he thought but after all is the one way to learn who's your friend bertha asked her brother dick morris the avant-garde of the party i never saw the fellow before if you had not frightened him by your sudden appearance said she you might have discovered a southerner i suppose though he don't look like one you addressed me as miss lawrence of south carolina and afterwards left me with this card to be given to her what shall i do with it ah the card will tell us who he is said dick picking it up he instantly burst into a row of laughter ah this comes to wearing a bloomer bertha though i must say it's by no means complimentary to your little feet could suspect you of having corns dick what do you mean ha ah, no doubt i came at the nick of time to prevent him from pulling off your shoes dick therewith she impatiently jerked the card from her brother's hand it was large thick handsomely glazed and contained the following inscription professor herbert chiropodist to her majesty queen victoria and the nobility of great britain incredible she exclaimed so young and embarrassed in his manners how could he ever have taken hold of the queen's foot embarrassed indeed said dick i think he has a very cool way of procuring patience but faith he's chosen a romantic operating room after climbing down these rocks the corns naturally begins to twinge and here's the professor on hand behold the march of civilization 
Bertha did not fall into a brother's vein of badinage, as usual. She was vexed that the fresh, manly face and blue eyes into which she had looked belonged to a charlatan, and vexed at herself for being vexed thereat. It was not so easy, however, to dismiss Professor Herbert from her mind, for Dick had related the incident to the others of the party, with his own embellishments, and marvellous were the jokes to which it gave rise throughout the day. Meantime, Mr. Bartlett, in happy ignorance of the worst blunder he had ever made, returned to the hotel. The day previous at Uyutica, he had been annoyed by an itinerant extractor of calls, suppressor of bunions, and regulator of irregular nails, whose profit card he had put into his pocket in order to get rid of the man. It was this card which he had presented to Miss Morris as his own. On reaching the hotel, he easily ascertained that a real name and place of residence with the additional fact that the party were to leave for Saragota on the morrow. It occurred to him also that Saratoga, in the height of the season, would be well worth a visit. In the evening, he again happened to meet the lady on the stairs. He retreated into a corner of the landing to make room for her ample skirts, and, catching a glance of curious interest for her hazel eyes, ventured to say, Good evening, Miss Loris, suddenly correcting her name in the middle. Bertha, in spite of the womanly dignity which she could very well summon to her aid, could not suppress a fragment of gay laughter in which the supposed professor joined. A slight inclination of the lovely head acknowledged this salutation. The next morning, Miss Bertha Morris left with her party for Saratoga, and, after allowing a day to intervene in order to avoid the appearance of design, Mr. Henry Bartlett followed. He did not admit to himself in the least that this movement was prompted by love, but he was aware of an intense desire to make her acquaintance. The earnestness which this desire infused into his nature gave him courage the man within him was beginning to wake and stir and the boyhood of character prolonged beyond the usual date was dropping rapidly into the irrecoverable conditions of the past it changed that they both took quarters in the same hotel and great was bertha's astonishment on her first morning visit to the Congress Spring, to find Professor Herbert quietly quaffing his third glass. He looked so much like a gentleman. He was really so fresh and rosy, so genuinely masculine in comparison with the blasé youth she was accustomed to see, that, forgetting his occupation, she acknowledged his bow with a cordiality which provoked herself the moment afterward. Mr. Bartlett was so much encouraged by this recognition that he ventured to walk beside her on their return to the hotel. She, having in the impulsive frankness and forgetfulness of her nature returned his greeting, felt bound to suffer the temporary companionship, embarrassing though it was. Fortunately, none of her friends were in sight nor was it probable that they knew the chiropodist in any case. She would be rid of him at the hotel door, and would take good care to avoid him in the future. How delightful it is here, says, said Mr. Bartlett, thinking more of his present position than of Saratoga in general. An inclination of the head was her only reply. This is my first visit, he added and I cannot conceive of a summer society gayer or more inspiring. I have no doubt you will find it a very favourable place for your business," said Bertha, maliciously recalling him to his occupation, as she thought. 
oh i hope so exclaimed the innocent bartlett for was not his only business in saratoga the endeavour to make her acquaintance and was the he not really in a fair way to be successful disgusting thought bertha as she suddenly turned and sprang up the steps in front of the ladies drawing-room he thinks of nothing but his horrid corn plaster or whatever it is I really believe he suspects that I need his services, that such a man should be so brazen a charlatan. It is monstrous. Such thoughts were not an auspicious commencement for the day, and Butter's friends remarked that she was not in her serious mood. She was very careful, however, not to speak of her meeting with the chiropodist. There would have been no end to her brother's banter she was also vexed that she could not forget his honest blue eyes and the full splendid curves of his mouth indignation she supposed was a predominant emotion but in reality there was a strong underfeeling of admiration had she been aware of it after dinner mr bartlett occupying the post of observation at his window room number thirteen forty six seventh story saw the morris party bertha among them enter a carriage and drive away in the direction of the lake half an hour later properly attired he mounted a handsome roan at the door of a livery stable and set off in the same direction he was an accomplished red rider his legs being somewhat shorter than was required by due proportion owing to which circumstance he appeared taller on horseback than a foot. Like all horsemen, he was thoroughly self-possessed when in the saddle. And could he but have ridden into drawing-rooms and dining-rooms, we have felt no trace of his customary timidity. Bertha noticed his figure afar off, approaching the carriage on a rapid trot, but made no remark. Dick, who had a quick eye for good points, both in man and beast, exclaimed, By Jove, there's a fine pair of them. Look at the action of that roan. See how the fellow rises at the right moment without leaving his saddle. No jumping or bumping there. Mr. Bartlett came on at a staving pace, lifting his hat to the ladies with perfect grace as he passed. He would have blushed could he have felt a single ripple of the wave of admiration which flowed after him. Bertha alone was silent, more than ever provoked and disgusted that such a gallant outward embodiment of manhood should be connected with such disagreeable associations. Had he been anything but a chiropodist, a singular feeling of shame, for his sake, prevented her from betraying his personality to her friends, and it came to pass that they innocently defended the very charlatan whom they had so ridiculed in the glen at Trenton from her half-disparaging observations. After all, she thought, the man may be honest in his profession, which he may look upon as simply that of a physician. A pain in the two is probably as troublesome as a pain in the head, and why should not one be cured as well as the other? A dentist, I'm sure, is a very respectable person, and for my part, I would as soon operate on a corny too as a carious tooth. I would not have you suppose, ladies, that Miss Morris made use of such horrid expressions in her conversation. I am only putting her thoughts into my own words. Still, the conclusion to which he invariably arrived was, I wish he were anything else. That evening there was a hop at the hotel. The Morrises were enthusiastic dancers, even the widow, Bertha's mother, not disdaining a quadrille. Mr. Bartlett, in an elegant evening dress, his eyes sparkling with new light, was there also. In the course of the day, he had encountered a Boston cousin, Miss Jane Heath, a tall, dashing girl, some two or three years older than himself. She was one of the few women with whom he felt entirely at ease. 
there was an honest cousinly affection between them and he always felt relieved in society when supported by her presence now harry said jane as they entered the room remember the first cottage belongs to me after that i prove my disinterestedness by finding new partners as he led her upon the floor his eyes dropped in countering those of bertha morris whose floating tulle was settling itself to rest as she whirled out of the ranks poor bertha had she been alone she could have cried he danced as well as he rode the splendid mean fellow the handsome horrid chiropodist well it was all outward varnish no doubt if it was true that he relieved the nobility of great britain of their corns he must have acquired something of the elegances of their society but such ease and grace in dancing could not be picked up by mere imitation it was a born gift even a brother dick who was looked upon as the highest result of fashionable education in such matters was no surer or lighter of foot an hour later bertha who had withdrawn from the dancers and was refreshing herself with the mild night air at an open window found herself temporarily separated from her friends mr bartlett had evidently been watching for such an opportunity for he presently disengaged himself from the crowd and approached her you're fond of dancing miss morris said he yes she answered hesitatingly divided between her determination to repel his effrontery and her inability to do so she turned partly away and gazed steadily into the moonshine mr bartlett however was not to be discouraged still even the most agreeable exercise will fatigue at last he remarked oh said bertha rather sharply suspecting a professional meaning in his words my feet are perfectly sound i assure you sir it is not to be denied that he was a little surprised at the earnestness of an assertion which in a playful tone would not have seemed out of place i think you proved that at trentall fall he rejoined but will you grant me the pleasure of another test during the next quadrille no further test is necessary sir i presume you have patience enough already and having uttered these words as coolly as her indignation allowed bertha moved away from the window patience said mr bartlett to himself wholly misapprehending her meaning yes i shall have patience whilst there is a chance to hope but why did she speak of patience women i have heard are natural diplomatists and have a thousand indirect ways of saying things which they do not wish to speak outright could she mean to test the sincerity of my wish to know her it is not to be expected that a stranger so awkwardly introduced should be received without hesitation mistrust perhaps no no i must persevere she would despise me if i did not understand her meaning the following days were cold and rainy there was an end of the gay outdoor life which offered him so many chances of meeting miss morris and the fleeting glimpses he caught of her in the great dining hall or the passage leading to the ladies parlour were simply tantalizing i have no doubt there was a mute appeal in his eyes which much must have troubled the young lady's conscience for she avoiding meeting his gaze the knowledge of his presence made her uneasy there was an atmosphere about the hotel which he would willingly have escaped she walked with the consciousness of an eye everywhere following her and in spite of herself furtively sought for it we who are aware of her mystification may be amused at it but imagine yourselves in the same situation ladies and you will appreciate its horrors no this was not longer to be endured and so after five or six days at saratoga the party suddenly left for niagara bertha 
an only daughter, was a petted child, and might have had her own way much oftener than was really the case. The principal use she made of her privilege was to follow the bent of a remarkably free, joyous, and confiding nature. She was just unconventional enough to preserve an individuality and thereby distinguish herself from thousands of girls who seem to have been cut out by a single pattern. The sphere within which true womanhood moves is much wider than most women suspect. To the frank, honest, and pure nature, what are called the bounds of propriety are its natural horizon ring, moving with it and enclosing it everywhere without restraining its freedom. We shall not be surprised to find that shortly after Miss Morris's departure, room number 1346 in the Catanational Hotel had another tenant. Mr. Bartlett followed as a matter of course. He began, nevertheless, to feel very much like a fool, and, as he afterward confessed, spent most of the time between Utica and the suspension bridge in deliberating whether he should seek or avoid an interview. As if such discussions with oneself ever amounted to anything. Ascertaining the lady's presence, he decided to devote his first day to Niagara, trusting the rest to chance. In fact, he could not have done a more sensible thing, for there is a special chance appointed for such cases. The forenoon was not over before he experienced its operations. Bertha, cloaked and cowled in India rubber, stood in the in the hurricane deck of the Maid of the Mist, as the venturesome little steamer approached the corner of the horseshoe fall. Looking up, through blinding spray of the shimmer of emerald and dazzling silver against the sky, she crept near a broad shouldered figure to shelter herself from the stormy gust of the fall. Suddenly, the boat wheeled at the very edge of a tremendous sheet and swirled away from the vortex with a heave which threw her off a fit. She did then fall, however for strong arms caught her waist and steadied her until the motion subsided. Through the rush of the spray and the roar of the fall, she indistinctly heard a voice apologizing for the unceremonious way in which the arms had seized her. She did not speak, fearful, in fact, of having a mouth filled with water, but frankly gave the gentleman her hand. The monkish figure bowed low over the wet fingers and respectfully withdrew. As the mist cleared away, she encountered familiar eyes. Was it possible? The chiropodist. This discovery gave Bertha no little uneasiness. A subtle instinct told her that he had followed her on her account in spite of her cornless feet. Perhaps he had left a lucrative practice at Taratoga, and why? There was but one answer to the question, and she blushed painfully as she admitted its possibility. What was to be done? She would tell her brother. But no, young men are so rash and violent. Avoid him? That was difficult and embarrassing. Ignore him? Yes, as much as possible, and if necessary, frankly tell him that she could not accept his acquaintance. On the whole, this course seemed best, though an involuntary sympathy with her victim made her wish that it were all over. In the afternoon, Mr. Morris, as usual, took a summer siesta. Dick had found a friend and was whirling somewhere behind a pair of fast horses, and finally, Verta, bored by the society in the ladies parlour, took her hat and a book and walked over to Goat Island. She made the circuit of its forests and flashing water views, and finally selected a shady seat on its western side, whence she could look out on the filmy stairs of the rapids. The unnecessary book lay in her lap. A more wonderful book than any printed volume lay open before her. Who shall dare to interpret the dare dream of a maiden? Soothed by the mellow roar of the waters, 
fascinated by the momentary leaps of spray from the fluted shell-shaped hollows of the descending waves and freshened by the wind that blew from the cold canadian shore she nursed her wild weeds of fancy till they blossomed into brighter than garden flowers meanwhile a thunder-cloud rose dark and swift in the west the menaces of its coming were unheard and bertha was first recalled to consciousness by the sudden blast of cool wind that precedes the ram when she looked up the great depth of storm already arched high over the canadian woods and big drops began to wrap on the shingly bank below her a little further down was a summer house open to the west it is true but it offered the only chance of shelter within view she had barely reached it before a heavy peal of thunder shattered the bolts of the rain and it rushed down in an overwhelming flood mounted on the bench and crouched in the least exposed corner she was endeavouring with but partial success to shelter herself from the driving flood when a man coming from the opposite end of the island rushed up at full speed here he panted miss morris take this umbrella i saw you at a distance and made haste to reach you i hope you're not wet the spacious umbrella was instantly clapped over her and the inevitable chiropodist placed himself in in front to steady it fully exposed to the rain bertha was not proof against this gallant self-sacrifice in the surprise of the storm the roar of which mingled with that of the fool made a continuous awful peal the companionship of any human being was a relief and she felt grateful for professor albert's arrival chiropodist though he was he must not suffer from her sake here said she lifting the umbrella it will shelter us both quick i insist upon it seeing that he hesitated there was really no time for parley for every drop pierced him to the skin and the next moment found him planted before her interposing a double shield his tender anxiety for her sake quite softened bertha how ungrateful she had been this is the second time i am obliged to you to-day sir said she i am sorry that i have unintentionally given you trouble oh miss morris cried the delighted butlet don't mention it it's nothing i'm quite amphibious you know you might be now in a place of shelter but for me she answered penitently i'd rather be here than anywhere else he exclaimed in a burst of candour which quite overleaps the barrier of self-possession and came down on the other side if you would allow me to be your friend miss morris if you would permit me to to speak with you now and then if if here he paused not knowing precisely what more to say yet feeling that he had already said enough to make his meaning clear bertha was cruelly embarrassed but only for a moment professor albert had at least been frank and earnest in his avowal. she felt his sincerity through and through and he deserved equal honesty at her hands i am your debtor in an uncertain voice and you have a right to expect gratitude at least from me i cannot therefore refuse your acquaintance though as you know your your occupation would be considered objectionable by many persons my occupation your profession then i must candidly confess that i have a prejudice a foolish one perhaps against it my profession cried the astonished bartlett why have none well it is scarcely to be called a profession but it is always liable to the charge of charlatanism pardon me the word and it may be ridiculed in so many ways i wish for your sake for i believe you to be capable of better things that you would adopt some other business mr bartlett's amazement was now beyond all bounds good heavens he exclaimed miss morris what do you mean 
Starting up from the bench as he uttered these words, he jostled Bertha's book from her hand. The leaves parted in falling, and a large card, escaping from between them, fluttered down upon the floor. He picked it up and restored it to her with the book. There, she answered, giving the card back again. There is, there is what I mean. Must I give you your own card in order to acquaint you with your own business? Mr. Bartlett looked at it for a second in blank amazement. Then, like a flash of lightning, the whole course of the misunderstanding flashed across his mind. He burst, I am ashamed to say, into a tremendous paroxysm of mingled tears and laughter. Were I not so strong and masculine a man, I should say hysterics. In vain he struggled to find words. At every attempt, a fresh convulsion of laughter seized him, and tears, mingled with rain, flowed down his cheeks. Bertha began to be alarmed at this strange and unexpected convulsion. Professor Herbert, she had said, what's the matter? Professor Herbert, he repeated in a faint, scarcely audible scream, then striving to suppress his uncontrollable fit of delight and comical surprise, he sank upon the bench at her feet, shaking from head to foot with the effort. Ah, 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 he at last panted forth, as if heaving an atlas slowed from his heart, and stood erect before her. With, with his face still flushed and eyes sparkling, he was as handsome an embodiment of youth and life as one could wish to see. In two words, he explained to her the mistake, on learning which Bertha blushed deeply, saying, How could I ever have supposed it? And then, reflecting upon the inferences which could be drawn from such an expression, became suddenly shy and silent. Of course, she accepted Mr. Bartlett's escort to the hotel when the rain was over, and he was presented to the agonized mother, who hailed him as a deliverer of her daughter from untold dangers, and privately remarked afterward to the latter, Upon my word, a very nice young man, my dear. Dick's commendation was no less emphatic, though differently expressed. A good fellow, well made in the shoulders and flanks, fine action, but wants a little training. By this time, ladies, you have probably guessed the conclusion. My story would neither be agreeable nor true. I am relating facts. If they were not married and did not have two children and live happy ever after. Married they were in the course of time, and happy they also are, for I visit them now and then. One thing I had nearly forgotten. When Mrs. Bartlett chooses to tease her husband in that playful way so delightful to married lovers, she invariably calls him Professor Herbert, while he retorts with Miss Lawrence of South Carolina. Moreover, in Mrs. Bartlett's confidential little boudoir over a workstand hangs a neatly framed card, whereon you may read Professor Herbert, chiropodist to Her Majesty Queen Victoria and the nobility of Great Britain. End of section 26「Short Stories」Volume 1 American Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano International Short Stories Volume 1 American Stories Edited by William Patton Section 27 Mr. Dooley on Corporal Punishment By F. P. Dunn Well, sir, said Mr. Dooley, I see that some school teachers down east have been petitioning to be allowed to slug the young. How's that? asked Mr. Hennessy. Well, said Mr. Dooley, they say they can't do anything with these tender little growths unless they use a club. They want the Board of Education to restore what's called corporal punishment. 
that is the fun of lickin' some one that can't fight back. Says one of them, the little ones under our care are far from being the small angels that they look. As a matter of fact, they are rebellious monsters that must be suppressed, be vigorous and, says he, stern measures. Is it right, says he, that us schoolmasters should daily risk our lives at the hands of these ferocious and tiggerish enemies of human society without having a chance to pound them? Yesterday a golden-haired imp of perdition placed a tack in me chair. Today I found a dead rat in the desk. At times they write opprobrious epithets about me on the blackboard, at other times crude but pinted caricatures. Nothing will control them. They hurl the murderous spitball. They pull the braid of the little girl. They fire baseballs through the windows. Sometimes lumps of chewing gum are found under their desks, where they have stuck them for further use. They shuffle their feet when I'm nervous. They look around them when they think I'm not looking. They pass notes grossly insulting each other. Moral suasion does no good. I have thried right into their parents, asking them to cripple their offspring, and the parents have come over and offered to fight me. I have thried keeping them after school, making them write compositions, and shaking the milk teeth out of them, but to no avail. My opinion is that the average small boy is a treacherous, dangerous crater like the Apache Indian, and that the only thing to do with him is to slam him with a wagon spoke, says he. And the Board of Education is discussing the petition. It can't quite make up its mind whether Solomon wasn't right. Solomon said, according to Hogan, spiled the rod and saved the child. He must have had a large family if he was anywhere near Titty Rosenfeld's law of averages. I don't see how he could have spared him from right and from correct in his family. He must have set up nights. Anyhow, the Board of Education discussing whether he was right or not. I don't know myself. All I know is that if I was a life insurance canvasser, or a coal dealer, or something else that made me eligible to be a member of a Board of Education, and an able-bodied man six feet tall came to me for permission to whale a boy three feet tall, I'd say, I don't know whether you are competent. Punishing people requires special training. It ain't of everybody that's suited for the job. You might bungle it. To take off your coat and vest and step into the next room and be examined. And in the next room the ambitious educator would find James J. Jeffries, or some other likely efficient expert, ready for him, and if he come back alive, he'd have a certificate entitling him to whack any little boy he met, except mine. Sure, there'd be very few people to say they believed in corporal punishment, if corporal punishment was general. I wouldn't give anyone the right to lick a child that wanted to lick a child. No one should be licked till he's too old to take a licking. If it's right to lie up an infinite of eight, why ain't it right to lie up a one of eighteen? Supposing President Hadley of Yale saw that the left tackle or the halfback of the football team wasn't behaving right. He had been caught blowing a pea-shooter at the professor of illuminatory chemistry, or pulling at the durbel if the professor of dogmatic theosophy. He don't know any different. He's not supposed to realize the distinction between right and wrong yet. Does President Hadley grab the child by the ear and conduct him to a corner if the schoolroom ain't wallop him? You bet he does not. President Hadley may be a bold man in raising money or translating Homer. But he knows the difference between courage and sheer recklessness. If he tried to convince this young idea how to shoot in this careless way, you'd read in the papers that the fire department was trying to rescue President Hadley from the roof of the building, but he declined to come down. But what would ye do with a child that refused to obey ye? demanded Mr. Hennessy. Not being either a parent or an educator, I never had such a child, said Mr. Dooley. I don't know what I'd do if I was. The only thing I wouldn't do would be to hit him if he couldn't hit back, and then I'd think twice about it. The older I grow, the more things there are I know I don't know anything about. And one of them is children. I can't figure them out at all. 
what do you know about them little ones that ye have so carefully reared be lavin them in the mornin before they get up and losin your temper with at night when ye come home from work they don't know ye and you don't know them you'll never know till it's too late i've often wondered what a little boy thinks about us that call ourselves grown up because we can't grow any more we wake him up in the mornin when he wants to sleep we make him wash his face when he knows it don't need washin that as much as it will later and we send him back to comb his hair in a way he don't approve of at all we fire him off to school just about the time of day when any one ought to be out of doors he trudges off to a brick building and a tired teacher tells him a lot of things he hasn't any interest in at all like how many times seven goes into a hundred and nine and who was king the fourth england in thirteen twenty two and where is kazabazu on the map he had to sit there most of the pleasant part of the day with sixty other kids and every time be thrice to do anything that seems right to him like jabbing a friend with a pin or carving his name on the desk the strange lady or gentleman that acts as his keeper swoops down on him and makes him feel like a criminal towards evening if he's been good and repressed all his nocturnal instincts he's allowed to go home and chop some wood when he's done that and he's just managed to get a few of his friends together and they're beginning to get up interest in the sport of throwing bricks down into a chinese laundry his little sister comes out and tells him he's wanted at home he instinctively pulls her hair and goes in to study his lessons so that he'll be able tomorrow to answer some ridiculous questions that are going to be asked him after a while you come home and greet him with your usual glare and you have supper together you do most of the talking which ain't much if he tries to cut in with something that intelligent people ought to talk about you stop him with a frown after supper he's allowed to study some more and when he's finished just as the night begins to look good he's fired off to bed and the light is taken away from him he sees ghosts and hobgoblins in the dark and the next he knows he's hauled out of bed and made to wash his face again and so it goes if he don't do any of these things or if he doesn't do them the way you think he's the right way some one hits him or wants to talk about happy childhood how would ye like to have twenty or thirty people issuing foolish orders to ye making ye do things ye didn't want to do and never understanding at all why it was so tis like living on this earth and being ruled by the inhabitants of mars he has his world you can bet on that and tis a mighty important world who knows why a kid would rather eat potatoes cooked nice and black on a fire made of straw and old boots than the delicious oatmeal so carefully and so often prepared for him by his kind parents who knows why he thinks a dark hole under a sidewalk is a robber's cave who knows why he likes to collect in one pocket a ball of twine glass marbles chewing gum a dead sparrow and half a lemon who knows what his seasons are they are not mine and they're not yours but he goes as regular from top time to marble time and from marble time to kite time as we go from summer to autumn and autumn to winter today he's trying to annihilate another boy's stick top with his tomorrow he's trying to sail a kite of a telegraphed wire who knows why he does it faith we know nothing about him and there's nothing about us i can remember when i was a little boy but i can't remember how i was a little boy i call back so as yesterday the things i did but why i did them i don't know faith if i could look forward to the things i've done i could no more easily explain why i was going to do them maybe we're both wrong in the way we look at each other us and the chowder we think we've grown up and they don't guess that we're children if they knew us better they'd not be so surprised at our actions and wouldn't force us to hit them when you issue some foolish order to your little boy he'd say papa is fractious today don't you think he ought to have some castor isle it's a wise child that knows his own father said mr hennessy it's a happy child that doesn't said mr dooley end of section twenty seven National Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. International Short Stories, Volume 1, American Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 28. Over a Wood Fire by Donald G. Mitchell. I have got a quiet farmhouse in the country, a very humble place to be sure, tenanted by a worthy enough man of the old New England stamp, where I sometimes go for a day or two in the winter to look over the farm accounts and to see how the stock is thriving on a winter's keep. One side of the door, as you enter from the porch, is a little parlour, scarce twelve feet by ten, with a cosy looking fireplace, a heavy oak floor, a couple of armchairs, and a brown table with carved lion's feet. Out of this room opens a little cabinet, only big enough for a broad bachelor bedstead, where I sleep upon feathers and wake in the morning with my eye upon a saucy coloured lithographic print of some fancy Bessie. It happens to be the only house in the world of which I am bona fide owner, and I take a vast deal of comfort in treating it just as I choose. I manage to break some article of furniture almost every time I pay it a visit, and if I cannot open the window readily of a morning to breathe the fresh air, I knock out a pane or two of glass with my boot. I lean against the walls in a very old armchair there is on the premises, and scarcely ever fail to worry such a hole in the plastering as would set me down for a round charge of damages in town, or make a prim housewife fret herself into a raging fever. I laugh out loud with myself in my big armchair when I think that I am neither afraid of one nor the other. As for the fire, I keep the little hearth so hot as to warm half the cellar below, and the whole space between the jams roars for two hours together with white flame. To be sure, the windows are not very tight between broken panes and bad joints, so that the fire, large as it is, is by no means an extravagant comfort. As night approaches, I have a huge pile of oak and hickory placed beside the hearth. I put out the tallow candle on the mantel, using the family snuffers with one leg broken. Then, drawing my chair directly in front of the blazing wood, and setting one foot on each of the old iron fire dogs until they grow too warm, I dispose myself for an evening of such sober and thoughtful quietude as I believe on my soul that very few of my fellow men have the good fortune to enjoy. My tenant, meantime, in the other room, I can hear now and then, though there is a thick stone chimney and broad entry between, multiplying contrivances with his wife to put two babies to sleep. This occupies them, I should say, usually an hour, though my only measure of time, for I never carry a watch into the country, is the blaze of my fire. By ten or thereabouts, my stock of wood is nearly exhausted. I pile upon the hot coals what remains, and sit watching how it kindles and blazes and goes out, even like our joys, and then slip by the light of the embers into my bed, where I luxuriate in such sound and healthful slumber as only such rattling window flames and country air can supply. But to return, the other evening it happened to be on my last visit to my farmhouse, when I had exhausted all the ordinary rural topics of thought, had formed all sorts of conjectures as to the income of the year, had planned a new wall around one lot, and the clearing up of another, now covered with patriarchal wood, and wondered if the little rickety house would not be, after all, a snug enough box to live and to die in. I fell on a sudden into such an unprecedented line of thought, which took such deep hold of my sympathies, sometimes even starting tears, that I determined the next day to set as much of it as I could recall on paper. Something, it may have been the home-looking blaze, I am a bachelor of, say, six-and-twenty, or possibly a plaintive cry of the baby in my tenant's room, has suggested to me the thought of marriage. I piled upon the heated fire logs the last armful of my wood, and now, said I, bracing myself courageously between the arms of my chair, I'll not flinch, I'll pursue the thought wherever it leads, though it leads me to the D, I am apt to be hasty, at least, continued I, softening, until my fire is out. 
the wood was green and at first showed no disposition to blaze it smoked furiously smoke thought i always goes before blaze and so does doubt go before decision and my reverie from that very starting point slipped into this shape one smoke signifying doubt a wife thought i yes a wife and why and pray my dear sir why not why why not doubt why not hesitate why not tremble does a man buy a ticket in a lottery a poor man whose whole earnings go in to secure the ticket without trembling hesitating and doubting can a man stake his bachelor respectability his independence and comfort upon the die of absorbing unchanging relentless marriage without trembling at the venture shall a man who has been free to chase his fancies over the wide world without let or hindrance shut himself up to marriage ship within four walls called home that are to claim him his time his trouble and his tears thenceforward for evermore without doubt thick and thick coming as smoke shall he who has been hitherto a mere observer of other men's cares and business moving off where they made him sick of heart approaching whenever and wherever they made him feel gleeful shall he now undertake administration of just such cares and business without qualms shall he whose whole life has been but a nimble succession of escapes from trifling difficulties now broach without doubtings that matrimony where if difficulty beset him there is no escape shall this brain of mine careless working never tired with idleness feeding on long vagaries and high gigantic castles dreaming out beatitudes hour by hour turn itself at length to such dull task work as thinking out a livelihood for wife and children where thenceforward will be those sunny dreams in which i have warmed my fancies and my heart and lighted my eye with crystal this very marriage which a brilliant working imagination has vested time and again with brightness and delight can serve no longer as a mine for teeming fancy all alas will be gone reduced to the dull standard of the actual no more room for intrepid forays of imagination no more gorgeous realm making all will be over why not i thought go on dreaming can any wife be prettier than an after-dinner fancy idle and yet vivid can paint for you can any children make less noise than the little rosy-cheeked ones who have no existence except in the omnium gatherum of your own brain can any housewife be more unexceptionable than she who goes sweeping daintily the cobwebs that gather in your dreams can any domestic larder be better stocked than the private larder of your head dozing on a cushioned chair back at delmonico's can any family purse be better filled than the exceeding plump one you dream of after reading such pleasant books as munchausen or typey but if after all it must be duty or what not making provocation what then and I clapped my feet hard against the fire dogs and leaned back and turned my face to the ceiling as much as to say and where on earth then shall a poor devil look for a wife somebody says Littleton or Shaftesbury I think that marriages should be happier if they were all arranged by the Lord Chancellor unfortunately we have no Lord Chancellor to make this commutation of our misery shall a man then scour the country on a mule's back like honest gil blas of stantilan or shall he make application to some such intervening providence as madame saint marc who as i see by the press manages these matters to one's hand for some five per cent of the fortunes of the parties i have trouted when the brook was so low and the sky so hot that i might as well have thrown my fly upon the turnpike and I have hunted hare at noon and woodcock in snow time never despairing scarce doubting But for a poor hunter of his kind without traps or snares or any aid of police or constabulary to traverse the world Where are swarming on a moderate computation some three hundred and odd millions of unmarried women for a single capture irremediable unchangeable and yet a capture which by strange metonymy not laid down in the books 
is very apt to turn captor into captive and make game of hunter all this surely surely may make a man shrug with doubt then again there are the plaguy wife's relations who knows how many third fourth or fifth cousins will appear at careless complimentary intervals long after you had settled into the placid belief that all congratulatory visits were at an end how many twisted-headed brothers will be putting in their advice as a friend to peggy how many maiden aunts will come to spend a month or two with their dear peggy and want to know every tea-time if she isn't a dear love of a wife then dear father-in-law will beg taking dear peggy's hand in his to give a little wholesome counsel and will be very sure to advise just the contrary of what you had determined to undertake and dear mamma-in-law will set her nose into peggy's cupboard and insist upon having the key to your own private locker in the wainscot then perhaps there is a little bevy of dirty-nosed nephews who come to spend the holidays and eat up your east india sweetmeats and who are for ever tramping over your head or raising the old harry below while you are busy with your clients last and worse is some fidgety old uncle for ever too cold or too hot who vexes you with his patronizing airs and impudently kisses his little peggy that could be borne however for perhaps he has promised his fortune to peggy peggy then will be rich and the thought made me rub my shins which were now getting comfortably warm upon the fire dogs then she will be forever talking of her fortune and pleasantly reminding you on occasion of a favorite purchase how lucky that she had the means and dropping hints about economy and buying very extravagant paisleys she will annoy you by looking over the stock list at breakfast time and mention quite carelessly to your clients that she is interested in such or such a speculation she will be provokingly silent when you hint to a tradesman that you have not the money by you for his small bill in short she will tear the life out of you making you pay in righteous retribution of annoyance grief vexation shame and sickness of heart for the superlative folly of marrying rich but if not rich then poor bah the thought made me stir the coals but there was still no blaze the paltry earnings you are able to wring out of clients by the sweat of your brow will now be all our income you will be pestered for pin money and pestered with your poor wife's relations ten to one she will stickle about taste so vistos and want to make things so pretty and that so charming if she only had the means and is sure paul a kiss can't deny his little peggy such a trifling sum and all for the common benefit then she for one means that her children shan't go a-begging for clothes and another pull at the purse trust a poor mother to dress her children in finery perhaps she is ugly not noticeable at first but growing on her and what is worse growing faster on you you wonder why you didn't see that vulgar nose long ago and that lip it is very strange you think that you ever thought it pretty and then to come to breakfast with her hair looking as it does and you not so much as daring to say peggy do brush your hair her foot too not very bad when decently shows but now since she's married she does wear such infernal slippers and yet for all this to be prigging up for an hour when any of my old chums come to dine with me bless your kind hearts my dear fellows said i thrusting the tongs into the coals and speaking out aloud as if my voice could reach from virginia to paris not married yet perhaps peggy is pretty enough only shrewish no matter for cold coffee you should have been up before what sad thin poorly cooked chops to eat with your rolls she thinks they are very good and wonders how you can set such an example to your children the butter is nauseating she has no other and hopes you'll not raise a storm about butter a little turned i think i see myself ruminated i sitting meekly at table scarce daring to lift up my eyes utterly fagged out with some quarrel of yesterday choking down detestably sour muffins that my wife thinks are delicious slipping in dried mouthfuls of burnt ham off the side of my fork tines 
slipping off my chair sideways at the end and slipping out with my hat between my knees to business and never feeling myself a competent sound-minded man till the oak door is between me and peggy ha ha not yet said i and in so earnest a tone that my dog started to his feet cocked his eye to have a good look into my face met my smile of triumph with an amiable wag of the tail and curled up again in the corner again peggy is rich enough well enough mild enough only she doesn't care a fig for you she has married you because father or grandfather thought the match eligible and because she didn't wish to disoblige them besides she didn't positively hate you and thought you were a respectable enough young person she has told you so repeatedly at dinner she wonders you like to read poetry she wishes you would buy her a good cookbook and insists upon your making your will at the birth of the first baby she thinks captain so-and-so a splendid-looking fellow and wishes you would trim up a little were it only for appearance sake you need not hurry up from the office so early at night she bless her dear heart does not feel lonely you read to her a love tale she interrupts the pathetic parts with directions to her seamstress you read of marriages she sighs and asks if captain so-and-so has left town she hates to be mewed up in a cottage or between brick walls she does so love the springs but again peggy loves you at least she swears it with her hand on the sorrows of werther she has pin money which she spends for the literary world and the friends in council she is not bad-looking save a bit too much of forehead nor is she sluttish unless a negligee till three o'clock and an ink stain on the forefinger be sluttish but then she is such a sad blue you never fancied when you saw her buried in a three-volume novel that it was anything more than a girlish vagary and when she quoted latin you thought innocently that she had a capital memory for her samplers but to be bored eternally about divine dante and funny goldoni is too bad your copy of teso a treasure print of 1680 is all bethumbed and dog-eared and spotted with baby gruel even your seneca and elzevir is all sweaty with handling she adores la fontaine reads balzac with a kind of artist scowl and will not let greek alone you hint at broken rest and an aching head at breakfast and she will fling you a scrap of anthology in lean of the camphor bottle or chant the Greek alley alley of tragic chorus. The nurse is getting dinner. You are holding the baby. Peggy is reading Bruyere. The fire smoked thick as pitch and puffed out little clouds over the chimney piece. I gave the forestick a kick at the thought of Peggy, baby, and Bruyere. Suddenly the flame flickered bluely athwart the smoke, caught at a twig below, rolled round the mossy oak stick twined among the crackling tree limbs mounted lit up the whole body of smoke and blazed out cheerily and bright doubt vanished with smoke and hope began with flame end of section 28 end of international short stories volume 1 american stories edited by william patton 1905-1910